Preface of the Empire of Russia From the Remotest Periods to the Present Time This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Bascom The Empire of Russia From the Remotest Periods to the Present Time by John S. C. Abbott Preface the world is now too busy to read voluminous history. The interminable details of battles and the petty intrigues of courtiers and mistresses have lost their interest. In this volume it has been our object to trace perspicuously the path which Russia has trod from earliest infancy to the present hour. The career of this empire has been so wild and wonderful that the historian can have no occasion to call in the aid of fancy for the embellishment of his narrative. The author has not deemed it necessary to encumber his pages with notes to substantiate his statements. The renowned Russian historian, Karamsin, who wrote under the patronage of Alexander I, gives ample authentication to all the facts which are stated up to the reign of that emperor. His voluminous history, in classic beauty, is unsurpassed by any of the annals of Greece or Rome. It has been admirably translated into French by Messrs. St. Thomas and Geoffret, in eleven imperial quarto volumes. In the critical citations of this author, the reader, curious in such researches, will find every fact in the early history of Russia here stated confirmed. There are but few valuable works upon Russia in the English language. Nearly all which can be relied upon as authorities are written either in French or German. The writer would refer those who seek a more minute acquaintance with this empire, now rising so rapidly in importance, first of all to Karamsin. The histoire philosophique et politique des Russiers depuis les temps les plus reclusés Jacques Nojo par Gessenau, Paris, five volumes, is a valuable work. The histoire du Russia par Pierre Charles Levesque, eight volumes, is discriminating and reliable. The various volumes of William Took upon Russian history in general, and upon the reign of Catherine, contain much information. It is only since the reign of Peter the Great that Russia has begun to attract much attention among the enlightened nations of Europe. Voltaire's life of this most renowned of the Russian sovereigns, at its first publication, attracted much notice. Since then, many books have been written upon fragments of Russian history and individual reigns. From most of these, the author has selected such events as have appeared to him most instructive and best adapted to give the reader a clear conception of the present condition and future prospects of this gigantic empire. The path she has trod since her first emergence into civilization from the chaos of barbarism can be very distinctly traced, and one can easily count the concentric accretions of her growth. This narrative reveals the mistakes which have overwhelmed her with woe, and the wisdom which has, at times, secured for Russia peace and prosperity. In writing these histories of the monarchies of continental Europe, the author has no wish to conceal his abhorrence of aristocratic usurpation. Believing in the universal brotherhood of man, his sympathies are most cordially with the oppressed masses. If the people are weak and debased, the claim is only the more urgent upon the powerful and the wise to act the part of elder brothers, holding out the helping hand to those who have fallen. The author feels grateful for the reception which the first number of this series, The Empire of Austria, has received from the American public. He hopes that this volume will not prove less interesting or instructive. In the course of a few months it will be followed by The History of Italy. End of Preface Chapter One of the Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Bascom. The Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time by John S. C. Abbott. Chapter One parentage and birth of russia from 600 bc to ad 910 primeval russia explorations of the greeks scythian invasion character of the scythians sarmatia assaults upon the roman empire eruption of the alanes 
conquests of trajan the gothic invasion the huns their character and aspect the devastations of attila the avars results of comminglings of these tribes normans birth of the russian empire the three sovereigns rurik sinius and truver adventures of Ascalad and deer introduction of christianity usurpation of oleg his conquests expedition against constantinople those vast realms of northern europe now called russia have been inhabited for a period beyond the records of history by wandering tribes of savages these barbaric hordes have left no monuments of their existence the annals of greece and of rome simply inform us that they were there generations came and departed passing through life's tragic drama and no one has told their story about five hundred years before the birth of our Saviour, the Greeks, sailing up the Bosphorus and braving the storms of the Black Sea, began to plant their colonies along its shores. Instructed by these colonists, Herodotus, who wrote about four hundred and forty years before Christ, gives some information respecting the then condition of interior Russia. The first great eruption into the wastes of Russia, of which history gives us any record, was about one hundred years before our Saviour. An immense multitude of conglomerated tribes, taking the general name of Scythians, with their wives and their children, their flocks and their herds, and their warriors fiercer than wolves, crossed the Volga and took possession of the whole country between the Don and the Danube. These barbarians did not molest the Greek colonies, but on the contrary, were glad to learn of them many of the rudiments of civilization. Some of these tribes retained their ancestral habits of wandering herdsmen, and, with their flocks, traversed the vast and treeless plains, where they found ample pasture. Others, selecting sunny and fertile valleys, scattered their seed and cultivated the soil. Thus the Scythians were divided into two quite distinct classes, the herdsmen and the laborers. The tribes who then peopled the vast wilds of northern Europe and Asia, though almost innumerable, and of different languages and customs, were all called by the Greeks Scythians, as we have given the general name of Indians to all the tribes who formerly ranged the forests of North America. The Scythians were as ferocious a race as earth has ever known. They drank the blood of their enemies, tanned their skins for garments, used their skulls for drinking cups, and worshipped a sword as the image or emblem of their favorite deity, the god of war. Philip of Macedon was the first who put any check upon their proud spirit. He conquered them in a decisive battle, and thus taught them that they were not invincible. Alexander the Great assailed them, and spread the terror of his arms throughout all the region between the Danube and the Deniper. Subsequently, the Roman legions advanced to the Euxine, and planted their eagles upon the heights of the Caucasus. The Roman historians seem to have dropped the Scythian name, and they called the whole northern expanse of Europe and Asia Sarmatia, and the barbarous inhabitants Sarmatians. About the time of our Saviour, some of these fierce tribes from the banks of the Thys and the Danube commenced their assaults upon the frontiers of the Roman Empire. This was the signal for that war of centuries which terminated in the overthrow of the throne of the Caesars. The Roman Senate, enervated by luxury, condescended to purchase peace of these barbarians and nations of savages whose names are now forgotten exacted tribute under the guise of payment for alliance from the proud empire but neither bribes nor alliances nor the sword in the hands of the enervated rome could effectually check the incursions of these bands who were ever emerging like wolves from the mysterious depths of the north in the haze of those distant times and remote realms we catch dim glimpses of locust legions emerging from the plains and the ravines between the Black Sea and the Caspian, and sweeping like a storm-cloud over nearly all of what is now called Russia. These people, to whom the name of Alains was given, had no fixed habitations. They conveyed their women and children in rude carts, their devastations were alike extended over Europe and Asia, and in the ferocity of their assaults they were as insensible to death as wild beasts could be. In the second century, the emperor Trajan conquered and took possession of the province of Dasha, which included all of Lower Hungary, Transylvania, Moldavia, Wallachia, and Bessarabia. The country was divided into Roman provinces, over each of which a prefect was established. 
in the third century the goths from the shores of the baltic came rushing over the wide arena with the howling of wolves and their gnashing of teeth they trampled down all opposition with their war knives drove out the romans crossed the black sea in their rude vessels and spread conflagration and death throughout the most flourishing cities and villages of bithynia galatia and cappadocia the famous temple of diana at ephesus these barbarians committed to the flames they overran all greece and took athens by storm as they were about to destroy the precious libraries of athens one of their chieftains said let us leave to the greeks their books that they in reading them may forget the arts of war and that we thus may more easily be able to hold them in subjugation these goths established an empire extending from the black sea to the baltic and which embraced nearly all of what is now european russia towards the close of the fourth century another of these appalling waves of barbaric inundation rolled over northern europe the huns emerging from the northern frontiers of china traversed the immense intervening deserts and swept over european russia spreading everywhere flames and desolation the historians of that day seemed to find no language sufficiently forcible to describe the hideousness and the ferocity of these savages they pressed down on the roman empire as merciless as wolves and the caesars turned pale at the recital of their deeds of blood it is indeed a revolting picture which contemporaneous history gives us of these barbarians in their faces was the concentrated ugliness of the hyena and the baboon they tattooed their cheeks to prevent the growth of their beards they were short thick-set and with backbones curved almost into a semicircle herbs roots and raw meat they devoured tearing their food with their teeth or hewing it with their swords to warm and soften their meat they placed it under their saddles when riding nearly all their lives they passed on horseback wandering incessantly over the vast plains they had no fixed habitations but warmly clad in the untanned skins of beasts like the beasts they slept wherever the night found them they had no religion nor laws no conception of ideas of honour their language was a wretched jargon and in their nature there seemed to be no moral sense to which compassion or mercy could plead such were the huns as described by the ancient historians the goths struggled against them in vain they were crushed and subjugated the king of the goths hermanric in chagrin and despair committed suicide that he might escape slavery thousands of the goths in their terror crowded down into the roman province of thrace now the turkish province of romania the empire then in its decadence could not drive them back and they obtained a permanent foothold there the huns thus attained the supremacy throughout all of northern europe there were then very many tribes of diverse names peopling these vast realms and incessant wars were waged between them the domination which the huns attained was precarious and not distinctly defined the terrible attila ere long appears as the king of these huns about the middle of the fifth century this wonderful barbarian extended his sway from the volga to the rhine and from the bosphorus to the shores of the baltic wherever he appeared blood flowed in torrents he swept the valley of the danube with flame and sword destroying cities fortresses and villages and converting the whole region into a desert at the head of an army of seven hundred thousand men he plunged all europe into dismay both the eastern and western empires were compelled to pay him tribute he even invaded gaul and upon the plains of chalons was defeated in one of the most bloody battles ever fought in europe contemporary historians record that one hundred and six thousand dead were left upon the field with the death of attila the supremacy of the huns vanished the eruption of the huns was a devastating scourge which terrified the world whole nations were exterminated in their march until at last the horrible apparition disappeared almost as suddenly as it arose with the disappearance of the huns central russia presents to us the aspect of a vast waste thinly peopled with the wrecks of nations and tribes debased and feeble living upon the cattle they herded and occasionally cultivating the soil and now there comes forward upon this theatre of violence and of blood another people called the sclavonians more energetic and more intelligent than any who had preceded them the origin of the sclavonians is quite lost in the haze of distance and in the savage wilds where they first appeared the few traditions which have been gleaned respecting them are of very little authority 
from about the close of the fifth century the inhabitants of the whole region now embraced by european russia were called sclavonians and yet it appears that these sclavonians consisted of many nations rude and warlike with various distinctive names they soon began to crowd upon the roman empire and become more formidable than the goths or the huns had been wading through blood they seized province after province of the empire destroying and massacring often in mere wantonness the emperor justinian was frequently compelled to purchase peace with them and to bribe them to alliance and now came another wave of invasion bloody and overwhelming the avars from the north of china swept over asia seized all the provinces on the black sea overran greece and took possession of most of the country between the volga and the elbe the sclavonians of the danube however successfully resisted them and maintained their independence generations came and went as these hordes wild degraded and wretched swept these northern wilds in debasement and cruelty rivaling the wolves which howled in their forests they have left no traces behind them and the few records of their joyless lives which history has preserved are merely the gleanings of uncertain tradition the thinking mind pauses in sadness to contemplate the spectacle of these weary ages when his brother man was the most ferocious of beasts and when all the discipline of life tended only to sink him into deeper abysses of brutality and misery there is here a problem in the divine government which no human wisdom can solve there is consolation only in the announcement that what we know not now we shall know hereafter all these diverse nations blending have formed the present russians along the shores of the baltic these people assumed the name of scandinavians and subsequently normans toward the close of the eighth century the normans filled europe with the renown of their exploits and their banners bade defiance even to the armies of charlemagne early in the ninth century they ravaged france italy scotland england and passed over to ireland where they built cities which remain to the present day there is no manner of doubt writes m Karamsin in his history of russia that five hundred years before christopher columbus they had discovered north america and instituted commerce with the natives it is not until the middle of the ninth century that we obtain any really reliable information respecting the inhabitants of central russia they are described as a light-complexioned flaxen-haired race robust and capable of great endurance their huts were cheerless affording but little shelter and they lived upon the coarsest food often devouring their meat raw the greeks expressed astonishment at their agility in climbing precipitous cliffs and admired the hardihood with which they plunged through bogs and swam the most rapid and swollen streams he who had the most athletic vigor was the greatest man and all the ambition and energy of the nation were expended in the acquisition of strength and agility they are ever described as strangers to fear rushing unthinkingly upon certain death they were always ready to accept combat with the roman legions entire strangers to military strategy they made no attacks in drilled lines or columns but the whole tumultuous mass in wild disorder rushed upon the foe with the most desperate daring having no guide but their own ferocity and the chieftains who led small bands their weapons consisted of swords javelins and poisoned arrows and each man carried a heavy shield as they crossed the danube in their bloody forays incited by love of plunder the inhabitants of the roman villages fled before them when pursued by an invincible force they would relinquish life rather than their booty even when the plunder was of a kind totally valueless in their savage homes the ancient annals depict in appalling colors the cruelties they exercised upon their captives they were however as patient in endurance as they were merciless in infliction no keenness of torture could force from them a cry of pain yet these people so ferocious are described as remarkably amiable among themselves seldom quarrelling honest and truthful and practising hospitality with truly patriarchal grace whenever they left home the door was unfastened and food was left for any chance wayfarer a guest was treated as a heavenly messenger and was guided on his way with the kindest expressions for his welfare the females as in all barbaric countries were exposed to every indignity all the hard labor of life was thrown upon them when the husband died the widow was compelled to cast herself upon the funeral pyre which consumed his remains it is said that this barbarous custom which christianity abolished was introduced to prevent the wife from secretly killing her husband 
the wife was also regarded as the slave of the husband and they imagined that if she died at the same time with her husband she would serve him in another world the wives often followed their husbands to the wars from infancy the boys were trained to fight and were taught that nothing was more disgraceful than to forgive an injury a mother was permitted if she wished to destroy her female children but the boys were all preserved to add to the military strength of the nation it was lawful also for the children to put their parents to death when they had become infirm and useless behold exclaims a russian historian how a people naturally kind when deprived of the light of revelation can remorselessly outrage nature and surpass in cruelty the most ferocious animals in different sections of this vast region there were different degrees of debasement influenced by causes no longer known a tribe called the Devlians, nestor states lived in the most gloomy forests with the beasts and like the beasts they ate any food which a pig would devour and had as little idea of marriage as have sheep or goats among the sclavonians generally there appears to have been no aristocracy each family was an independent republic different tribes occasionally met to consult upon questions of common interest when the men of age and who had acquired reputation for wisdom guided in council gradually during the process of their wars an aristocracy arose warriors of renown became chiefs and created for themselves posts of authority and honor by prowess and plunder they acquired wealth in their incursions into the empire they saw the architecture of greece and rome and thus incited they began to rear castles and fortresses he who was recognized as the leading warrior in time of battle retained his authority in the days of peace which were very few the castle became necessary for the defense of the tribe or clan and the chieftain became the feudal noble invested with unlimited power at one time every man who was rich enough to own a horse was deemed a noble the first power recognized was only military authority but the progress of civilization developed the absolute necessity of other powers to protect the weak to repress crime and to guide in the essential steps of nations emerging from darkness into light with all nations advancing from barbarism the process has ever been slow by which the civil authority has been separated from the military it is impossible to adduce from the chaos of those times any established principles often the duke or leader was chosen with imposing ceremonies some men of commanding abilities would gather into their hands the reins of almost unlimited power and would transmit that power to their sons others were chiefs but in name we have but dim glimpses of the early religion of this people in the sixth century they are represented as regarding with awe the deity whom they designated as the creator of thunder the spectacle of the majestic storms which swept their plains and the lightning bolts hurled from an invisible hand deeply impressed these untutored people they endeavored to appease the anger of the supreme being by the sacrifice of bulls and other animals they also peopled the groves the fountains the rivers with deities statues were rudely chiseled into which they supposed the spirits of their gods entered and which they worshipped they deemed the supreme being himself too elevated for direct human adoration and only ventured to approach him through gods of a secondary order they believed in a fallen spirit a god of evil who was the author of all the calamities which afflict the human race the polished greeks chiseled their idols from snow-white marble into the most exquisite proportions of the human form many they invested with all the charms of loveliness and endowed them with the most amiable attributes the voluptuous venus and the laurel-crowned bacchus were their gods but the sclavonians regarding their deities only as possessors of power and objects of terror carved their idols gigantic in stature and hideous in aspect from these rude scattered and discordant populations the empire of russia quite suddenly sprang into being its birth was one of the most extraordinary events history has transmitted to us we have seen that the normans dwelling along the southern and eastern shores of the baltic and visiting the most distant coasts with their commercial and predatory fleets had attained a degree of power intelligence and culture which gave them a decided preeminence over the tribes who were scattered over the wilds of central russia a sclavonian whose name tradition says was gostomisl a man far superior to his countrymen in intelligence and sagacity deploring the anarchy which reigned everywhere around him and admiring the superior civilization of the normans persuaded several tribes unitedly to send an embassy to the normans to solicit of them a king 
the embassy was accompanied by a strong force of these fierce warriors who knew well how to fight but who had become conscious that they did not know how to govern themselves their message was laconic but explicit our country they said is grand and fertile but under the reign of disorder come and govern us and reign over us three brothers named rurik sinius and truver illustrious both by birth and achievements consented to assume the sovereignty each over a third part of the united applicants each engaging to cooperate with and uphold the others escorted by the armed retinue which had come to retrieve them they left their native shores and entered the wilds of scandinavia rurik established himself at novgorod on lake ilmen Sinius, advancing some three hundred miles further, northeast, took his station at Bailo Ozero, on the shores of Lake Bailo. Truver went some hundred miles further south to Truver in the vicinity of Smolensk. Thus there were three sovereigns established in Russia, united by the ties of interest and consanguinity. It was then that this region acquired the name of Russia, from the Norman tribe who furnished these three sovereigns. The Russia which thus emerged into being was indeed an infant compared with the gigantic empire in this day of its growing and vigorous manhood. It embraced then but a few thousand square miles, being all included in the present provinces of St. Petersburg, Novgorod, and Peskov. But two years passed away ere Sinius and Truver died, and Rurik united their territories with his own, and thus established the Russian monarchy. The realms of Rurik grew, rapidly by annexation and soon extended east some two hundred miles beyond where moscow now stands to the headwaters of the volga they were bounded on the southwest by the duina on the north they reached to the wild wastes of arctic snows over these distant provinces rurik established governors selected from his own nation the normans these provincial governors became feudal lords and thus with the monarchy the feudal system was implanted Feudality was the natural first step of a people emerging from barbarism. The sovereign rewarded his favorites or compensated his servants, civil and military, by ceding to them provinces of greater or less extent, with unlimited authority over the people subject to their control. These lords acknowledged fealty to the sovereign, paid a stipulated amount of tribute, and, in case of war, were bound to enter the field with a given number of men in defense of the crown. It was a system essential, perhaps, to those barbarous times when there was no easy communication between distant regions, no codes of laws, and no authority before which savage men would bow but that of the sword. At this time, two young Norman nobles, inspired with that love of war and spirit of adventure which characterized their countrymen, left the court of Rurik at Novgorod, where they had been making a visit, and with well-armed retainers commenced a journey to Constantinople to offer their services to the emperor. It was twelve hundred miles directly south from Novgorod to the imperial city. The adventurers had advanced about halfway when they arrived at a little village called Kiev, upon the banks of the Danaper. The location of the city was so beautiful, upon a commanding bluff at the head of the navigation of this majestic stream, and the region around seemed so attractive, that the Norman adventurers, Ascalod and Deer by name, decided to remain there. They were soon joined by others of their warlike countrymen. The natives appeared to have made no opposition to their rule, and thus Kiev became the center of a new and independent Russian kingdom. These energetic men rapidly extended their territories, raised a large army, which was thoroughly drilled in all the science of Norman warfare, and then audaciously declared war against Greece and attempted its subjugation. The Danaper, navigable for boats most of the distance from Kiev to the Euxine, favored their enterprise. They launched upon the stream two hundred barges, which they filled with their choicest troops. Rapidly they floated down the stream, spread their sails upon the bosom of the Euxine, entered the Bosphorus, and anchoring their fleet at the mouth of the Golden Horn, laid siege to the city. The Emperor Michael III then reigned at Constantinople. This Northman invasion was entirely unexpected, and the Emperor was absent, engaged in war with the Arabs. A courier was immediately dispatched to inform him of the peril of the city. He hastily returned to his capital, which he finally reached after eluding with much difficulty the vigilance of the besiegers. Just as the inhabitants of the city were yielding to despair, there arose a tempest which swept the Bosphorus with resistless fury. The crowded barges were dashed against each other, shattered, wrecked, and sunk. 
the christians of constantinople justly attributed their salvation to the interposition of god Askeladd and deer with the wrecks of their army returned in chagrin to kiev the historians of that period relate that the idolatrous russians were so terrified by this display of the divine displeasure that they immediately sent ambassadors to constantinople professing their readiness to embrace christianity and asking that they might receive the rite of baptism in attestation of the fact that Christianity at this period entered Russia, we are referred to a well-authenticated letter of the patriarch Photius, written at the close of the year 866. The Russians, he says, so celebrated for their cruelty, conquerors of their neighbors, and who in their pride dared to attack the Roman Empire, have already renounced their superstitions, and have embraced the religion of Jesus Christ. Lately our most formidable enemies, they have now become our most faithful friends. We have recently sent them a bishop and a priest, and they testify the greatest zeal for Christianity. It was in this way, it seems, that the religion of our Saviour first entered barbaric Russia. The gospel, thus welcomed, soon became firmly established at Kiev, and rapidly extended its conquests in all directions. The two Russian kingdoms, that of Rurik in the north and that of Askeladd and Deir on the Danaper, rapidly extended as these enterprising kings by arms subjugated adjacent nations to their sway. Rurik remained upon the throne fifteen years, and then died, surrendering his crown to his son Igor, still a child. A relative, Oleg, was entrusted with the regency, during the minority of the boy king. Such was the state of Russia in the year 879. In that dark and cruel age, war was apparently the only thought, military conquest the only glory. The regent, Oleg, taking with him the young prince Igor, immediately set out with a large army on a career of conquest, marching directly south some hundred miles and taking possession of all the country by the way, he arrived at last at the headwaters of the Danaper. The renown of the kingdom of Askeladd and Deir had reached his ears, and aware of their military skill and that the ranks of their army were filled with Norman warriors, Oleg decided to seize the two sovereigns by stratagem. As he cautiously approached Kiev, he left his army in a secluded encampment, and with a few chosen troops floated down the stream in barges, disguised as merchant boats. Landing in the night, beneath the high and precipitous banks near the town, he placed a number of his soldiers in ambuscade, and then, calling upon the princes of Kiev, informed them that he had been sent by the king of Novgorod with a commercial adventure down the Danaper, and invited them to visit his barges. The two sovereigns, suspecting no guile, hastened to the banks of the river. Suddenly the men in ambush rose, and piercing them with arrows and javelins, they both fell dead at the feet of Oleg. The two victims of this perfidy were immediately buried upon the spot where they fell. In commemoration of this atrocity, the church of St. Nicholas has been erected near the place, and even to the present day, the inhabitants of Kiev conduct the traveller to the tomb of Askeladd and Deir. Oleg, now marshalling his army, marched triumphantly into the town, and, without experiencing any formidable opposition, annexed the conquered realm to the northern kingdom. Oleg was charmed with his conquest. The beautiful sight of the town, the broad expanse of the river, the facilities which the stream presented for maritime and military adventures so delighted him that he exclaimed, Let Kiev be the mother of all the Russian cities. Oleg established his army in cannonments, strengthened it with fresh recruits, commenced predatory excursions on every side, and soon brought the whole region, for many leagues around, under his subjugation. All the subjected nations were compelled to pay him tribute, though, with the sagacity which marked his whole course, he made the tax so light as not to be burdensome. The territories of Oleg were now vast, widely scattered, and with but the frailest bond of union between them. Between the two capitals of Novgorod and Kiev, which were separated by a distance of seven or eight hundred miles, there were many powerful tribes still claiming independence. Oleg directed his energies against them, and his march of conquest was resistless. In the course of two years he established his undisputed sway over the whole region, and thus opened unobstructed communication between his northern and southern provinces. He established a chain of military posts along the line, and placed his renowned warriors in feudal authority over numerous provinces. Each lord in his castle was supreme in authority over the vassals subject to his sway. Life and death were in his hands. The fealty he owed his sovereign was paid in a small tribute, and in military service with an appointed number of soldiers whom he led into the field and supported. Having thus secured safety in the north, Oleg turned his attention to the south. 
with a well-disciplined army he marched down the left bank of the river sweeping the country for a hundred miles in width everywhere planting his banners and establishing his simple and effective government of baronial lords it was easy to weaken any formidable or suspected tribe by the slaughter of the warriors there were two safeguards against insurrection the burdens imposed upon the vassals were so light as to induce no murmurings and all the feudal lords were united to sustain each other the first movement towards rebellion was drowned in blood igor the legitimate sovereign had now attained his majority but accustomed as he had long been to entire obedience he did not dare to claim the crown from a regent flushed with the brilliancy of his achievements who had all power in his hands and who by a nod could remove him for ever out of his way igor was one day engaged in the chase when at the door of a cottage in a small village near kiev he saw a young peasant girl of marvellous grace and beauty she was a norman girl of humble parentage young igor inflamed by her beauty immediately rode to the door and addressed her her voice was melody her smile ravishing and in her replies to his questionings she developed pride of character quickness of intelligence and invincible modesty which charmed him and instantly won his most passionate adoration the young prince rode home sorely wounded cupid had shot one of his most fiery arrows into the very centre of his heart though many high-born ladies had been urged upon igor he renounced them all and allowing beauty to triumph over birth honourably demanded and received the hand of the lowly-born yet princely-minded and lovely olga they were married at kiev in the year nine o three the revolution at kiev had not interrupted the friendly relations existing between kiev and constantinople the christians of the imperial city made great efforts by sending missionaries to kiev to multiply the number of christians there oleg though a pagan granted free toleration to christianity and reciprocated the presents and friendly messages he received from the emperor but at length oleg having consolidated his realms and ambitious of still greater renown wealth and power resolved boldly to declare war against the empire itself and to march upon constantinople the warriors from a hundred tribes each under their feudal lord were ranged about his banners for miles along the banks of the Danaper at kiev the river was covered with barges two thousand in number an immense body of cavalry accompanied the expedition following along the shore the navigation of the river which poured its flood through a channel nearly a thousand miles in length from kiev to the uxine was difficult and perilous it required the blind unthinking courage of semi-barbarians to undertake such an enterprise there were many cataracts down which the flotilla would be swept over foaming billows and amidst jagged rocks in many places the stream was quite impassable by boats and it was necessary to take all the barges with their contents on shore and drag them for miles through the forest again to launch them upon smoother water and all this time they were exposed to attacks from numerous and ferocious foes having arrived at the mouth of the Danaper, they had still six or eight hundred miles of navigation over the waves of that storm-swept sea and then at the close they had to encounter in deadly fight all the power of the roman empire but unintimidated by these perils oleg leaving igor with his bride at kiev launched his boats upon the current and commenced his desperate enterprise end of chapter one chapter two of the empire of russia from the remotest periods to the present time this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jean bascom the empire of russia from the remotest periods to the present time by john s c abbott chapter 2 growth and consolidation of russia from 910 to 973 expedition to constantinople treaty with the emperor last days of oleg his death igor assumes the scepter his expedition to the don descent upon constantinople his defeat second expedition pusillanimity of the greeks death of igor regency of olga her character succession of sviatoslav his impiety and ambition 
conquest of bulgaria division of the empire defeat ruin and death of sviatoslav civil war death of oleg flight of vladimir supremacy of yaropolk the fleet of oleg successfully accomplished the navigation of the daniper followed by the horse along the shores each barge carried forty warriors entering the black sea they spread their sails and ran along the western coast to the mouth of the bosphorus the enormous armament approaching the imperial city of constantine by sea and by land completely invested it the superstitious leon surnamed the philosopher sat then upon the throne he was a feeble man engrossed with the follies of astrology and without making preparations for any vigorous defence he contented himself with stretching a chain across the golden horn to prevent the hostile fleet from entering the harbour the cavalry of oleg encountering no serious opposition burnt and plundered all the neighbouring regions the beautiful villas of the wealthy greeks their churches and villages all alike fell a prey to the flames every species of cruelty and barbarity was practised by the ruthless invaders the effeminate greeks from the walls of the city gazed upon this sweep of desolation but ventured not to march from behind their ramparts to assail the foe oleg drew his barges upon the shore and dragged them on wheels toward the city that he might from them construct instruments and engines for scaling the walls the greeks were so terrified at this spectacle of energy that they sent an embassage to oleg imploring peace and offering to pay tribute to conciliate the invader they sent him large presents of food and wine oleg apprehensive that the viands were poisoned refused to accept them he however demanded enormous tribute of the emperor to which the greeks consented on condition that oleg would cease hostilities and return peaceably to his country upon this basis of a treaty the russian array retired to some distance from the city and oleg sent four commissioners to arrange with the emperor the details of peace the humiliating treaty exacted was as follows one the greeks engaged to give twelve grivnas to each man of the russian army and the same sum to each of the warriors in the cities governed by the dependent princes of oleg two the ambassadors sent by russia to constantinople shall have all their expenses defrayed by the emperor and moreover the emperor engages to give to every russian merchant in greece bread wine meat fish and fruits for the space of six months to grant him free access to the public baths and to furnish him on his return to his country with food anchors sails and in a word with everything he needs on the other hand the greeks propose that the russians who visit constantinople for any other purposes than those of commerce shall not be entitled to this supply of their tables the russian prince shall forbid his ambassadors from giving any offence to the inhabitants of the grecian cities or provinces the quarter of st memes shall be especially appropriated to the russians who upon their arrival shall give information to the city council their names shall be inscribed and there shall be paid to them every month the sums necessary for their support no matter from what part of russia they may have come a particular gate shall be designated by which they may enter the city accompanied by an imperial commissary they shall enter without arms and never more than fifty at a time and they shall be permitted freely to engage in trade in constantinople without the payment of any tax this treaty by which the emperor placed his neck beneath the feet of oleg was ratified by the most imposing ceremonies of religion the emperor took the oath upon the evangelists oleg swore by his sword and the gods of russia in token of his triumph oleg proudly raised his shield as a banner over the battlements of constantinople and returned laden with riches to kiev where he was received with the most extravagant demonstrations of adulation and joy the treaty thus made with the emperor and which is preserved in full in the russian annals shows that the russians were no longer savages but that they had so far emerged from that gloomy state as to be able to appreciate the sacredness of law the claims of honor and the authority of treaties it is observable that no signatures are attached to this treaty but those of the norman princes which indicates that the original sclavonic race were in subjugation as the vassals of the normans 
Oleg appears to have placed in posts of authority only his own countrymen. Oleg now, as old age was advancing, passed many years in quietude. Surrounded by an invincible army, and with renown which pervaded the most distant regions, no tribes ventured to disturb his repose. His distance from southern Europe protected him from annoyance from the powerful nations which were forming there. His latter years seemed to have been devoted to the arts of peace, for he secured to an unusual degree the love as well as the admiration of his subjects. Ancient analysts record that all Russia moaned and wept when he died. He is regarded as more prominently than any other man the founder of the Russian Empire. He united, though by treachery and blood, the northern and southern kingdoms under one monarch. He then by conquest extended his empire over the vast realms of barbarians, bringing them all under the simple yet effective government of feudal lords. He consolidated this empire, and by sagacious measures encouraging arts and commerce, he led his barbarous people onward in the paths of civilization. He gave Russia a name and renown, so that it assumed a position among the nations of the globe, notwithstanding its remote position amidst the wilds of the north. His usurpation history cannot condemn. In those days any man had the right to govern who had the genius of command. Genius was the only legitimacy. But he was an assassin, and can never be washed clean from that crime. He died after a reign of thirty-three years, and was buried, with all the displays of pomp which that dark age could furnish, upon one of the mountains in the vicinity of Kiev, which mountain for many generations was called the Tomb of Oleg. Igor now assumed the reins of government. He had lived in Kiev a quiet, almost an effeminate life, with his beautiful bride Olga. A very powerful tribe, the Drevolians, which had been rather restive, even under the rigorous sway of Oleg, thought this a favorable opportunity to regain their independence. They raised the standard of revolt. Igor crushed the insurrection with energy which astonished all who knew him and which spread his fame far and wide through all the wilds of Russia, as a monarch thoroughly capable of maintaining his command. Far away in unknown realms, beyond the eastern boundary of Russia, where the gloomy waves of the Irtish, the Tobol, the Ural, and the Volga flow through vast deserts, washing the base of fur-clad mountains and murmuring through wildernesses, the native domain of wolves and bears, there were wandering innumerable tribes, fierce, cruel, and barbarous, who held the frontiers of Russia in continual terror. They were called by the general name of Pechenegues. Igor was compelled to be constantly on the alert to defend his vast frontier from the eruptions of these merciless savages. This incessant warfare led to the organization of a very efficient military power, but there was no glory to be acquired in merely driving back to their dens these wild assailants. Weary of the conflict, he at last consented to purchase a peace with them, and then, seeking the military renown which Oleg had so signally acquired, he resolved to imitate his example and make a descent upon Constantinople. The annals of those days, which seem to be credible, state that he floated down the Danaper with ten thousand barges and spread his sails upon the waves of the Euxine. Entering the Bosphorus, he landed on both shores of that beautiful strait, and, with the most wanton barbarity, ravaged the country far and near, massacring the inhabitants, pillaging the towns, and committing all the buildings to the flames. There chanced to be at Constantinople a very energetic Roman general, who was dispatched against them with a Greek fleet and a numerous land force. The Greeks in civilization were far in advance of the Russians. The land force drove the Russians to their boats, and then the Grecian fleece bore down upon them. A new instrument of destruction had been invented, the terrible Greek fire. Attached to arrows and javelins, and in great balls glowing with intensity of flame which water would not quench, it was thrown into the boats of the Russians, enkindling conflagration and exciting terror indescribable. It seemed to the superstitious followers of Igor that they were assailed by foes hurtling the lightnings of Jove. In this fierce conflict, Igor, having lost a large number of barges and many of his men, drew off his remaining forces in disorder, and they slowly returned to their country in disgrace, emaciate and starving. Many of the Russians taken captive by the Greeks were put to death with the most horrible barbarities. 
Igor, exasperated rather than intimidated by this terrible disaster, resolved upon another expedition, that he might recover his lost renown by inflicting the most terrible vengeance upon the Greeks. He spent two years in making preparations for the enterprise, called to his aid warriors from the most distant tribes of the empire, and purchased the alliance of the Pechenegues with an immense array of barges, which for leagues covered the surface of the Deniper, and with an immense squadron of cavalry following along the bank, he commenced the descent of the river. The emperor was informed that the whole river was filled with barges, descending for the siege and sack of Constantinople. In terror he sent ambassadors to Igor to endeavor to avert the storm. The imperial ambassadors met the flotilla near the mouth of the Daniper, and offered, in the name of the emperor, to pay the same tribute to Igor which had been paid to Oleg, and even to increase that tribute. At the same time they endeavored to disarm the cupidity of the foe by the most magnificent presence. Igor halted his troops, and collecting his chieftains in council, communicated to them the message of the emperor. They replied, if the emperor will give us the treasure we demand, without our exposing ourselves to the peril of battle, what more can we ask? Who can tell on which side will be the victory? Thus influenced, Igor consented to a treaty. The opening words of this curious treaty are worthy of being recorded. They were as follows. We, the ambassadors of Igor, solemnly declare that this treaty shall continue so long as the sun shall shine, in defiance of the machinations of that evil spirit who is the enemy of peace and the fomenter of discord. The Russians promise never to break this alliance with the Horde, those who have been baptized under penalty of temporal and eternal punishment from God, others under the penalty of being forever deprived of the protection of Peroun of never being able to protect themselves with their shields, of being doomed to lacerate themselves with their own swords, arrows, and other arms, and of being slaves in this world and that which is to come. This important treaty consisted of fourteen articles, drawn up with great precision, and in fact making the Greek emperor, as it were, but a vassal of the Russian monarch. One of the articles of the treaty is quite illustrative of the times. It reads, If a Christian kills a Russian— or if a Russian kills a Christian, the friends of the dead have a right to seize the murderer and kill him. This treaty was concluded at Constantinople, between the emperor and the ambassadors of Igor. Imperial ambassadors were sent with the written treaty to Kiev. Igor, with imposing ceremonies, ascended the sacred hill where was erected the Russian idol of Peroun, and with his chieftains took a solemn oath of friendship to the emperor and then, at a gauge of their sincerity, deposited at the feet of the idol their arms and shields of gold. The Christian nobles repaired to the cathedral of St. Elias, the most ancient church of Kiev, and there took the same oath at the altar of the Christian's god. The renowned Russian historian Nestor, who was a monk in the monastery at Kiev, records that at the time there were numerous Christians in Kiev. Igor sent the imperial ambassadors back to Constantinople laden with rich presents. Elated by wealth and success, the Russian king began to impose heavier burdens of taxation upon subjugated nations. The Drevlins resisted. With an insufficient force, Igor entered their territories. The Drevlians, with the fury of desperation, fell upon him, and he was slain, and his soldiers put to rout. During his reign he held together the vast empire Oleg had placed in his hands, though he had not been able to extend the boundaries of his country. It is worthy of notice, and of the highest praise, that Igor, though a pagan, imitating the example of Oleg, permitted perfect toleration throughout his realms. The gospel of Christ was freely preached, and the Christians enjoyed entire freedom of faith and worship. His reign continued thirty-two years. Sviatoslav, the son of Igor, at the time of his father's unhappy death, was in his minority. The empire was then in great peril. The Drevlians, one of the most numerous and warlike tribes, were in open and successful revolt. The army, accustomed to activity and now in idleness, was very restive. The old Norman generals, ambitious and haughty, were disposed to pay but little respect to the claims of a prince who was yet in his boyhood. But Providence had provided for this exigence. Olga, the mother of Sviatoslav, assumed the regency, and developed traits of character which place her in the ranks of the most extraordinary and noble of women. 
calling to her aid two of the most influential of the nobles one of whom was the tutor of her son and the other commander-in-chief of the army she took the helm of state and developed powers of wisdom and energy which have rarely been equalled and perhaps never surpassed she immediately sent an army into the country of the drevlians and punished with terrible severity the murders of her husband the powerful tribe was soon brought again into subjugation to the russian crown as a sort of defiant parade of her power and to overawe the turbulent drevlians she traversed their whole country with her son accompanied by a very imposing retinue of her best warriors having thus brought them to subjugation she instituted over them a just and benevolent system of government that they might have no occasion to rise in revolt they soon became so warmly attached to her that they ever were foremost in support of her power one year had not passed ere olga was seated as firmly upon the throne as oleg or igor had ever been she then leaving her son sviatoslav at kiev set out on a tour through her northern provinces everywhere by her wise measures and her deep interest in the welfare of her subjects she won admiration and love the annals of those times are full of her praises the impression produced by this visit was not effaced from the popular mind for five hundred years being handed down from father to son the sledge in which she travelled was for many generations preserved as a sacred relic she returned to kiev and there resided with her son for many years in peace and happiness the whole empire was tranquil and in the lowly cabins of the russians there was plenty and no sounds of war or violence disturbed the quiet of their lives this seems to have been one of the most serene and pleasant periods of russian history this noble woman was born a pagan but the gospel of christ was preached in the churches of kiev and she heard it and was deeply impressed with its sublimity and beauty her life was drawing to a close the grandeur of empire she was soon to lay aside for the darkness and the silence of the tomb these thoughts oppressed her mind which was by nature elevated sensitive and refined she sent for the christian pastors and conversed with them about the immortality of the soul and salvation through faith in the atonement of our lord and saviour jesus christ the good seed of christian truth fell into good soil cordially she embraced the gospel that her renunciation of paganism and her confession of the saviour might be more impressive she decided to go to constantinople to be baptized by the venerable christian patriarch who resided there the christian emperor constantine porphyrogenate informed of her approach prepared to receive her with all the pomp worthy of so illustrious a princess of so powerful a people he has himself left a record of these most interesting ceremonies olga approached the imperial palace with a very splendid suite composed of nobles of her court of ladies of distinction and of the russian ambassadors and merchants residing at constantinople the emperor with a corresponding suite of splendor met the russian queen at a short distance from the palace and conducted her with the retinue to the apartments arranged for their entertainment it was the ninth of september nine fifty five in the great banqueting hall of the palace there was a magnificent feast prepared the guests were regaled with richest music after such an entertainment as even the opulence of the east had seldom furnished there was an exchange of presents the emperor and the queen strove to outvie each other in the richness and elegance of their gifts every individual in the two retinues received presents of great value the queen at her baptism received the christian name of helen we do not find any record of the ceremonies performed at her baptism it is simply stated that the emperor himself stood as her sponsor olga as she returned to kiev with her baptismal vows upon her and in the freshness of her christian hopes manifested great solicitude for her son who still continued a pagan but sviatoslav was a wild pleasure-seeking young man who turned a deaf ear to all his mother's counsels the unbridled license which paganism granted was much more congenial to his unrenewed heart than the salutary restraints of the gospel of christ the human heart was then and there as now and here the russian historian karamasin says in vain this pious mother spoke to her son of the happiness of being a christian of the peaceful spirit he would find in the worship of the true god how can i replied sviatoslav make a profession of this new religion which will expose me to the ridicule of all my companions in arms 
in vain olga urged upon him that his example might induce others to embrace the gospel of christ the young prince was inflexible he made no effort to prevent others from becoming christians but did not disguise his contempt for the christian faith and so persistently rejected all the exhortations of his mother whom he still tenderly loved that she was at last forced to silence and could only pray in sadness that god would open the eyes and touch the heart of her child the young prince having attained his majority in the year nine sixty four assumed the crown his soul was fired with the ambition of signalizing himself by great military exploits the blood of igor of oleg and of rurik coursed through his veins and he resolved to lead the russian arms to victories which should eclipse all their exploits he gathered an immense army and looked eagerly around to find some arena worthy of the display of his genius his character was an extraordinary one combining all the virtues of ancient chivalry virtues which guided by christian faith constitute the noblest men but which without piety constitute a man the scourge of his race fame was the god of sviatoslav to acquire the reputation of a great warrior he was willing to whelm provinces in blood but he was too magnanimous to take any mean advantage of their weakness he would give them a fair warning that no blow should be struck assassin-like stealthily and in the dark he accustomed his body spartan-like to all the fatigues and exposures of war he indulged in no luxury of tents or carriages and ate the flesh of horses and wild beasts which he roasted himself over the coals in his campaigns the ground was his bed the sky his curtain his horse blanket his covering and the saddle his pillow and he seemed equally regardless of both heat and cold his soldiers looked to him as their model and emulated his hardihood turning his attention first to the vast and almost unknown realms spreading out towards east he sent word to the tribes on the don and the volga that he was coming to fight them as soon as they had time to prepare for their defences he followed his word here was chivalric crime and chivalric magnanimity marching nine hundred miles directly east from kiev over the russian plains he came to the banks of the don the region was inhabited by a very powerful nation called the Khozars. They were arrayed under their sovereign on the banks of the river to meet the foe. The Khozars had even sent for the Greek engineers to aid them in throwing up their fortifications. And they were in an entrenched camp constructed with much military skill. A bloody battle ensued, in which thousands were slain. But Sviatoslav was victor, and the territory was annexed to Russia, and Russian nobles were placed in feudal possession of its provinces. The conqueror then followed the dawn to the Sea of Azov, fighting sanguinary battles all the way, but everywhere victorious. The terror of his arms inspired widespread consternation, and many tribes, throwing aside their weapons, bowed the neck to the Russian king and implored his clemency. Sviatoslav returned to Kiev with waving banners, exulting in his renown. He was stimulated, not satiated, by this success, and now planned another expedition still more perilous and grand. On the south of the Danube, near its mouth, was Bulgaria, a vast realm, populous and powerful, which had long bid defiance to all the forces of the Roman Empire. The conquest of Bulgaria was an achievement worthy of the chivalry even of Sviatoslav. With an immense fleet of barges containing sixty thousand men, he descended the Danaper to the Euxine. Coasting along the western shore, his fleet entered the mouth of the Danube. The Bulgarians fought like heroes to repel the invaders. All their efforts were in vain. The Russians sprang from their barges on the shore, and protected by their immense bucklers, sword in hand, routed the Bulgarians with great slaughter. Cities and villages rapidly submitted to the conqueror. The king of Bulgaria, in his despair, rushed upon death. Sviatoslav, laden with the spoils of the vanquished and crowned with the laurels of victory, surrendered himself to rejoicing and to all the pleasures of voluptuous indulgence. From these dissipations, Sviatoslav was suddenly recalled by the tidings that his own capital was in danger, that a neighboring tribe of great military power, taking advantage of his absence with his army, had invested Kiev and were hourly expected to take it by assault. In dismay, he hastened his return, and found to his inexpressible relief that the besiegers had been routed by the stratagem and valor of a Russian general, and that the city and its inhabitants were thus rescued from destruction. 
but the russian king having tasted the pleasures of a more sunny clime and having rioted in the excitements of sensual indulgence soon became weary of tranquil life in kiev he was also anxious to escape from the reproof which he always felt from the pious life of his mother he therefore resolved to return to his conquered kingdom of bulgaria he said to his mother i had rather live in bulgaria than at kiev bulgaria is the centre of wealth nature and art the greeks send their gold and cloths the hungarians silver and horses the russians furs wax honey and slaves wait my son at least till after my death exclaimed olga i am aged and infirm and very soon shall be conveyed to my tomb this interview hastened the death of olga in four days she slept in jesus she earnestly entreated her son not to admit of any pagan rites at her funeral she pointed out the place of her burial and was interred with christian prayers accompanied by the lamentations and tears of all the people sviatoslav in his foreign wars which his mother greatly disproved had left her with the administration of internal affairs nestor speaks of this pious princess in beautiful phrases as the morning star of salvation for russia sviatoslav having committed his mother to the tomb made immediate preparations to transfer his capital from kiev to the more genial clime of bulgaria had he been influenced by statesmanlike considerations it would have been an admirable move the climate was far preferable to that of kiev the soil more fertile and the openings for commerce through the danube and the Euxine immeasurably superior but sviatoslav thought mainly of pleasure it was now the year nine seventy sviatoslav had three sons whom he established though all in their minority in administration of affairs in the realms from which he was departing yeropolk received the government of kiev his second son oleg was placed over the powerful nation of drevlians a third son valdemar the child of dishonor not born in wedlock was entrusted with the command at novgorod having thus arranged these affairs sviatoslav with a well-appointed army eagerly set out for his conquered province of bulgaria but in the meantime the bulgarians had organized a strong force to resist the invader the russians conquered in a bloody battle and by storm retook paraglesovets the beautiful capital of bulgaria where sviatoslav established his throne the greeks at constantinople were alarmed by this near approach of the ever encroaching and warlike russians and trembled lest they should next fall a prey to the rapacity of sviatoslav the emperor jean zimiskis immediately entered into an alliance with the bulgarians offering his daughter in marriage to boris son of their former king a bloody war ensued the greeks and bulgarians were victors and sviatoslav almost gnashing his teeth with rage was driven back again to the cold regions of the north the greek historians give the following description of the personal appearance of sviatoslav he was of medium height and well formed his physiognomy was severe and stern his breast was broad his neck thick his eyes blue with heavy eyebrows he had a broad nose heavy moustaches but a slight beard the large mass of hair which covered his head indicated his nobility from one of his ears there was suspended a ring of gold decorated with two pearls and a ruby as sviatoslav with his shattered army ascended the danaper in their boats the pechenegues fierce tribes of barbarians whom sviatoslav had subdued rose in revolt against him they gathered in immense numbers at one of the cataracts of the danaper where it would be necessary for the russians to transport their boats for some distance by land they hoped to cut off his retreat and thus secure the entire destruction of their formidable foe the situation of sviatoslav was now desperate nothing remained for him but death with the abandonment of despair he rushed into the thickest of the foe and soon fell a mangled corpse how much more happy would have been his life how much more happy his death had he followed the counsels of his pious mother Coria, chief of the Pechenegues, cut off the head of Sviatoslav, and ever after used his skull for a drinking cup. The analyst, Strakovsky, states that he had engraved upon the skull the words, In seeking the destruction of others, you met with your own. A few fugitives from the army of Sviatoslav succeeded in reaching Kiev, where they communicated the tidings of the death of the king. The empire now found itself divided into three portions, each with its sovereign. 
Yeropolk was supreme at Kiev, Oleg reigned in the spacious country of the Derevlians, Valdemar was established at Novgorod. No one of these princes was disposed to yield the supremacy to either of the others. They were soon in arms. Yeropolk marched against his brother Oleg. The two armies met about one hundred and fifty miles northwest of Kiev, near the present town of Obrouch. Oleg and his forces were utterly routed. As the whole army, in confusion and disarray, were in pell-mell flight, hotly pursued, the horse of Oleg fell. Nothing could resist, even for an instant, the onswelling flood. He was trampled into the mire, beneath the iron hoofs of squadrons of horse and the tramp of thousands of mailed men. After the battle his body was found so mutilated that it was with difficulty recognized. As it was spread upon a mat before the eyes of Yeropolk, he wept bitterly, and caused the remains to be interred with funeral honors. The monument raised to his memory has long since perished, but even to the present day the inhabitants of Zobrush point out the spot where Oleg fell. Valdemar, prince of Novgorod, terrified by the fate of his brother Oleg, and apprehensive that a similar doom awaited him, sought safety in flight. Forsaking his realm, he retired to the Baltic, and took refuge with the powerful Normans from whom his ancestors had come. Yeropolk immediately dispatched lieutenants to take possession of the government, and thus all Russia, as a united kingdom, was again brought under the sway of a single sovereign. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of the Empire of Russia From the Remotest Periods to the Present Time This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Bascom The Empire of Russia From the Remotest Periods to the Present Time by John S. C. Abbott. Chapter 3 Reigns of Valdemar, Yaroslav, Yisyaslav, and Vesevolod, from 973 to 1092. Flight of Valdemar, His Stolen Bride, The March upon Kiev, Debauchery of Valdemar, Zealous Paganism, Introduction of Christianity, Baptism in the Danaper, Entire change in the character of Valdemar. His great reforms. His death. Usurpation of Sviatopolk the Miserable. Accession of Yaroslav. His administration and death. Accession of Yisyaslav. His strange reverses. His death. Vesevolod ascends the throne. His two flights to Poland. Appeals to the Pope. Wars, famine, and pestilence. Character of Vesevolod. Though Valdemar had fled from Russia, it was by no means with the intention of making a peaceful surrender of his realms to his ambitious brother. For two years he was incessantly employed upon the shores of the Baltic, the home of his ancestors, in gathering adventurers around his flag to march upon Novgorod and chase from thence the lieutenants of Yeropolk. He at length, at the head of a strong army, triumphantly entered the city. Halfway between Novgorod and Kiev was the city and province of Polotsk. The governor was a Norman named Rovgolod. His beautiful daughter, Rogneda, was affianced to Yeropolk, and they were soon to be married. Valdemar sent ambassadors to Rovgolod, soliciting an alliance and asking for the hand of his daughter. The proud princess, faithful to Yeropolk, returned the stinging reply that she would never marry the son of a slave. We have before mentioned that the mother of Valdemar was not the wife of his father. She was one of the maids of honor of Olga. This insult roused the indignation of Valdemar to the highest pitch. Burning with rage, he marched suddenly upon Polotsk, took the city by storm, killed Rovgolod and his two sons, and compelled Rogneda, his captive, to marry him paying but little attention to the marriage ceremony. Having thus satiated his vengeance, he marched upon Kiev with a numerous army, composed of chosen warriors from various tribes. 
Yeropolk, alarmed at the strength with which his brother was approaching, did not dare to give him battle, but accumulated all his force behind the ramparts of Kiev. The city soon fell into the hands of Valdemar, and Yeropolk, basely betrayed by one of his generals, was assassinated by two officers of Valdemar acting under his authority. Valdemar was now in possession of the sovereign power, and he displayed as much energy in the administration of affairs as he had shown in the acquisition of the crown. He immediately imposed a heavy tax upon the Russians to raise money to pay his troops. Having consolidated his power, he became a very zealous supporter of the old pagan worship, rearing several new idols upon the sacred hill and placing in his palace a silver statue of Peroun. His soul seems to have been harrowed by the consciousness of crime, and he sought, by the cruel rites of a debasing superstition, to appease the wrath of the gods. Still remorse did not prevent him from plunging into the most revolting excesses of debauchery. The chronicles of those times state that he had three hundred concubines in one of his palaces, three hundred in another at Kiev, and two hundred at one of his country seats. It is by no means certain that these are exaggerations— for every beautiful maiden in the empire was sought out to be transferred to his harems. Paganism had no word of remonstrance to utter against such excesses. But Vatimar, devoted as he was to sensual indulgence, was equally fond of war. His armies were ever on the move, and the cry of battle was never intermitted. On the southeast he extended his conquests to the Carpathian Mountains, where they skirt the plains of Hungary. In the northwest he extended his sway by all the energies of fire and blood, even to the shores of the Baltic and to the Gulf of Finland. Elated beyond measure by his victories, he attributed his success to the favor of his idol gods, and resolved to express his homage by offerings of human blood. He collected a number of handsome boys and beautiful girls, and drew lots to see which of them should be offered in sacrifice. The lot fell upon a fine boy from one of the Christian families. The frantic father interposed to save his child, but the agents of Valdemar fell fiercely upon them, and they were both slain and offered in sacrifice. Their names, Ivan and Theodore, are still preserved in the Russian church as the first Christian martyrs of Kiev. A few more years of violence and crime passed away when Valdemar became the subject of that marvelous change which, nine hundred years before, had converted the persecuting Saul into the devoted apostle. The circumstances of his conversion are very peculiar, and are very minutely related by Nestor. Other recitals seem to give authenticity to the narrative. For some time Valdemar had evidently been in much anxiety respecting the doom which awaited him beyond the grave. He sent for the teachers of the different systems of religion, to explain to him the peculiarities of their faith. First came the Mohammedans from Bulgaria, then the Jews from Jerusalem, then the Christians from the Papal Church at Rome, and then Christians from the Greek Church at Constantinople. The Mohammedans and Jews he rejected promptly, but was undecided respecting the claims of Rome and Constantinople. He then selected ten of the wisest men in his kingdom, and sent them to visit Rome and Constantinople and report in which country divine worship was conducted in the manner most worthy of the supreme being. The ambassadors returning to Kiev reported warmly in favor of the Greek church. Still the mind of Valdemar was oppressed with doubts. He assembled a number of the most virtuous nobles and asked their advice. The question was settled by the remark of one who said, Had not the religion of the Greek church been the best, the sainted Olga would not have accepted it. This wonderful event is well authenticated. Nestor gives a recital of it in its minute details, and an old Greek manuscript, preserved in the Royal Library at Paris, records the visit of these ambassadors to Rome and Constantinople. Valdemar's conversion, however, seems, at this time, to have been intellectual rather than spiritual. A change in his policy of administration rather than a change of heart. Though this external change was a boundless blessing to Russia, there is but little evidence that Valdemar then comprehended that moral renovation which the gospel of Christ effects as its crowning glory. He saw the absurdity of paganism, he felt tortured by remorse, 
Perhaps he felt in some degree the influence of the gospel which was even then faithfully preached in a few churches in idolatrous Kiev, and he wished to elevate Russia above the degradation of brutal idolatry. He deemed it necessary that his renunciation of idolatry and adoption of Christianity should be accompanied with pomp which should produce a widespread impression upon Russia. He accordingly collected an immense army, descended the Danaper in boats, sailed across the Black Sea, and entering the Gulf of Cherson near Sevastopol, after several bloody battles, took military possession of the Crimea. Thus victorious, he sent an embassage to the emperors Basil and Constantine at Constantinople, that he wished the young Christian princess Anne for his bride, and that, if they did not promptly grant his request, he would march his army to attack the city. The emperors, trembling before the approach of such a power, replied that they would not withhold from him the hand of the princess, if he would first embrace Christianity. Baltimore, of course, assented to this, which was the great object he had in view, but demanded that the princess, who was a sister of the emperor's, should first be sent to him. The unhappy maiden was overwhelmed with anguish at the reception of these tidings. She regarded the pagan Russians as ferocious savages, and to be compelled to marry their chief was to her a doom more dreadful than death. But policy, which is the religion of cabinets, demanded the sacrifice. The princess, weeping in despair, was conducted, accompanied by the most distinguished ecclesiastics and nobles of the empire, to the camp of Valdemar, where she was received with the most gorgeous demonstrations of rejoicing. The whole army expressed their gratification by all the utterances of triumph. The ceremony of baptism was immediately performed in the church of St. Basil, in the city of Cherson, and then, at the same hour, the marriage rites with the princess were solemnized. Valdemar ordered a large church to be built at Cherson in memory of his visit. He then returned to Kiev, taking with him some preachers of distinction. A communion service wrought in the most graceful proportions of Grecian art, and several exquisite specimens of statuary and sculpture, to inspire his subjects with a love for the beautiful. He accepted the Christian teachers as his guides, and devoted himself with extraordinary zeal to the work of persuading all his subjects to renounce their idol-worship and accept Christianity. Every measure was adopted to throw contempt upon paganism. The idols were collected and burned in huge bonfires. The sacred statue of Peroun, the most illustrious of the pagan gods, was dragged ignominiously through the streets, pelted with mud and scourged with whips, until at last, battered and defaced, it was dragged to the top of a precipice and tumbled headlong into the river, amidst the derision and hootings of the multitude. Our zealous new convert now issued a decree to all the people of Russia, rich and poor, lords and slaves, to repair to the river in the vicinity of Kiev to be baptized. At an appointed day the people assembled by thousands on the banks of the Danaper. Valdemar at length appeared, accompanied by a great number of Greek priests. The signal being given, the whole multitude, men, women, and children, waded slowly into the stream. Some boldly advanced out up to their necks in the water. Others, more timid, ventured only waist-deep. Fathers and mothers led their children by the hand. The priests, standing upon the shore, read the baptismal prayers and chanted the praises of God and then conferred the name of Christians upon these barbarians. The multitude then came up from the water. Valdemar was in a transport of joy. His strange soul was not insensible to the sublimity of the hour and of the scene. Raising his eyes to heaven, he uttered the following prayer. Creator of heaven and earth, extend thy blessing to these thy new children. May they know thee as the true God, and be strengthened by thee in the true religion. Come to my help against the temptations of the evil spirit, and I will praise thy name. Thus, in the year 988, paganism was, by a blow, demolished in Russia, and nominal Christianity introduced throughout the whole realm. A Christian church was erected upon the spot where the statue of Peroun had stood. Architects were brought from Constantinople to build churches of stone in the highest artistic style. Missionaries were sent throughout the whole kingdom to instruct the people in the doctrines of Christianity and to administer the rite of baptism. Nearly all the people readily received the new faith. Some, however, attached to the ancient idolatry refused to abandon it. 
Valdemar, nobly recognizing the rights of conscience, resorted to no measures of violence. The idolaters were left undisturbed, save by the teachings of the missionaries. Thus for several generations idolatry held a lingering life in the remote sections of the empire. Schools were established for the instruction of the young, learned teachers from Greece secured, and books of Christian biography translated into the Russian tongue. Valdemar had then ten sons. Three others were afterwards born to him. He divided his kingdom into ten provinces or states, over each of which he placed one of these sons as governor. On the frontiers of the empire he caused cities, strongly fortified, to be erected as safeguards against the invasion of remote barbarians. For several years Russia enjoyed peace, but with trivial interruptions. The character of Valdemar every year wonderfully improved. Under his Christian teachers he acquired more and more of the Christian spirit, and that spirit was infused into all his public acts. He became the father of his people, and especially the friend and helper of the poor. The king was deeply impressed with the words of our Saviour, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, and with the declaration of Solomon, He who giveth to the poor lendeth to the Lord. In the excess of his zeal of benevolence he was disposed to forgive all criminals. Thus crime was greatly multiplied, and the very existence of the state became endangered. The clergy, in a body, remonstrated with him, assuring him that God had placed him upon the throne expressly that he might punish the wicked and thus protect the good. He felt the force of this reasoning, and instituted, though with much reluctance, a more rigorous government. War had been his passion. In this respect also his whole nature seemed to be changed, and nothing but the most dire necessity could lead him to an appeal to arms. The Princess Anne appears to have been a sincere Christian, and to have exerted the most salutary influence upon the mind of her husband. In the midst of these great measures of reform, sudden sickness seized Valdemar in his palace, and he died, in the year 1015, so unexpectedly that he appointed no successor. His death caused universal lamentations, and thousands crowded to the church of Notre Dame to take a last look at their beloved sovereign, whose body reposed there for a time in state in a marble coffin. The remains were then deposited by the side of his last wife, the Christian Princess Anne, who had died a few years before. The Russian historian Karamsin says, This prince, whom the Church has recognized as equal to the apostles, merits from history the title of great. It is God alone who can truly know whether Valdemar was a true Christian at heart, or if he were influenced simply by political concerns. It is sufficient for us to state that, after having embraced that divine religion, Valdemar appears to have been sanctified by it, and he developed a totally different character from that which he exhibited when involved in the darkness of paganism. One of the sons of Valdemar, whose name was Fiatopolk, chanced to be at Kiev at the time of his father's death. He resolved to usurp the throne, and to cause the assassination of all the brothers from whom he could fear any opposition. Three of his brothers speedily fell victim to his bloody perfidy. Yaroslav, who had been entrusted with the feudal government of Novgorod, being informed of the death of his father, of the usurpation of Sviatopolk, and of the assassination of three of his brothers, raised an army of forty thousand men and marched upon Kiev. Sviatopolk, informed of his approach, hastened with all his troops to meet him. The two armies encountered each other upon the banks of the Danaper, about one hundred and fifty miles above Kiev. The river separated them, and neither dared to attempt to cross in the presence of the other. Several weeks passed, the two camps thus facing each other, without any collision. At length, Yaroslav, with the Novgorodians, crossed the stream stealthily and silently in a dark night, and fell fiercely upon the sleeping camp of Sviatopolk. His troops, thus taken by surprise, fought for a short time desperately. They were, however, soon cut to pieces or dispersed, and Sviatopolk himself saved his life only by a precipitate flight. Yaroslav, thus signally victorious, continued his march without further opposition to Kiev, and entered the capital in triumph. Sviatopolk fled to Poland, secured the cooperation of the Polish king, whose daughter he had married, returned with a numerous army, defeated his brother in a sanguinary battle, drove him back to Novgorod, and again, with flying banners, took possession of Kiev. 
the path of history now leads us through the deepest sloughs of perfidy and crime two of the sisters of yaroslav were found in kiev one of them had previously refused the hand of the king of poland the barbarian in revenge seized her as his concubine sviatopolk jealous of the authority which his father-in-law claimed and which he could enforce by means of the polish army administered poison in the food of the troops a terrible and unknown disease broke out in the camp and thousands perished the wretch even attempted to poison his father-in-law but the crime was suspected and the polish king boleslas fled to his own realm sviatopolk was thus again left so helpless as to invite attack yaroslav with eagerness availed himself of the opportunity raising a new army he marched upon kiev retook the city and drove his brother again into exile the energetic yet miserable man fled to the banks of the volga where he formed a large army of the ferocious pechenegues exciting their cupidity with promises of boundless pillage with these wolfish legions he commenced his march back again upon his own country the terrible encounter took place on the banks of the alta russian historians describe the conflict as one of the most fierce in which men have ever engaged the two armies precipitated themselves upon each other with the utmost fury breast to breast swords javelins and clubs clashing against brazen shields the novgorodians had taken a solemn oath that they would conquer or die three times the combatants from sheer exhaustion ceased the strife three times the deadly combat was renewed with redoubled ardor the sky was illumined with the first rays of the morning when the battle commenced the evening twilight was already darkening the field before the victory was decided the hordes of the wretched sviatopolk were then driven in rabble rout from the field leaving the ground covered with the slain the defeat was so awful that sviatopolk was plunged into utter despair half dead with terror tortured by remorse and pursued by the frown of heaven he fled into the deserts of bohemia where he miserably perished an object of universal execration in the annals of russia the surname of miserable is ever affixed to this infamous prince yaroslav thus crowned by victory received the undisputed title of sovereign of russia it was now the year ten twenty for several years yaroslav reigned in prosperity there were occasional risings of barbaric tribes which by force of arms he speedily quelled much time and treasure were devoted to the embellishment of the capital churches were erected the city was surrounded by brick walls institutions of learning were encouraged and most important of all the bible was translated into the russian language it is recorded that the king devoutly read the scriptures himself both morning and evening and took great interest in copying the sacred books with his own hands the closing years of life this illustrious prince passed in repose and in the exercises of piety while he still continued with unintermitted zeal to watch over the welfare of the state nearly all the pastors of the churches were greeks from constantinople and yaroslav apprehensive that the greeks might acquire too much influence in the empire made great efforts to raise up russian ecclesiastics and to place them in the most important posts at length the last hours of the monarch arrived and it was evident that death was near he assembled his children around his bed four sons and five daughters and thus affectingly addressed them i am about to leave the world i trust that you my dear children will not only remember that you are brothers and sisters but that you will cherish for each other the most tender affection ever bear in mind that discord among you will be attended with the most funereal results and that it will be destructive of the prosperity of the state by peace and tranquillity alone can its power be consolidated yisyaslav will be my successor to ascend the throne of kiev obey him as you have obeyed your father i give chernigov to sviatoslav periaslav to vesevolod and smolsk to vyacheslav i hope that each of you will be satisfied with his inheritance your oldest brother in his quality of sovereign prince will be your natural judge he will protect the oppressed and punish the guilty on the nineteenth of february ten fifty four yaroslav died in the seventy-first year of his age his subjects followed his remains in tears to the tomb in the church of saint sophia where his marble monument carved by grecian artists is still shown 
Influenced by a superstition common in those days, he caused the bones of Oleg and Yeropolk, the two murdered brothers of Valdemar, who had perished in the errors of paganism, to be disinterred, baptized, and then consigned to Christian burial in the Church of Kiev. He established the first public school in Russia, where three hundred young men, sons of the priests and nobles, received instruction in all those branches which would prepare them for civil or ecclesiastical life. Ambitious of making Kiev the rival of Constantinople, he expended large sums in its decoration. Grecian artists were munificently patronized, and paintings and mosaics of exquisite workmanship added attraction to churches reared in the highest style of existing art. He even sent to Greece for singers that the church choirs might be instructed in the richest utterances of music. He drew up a code of laws called Russian Justice, which, for that dark age, is a marvelous monument of sagacity, comprehensive views, and equity. The death of Yaroslav proved an irreparable calamity, for his successor was incapable of leading on in the march of civilization, and the realm was soon distracted by civil war. It is a gloomy period of three hundred years upon which we must now enter, while violence, crime, and consequently misery desolated the land. It is worthy of record that Nestor attributes the woes which ensued to the general forgetfulness of God, and the impiety which commenced the reign immediately after the death of Yaroslav. God is just, writes the historian. He punishes the Russians for their sins. We dare to call ourselves Christians, and yet we live like idolaters. Although multitudes throng every place of entertainment, although the sound of trumpets and harps resounds in our houses, and mountebanks exhibit their tricks and dances, the temples of God are empty, surrendered to solitude and silence. Bands of barbarians invaded Russia from the distant regions of the Caspian Sea, plundering, killing, and burning. They came suddenly, like the thundercloud in a summer's day, and as suddenly disappeared where no pursuit could find them. Ambitious nobles, descendants of former kings, plied all the arts of perfidy and of assassination to get possession of different provinces of the empire, each hoping to make his province central and to extend his sway over all the rest of Russia. The brothers of Yisiaslav became embroiled and drew the sword against each other. An insurrection was excited in Kiev, the populace besieged the palace, and the king saved his life only by a precipitate abandonment of his capital. The military mob pillaged the palace and proclaimed their chieftain, Vesislav, king. Yisiaslav fled to Poland. The Polish king, Boleslas II, who was a grandson of Valdemar and who had married a Russian princess, received the fugitive king with the utmost kindness. With a strong Polish army accompanied by the king of Poland, Yisiaslav returned to Kiev to recover his capital by the sword. The insurgent chief who had usurped the throne in cowardly terror fled. Yisiaslav entered the city with the stern strides of a conqueror and wreaked horrible vengeance upon the inhabitants, making but little discrimination between the innocent and the guilty. Seventy were put to death. A large number had their eyes plucked out, and for a long time the city resounded with the cries of victims, suffering under all kinds of punishments from the hands of this implacable monarch. Thus the citizens were speedily brought into abject submission. The Polish king with his army remained a long time at Kiev, luxuriating in every indulgence at the expense of the inhabitants. He then returned to his own country, laden with riches. Yisiaslav reascended the throne, having been absent ten months. Disturbances of a similar character agitated the provinces which were under the government of the brothers of Yisiaslav and which had assumed the authority and dignity of independent kingdoms. Thus all Russia was but an arena of war, a volcanic crater of flame and blood. Three years of conflict and woe passed away, when two of the brothers of Yisiaslav united their armies and marched against him, and again he was compelled to seek a refuge in Poland. He carried with him immense treasure, hoping thus again to engage the services of the Polish army. But Boleslas infamously robbed him of this treasure, and then, to use an expression of Nestor, showed him the way out of his kingdom. The woe-stricken exile fled to Germany and entreated the interposition of the emperor, Henry IV, promising to reward him with immense treasure and to hold the crown of Russia as tributary to the German Empire. The emperor was excited by the alluring offer, 
and sent ambassadors to Sviatoslav, now enthroned at Kiev, ostensibly to propose reconciliation, but in reality to ascertain what the probability was of success in a warlike expedition to so remote a kingdom. The ambassadors returned with a very discouraging report. The banished prince, thus disappointed, turned his steps to Rome, and implored the aid of Gregory the Seventh, that renowned pontiff, who was ambitious of universal sovereignty, and who had assumed the title of King of Kings. Yeziaslav, in his humiliation, was ready to renounce his fidelity to the Greek Church, and also the dignity of an independent prince. He promised, in consideration of the support of the Pope, to recognize not only the spiritual power of Rome, but also the temporal authority of the pontiff. He also entered bitter complaints against the King of Poland. Yeziaslav did not visit Rome in person, but sent his son to confer with the Pope. Gregory, rejoiced to acquire spiritual dominion over Russia, received the application in the most friendly manner, and sent ambassadors to the fugitive prince with the following letter. Gregory, bishop, servant of the servants of God, to Yeziaslav, prince of the Russians, safety, health, and the apostolic benediction. Your son, having visited the sacred places at Rome, has humbly implored that he might be re-established in his possessions by the authority of St. Peter, and has given his solemn vow to be faithful to the chief of the apostles. We have consented to grant his request, which we understand is in accordance with your wishes, and we, in the name of the chief of the apostles, confer upon him the government of the Russian kingdom. We pray that St. Peter may preserve your health, that he will protect your reign and your estates, even to the end of your life, and that you may then enjoy a day of eternal glory. Wishing also to give a proof of our desire to be useful to you hereafter, we have charged our ambassadors, one of whom is your faithful friend, to treat with you verbally upon all those subjects alluded to in your communication to us. Receive them with kindness as the ambassadors of St. Peter, and receive without restriction all the propositions they may make in our name. May God, the All-Powerful, illumine your heart with divine light and with temporal blessings, and conduct you to eternal glory. Given at Rome, the 15th of May, in the year 1075. Thus adroitly the Pope assumed the sovereignty of Russia, and the right and the power, by the mere utterance of a word, to confer it upon whom he would. The all-grasping pontiff thus annexed Russia to the domains of St. Peter. Another short letter Gregory wrote to the King of Poland. It was as follows. In appropriating to yourself illegally the treasures of the Russian prince, you have violated the Christian virtues. I conjure you in the name of God to restore to him all the property of which you and your subjects have deprived him, for robbers can never enter the kingdom of heaven unless they first restore the plunder they have taken. Fortunately for the fugitive prince, his usurping brother Sviatoslav just at this time died, in consequence of a severe surgical operation. The Polish king appears to have refunded the treasure of which he had robbed the exiled monarch, and Yeziaslav, hiring an army of Polish mercenaries, returned a second time in triumph to his capital. It does not appear that he subsequently paid any regard to the interposition of the Pope. We have now but a long succession of conspiracies, insurrections, and battles. In one of these civil conflicts, Yeziaslav, at the head of a formidable force, met another powerful army, but a few leagues from Kiev. In the hottest hour of the battle, a reckless cavalier, in the hostile ranks, perceiving Yeziaslav in the midst of his infantry, precipitated himself on him, pierced him with his lance, and threw him dead upon the ground. His body was conveyed in a canoe to Kiev, and buried with much funeral pomp in the church of Notre Dame, by the side of the beautiful monument which had been erected to the memory of Valdemar. Yeziaslav expunged from the Russian Code of Laws the death penalty, and substituted in its stead heavy fines. The Russian historians, however, record that it is impossible to decide whether this measure was the dictate of humanity, or if he wished in this way to replenish his treasury. Vesevolod succeeded to the throne of his brother Yeziaslav in the year 1078. The children of Yeziaslav had provinces assigned them in appanage. Vesevolod was a lover of peace, and yet devastation and carnage were spread everywhere before his eyes. Every province in the empire was torn by civil strife. Hundreds of nobles and princes were inflamed with the ambition for supremacy, and with the sword alone could the path be cut to renown. The wages offered the soldiers on all sides was pillage. 
cities were everywhere sacked and burned and the realm was crimsoned with blood civil wars necessarily followed by the woes of famine which woes are ever followed by the pestilence the plague swept the kingdom with terrific violence and whole provinces were depopulated in the city of kiev alone seven thousand perished in the course of ten weeks universal terror and superstitious fear spread through the nation an earthquake indicated that the world itself was trembling in alarm an enormous serpent was reported to have been seen falling from heaven invisible and malignant spirits were riding by day and by night throughout the streets of the cities wounding the citizens with blows which though unseen were heavy and murderous and by which blows many were slain all hearts sank in gloom and fear barbarian hordes ravaged both banks of the Danaper, committing towns and villages to the flames and killing such of the inhabitants as they did not wish to carry away as captives Vesevalod, an amiable man of but very little force of character was crushed by the calamities which were overwhelming his country not an hour of tranquillity could he enjoy it was the ambition of his nephews ambitious energetic unprincipled princes struggling for the supremacy which was mainly the cause of all these disasters end of chapter three Chapter Four of the Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Bascom. The Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time by John S. C. Abbott. Chapter Four Years of War and Woe from 1092 to 1167 character of vesevolod succession of sviatopolk his discomfiture deplorable condition of russia death of sviatopolk his character accession of monomak curious festival at kiev energy of monomak alarm of the emperor at constantinople Horrors of War Death of Monomach His Remarkable Character Pious Letter to His Children Accession of Mstislav His Short but Stormy Reign Struggles for the Throne Final Victory of Yezyaslav Moscow in the Province of Suzdal Death of Yezyaslav Wonderful Career of Rostislav Rising Power of Moscow Georgievich, Prince of Moscow The Sevalod had the reputation of having been a man of piety, but he was quite destitute of that force of character which one required to hold the realm in such stormy times. He was a man of great humanity and of unblemished morals. The woes which desolated his realms and which he was utterly unable to avert crushed his spirit and hastened his death. Perceiving that his dying hour was at hand, he sent for his two sons, Vladimir and Rostislav, and the sorrowing old man breathed his last in their arms. The Sevalod was the favorite son of Yaroslav the Great, and his father, with his dying breath, had expressed the wish that the Sevalod, when death should come to him, might be placed in the tomb by his side. These affectionate wishes of the dying father were gratified, and the remains of Vesevalod were deposited, with the most imposing ceremonies of those days, in the church of St. Sophia, by the side of those of his father. The people, forgetting his weakness and remembering only his amiability, wept at his burial. Vladimir, the eldest son of Vesevalod, with great magnanimity surrendered the crown to his cousin Sviatopolk, saying, "'His father was older than mine, and reigned at Kiev before my father.' I wish to avoid dissension in the horrors of civil war. He then proclaimed Sviatopolk sovereign of Russia. The new sovereign had been feudal lord of the province of Novgorod. He, however, soon left his northern capital to take up his residence in the more imperial palaces of Kiev. But disaster seemed to be the doom of Russia, 
and the sounds of rejoicing which attended his accession to the throne had hardly died away ere a new scene of woe burst upon the devoted land. The young king was rash and headstrong. He provoked the ire of one of the strong neighboring provinces, which was under the sway of an energetic feudal prince, ostensibly a vassal of the crown, but who, in his pride and power, arrogated independence. The banners of a hostile army were soon approaching Kiev. Sviatopolk marched heroically to meet them. A battle was fought, in which he and his army were awfully defeated. Thousands were driven by the conquerors into a stream swollen by the rains, where they miserably perished. The fugitives, led by Sviatopolk, in dismay fled back to Kiev and took refuge behind the walls of the city. The enemy pressed on, ravaging, with the most cruel desolation, the whole region around Kiev, and in a second battle conquered the king and drove him out of his realms. The whole of southern Russia was abandoned to barbaric destruction. Nestor gives a graphic sketch of the misery which prevailed. One saw everywhere, he writes, villages in flames, churches, houses, granaries were reduced to heaps of ashes, and the unfortunate citizens were either expiring beneath the blows of their enemies or were awaiting death with terror. Prisoners, half-naked, were dragged in chains to the most distant and savage regions. As they toiled along, they said, weeping, one to another, I am from such a village, and I am from such a village. No horses or cattle were to be seen upon our plains. The fields were abandoned to weeds. The ferocious beasts ranged the places but recently occupied by Christians. The whole reign of Sviatopolk, which continued until the year 1113, was one continued storm of war. It would only weary the reader to endeavor to disentangle the labyrinth of confusion and to describe the ebbings and floodings of battle. Every man's hand was against his neighbor, and friends today were foes tomorrow. Sviatopolk himself was one of the most imperfect of men. He was perfidious, ungrateful, and suspicious, haughty in prosperity, mean and cringing in adversity. His religion was the inspiration of superstition and cowardice, not of intelligence and love. Whenever he embarked upon any important expedition, he took an ecclesiastic to the tomb of St. Theodosius, there to implore the blessing of heaven. If successful in the enterprise, he returned to the tomb to give thanks. This was the beginning and end of his piety. Without any scruple, he violated the most sacred laws of morality. The marriage vow was entirely disregarded, and he was ever ready to commit any crime which would afford gratification to his passions, or which would advance his interests. The death of Sviatopolk occurred in a season of general anarchy, and it was uncertain who would seize the throne. The citizens of Kiev met in solemn and anxious assembly, and offered the crown to an illustrious noble, Monomach, a brother of Sviatopolk, and a man who had acquired renown in many enterprises of most desperate daring. In truth it required energy and courage of no ordinary character for a man at that time to accept the crown. Innumerable assailants would immediately fall upon him, putting to the most imminent peril not only the crown, but the head which wore it. By the Russian custom of descent, the crown incontestably belonged to the oldest son of Sviatoslav and Monomach, out of regard to his rights, declined the proffered gift. This refusal was accompanied by the most melancholy results. A terrible tumult broke out in the city. There was no arm of law sufficiently powerful to restrain the mob, and anarchy, with all its desolation, reigned for a time triumphant. A deputation of the most influential citizens of Kiev was immediately sent to Monomach, with the most earnest entreaty that he would hasten to rescue them and their city from the impending ruin. The heroic prince could not turn a deaf ear to this appeal. He hastened to the city, where his presence, combined with the knowledge which all had of his energy and courage, at once appeased the tumult. He ascended the throne, greeted by the acclamations of the whole city. No opposition ventured to manifest itself, and Monomach was soon in the undisputed possession of power. Nothing can give one a more vivid idea of the state of the times than the festivals appointed in honor of the new reign as described by the ancient analysts. The bones of the two saints were transferred from one church to another in the city. 
a magnificent coffin of silver embellished with gold precious stones and bas reliefs so exquisitely carved as to excite the admiration even of the grecian artists contained the sacred relics and excited the wonder and veneration of the whole multitude the imposing ceremony drew to kiev the princes the clergy the lords the warriors even from the most distant parts of the empire the gates of the city and the streets were encumbered with such multitudes that in order to open a passage for the clergy with the sarcophagus the monarch caused cloths garments precious furs and pieces of silver to be scattered to draw away the throng a luxurious feast was given to the princes and for three days all the poor of the city were entertained at the expense of the public treasure monomach now fitted out sundry expeditions under his enterprising son to extend the territories of russia and to bring tumultuous tribes and nations into subjugation and order his son mstislav was sent into the country of the chudes now livonia on the shores of the baltic he overran the territory seized the capital and established order his son Vesevalod, who was stationed at Novgorod, made an expedition into Finland. His army experienced inconceivable sufferings in that cold, inhospitable clime. Still they overawed the inhabitants, and secured tranquillity. Another son, Georges, marched to the Volga, embarked his army in a fleet of barges, and floated along the stream to eastern Bulgaria, conquered an army raised to oppose him, and returned to his principality laden with booty. Another son, Yeropolk, assailed the tumultuous tribes upon the dawn. Brilliant success accompanied his enterprise. Among his captives he found one maiden of such rare beauty that he made her his wife. At the same time the kingdom of Russia was invaded by barbarous hordes from the shores of the Caspian. Monomach himself headed an army and assailed the invaders with such impetuosity that they were driven with much loss back again to their wilds. The military renown of Monomach thus attained made his name a terror even to the most distant tribes, and, for a time, held in awe those turbulent spirits who had been filling the world with violence. Elated by his conquests, Monomach fitted out an expedition to Greece. A large army descended the Danaper, took possession of Thrace, and threatened Adrianople. The emperor, in great alarm, sent ambassadors to Monomach with the most precious presents. There was a cornelian exquisitely cut and set, a golden chain and necklace, a crown of gold, and most precious of all, a crucifix made of wood of the true cross. The metropolitan bishop of Ephesus, who was sent with these presents, was authorized, in the name of the church and of the empire, to place the crown upon the brow of Monomach in gorgeous coronation in the cathedral church of Kiev, and to proclaim Monomach emperor of Russia. This crown, called the Golden Bonnet of Monomach, is still preserved in the Museum of Antiquities at Moscow. These were dark and awful days. Horrible as war now is, it was then attended with woes now unknown. Gleb, prince of Minsk, with a ferocious band, attacked the city of Slutsk, after a terrible scene of carnage, in which most of those capable of bearing arms were slain, the city was burned to ashes, and all the survivors, men, women, and children, were driven off as captives to the banks of the Duina, where they were incorporated with the tribe of their savage conqueror. In revenge, Monomach sent his son Yeropolk to Drutsk, one of the cities of Gleb. No pen can depict the horrors of the assault. After a few hours of dismay, shriekings, and blood, the city was in ashes, and the wretched victims of man's pride and revenge were conducted to the vicinity of Kiev, where they reared their huts, and in widowhood, orphanage, and penury commenced life anew. Gleb himself in this foray was taken prisoner, conducted to Kiev, and detained there a captive until he died. Monomach reigned thirteen years, during which time he was incessantly engaged in wars with the audacious nobles of the provinces who refused to recognize his supremacy, and many of whom were equal to him in power. He died May 19, 1126, in the seventy-third year of his age, renowned, say the ancient analysts, for the splendor of his victories and the purity of his morals. He was fully conscious of the approach of death, and seems to have been sustained in that trying hour by the consolations of religion. He lived in an age of darkness and of tumult, but he was a man of prayer, and according to the light he had, he walked humbly with God. Commending his soul to the Savior, he fell asleep. 
it is recorded that he was a man of such lively emotions that his voice often trembled and his eyes were filled with tears as he implored god's blessing upon his distracted country he wrote just before his death a long letter to his children conceived in the most lovely spirit of piety we have space but for a few extracts from these christian counsels of a dying father the whole letter written on parchment is still preserved in the archives of the monarchy the foundation of all virtue he wrote is the fear of god and the love of man o oh, my dear children praise god and love your fellow-men it is not fasting it is not solitude it is not a monastic life which will secure for you the divine approval it is doing good to your fellow-creatures alone never forget the poor take care of them and ever remember that your wealth comes from god and that it is only entrusted to you for a short time do not hoard up your riches that is contrary to the precepts of the saviour be a father to the orphans the protectors of the widows and never permit the powerful to oppress the weak never take the name of god in vain and never violate your oath do not envy the triumph of the wicked or the success of the impious but abstain from everything that is wrong banish from your hearts all the suggestions of pride and remember that we are all perishable to-day full of life to-morrow in the tomb regard with horror falsehood intemperance and impurity vice is equally dangerous to the body and to the soul treat aged men with the same respect with which you would treat your parents and love all men as your brothers when you make a journey in your provinces do not suffer the members of your suite to inflict the least injury upon the inhabitants treat with particular respect strangers of whatever quality and if you cannot confer upon them favors treat them with a spirit of benevolence since upon the manner with which they are treated depends the good or evil report which they will take back with them to their own land salute every one whom you meet love your wives but do not permit them to govern you when you have learned anything useful endeavor to imprint it upon your memory and be always seeking to acquire information my father spoke five languages a fact which excited the admiration of strangers guard against idleness which is the mother of all vices man ought always to be occupied when you are travelling on horseback instead of allowing your mind to wander upon vain thoughts recite your prayers or at least repeat the shortest and best of them all o lord have mercy upon us never retire at night without falling upon your knees before god in prayer and never let the sun find you in your bed always go to church at an early hour in the morning to offer to god the homage of your first and freshest thoughts this was the custom of my father and of all the pious people who surrounded him with the first rays of the sun they praised the lord and exclaimed with fervor condescend o lord with thy divine light to illumine my soul the faults of monomach were those of his age non vitia hominis sed vitia seculi but his virtues were truly christian and it can hardly be doubted that as his earthly crown dropped from his brow he received a brighter crown in heaven the devastations of the barbarians in that day were so awful burning cities and churches and massacring women and children that they were regarded as enemies of the human race and were pursued with exterminating vengeance monomach left several children and a third wife one of his wives gaida was a daughter of harold king of england his oldest son mstislav succeeded to the crown his brothers received as their inheritance the government of extensive provinces the new monarch inheriting the energies and the virtues of his illustrious sire had long been renowned the barbarians east of the volga as soon as they heard of the death of monomach thought that russia would fall an easy prey to their arms in immense numbers they crossed the river spreading far and wide the most awful devastation but mstislav fell upon them with such impetuosity that they were routed with great slaughter and driven back to their wilds their chastisement was so severe that for a long time they were intimidated from any further incursions with wonderful energy mstislav attacked many of the tributary nations who had claimed a sort of independence and who were ever rising in insurrection he speedily brought them into subjugation to his sway and placed over them rulers devoted to his interests in the dead of winter an expedition was marched against the chudes who inhabited the southern shores of the bay of finland 
the men were put to death the cities and villages burned the women and children were brought away as captives and incorporated with the russian people mstislav reigned but about four years when he suddenly died in the sixtieth year of his age his whole reign was an incessant warfare with insurgent chiefs and barbarian invaders there is an awful record at this time of the scourge of famine added to the miseries of war all the northern provinces suffered terribly from this frown of god immense quantities of snow covered the ground even to the month of may the snow then melted suddenly with heavy rains deluging the fields with water which slowly retired converting the country into a widespread marsh it was very late before any seed could be sown the grain had but just begun to sprout when myriads of locusts appeared devouring every green thing a heavy frost early in the autumn destroyed the few fields the locusts had spared and then commenced the horrors of a universal famine men women and children wasted and haggard wandered over the fields seeking green leaves and roots and dropped dead in their wanderings the fields and the public places were covered with putrefying corpses which the living had not strength to bury a fetid miasma ascending from this cause added pestilence to famine and woes ensued too awful to be described immediately after the death of mstislav the inhabitants of kiev assembled and invited his brother vladimirovich to assume the crown this prince then resided at novgorod which city he at once left for the capital he proved to be a feeble prince and the lords of the remote principalities assuming independence bade defiance to his authority there was no longer any central power and russia instead of being a united kingdom became a conglomeration of antagonistic states every feudal lord marshalling his serfs in warfare against his neighbor in the midst of this state of universal anarchy caused by the weakness of a virtuous prince who had not sufficient energy to reign vladimirovich died in eleven thirty nine the death of the king was a signal for a general outbreak a multitude of princes rushing to seize the crown vyacheslav prince of a large province called Pereyaslav, was the first to reach kiev with his army the inhabitants of the city to avoid the horrors of war marched in procession to meet him and conducted him in triumph to the throne vyacheslav had hardly grasped the sceptre and stationed his army within the walls when from the steeples of the city the banners of another advancing host were seen gleaming in the distance and soon the tramp of their horsemen and the defiant tones of the trumpet were heard as another and far more mighty host encircled the city this new army was led by the Sevalod, prince of a province called vyuchigorod vyacheslav convinced of the impossibility of resisting such a power as the Sevalod had brought against kiev immediately consented to retire and to surrender the throne to his more powerful rival the Sevalod entered the city in triumph and established himself firmly in power there is nothing of interest to be recorded during his reign of seven years save that russia was swept by incessant billows of flame and blood the princes of the provinces were ever rising against his authority combinations were formed to dethrone the king and the king formed combinations to crush his enemies the hungarians the swedes the danes the poles all made war against this energetic prince but with an iron hand he smote them down toil and care soon exhausted his frame and he was prostrate on his dying bed bequeathing his throne to his brother igor he died leaving behind him the reputation of having been one of the most energetic of the kings of this blood deluged land igor was fully conscious of the perils he thus inherited he was very unpopular with the inhabitants of kiev and loud murmurs greeted his accession to power a conspiracy was formed among the most influential inhabitants of kiev and a secret embassage was sent to the grand prince yeziaslav a descendant of monomach inviting him to come and with their aid take possession of the throne the prince attended the summons with alacrity and marched with a powerful army to kiev igor was vanquished in a sanguinary battle taken captive imprisoned in a convent and yeziaslav became the nominal monarch of russia Sviatoslav, the brother of Igor, overwhelmed with anguish in view of his brother's fall and captivity, traversed the expanse of Russia to enlist the sympathies of the distant princes to march for the rescue of the captive. He was quite successful. 
an allied army was soon raised and under determined leaders was on the march for kiev the king yezioslav with his troops advanced to meet them in the meantime igor crushed by misfortune and hopeless of deliverance sought solace for his woes in religion for a long time said he i have desired to consecrate my heart to god even in the height of prosperity this was my strongest wish what can be more proper for me now that i am at the very gates of the tomb for eight days he laid in his cell expecting every moment to breathe his last and then reviving a little he received the tonsure from the hands of the bishop and renouncing the world and all its cares and ambitions devoted himself to the prayers and devotions of the monk the king pressed sviatoslav with superior forces conquered him in several battles and drove him a fugitive into dense forests and into distant wilds sviatoslav like his brother weary of the storms of life also sought the solace which religion affords to the weary and the heart-stricken pursued by his relentless foe he came to a little village called moscow far back in the interior this is the first intimation history gives of this now renowned capital of the most extensive monarchy upon the globe a prince named georges reigned here over the extensive province then called suzdal who received the fugitive with heartfelt sympathy aided by georges and several of the surrounding princes another army was raised and sviatoslav commenced a triumphal march sweeping all opposition before him until he arrived a conqueror before the walls of novgorod the people of kiev enraged by the success of the foe of their popular king rose in a general tumult burst into a convent where igor was found at his devotions tied a rope about his neck and dragged him a mutilated corpse through the streets the king yezioslav called for a levy en masse of the inhabitants of kiev summoned distal feudal barons with their armies to his banner and marched impetuously to meet the conquering foe fierce battles ensued in which sviatoslav was repeatedly vanquished and retreated to suzdal again to appeal to georges for aid yezioslav summoned the novgorodians before him and in the following energetic terms addressed them my brethren said he georges the prince of suzdal has insulted novgorod i have left the capital of russia to defend you do you wish to prosecute the war the sword is in my hands do you desire peace i will open negotiations war war the multitude shouted you are our monarch and we will all follow you from the youngest to the oldest a vast army was immediately assembled on the shores of the lake of ilmen near the city of novgorod which commenced its march of three hundred miles to the remote realms of suzdal georges was unprepared to meet them he fled surrendering his country to be ravaged by the foe his cities and villages were burned and seven thousand of his subjects were carried captive to kiev but georges was not a man to bear such calamity meekly he speedily succeeded in forming an alliance with the barbarian nations around him and burning with rage followed the army of the retiring foe he overtook them near the city of periaslav it was the evening of the twenty-third of august the unclouded sun was just sinking at the close of a sultry day and the vesper chants were floating through the temples of the city the storm of war burst as suddenly as the thunder peals of an autumnal tempest the result was most awful and fatal to the king his troops were dispersed and cut to pieces yezioslav himself with difficulty escaped and reached the ramparts of kiev the terrified inhabitants entreated him not to remain as his presence would only expose the city to the horror of being taken by storm our fathers our brothers our sons they said are dead upon the fields of battle or are in chains we have no arms generous prince do not expose the capital of russia to pillage flee for a time to your remote principalities there to gather a new army you know that we will never rest contented under the government of georges we will rise and revolt against him as soon as we shall see your standards approaching yezioslav fled first to smolensk some three hundred miles distant and thence traversed his principalities seeking aid georges entered kiev in triumph calling his warriors around him he assigned to them the provinces which he had wrested from the feudal lords of the king hungary bohemia and poland then consisted of barbaric peoples just emerging into national existence 
The king of Hungary had married Euphrosyne, the youngest sister of Yeziaslav. He immediately sent to his brother-in-law ten thousand cavaliers. The kings of Bohemia and of Poland also entered into an alliance with the exiled prince, and in person led the armies which they contributed to his aid. A war of desperation ensued. It was as a conflict between the tiger and the lion. The annals of those dark days contained but a weary recital of deeds of violence, blood, and woe, which for ten years desolated the land. All Russia was roused. Every feudal lord was leading his vassals to the field. There were combinations and counter-combinations innumerable. Cities were taken and retaken. Today the banners of Yeziaslav float upon the battlements of Kiev. Tomorrow those banners are hewn down and the standards of George's are unfurled to the breeze. Now we see Yeziaslav a fugitive, hopeless, in despair. Again the rolling wheel of fortune raises him from his depression, and, with the strides of a conqueror, he pursues his foe, in his turn vanquished and woe-stricken. But the pomp of heraldry, the pride of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth e'er gave, alike await the inevitable hour, the paths of glory lead but to the grave. Death, which Yeziaslav had braved in a hundred battles, approached him by the slow but resistless march of disease. For a few days the monarch tossed in fevered restlessness on his bed at Kiev, and then, from his life of incessant storms on earth, his spirit ascended to the God who gave it. George's was, at that time, in the lowest state of humiliation. His armies had all perished, and he was wandering in exile, seeking new forces with which to renew the strife. Rostislav, Grand Prince of Novgorod, succeeded to the throne. But Georges, animated by the death of Yeziaslav, soon found enthusiastic adventurers rallying around his banners. He marched vigorously to Kiev, drove Rostislav from the capital, and seized the scepter. But there was no lull in the tempest of human ambition. Georges had attained the throne by the energies of his sword, and, acting upon the principle that, to the victors belong the spoils, he had driven from their castles all the lords who had been supporters of the past administration. He had conferred their mansions and their territories upon his followers. Human nature has not materially changed. Those in office were fighting to retain their honors and emoluments. Those out of office were struggling to attain the posts which brought wealth and renown. The progress of civilization has, in our country, transferred this fierce battle from the field to the ballot box. It is, indeed, a glorious change. The battle can be fought thus just as effectually, and infinitely more humanely. It has required the misery of nearly six thousand years to teach even a few millions of mankind that the ballot box is a better instrument for political conflicts than the cartridge box. Armies were gathering in all directions to march upon George's. He was now an old man, weary of war, and endeavored to bribe his foes to peace. He was, however, unsuccessful, and found it to be necessary again to lead his armies into the field. It was the 20th of March, 1157, when George's, entering Kiev in triumph, ascended the throne. On the 1st of May he dined with some of his lords. Immediately after dinner he was taken sick and, after languishing a fortnight in ever-increasing debility, on the fifteenth he died. The inhabitants of Kiev, regarding him as a usurper, rejoiced at his death, and immediately sent an embassage to Davidovich, prince of Chernigov, a province about one hundred and fifty miles north of Kiev, inviting him to hasten to the capital and seize the scepter of Russia. Kiev and all Occidental Russia, thus ravaged by interminable wars, desolated by famine and by flame, was rapidly on the decline, and was fast lapsing into barbarism. Davidovich had hardly ascended the throne ere he was driven from it by Rostislav, whom Georges had dethroned, but the remote province of Suzdal, of which Moscow was the capital, situated some seven hundred miles northeast of Kiev, was now emerging from barbaric darkness into wealth and civilization. The missionaries of Christ had penetrated those remote realms, churches were reared, the gospel was preached, peace reigned, industry was encouraged, and, under their influence, Moscow was attaining that supremacy which subsequently made it the heart of the Russian Empire. The inhabitants of Kiev received Rostislav with demonstrations of joy, as they received every prince whom the fortunes of war imposed upon them, 
hoping that each one would secure for their unhappy city the blessings of tranquillity. Davidovich fled to Moldavia. There was then in Moldavia, between the rivers Pruth and Sereth, a piratic city called Berlad. It was the resort of vagabonds of all nations and creeds, who pillaged the shores of the Black Sea and plundered the boats ascending and descending the Danube and the Danaper. These brigands, enriched by plunder and strengthened by accessions of desperadoes from every nation and every tribe, had bidden defiance both to the grand princes of Russia and the powers of the empire. Eagerly these robber hordes engaged as auxiliaries of Davidovich. In a tumultuous band they commenced their march to Kiev. They were, however, repulsed by the energetic Rostislav, and Davidovich, with difficulty escaping from the sanguinary field, fled to Moscow and implored the aid of its independent prince, Georgievich. The prince listened with interest to his representations, and following the example of the more illustrious nations of modern times, thought it a good opportunity to enlarge his territories. The city of Novgorod, capital of the extensive and powerful province of the same name, was some seven hundred miles north of Kiev. It was not more than half that distance west of Moscow. The inhabitants were weary of anarchy and blood, and anxious to throw themselves into the arms of any prince who could secure for them tranquillity. The fruit was ripe, and was ready to drop into the hands of Georgievich. He sent word to the Novgorodians that he had decided to take their country under his protection, that he had no wish for war, but that, if they manifested any resistance, he should subdue them by force of arms. The Novgorodians received the message with delight, rose in insurrection, and seized their prince, who was the oldest son of Rostislav, imprisoned him, his wife and children, in a convent, and, with tumultuous joy, received as their prince the nephew of Georgievich. Rostislav was so powerless that he made no attempt to avenge this insult. Davidovich made one more desperate effort to obtain the throne, but he fell upon the field of battle, his head being cleft with a saber stroke. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Bascom. The Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time by John S. C. Abbott. Chapter Five. Mstislav and Andre. From 1167 to 1212. Centralization of power at Kiev. Death of Rostislav. His religious character. Mstislav Yezislavich ascends the throne. Proclamation of the king. Its effect. Plans of Andre. Scenes at Kiev. Return and death of Mstislav. War in Novgorod. Peace concluded throughout Russia. Insult of Andre and its consequences. Greatness of soul displayed by Andre. Assassination of Andre. Renewal of anarchy. Emigration from Novgorod. Reign of Michael. The Sevala the Third. Evangelization of Bulgaria. Death of the Sevala the Third. His Queen Maria. The Prince of Suzdal watched the progress of events in Occidental Russia with great interest. He saw clearly that war was impoverishing and ruining the country, and this led him to adopt the most wise and vigorous measures to secure peace within his own flourishing territories. He adopted the system of centralized power, keeping the reins of government firmly in his own hands, and appointing governors over remote provinces, who were merely the executors of his will and who were responsible to him for all their acts. At Kiev the system of independent apanages prevailed. The lord placed at the head of a principality was an unlimited despot, accountable to no one but God for his administration. His fealty to the king consisted merely in an understanding that he was to follow the banner of the sovereign in case of war. But in fact these feudal lords were more frequently found claiming entire independence, 
and struggling against their nominal sovereign to wrest from his hands the sceptre. Rostislav was now far advanced in years. Conscious that death could not be far distant, he took a journey, though in very feeble health, to some of the adjacent provinces, hoping to induce them to receive his son as his successor. On this journey he died at Smolensk, the 14th of March, 1167. Religious thoughts had in his latter years greatly engrossed his attention. He breathed his last, praying with a trembling voice, and fixing his eyes devoutly on an image of the Saviour, which he held devoutly in his hand. He exhibited many Christian virtues, and for many years manifested much solicitude that he might be prepared to meet God in judgment. The earnest remonstrances alone of his spiritual advisers dissuaded him from abdicating the throne and adopting the austerities of a monastic life. He was not a man of commanding character, but it is pleasant to believe that he was, though groping in much darkness, a sincere disciple of the Saviour, and that he passed from earth to join the spirits of the just made perfect in heaven. Mstislav Yevislavich, a nephew of the deceased king, ascended the throne. He had, however, uncles, nephews, and brothers, who were quite disposed to dispute with him the possession of power, and soon civil war was raging all over the kingdom with renewed virulence. Several years of destruction and misery thus passed away, during which thousands of the helpless people perished in their blood, to decide questions of not the slightest moment to them. The doom of the peasants was alike poverty and toil, whether one lord or another lord occupied the castle which overshadowed their huts. The Danaper was then the only channel through which commerce could be conducted between Russia and the Greek Empire. Barbaric nations inhabited the shores of this stream, and they had long been held in check by the Russian armies. But now the kingdom had become so enfeebled by war and anarchy, all the energies of the Russian princes being exhausted in civil strife, that the barbarians plundered with impunity the boats ascending and descending the stream, and eventually rendered the navigation so perilous that commercial communication with the empire was at an end. The Russian princes thus debarred from the necessities and luxuries which they had been accustomed to receive from the more highly civilized and polished Greeks were impelled to measures of union for mutual protection. The king, in this emergence, issued a proclamation which met with a general response. "'Russia, our beloved country,' exclaimed Mstislav, "'groans beneath the stripes which the barbarians are laying upon her, and which we are unable to avenge. They have taken solemn oaths of friendship, they have received our presents, and now, regardless of the faith of treaties, they capture our Christian subjects and drag them as slaves into their desert wilds.' There is no longer any safety for our merchant boats navigating the Danaper. The barbarians have taken possession of that only route through which we can pass into Greece. It is time for us to resort to new measures of energy. My friends and my brothers, let us terminate our unnatural war. Let us look to God for help, and, drawing the sword of vengeance, let us fall in united strength upon our savage foes. It is glorious to ascend to heaven from the field of honor thus to follow in the footsteps of our father. This spirited appeal was effective. The princes rallied each at the head of a numerous band of vassals, and thus a large army was soon congregated. The desire to punish the insulting barbarians inspired universal enthusiasm. The masses of the people were aroused to avenge their friends who had been carried into captivity. The priests, with prayers and anthems, blessed the banners of the faithful, and, on the 2nd of March, 1168, the army, elate with hope and nerved with vengeance, commenced their descent of the river. The barbarians, terrified by the storm which they had raised, and from whose fury they could attain no shelter, fled so precipitately that they left their wives and their children behind them. The Russians, abandoning the encumbrance of their baggage, pursued them in the hottest haste. Over the hills and through the valleys, and across the streams, pursuers and pursued rushed on, until at last the fugitives were overtaken upon the banks of a deep and rapid stream, which they were unable to cross. Mercilessly they were massacred, many Russian prisoners were rescued, and booty to an immense amount was taken. For these river pirates were rich, having for years been plundering the commerce of Greece and Russia. 
according to the custom of those days the booty was divided between the princes and the soldiers each man receiving according to his rank as the army returned in triumph to the jennifer to their boundless satisfaction they saw the pennants of a merchant fleet ascending the river from constantinople laden with the riches of the empire the army crowded the shores and greeted the barges with all the demonstrations of exultation and joy the punishment of the barbarians being thus effectually accomplished the princes immediately commenced anew their strife all their old feuds were revived every lord wished to increase his own power and to diminish that of his natural rival andre of suzdal to whom we have before referred whose capital was the little village of moscow far away in the interior deemed the moment favorable for dethroning mstislav and extending the area of such freedom as his subjects enjoyed over the realms of novgorod and kiev he succeeded in uniting eleven princes with him in his enterprise his measures were adopted with great secrecy assembling his armies curtained by leagues of forests he unobserved commenced his march toward the danifer the banners of the numerous army were already visible from the steeples of kiev before the sovereign was appraised of his danger for two days the storms of war beat against the walls and roared around the battlements of the city when the besiegers bursting over the walls swept the streets in horrid carnage this mother of the russian cities had often been besieged and often capitulated but never before had it been taken by storm and never before and never since have the horrors of war been more sternly exhibited for three days and three nights the city and its inhabitants were surrendered to the brutal soldiery the imagination shrinks from contemplating the awful scene the world of woe may be challenged to exhibit anything worse fearful indeed must be the corruption when man can be capable of such inhumanity to his fellow man war unchains the tiger and shows his nature mstislav the sovereign in the midst of the confusion the uproar and the blood succeeded almost as by a miracle in escaping from the wretched city basely however abandoning his wife and his children to the enemy thus fell kiev for some centuries it had been the capital of russia it was such no more the victorious andre of moscow was now by the energies of his sword sovereign of the empire Kiev became but a provincial and tributary city, which the sovereign placed under the governorship of his brother Gleb. Nearly all the provinces of known Russia were now more or less tributary to Andre. Three princes only preserved their independence. As the army of Andre retired, Gleb was left in possession of the throne of Kiev. In those days there were always many petty princes ready to embark with their followers in any enterprise which promised either glory or booty mstislav the fugitive sovereign soon gathered around him his semi-savage bands entered the province of kiev plundering and burning the homes of his former subjects as he approached kiev gleb unprepared for efficient resistance was compelled to seek safety in flight the inhabitants of the city to escape the horrors of another siege and sack threw open their gates and crowded out to meet their former monarch as a returning friend Mstislav entered the city in triumph and quietly reseated himself upon the throne. He, however, ascended it but to die. A sudden disease seized him, and the songs of triumph which greeted his entrance died away in requiems and wailings as he was borne to the silent tomb. With dying breath, he surrendered his throne to his younger brother Yaroslav. Andre at Moscow had other formidable engagements on hand which prevented his interposition in the affairs of Kiev the novgorodians had bidden defiance to his authority and their subjugation was essential before any troops could be spared to chastise the heir of mstislav the novgorodian army had even penetrated the realms of andre and were exacting tribute from his provinces the grand prince andre himself was far advanced in years opposed to war and had probably been pushed on in his enterprises by the ambition of his son who was also named mstislav this young prince was impetuous and fiery greedy for military glory and restless in his graspings for power the novgorodians were also warlike and indomitable the conflict between two such powers arrested the attention of all russia 
Mr. Slav made the most extensive preparations for the attack upon the Novgorodians, and they, in their turn, were equally energetic in preparations for the defense. The army marched from Moscow, and following the valley of the Masta, entered the spacious province of Novgorod. They entered the region not like wolves, not like men, but like demons. The torch was applied to every hut, to every village, to every town. They amused themselves with tossing men, women, and children upon their campfires, glowing like furnaces. The sword and the spear were two merciful instruments of death. The flames of the burning towns blazed along the horizon night after night, and the cry of the victims roused the Novgorodians to the intensest thirst for vengeance. With the sweep of utter desolation, Mstislav approached the city, and when his army stood before the walls, there was behind him a path, leagues in width, and two hundred miles in length, covered with ruins, ashes, and the bodies of the dead. It was the 25th of February, 1170. The city was immediately summoned to surrender. The Novgorodians, appalled by the fate of Kiev, and by the horrors which had accompanied the march of Mstislav, took a solemn oath that they would struggle to the last drop of blood in defense of their liberties. The clergy, in procession, bearing the image of the Virgin in their arms, traversed the fortifications of the city, and with prayers, hymns, and the most imposing Christian rites, inspired the soldiers with religious enthusiasm. The Novgorodians threw themselves upon their knees, and in simultaneous prayer cried out, with the blending of ten thousand voices, O oh God, come and help us, come and help us! Thus roused to frenzy, with the clergy chanting hymns of battle, and pleading with heaven for success, with the image of the Virgin contemplating their deeds, the soldiers rushed from behind their ramparts upon the foe. Death was no longer dreaded. The only thought of every man was to sell his life as dearly as possible. Such an onset of maniacal energy no mortal force could stand. The soldiers of Mstislav fell as the waving grain bows before the tornado. Their defeat was utter and awful. Mercy was not thought of. Sword and javelin cried only for blood, blood. The wretched Mstislav in dismay fled, leaving two-thirds of his army in gory death, and in his flight he met that chastisement which his cruelties merited. He had to traverse a path two hundred miles in length, along which not one field of grain had been left undestroyed, and where every dwelling was in ashes, and no animal life whatever had escaped his ravages. Starvation was his doom. Every rod of the way his emaciated soldiers dropped dead in their steps. Famine also, with all its woes, reigned in Novgorod. Under these circumstances, the two parties consented to peace, the Novgorodians retaining their independence, but accepting a brother of the Grand Prince Andre to succeed their own prince, who was then at the point of death. Andre, having thus terminated the strife with Novgorod by the peace which he loved, turned his attention to Kiev, and with characteristic humanity gratified the wishes of the inhabitants by allowing them to accept Roman, Prince of Smolensk, as their chieftain. Roman entered the city, greeted by the most flattering testimonials of the joy of the inhabitants, while they united with him in the oath of allegiance to Andre as the sovereign of Russia. Andre, who was ever disposed to establish his sovereign power, not by armies, but by equity and moderation, and who seems truly to have felt that the welfare of Russia required that all its provinces should be united under common laws and a common sovereign, turned his attention again to Novgorod, hoping to persuade its inhabitants to relinquish their independence and ally themselves with the general empire. Rurik, the brother of André, who had been appointed Prince of Novgorod, proved unpopular, and was driven from his command. André, instead of endeavouring to force him back upon them by the energies of his armies, with a wise spirit of conciliation acquiesced in their movement, and sent to them his younger son, George, as a prince, offering to assist them with his counsel and to aid them with his military force whenever they should desire it. Thus internal peace was established throughout the empire. By gradual advances, and with great sagacity, André, from his humble palace in Moscow, extended his influence over the remote provinces and established his power. The princes of Kiev and its adjacent provinces became jealous of the encroachments of André, and hostile feelings were excited. The king at length sent an ambassador to them with very imperious commands. 
the ambassador was seized at kiev his hair and beard shaven and was then sent back to moscow with the defiant message until now we have wished to respect you as a father but since you do not blush to treat us as vassals and as peasants since you have forgotten that you speak to princes we spurn your menaces execute them we appeal to the judgment of god this grievous insult of word and deed roused the indignation of the aged monarch as it had never been roused before he assembled an army of fifty thousand men who were rendezvoused at novgorod and placed under the command of the king's son george's another army nearly equal in number was assembled at chernigov collected from the principalities of polotsk turov grodno pinsk and smolensk the bands of this army were under the several princes of the provinces sviatoslav grandson of the renowned olga was entrusted with the supreme command these two majestic forces were soon combined upon the banks of the Danaper. all resistance fled before them and with strides of triumph they marched down the valley to kiev the princes who had aroused this storm of war fled to voyoychegorod an important fortress further down the river where they strongly entrenched themselves and sternly awaited the advance of the foe the royalist forces having taken possession of kiev pursued the fugitives the march of armies so vast conducting war upon so great and a scale excited the astonishment of all the inhabitants upon the river's banks a little fortress defended by a mere handful of men appeared to them an object unworthy of an army sufficiently powerful to crush an empire but in the fortress there was perfect unity and its commander had the soul of a lion in the camp of the besiegers there was neither harmony nor zeal many of the princes were inimical to the king and were jealous of his growing power others were envious of sviatoslav the commander-in-chief and were willing to sacrifice their own fame that he might be humbled not a few even were in sympathy with the insurgents and were almost disposed to unite under their banners it was the eighth of september eleven seventy three when the royalist forces encircled the fortress gunpowder was then unknown and contending armies could only meet hand to hand for two months the siege was continued with bloody conflicts every day wintry winds swept the plains and storms of snow whitened the fields when from the battlements of the fortress the besieged saw the banners of another army approaching the arena they knew not whether the distant battalions were friends or foe but it was certain that their approach would decide the strife for each party was so exhausted as to be unable to resist any new assailants soon the signals of war proclaimed that an army was approaching for the rescue of the fortress shouts of exultation rose from the garrison which fell like the knell of death upon the ears of the besiegers freezing on the plains the alarm which spread through the camp was instantaneous and terrible the darkness of a november night soon settled down over city and plain with the first rays of the morning the garrison were upon the walls when to their surprise they saw the whole vast army in rapid and disordered flight the plains around the fortress were utterly deserted and covered with the wrecks of war the garrison immediately rushed from behind their ramparts united with their approaching friends and pursued the fugitives the royalists in their dismay attempted to cross the river on the fragile ice it broke beneath the enormous weight and thousands perished in the cold stream the remainder of this great host were almost to a man either slain or taken captive their whole camp and baggage fell into the hands of the conquerors this wonderful victory achieved by the energies of mstislav has given him a name in russian annals as one of the most renowned and brave of the princes of the empire george the prince of novgorod son of andre escaped from the carnage of that ensanguined field and overwhelmed with shame returned to his father in moscow the king in this extremity developed true greatness of soul he exhibited neither dejection nor anger but bowed to the calamity as to a chastisement he needed from god the victory of the insurgents if they may be so called who occupied the provinces in the valley of the Janiper, was not promotive either of prosperity or peace mindful of the former grandeur of kiev as the ancient capital of the russian empire ambitious princes were immediately contending for the possession of that throne after several months of confusion and blood andre succeeded by skilful diplomacy in again inducing them for the sake of general tranquillity to come under the general government of the empire 
the nobles could not but respect him as the most aged of their princes as a man of imperial energy and ability and as the one most worthy to be their chief he alone had the power to preserve tranquillity in extended russia they therefore applied to him to take kiev under certain restrictions again into his protection and to nominate for that city a prince who should be in his alliance this homage was acceptable to andre but while he was engaged in this negotiation a conspiracy was formed against the monarch and he was cruelly assassinated it was the night of the twenty ninth of june eleven seventy four the king was sleeping in a chateau two miles from moscow at midnight the conspirators twenty in number having inflamed themselves with brandy burst into the house and rushed towards the chamber where the aged monarch was reposing the clamour awoke the king and he sprang from the bed just as two of the conspirators entered his chamber aged as the monarch was with one blow of his vigorous arm he felled the foremost to the floor the comrade of the assassin in the confusion thinking it was the king who had fallen plunged his poignard to the hilt in his companion's breast other assassins rushed in and fell upon the monarch he was a man of gigantic powers and struggled against his foes with almost supernatural energy filling the chateau with his shrieks for help at last pierced with innumerable wounds he fell in his blood apparently silent in death the assassins terrified by the horrible scene and apprehensive that the guard might come to the rescue of the king caught up their dead comrade and fled the monarch had however but fainted he almost instantly revived and with impetuosity and bravery seized his sword and gave chase to the murderers shouting with all his strength to his attendants to hasten to his aid the assassins turned upon him they had lanterns in their hands and were twenty to one the first blow struck off the right arm of the king a sabre thrust pierced his heart passed through his body and the monarch fell dead his last words were lord into thy hands i commit my spirit there is to this day preserved a scimitar of grecian workmanship which tradition says was the sword of andre upon the blade is inscribed in greek letters holy mother of god assist thy servant the death of the monarch was the signal for the universal outbreak of violence and crime where the sovereign is the only law the death of the monarch is the destruction of the government the anarchy which sometimes succeeded his death was awful the russian analysts cherish the memory of andre affectionately they say that he was courageous sagacious and a true christian and that he merited the title he had received of a second solomon had he established his throne in the more central city of kiev instead of the remote village of moscow he could more efficiently have governed the empire but blinded by his love for his own northern realms he was ambitious of elevating his own native village unfavorable as was its location into the capital of the empire during his whole reign he manifested great zeal in extending christianity through the empire and evinced great interest in efforts for the conversion of the jews just before the death of the king a number of the inhabitants of novgorod fatigued with civil strife and crowded out by the density of the population formed a party to emigrate to the uninhabited lands far away in the east traversing a region of about three hundred miles on the parallel of fifty-seven degrees of latitude they reached the headwaters of the volga here they embarked in boats and drifted down the wild stream for a thousand miles to the mouth of the river kama where they established a colony at this point they were twelve hundred miles north of the point where the volga empties into the caspian other adventurers soon followed and flourishing colonies sprang up all along the banks of the Kama and the Vyatha. This region was the Missouri Valley of Russia. By this immigration, the Russian name, its manners, its institutions, were extended through a sweep of a thousand miles. The colonists had many conflicts with the aboriginal inhabitants, but Russian civilization steadily advanced over barbaric force soon after the death of andre the nobles of that region met in a public assembly to organize some form of confederate government one of the speakers rose and said no one is ignorant of the manner in which we have lost our king he has left but one son who reigns at novgorod the brothers of andre are in southern russia who then shall we choose for our sovereign let us elect michael of chernigov he is the oldest son of monomach and the most ancient of the princes of his family 
ambassadors were immediately sent to michael offering him the throne and promising him the support of the confederate princes michael hastened to moscow with a strong army supported by several princes and took possession of moscow and the adjacent provinces a little opposition was manifested which he speedily quelled with the sword great rejoicings welcomed the enthronement of a new prince and the restoration of order michael proved worthy of his elevation he immediately traversed the different provinces in that region and devoted himself to the tranquillity and prosperity of his people the popularity of the new sovereign was at its height all lips praised him all hearts loved him he was declared to be a special gift which heaven in its boundless mercy had conferred unfortunately this virtuous prince reigned but one year leaving however in that short time upon the russian annals many memorials of his valour and of his virtue it was a barbaric age rife with perfidy and crime yet not one act of treachery or cruelty had sullied his name it was his ambition to be the father of his people and the glory he sought was the happiness and the greatness of his country southern russia was still in the theatre of interminable civil war the provinces were impoverished and kiev was fast sinking to decay michael had a brother the Sevalod, who had accompanied him to moscow the nobles and the leading citizens their eyes still dim with the tears which they had shed over the tomb of their sovereign urged him to accept the crown he was not reluctant to accede to their request and received their oaths of fidelity to him under the title of vesevolod the third his title however was disputed by distant princes and an armed band approaching moscow by surprise seized the town and reduced it to ashes ravaged the surrounding region and carried off the women and children as captives vesevolod was at the time absent in the extreme northern portion of his territory but he turned upon his enemies with the heart and with the strength of a lion it was midwinter regardless of storms and snow and cold he pursued the foe like the north wind and crushed them as with an iron hand with a large number of prisoners he returned to the ruins of moscow two of the most illustrious of the hostile princes were among the prisoners the people enraged at the destruction of their city fell upon the captives and seizing the two princes tore out their eyes the Sevalod was a young man who had not acquired renown many of the warlike princes of the spacious provinces regarded his elevation with envy sviatoslav prince of chernigov was roused to intense hostility and gathering around him the nobles of his province resolved with a vigorous arm to seize for himself the throne enlisting in his interest several other princes he commenced his march against his sovereign the Sevalod prepared with vigour to repulse his assailants after long and weary marchings the two armies met in the defiles of the mountains a swift mountain stream rushing along its rocky bed between deep and precipitous banks separated the combatants for a fortnight they vainly assailed each other hurling clouds of arrows and javelins across the stream which generally fell harmless upon brazen helmet and buckler but few were wounded and still fewer slain yet neither party dared venture the passage of the stream in the presence of the other at length weary of the unavailing conflict sviatoslav the insurgent chief led a challenge to the Sevalod the sovereign let god said he decide the dispute between us let us enter into the open field with our two armies and submit the question to the arbitrament of battle you may choose either side of the river which you please the Sevalod did not condescend to make any reply to the rebellious prince seizing his ambassadors he sent them as captives to vladimir a fortress some hundred miles east of moscow he hoped thus to provoke sviatoslav to attempt the passage of the stream but sviatoslav was not to be thus entrapped breaking up his camp he retired to novgorod where he was received with rejoicings by the inhabitants here he established himself as a monarch accumulated his forces and began by diplomacy and by arms to extend his conquests over the adjacent principalities he sent a powerful army to descend the banks of the Danaper, capturing all the cities on the right hand and on the left and binding the inhabitants by oaths of allegiance the army advancing with resistless strides arrived before the walls of kiev took possession of the deserted palaces of this ancient capital and sviatoslav proclaimed himself monarch of southern russia 
but while Sviatoslav was thus prosecuting his conquests, at the distance of four hundred miles south of Novgorod, Vesevolod advanced with an army to this city, and was in his turn received by the Novgorodians with the ringing of bells, bonfires, and shouts of welcome. All the surrounding princes and nobles promptly gave in their adhesion to the victorious sovereign, and Sviatoslav found that all his conquests had vanished as by magic from beneath his hand. Under these circumstances, Vesevolod and Sviatoslav were both inclined to negotiation. As the result, it was agreed that Vesevolod should be recognized as the monarch of Russia, and that Sviatoslav should reign as tributary prince of Kiev. To bind anew the ties of friendship, Vesevolod gave in marriage his beautiful sister to the youngest son of Sviatoslav. Thus this civil strife was terminated. But the gates of the Temple of Janus were not yet to be closed. Foreign war now commenced, and raged with unusual ferocity. Six hundred miles east of Moscow was the country of Bulgaria. It comprehended the present Russian province of Orenburg, and was bounded on the east by the Ural Mountains, and on the west by the Volga. A population of nearly a million and a half inhabited this mountainous realm. Commerce and arts flourished, and the people were enriched by their commerce with the Grecian Empire. They were, however, barbarians, and as even in the nineteenth century the slave trade is urged as a means of evangelizing the heathen of Africa, war was urged with its carnage and woe as the agent of disseminating Christianity through pagan Bulgaria. The motive assigned for the war was to serve Christ by the conversion of the infidel. The motives which influenced were ambition, love of conquest, and the desire to add to the opulence and the power of Russia. The Sevalod made grand preparations for this enterprise. Conferring with the warlike Sviatoslav and other ambitious princes, a large army was collected at the headwaters of the Volga. They floated down the wild stream in capacious flat-bottomed barges till they came to the mouth of the Kama. Thus far their expedition had been like the jaunt of a gala day. Summer warmth and sunny skies had cheered them as they floated down the romantic stream, through forests, between mountains, and along flowery savannas, with pennants floating gaily in the air, and music swelling from their martial bands. War has always its commencement of pomp and pageantry, followed by its terminations of woe and despair. The Sevalade in person led the army. Near the mouth of the Kama they abandoned their flotilla, which could not be employed in ascending the rapid stream. Continuing their march by land, they pushed boldly into the country of the Bulgarians, and laid siege to their capital, which was called the Great City. For six days the battle raged, and the city was taken. It proved, however, to be but a barren conquest. An arrow from the walls pierced the side of a beloved nephew of the Sevalad, the young man in excruciating agony died in the arms of the monarch. The Sevalod was so much affected by the sufferings which he was thus called to witness, that, dejected and disheartened, he made the best terms he could, soothing his pride by extorting from the vanquished a vague acknowledgment of subjugation to the empire. He then commenced his long march of toil and suffering back again to Moscow, over vast plains and through dense forests, having really accomplished nothing of any moment. The reign of Vesevolod continued for thirty-seven years. It was a scene of incessant conflict, with insurgent princes disputing his power and struggling for the supremacy. Often his imperial title was merely nominal. Again a successful battle would humble his foes and bring them in subjugation to the foot of his throne, but on the whole, during his reign, the fragmentary empire gained solidity, the monarchial arm gained strength, and the sovereign obtained a more marked supremacy above the rival princes who had so long disputed the power of the throne. The Sevalod died, generally regretted, on the 12th of April, 1212. In the Russian annals he has received the surname of Great. His reign, compared with that of most of his predecessors, was happy. He left in churches and in fortresses many monuments of his devotion and of his military skill. His wife, Maria, seems to have been a woman of sincere piety. Her brief pilgrimage on earth, passed six hundred years ago, led her through the same joys and griefs which in the nineteenth century oppress human hearts. The last seven years of her life she passed on a bed of sickness and extreme suffering. The patience she displayed caused her to be compared with the patriarch Job. 
just before she died she assembled her six surviving children around her bed as with tears they gazed upon the emaciated cheeks of their beloved and dying mother she urged them to love god to study the bible to give their hearts to the saviour and to live for heaven she died universally regretted and revered the reign of vesevolod was contemporaneous with the conquest of constantinople by the crusaders the latin or roman church thus for a season extended its domination over the greek or eastern church the french and venetians robbed the rich churches of constantine with their paintings statuary relics and all their treasures of art the greek emperor himself fled in disguise to thrace the roman pontiff innocent the third deeming this a favorable moment to supplant the greek religion in russia sent letters to the russian clergy in which he said the religion of rome is becoming universally triumphant the whole grecian empire has recognized the spiritual power of the pope will you be the only people who refuse to enter into the fold of christ and to recognize the roman church as the ark of salvation out of which no one can be saved i have sent you a cardinal a man noble well instructed and legate of the successors of the apostles he has received full power to enlighten the minds of the russians and to rescue them from all their errors this pastoral exhortation was entirely unavailing the bishops and clergy of the russian church still pertinaciously adhered to the faith of their fathers the crusaders were ere long driven from the imperial city and the greek church again attained its supremacy in the east a supremacy which it has maintained to the present day End of chapter 5chapter six of the empire of russia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada the empire of russia from the remotest period to the present time by john stevens cabot abbott chapter six the grand princes of vladimir and the invasion of genghis khan from twelve twelve to twelve thirty eight ascension of georges famine battle of lipitsk defeat of georges his surrender constantine seizes the sceptre exploits of mitislav imbecility of constantine death of constantine georges the third invasion of bulgaria progress of the monarchy right of succession commerce of the dnieper genghis khan his rise and conquests invasion of southern russia death of genghis khan succession of his son ogadai march of bati entrance into russia utter defeat of the russians moscow was the capital of a province then called suzdal northwest of this province there was another large yaroslavlete called vladimir with a capital of the same name north of these provinces there was an extensive territory named yaroslavle immediately after the death of sevalod a brother of the deceased monarch named georges ascended the throne with the assent of all nobles of suzdal and vladimir at the same time his brother constantine prince of yaroslavle claimed the crown eager partisans rallied around the two aspirants constantine made the first move by burning the town of kostroma and carrying off the inhabitants as captives georges replied by an equally sanguinary assault upon rostov such war has ever been when princes quarrel being unable to strike each other they wreak their vengeance upon innocent and helpless villages burning their houses slaying sons and brothers and either dragging widows and orphans into captivity 
or leaving them to perish of exposure and starvation in this conflict georges was victor and he signed to his brothers and cousins the administration of the provinces of southern russia still the ancient annals gives us nothing but a dreary record of war a very energetic prince arose by the name of mstislav who for years strove over subjugated provinces desolating them with fire and sword another horrible famine commenced its ravages at this time caused principally by the desolations of war throughout all northern and eastern russia the starving inhabitants ate the bark of trees leaves and the most disgusting reptiles the streets were covered with the bodies of the dead abandoned to the dogs crowds of skeleton men and women wandered through the fields in vain seeking food and ever dropping in the convulsions of death christian faith is stunned in the contemplation of such woes and yet it sees in them but the fruits of man's depravity the enigma of life can find no solution but in divine revelation and even that revelation does but show in what direction the solution lies mstislav of novgorod encouraged by his military success and regardless of the woes of the populace entered into an alliance with constantine promising with his aid to drive georges from the throne and to place the scepter in the hands of constantine the king sent an army of ten thousand men against the insurgents all over russia there was a choosing of sides as prince after prince ranged his followers under the banners of one or the other of the combatants at last the two armies met upon the banks of the river Ksa. the russian analysts say that the sovereign was surrounded with the banners of thirty regiments accompanied by a military band of one hundred and forty trumpets and drums the insurgent princes either alarmed by the power of the sovereign or anxious to spare the effusion of blood proposed terms of accommodation it's too late to talk of peace said georges you are now as fishes on the land you have advanced too far and your destruction is inevitable the ambassadors retired in sadness georges then assembled his captains and gave orders to form the troops in line of battle addressing the troops he said let no soldier's life be spared aim particularly at the officers the helmets the clothes and the horses of the dead shall belong to you let us not be troubled with any prisoners the princes alone may be taken captive and reserved for public execution both parties now prepared with soundings of the trumpet and shoutings of the soldiers for combat it was in the early dawn of the morning that the celebrated battle of lipitsk commenced the arena of strife was a valley broken by rugged hills on the headwaters of the don about two hundred miles south of moscow it was a gloomy day of wind and clouds and rain and while the cruel tempest of man's passion swept the earth an elemental tempest wrecked the skies from the morning till the evening twilight the battle raged inspired by the antagonistic forces of haughty confidence and of despair darkness separated the combatants neither party having gained any decisive advantage the night was freezing cold a chill april wind sweeping the mists over the heights upon which the two hosts exhausted and bleeding slept upon their arms each fearing a midnight surprise with the earliest dawn of the next morning the battle was renewed both armies defiantly and simultaneously moving down from the hills to meet on the plains mstislav rode along the ranks of his troops exclaiming let no man turn his head retreat now is destruction let us forget our wives and children and fight for our lives his soldiers with shouts of enthusiasm threw aside all encumbering clothes 
and uttering those loud outcries with which semi-barbarians ever rush into battle, impetuously fell upon the advancing foe. Mstislav was a prince of Herculean stature and strength. With a battle-axe in his hands, he advanced before the troops, and it is recorded that, striking on the right hand and the left, he cut a path through the ranks of the enemy as a strong man would trample down the grain. A wake of the dead marked his path. It was one of the most deplorable of Russian battles, for the dispute had arrayed the son against the father, brother against brother, friend against friend. The victory, however, was now not for a moment doubtful. The royal forces were entirely routed, and were pursued with enormous slaughter by the victorious Mstislav. Nearly ten thousand of the followers of George's were slain upon the field of battle. George's, having had three horses killed beneath him, escaped, and on the fourth day reached Vladimir, where he found only old men, women, children, and ecclesiastics. So entirely had he drained the country for the war. The king himself was the first to announce to the citizens of Vladimir the terrible defeat. Wan from fatigue and suffering, he rode in at the gates, his hair disheveled and his clothing torn. As he traversed the streets, he called earnestly upon all who remained to rally upon the walls for their defense. It was late in the afternoon when the king reached the metropolis, during the night a throng of fugitives was continually entering the city, wounded and bleeding. In the early morning the king assembled the citizens in the public square and urged them to a desperate resistance. But they, disheartened by the awful reverse, exclaimed, Prince, courage can no longer save us. Our brethren have perished on the field of battle. Those who have escaped are wounded, exhausted, and unarmed. We are unable to oppose the enemy. Georges entreated them to make at least a show of resistance, that he might open negotiations with the foe. Soon Mstislav appeared, leading his troops in a solid phalanx, with waving banners and trumpet blasts, and surrounded the city. In the night, a terrible conflagration burst forth within the city, and his soldiers entreated him to take advantage of the confusion for an immediate assault. The magnanimous conqueror refused to avail himself of the calamity, and restrained the ardor of his troops. The next morning, Georges, despairing of any further defense, rode from the gates into the camp of Mstislav. You are victorious, said he. Dispose of me and my fortunes as you will. My brother Constantine will be obedient to your wishes. The unhappy prince was sent into exile, embarking with his wife and children and a few faithful followers in barges at the headwaters of the Volga. He floated down the stream towards the Caspian Sea and disappeared forever from the observation of history. Constantine was now raised to the imperial throne through the energies of Mstislav. This latter prince returned to his domains in Novgorod, and under the protection of the throne he rivaled the monarch in splendor and power. Constantine established his capital at Vladimir, about 150 miles west of Moscow. The warlike Mstislav, greedy of renown, with the chivalry of a knight-errant, sought to have a hand in every quarrel then raging far or near. Southern Russia continued in a state of incessant embroilments, and the princes of the provinces, but nominally in subjection to the crown, lived in a state of interminable war. Occasionally they would sheathe the sword of civil strife and combine in some important expedition against the Hungarians or the Poles. 
but tranquillity reigned in the principality of vladimir and the adjacent provinces influenced by the pacific policy of the sovereign or overawed by his power cultivated the arts of peace constantine however was effeminate as well as peaceful the tremendous energy of mstislav had shed some lustre upon him and thus for a time it was supposed that he possessed a share no one knew how great of that extraordinary vigor which had placed him on the throne but now mstislav was far away on bloody fields in hungary and the princes in the vicinity of vladimir soon found that constantine had no spirit to resent any of their encroachments enormous crimes were perpetrated with impunity princes were assassinated and murderers seized their castles and their sceptres while the imbecile constantine instead of avenging such outrages contented himself with shedding tears building churches distributing alms and kissing the relics of the saints which had been sent to him from constantinople thus he lived for several years a superstitious perhaps a pious man but so utterly devoid of energy of enlightened views respecting his duty as a ruler that the helpless were unprotected and the wicked rioted unpunished in crime he died in the year twelve nineteen at the early age of thirty-three finding death approaching he called his two sons to his bedside and exhorted them to live in brotherly affection to be the benefactors of widows and orphans and especially to be supporters of religion the wife of constantine imbibing his spirit immediately upon his death renounced the world and retiring to the cloisters of the convent immured herself in its glooms until she also rejoined her husband in the spirit land georges the second son of sevalod now ascended the throne he signalized the commencement of his reign by a military excursion to oriental bulgaria descending the volga in barges to the mouth of the kama he invaded with a well-disciplined army the realm he wished to subjugate the russians approached the city of ochel it was strongly fortified with palisades and a double wall of wood the assailants approached led by a strong party with hatchets and torches they were closely followed by archers and lancers to drive the defenders from the ramparts the palisades were promptly cut down and set on fire the flames spread to the wooden walls and over the burning ruins the assailants rushed into the city a high wind arose and the whole city whose buildings were constructed of wood only soon blazed like a volcano the wretched citizens had but to choose between the swords of the russians and the fire many in their despair plunged their poignards into the bosoms of their wives and children and then buried the dripping blade in their own hearts multitudes of the russians even encircled by the flames in the narrow streets miserably perished in a few hours the city and nearly all of its male inhabitants were destroyed extensive regions of the country were then ravaged and bulgaria as a conquered province was considered as annexed to the russian empire georges enriched with plunder and having extorted oaths of allegiance from most of the bulgarian princes reascended the volga to vladimir as he was on his return he laid the foundations of a new city nizhny novgorod at the confluence of two important streams about two hundred miles west of moscow the city remains to the present day it will be perceived through what slow and vacillating steps the russian monarchy was established in the earliest dawn of the kingdom yaroslav divided russia into five principalities to his eldest son he gave the title of grand prince constituting him 
by his will, chief or monarch of the whole kingdom. His younger brothers were placed over the principalities, holding them as vassals of the grand prince at Cave, and transmitting the right of succession to their children. Yasoslav and some of his descendants, men of great energy, succeeded in holding under more or less of restraint the turbulent princes, who were simply entitled princes to distinguish them from the grand prince or monarch. These princes had under them innumerable vassal lords, who, differing in wealth and extent of dominions, governed with despotic sway the serfs or peasants subject to their power. No government could be more simple than this, and it was the necessary resultant of those stormy times. But in process of time feeble grand princes reigned at cave, the vassal princes, strengthening themselves in alliance with one another or seeking aid from foreign semi-civilized nations such as the Poles, the Danes, the Hungarians, often imposed laws upon their nominal sovereign and not unfrequently drove him from the throne and placed upon it a monarch of their own choice. Sviatopolk II was driven to the humiliation of appearing to defend himself from accusation before the tribunal of his vassal princes. Monomach and Mstislav I, with imperial energy, brought all the vassal princes in subjection to their scepter, and reigned as monarchs. But their successors, not possessing like qualities, were unable to maintain the regal dignity, and gradually cave sank into a provincial town, and the scepter was transferred to the principality of Suzdal. Andre of Suzdal abolished the system of appanages, as it was called, in which the principalities were in entire subjection to the princes who reigned over them, these princes only rendering vassal service to the sovereign. He, in their stead, appointed governors over the distant provinces, who were his agents to execute his commands. This measure gave new energy and consolidation to the monarchy, and added incalculable strength to the regal arm. But the grand princes, who immediately succeeded André, had not efficiency to maintain this system, and the princes again regained their position of comparative independence. Indeed, they were undisputed sovereigns of their principalities, bound only to recognize the superior rank of the grand prince and to aid him when called upon as allies. In process of time, the princes of the five great principalities, Pereslavle, Chernigov, Kiev, Novgorod, and Smolensk, were subdivided through the energies of warlike nobles into minor appanages or independent provinces, independent in everything save feudal service, a service often feebly recognized and dimly defined. The sovereigns of the great provinces assumed the title of grand princes. The smaller sovereigns were simply called princes. Under these princes were the petty lords or nobles. The spirit of all evil could not have devised a system better calculated to keep a nation incessantly embroiled in war. The princes of Novgorod claimed the right of choosing their grand prince. In all the other provinces, the scepter was nominally hereditary. In point of fact, it was only hereditary when the one who ascended the throne had sufficient vigor of arm to beat back his assailing foes. For two hundred years, during nearly all of the eleventh and twelfth centuries, it is with difficulty we can discern any traces of the monarchy. The history of Russia during this period is but a history of interminable battles between the grand princes and petty, yet most cruel and bloody, 
conflicts between the minor princes the doctrine of hereditary descent of the governing power was the cause of nearly all these conflicts a semi-idiot or a brutal ruffian was thus often found the ruler of millions of energetic men war and bloodshed were of course the inevitable result this absurdity was perhaps a necessary consequence of the ignorance and the brutality of the times but happy is that nation which is sufficiently enlightened to choose its own magistrates and to appreciate the sanctity of the ballot box. The history of the United States thus far, with its elective administrations, is a marvel of tranquility, prosperity, and joy, as it is recorded amidst the bloody pages of this world's annals. According to the ancient custom of Russia, the right of succession transferred the crown not to the oldest son but to the brother or the most aged member belonging to the family connections of the deceased prince the energetic monomach violated this law by transferring the crown to his son when by custom it should have passed to the prince of chernigov hence for ages there was implacable hatred between these two houses, and Russia was crimsoned with blood of a hundred battlefields. Nearly all the commerce of Russia at this time was carried on between Kiev and Constantinople by barges traversing the Dnieper and the Black Sea. These barges went strongly armed as a protection against the barbarians who crowded the banks of the river. The stream, being thus the great thoroughfare of commerce, received the popular name of the Road to Greece. The Russians exported rich furs in exchange for the cloths and spices of the East. As the Russian power extended towards the rising sun, the Volga and the Caspian Sea became the highways of a prosperous, though an interrupted, commerce. It makes the soul melancholy to reflect upon these long, long ages of rapine, destruction, and woe. But for this, had man been true to himself, the whole of Russia might now have been almost the Garden of Eden, with every marsh drained, every stream bridged, every field waving with luxuriance, every deformity changed into an object of beauty, with roads and canals intersecting every mile of its territory, with gorgeous cities embellishing the river banks and the mountain sides, and cottages smiling upon every plain. Man has no foe to his happiness so virulent and deadly as his brother man. The heaviest curse is human depravity. We now approach in the early part of the thirteenth century one of the most extraordinary events which has occurred in, in the history of man, the sweep of Tartar hordes over all northern Asia and Europe, under their indomitable leader, Genghis Khan. In the extreme north of the Chinese empire, just south of Irkutsk, in the midst of the desert wilds, unknown to Greek or Roman, there were wandering tribes called Mughals, they were a savage, vagabond race without any fixed habitations, living by the chase and by herding cattle. The chief of one of these tribes, greedy of renown and power, conquered several of the adjacent tribes and brought them into very willing subjection to his sway. War was a pastime for these fierce spirits, and their bold chief led them to victory and abundant booty. This barbarian conqueror, Beador by name, died in the prime of life, surrendering his wealth and power to his son, Timochin, then but thirteen years of age. This boy thus found himself lord of forty thousand families. Still he was but a subordinate prince or khan, owing allegiance to the Tartar sovereign of northern China brought up by his mother in the savage simplicity of a wandering shepherd's hut he developed a character which made him the scourge of the world and one of its most appalling wonders 
the most illustrious monarchies were overturned by the force of his arms, and millions of men were brought into subjection to his power. At the death of his father, Beador, many of the subjugated clans endeavored to break the yoke of the boy prince. Timochin, with the vigor and military sagacity of a veteran warrior, assembled an army of thirty thousand men, defeated the rebels, and plunged their leaders, seventy in number, each into a cauldron of boiling water. Elated by such brilliant success, the young prince renounced allegiance to the Tartar sovereign and assumed independence. Terrifying his enemies by severity, rewarding his friends with rich gifts, and overawing the populace by claims of supernatural powers, this extraordinary young man commenced a career of conquest which the world has never seen surpassed. Assembling his ferocious hordes, now enthusiastically devoted to his service, upon the banks of a rapid river, he took a solemn oath to share with them all the bitter and the sweet which he should encounter in the course of his life. The neighboring prince of Kiriat ventured to draw the sword against him. He forfeited his head for his audacity, and his skull, trimmed with silver, was converted into a drinking cup. At the close of this expedition, his vast army were disposed in nine different camps upon the headwaters of the river Amor. Each division had tents of a particular color. On a festival day, as all were gazing with admiration upon their youthful leader, a hermit, by previous secret appointment, appeared as the prophet from heaven. Approaching the prince, the pretended ambassador from the celestial court declared in a loud voice, God has given the whole earth to Timochen. As the sovereign of the world, he is entitled to the name of Genghis Khan, the great prince. No one was disposed to question the divine authority of this envoy from the skies. Shouts of applause rent the air, and chiefs and warriors, with unanimous voice, expressed their eagerness to follow their leader wherever he might guide them. Admiration of his prowess and terror of his arms spread far and wide, and ambassadors thronged his tent from adjacent nations, wishing to range themselves beneath his banners. Even the monarch of Tibet, overawed, sent messengers to offer his service as a vassal prince to Genghis Khan. The conqueror now made an eruption into China proper, and with his wolfish legions clambering the world-renowned wall, routed all the armies raised to oppose him, and speedily was master of ninety cities. Finding himself encumbered with a crowd of prisoners, he selected a large number of the aged and choked them to death. The sovereign, thoroughly humiliated, purchased peace by a gift of five hundred young men, five hundred beautiful girls, three thousand horses, and an immense quantity of silk and gold. Genghis Khan retired to the north with his treasures, but soon again returned and laid siege to Peking, the capital of the empire. With the energies of despair, though all unavailingly, the inhabitants attempted their defense. It was the year of 1215, when Peking fell before the arms of the Mughal conqueror. The whole city was immediately committed to flames, and the wasting conflagration raged for a whole month, when nothing was left of the once beautiful and populous city but a heap of ashes. Leaving troops in garrison throughout the subjugated country, the conqueror commenced his march towards the west laden with the spoils of plundered cities. Like the rush of a torrent, his army swept along until they entered the vast wilds of Turkomania. Here the great and the mighty Saladin had reigned, extending his sway from the Caspian Sea to the Ganges. 
dictating laws even to the caliph at Baghdad, who was the pope of the Mohammedans. Mohammed II now held the throne, a prince so haughty and warlike that he arrogated the name of the second Alexander the Great. With two such spirits heading their armies, a horrible war ensued. The capital of this region, Bokhara, had attained a very considerable degree of civilization and was renowned for its university, where the Mohammedan youth of noble families were educated. The city, after an unavailing attempt at defense, was compelled to capitulate. The elders of the metropolis brought the keys and laid them at the feet of the conqueror. Genghis Khan rode contemptuously on horseback into the sacred mosque, and seizing the Al-Quran from the altar, threw it upon the floor and trampled it beneath the hoofs of his steed. The whole city was inhumanely reduced to ashes. From Bokhara he advanced to Samarkand, this city was strongly fortified and contained a hundred thousand soldiers within its walls, besides an immense number of elephants trained to fight. The city was soon taken. Thirty thousand were slain and thirty thousand carried into perpetual slavery. All the adjacent cities soon shared a similar fate. For three years the armies of Genghis Khan ravaged the whole country between the Aral Lake and the Indus, with such fearful devastation that for six hundred years the region did not recover from the calamity. Mohammed II, pursued by his indefatigable foe, fled to one of the islands of the Caspian Sea, where he perished in paroxysms of rage and despair. Genghis Khan, having thoroughly subdued this whole region, now sent a division of his army, under two of his most distinguished generals, across the Caspian Sea to subjugate the regions on the western shore. Here, as before, victory accompanied their standards, and, with merciless severity, they swept the whole country to the Sea of Azov. The tidings of their advance, so bloody, so resistless, spread into Russia, exciting universal terror. The conquerors, elated with success, rushed on over the plains of Russia and were already pouring down into the valley of the Dnieper. Mstislav, Prince of Galich, already so renowned for his warlike exploits, was eager to measure arms with those soldiers, the terror of whose ravages now filled the world. He hurriedly assembled all the neighboring princes at cave and urged immediate and vigorous cooperation to repel the common foe. The Russian army was promptly rendezvoused on the banks of the Dnieper, preparatory to its march. Another large army was collected by the Russian princes who inhabited the valley of the Knister. In a thousand barges they descended the river to the Black Sea. Then, entering the Dnieper, they ascended the stream to unite with the main army, waiting impatiently their arrival. On the 21st of May, the whole force was put in motion, and after a march of nine days, met the Tartar army on the banks of the river Kaletz. The waving banners and the steeds of the Tartar host, covering the plains as far as the eye could extend, in numbers apparently countless, presented an appalling spectacle. Many of the Russian leaders were quite in despair. Others, young, ardent, inexperienced, were eager for the fight. The battle immediately commenced, and the combatants fought with all the ferocity which human energies could engender but the Russians were, in the end, routed entirely. The Tartars drove the bleeding fugitives in wild confusion before them back to the Dnieper. Never before had Russia encountered so frightful a disaster. The whole army was destroyed, 
not one-tenth of their number escaped that field of massacre. Seven princes and seventy of the most illustrious nobles were among the slain. The Tartars followed up their victory with their accustomed inhumanity, and, as if it were their intention to depopulate the country, swept it in all directions, putting the inhabitants indiscriminately to the sword. They acted upon the maxim which they ever proclaimed. The conquered can never be the friends of the conquerors, and the death of one is essential to the safety of the other. The whole of southern Russia trembled with terror, and men, women, and children, in utter helplessness, with groans and cries, fled to the churches, imploring the protection of God. The divine power, which alone could aid them, interposed in their behalf. For some unknown reason, Genghis Khan recalled his troops to the shores of the Caspian, where this blood-stained conqueror, in the midst of his invincible armies, dictated laws to the vast regions he had subjected to his will. This frightful storm, having left utter desolation behind it, passed away as rapidly as it had approached, scathed as by the lightnings of heaven. The whole of southern Russia, east of the Dnieper, was left smoking like a furnace. The nominal king, Georges II, far distant in the northern realm of Suzdal and Vladimir, listened to Paul to the reports of the tempest raging over the southern portion of the kingdom. And when the dark cloud disappeared and its thunders ceased, he congratulated himself in having escaped its fury. After the terrible battle of Kalka, six years passed before the locust legions of the Tartars again made their appearance, and Russia hoped that the scourge had disappeared forever. In the year 1227, Genghis Khan died. It has been estimated that the ambitions of this one man cost the lives of between five and six millions of the human family. He nominated as his successor his oldest son, Octai, and enjoined it upon him never to make peace but with vanquished nations. Ambitious of being the conqueror of the world, Octai ravaged with his armies the whole of northern China in the heart of Tartary. He reared his palace, embellished with the highest attainments of Chinese art. Raising an army of 300,000 men, the Tartar sovereign placed his nephew, Batu, in command, and ordered him to bring into subjection all the nations on the northern shores of the Caspian Sea, and then to continue his conquests throughout all the expanse of northern Russia. A bloody strife of three years planted his banners upon every cliff and through all the defiles of the Ural Mountains, and then the victor plunging down the western declivities of this great natural barrier between Europe and Asia, established his troops for winter quarters in the valley of the Volga. To strike the rain with terror, he burned the capital city of Bulgaria and put all the inhabitants to the sword. Early in the spring of the year 1238, with an army, says the ancient annalist, as innumerable as locusts, he crossed the Volga, and threading many almost impenetrable forests, after a march, in a northwest direction of about 400 miles, entered the province of Rezdan, just south of Zuzdal. He then sent an embassage to the king and his confederate princes, saying, If you wish for peace with the Tartars, you must pay us an annual tribute of one-tenth of your possessions. The heroic reply was returned. When you have slain us all, you can then take all that we have. Bati, at the head of his terrible army, 
continued his march through the populous province of Rezdan, burning every dwelling and endeavoring, with indiscriminate massacre, to exterminate the inhabitants. City after city fell before them until they approached the capital. This they besieged, first surrounding it with palisades that it might not be possible for any of the inhabitants to escape. The innumerable host pressed the siege day and night, not allowing the defenders one moment for repose. On the sixteenth day, after many had been slain, and all the citizens were in utter exhaustion from toil and sleeplessness, they commenced the final assault with ladders and battering rams. The walls of wood were soon set on fire, and, through flame and smoke, the demoniac assailants rushed into the city. Indiscriminate massacre ensued of men, women, and children, accompanied with the most revolting cruelty. The carnage continued for many hours, and when it ceased, the city was reduced to ashes, and not one of its inhabitants was left alive. The conquerors then rushed on to Moscow. Here the tempest of battle raged for a few days, and then Moscow followed in the footsteps of Rezdan. End of chapter 6Chapter 7 of the Empire of Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Empire of Russia from the remotest periods to the present time by john stevens cabot abbott chapter seven the sway of the tartar princess from twelve thirty eight to thirteen o four retreat of george's the second desolating march of the tartars capture of vladimir fall of moscow utter defeat of george's conflict at torjek March of the Tartars towards the south. Subjugation of the Polovtsi. Capture of Cave. Humiliation of Yaroslav. Overthrow of the Russian kingdom. Haughtiness of the Tartars. Reign of Alexander. Succession of Yaroslav. The reign of Vasuli. State of Christianity. Infamy of Andre. Struggles with Dmitri independence of the principalities death of andre the king georges fled from moscow before it was invested by the enemy leaving his defence to two of his sons retiring in a panic to the remote northern province of yaroslav he encamped with a small force upon one of the tributaries of the mologa and sent earnest entreaties to numerous princes to hasten with all the forces they could raise and join his army the tartars from moscow marched northwest some one hundred and fifty miles to the imperial city of vladimir they appeared before its walls on the second of february on the evening of the sixth the battering rams and ladders were prepared and it was evident that the storming of the city was soon to begin the citizens conscious that nothing awaited them but death or endless slavery with one accord resolved to sell their lives as dearly as possible accompanied by their wives and their children they assembled in the churches partook of the sacrament of the lord's supper implored heaven's blessings upon them and then husbands brothers fathers took affecting leave of their families and repaired to the walls for the deadly strife early on the morning of the seventh the assault commenced the impetuosity of the onset was irresistible in a few moments the walls were scaled 
the streets flooded with the foe the pavement covered with the dead and the city on fire in a hundred places the conquerors did not wish to encumber themselves with captives all were slain laden with booty and crimsoned with the blood of their foes the victors dispersed in every direction burning and destroying but encountering no resistance during the month they took fourteen cities slaying all the inhabitants but such as they reserved for slaves the monarch georges was still upon the banks of the site near where it empties into the mologa when he heard the tidings of the destruction of moscow and vladimir and of the massacre of his wife and his children his eyes filled with tears and in the anguish of his spirit he prayed that god would enable him to exemplify the patience of job adversity develops the energy of noble spirits georges rallied his troops and made a desperate onset upon the foe as they approached his camp it was the morning of the fourth of march but again the battle was disastrous to russia mogul numbers triumphed over russian valor and the king and nearly all his army were slain some days after the battle the bishop of rostov traversed the field covered with the bodies of the dead there he discovered the corpse of the monarch which he recognized by the clothes the head had been severed from the body the bishop removed the gory trunk of the prince and gave it a respectful burial in the church of notre dame at rostov the head was subsequently found and deposited in the coffin with the body the conquerors continuing their march westerly one hundred and fifty miles burning and destroying as they went reached the populous city of torjek the despairing inhabitants for fifteen days beat off the assailants the city then fell its ruin was entire the dwellings became but the funeral pyres for the bodies of the slain the army of bati then continued its march to lake selagir the source of the volga within one hundred miles of the great city of novgorod villages disappeared writes the ancient annalists and the heads of the russians fell under the swords of the tartars as the grass falls before the scythe instead of pressing on to novgorod for some unknown reason bati turned south and marching two hundred miles laid siege to the strong fortress of kozelks in the principality of kaluga the garrison warned of the advance of the foe made the most heroic resistance for four weeks they held their assailants at bay banking every effort of the vast numbers who encompassed them a more determined and heroic defence was never made at last the fortress fell and not one soul escaped the exterminating sword but t now satiated with carnage retired with his army to the banks of the don yaroslav prince of cave and brother of georges the second hoping that the dreadful storm had passed away hastened to the smouldering ruins of vladimir to take the title and the shadowy authority of the grand prince never before were more conspicuously seen the energies of a noble soul at first it seemed that his reign could be extended only over gory corpses and smouldering ruins undismayed by the magnitude of the disaster he consecrated all the activity of his genius and the loftiness of his spirit to the regeneration of the desolate land in the spacious valleys of the don and its tributaries lived the powerful nation of the polovtsi who had often bid defiance to the whole strength of russia kothian their prince for a short time made vigorous opposition to the march of the conquerors but overwhelmed by numbers he was at length compelled to retreat and with his army of forty thousand men to seek refuge in hungary the country of the polovtsi was then abandoned to the tartars 
Having ravaged the central valleys of the Don and the Volga, these demoniac warriors turned their steps again into southern Russia. The inhabitants, frantic with terror, fled from their line of march as lambs fly from wolves. The blasts of their trumpets and the clatter of their horses' hooves were speedily resounding in the valley of the Dnieper. Soon from the steeples of cave, the banners of the terrible army were seen approaching from the east. They crossed the Dnieper and surrounded the imperial city, which, for some time anticipating the storm, had been making preparations for the most desperate resistance. The ancient analysts say that the noise of their innumerable chariots, the lowing of camels, and of the vast herds of cattle which accompanied their march, the neighing of horses, and the ferocious cries of the barbarians, created such a clamor that no ordinary voice could be heard in the heart of the city. The attack was speedily commenced, and the walls were assailed with all the then known instruments of war. Day and night, without a moment's intermission, the besiegers, like incarnate fiends, plied their works. The Tartars, as ever, were victorious, and Cave, with all its thronging population and all its treasures of wealth, architecture, and art, sank in the abyss of flame and blood. It sank to rise no more, though it has since been partially rebuilt, this ancient capital of the Grand Princess of Russia even now presents but the shadow of its pristine splendor. Onward, still onward, was the cry of the barbarians, leaving smoking brands and half-burned corpses where the imperial city once stood. The insatiable Bati pressed on hundreds of miles further west, assailing, storming, destroying the provinces of Galicia as far as southern Vladimir within a few leagues of the frontiers of Poland. Russia, being thus entirely devastated and at the feet of the conquerors, Bati wheeled his army around towards the south and descended into Hungary. Novgorod was almost the only important city in Russia which escaped the ravages of this terrible foe. Bati continued his career of conquest and, in 1245, was almost undisputed master of Russia of many of the Polish provinces, of Hungary, Croatia, Serbia, Bulgaria, on the Danube, Moldavia, and Wallachia. He then returned to the Volga and established himself there as permanent monarch over all these subjugated realms. No one dared to resist him, but he sent a haughty message to the Grand Prince Yaroslav at northern Vladimir ordering him to come to his camp on the distant Volga. Yaroslav, in the position in which he found himself, Russia being exhausted, depopulated, covered with ruins and with graves, did not dare disobey. Accompanied by several of his nobles, he took the weary journey and humbly presented himself in the tent of the conqueror. But he compelled the humiliated prince to send his young son, Constantine to Tartary, to the palace of the Grand Khan Oktai, who was about to celebrate with his chiefs the brilliant conquests his armies had made in China and Europe. If the statements of the analysts of those days may be credited, so sumptuous a fate the world had never seen before. The guests assembled in the metropolis of the Khan were innumerable. Yaroslav was compelled to promise allegiance to the Tartar chieftain and all the other Russian princes who had survived the general slaughter were also forced to pay homage and tribute to Bati. After two years the young prince Constantine returned from Tartary and then Yaroslav himself was ordered with all his relatives to go to the capital of this barbaric empire on the banks of the Amor where the Tartar chiefs were to meet to choose a successor to Octai, who had recently died. 
With tears the unhappy prince bade adieu to his country, and traversing vast deserts and immense regions of hills and valleys, he at length reached the metropolis of his cruel masters. Here he successfully defended himself against some accusations which had been brought against him, and, after a detention of several months, he was permitted to set out on his return. He had proceeded but a few hundred miles on the weary journey when he was taken sick and died the 20th of September, 1246. The faithful nobles who accompanied him bore his remains to Vladimir, where they were interred. There was no longer a Russian kingdom. The country had lost its independence, and the Tartar sway, rude, vacillating, and awfully cruel, extended from remote China to the shores of the Baltic. The Roman, Grecian, and Russian empires thus crumbling, the world was threatened with the universal inundation of barbarism. Russian princess, with more or less power, ruled over the serfs who tilled their lands, but there was no recognized head of the once powerful kingdom, and no Russian prince ventured to disobey the commands even of the humblest captains of the Tartar hordes. While affairs were in this deplorable state, a Russian prince, Daniel of Galicia, engaged secretly, but with great vigor, in the attempt to secure the cooperation of the rest of Europe to emancipate Russia from the Tartar yoke. Greece, overawed by the barbarians, did not dare make any hostile movement against them. Daniel turned to Rome and promised the Pope, Innocent the Fourth, that Russia should return to the Roman Church and would march under the papal flag if the Pope would rouse Christian Europe against the Tartars. The Pope eagerly embraced these offers, pronounced Daniel to be King of Russia, and sent the papal legate to appoint Roman bishops over the Greek Church. At the same time, he wished to crown Daniel with regal splendor. I have need, exclaimed the prince, of an army, not a crown. A crown is but a childish ornament when the yoke of the barbarian is galling our necks. Daniel at length consented for the sake of its moral influence to be crowned king, and the Pope issued his letters calling upon the faithful to unite under the banners of the cross to drive the barbarians from Europe. This union, however, accomplished but little, as the Pope was only anxious to bring the Greek church under the sway of Rome, and Daniel sought only military aid to expel the Tartars, each endeavoring to surrender as little and to gain as much as possible. One of the Christian nobles endeavored to persuade Mangu, a Tartar chieftain, of the superiority of the Christian religion. The pagan replied, We are not ignorant that there is a God, and we love him with all our heart. There are more ways of salvation than there are fingers on your hands. If God has given you the Bible, he has given us our wise men, magi. But you do not obey the precepts of your Bible, while we are perfectly obedient to the instructions of our magi, and never think of disputing their authority. The pride of these Tartar conquerors may be inferred from the following letter, sent by the great Khan to Louis, King of France. In the name of God, the All-Powerful, I command you, King Louis, to be obedient to me, when the will of heaven shall be accomplished, when the universe shall have recognized me as its sovereign, tranquillity will then be seen restored to earth. But if you dare to despise the decrees of God, to say that your country is remote, your mountains inaccessible, and your seas deep and wide, and that you fear not my displeasure, then the Almighty will speedily show you how terrible is my power." After the death of Yaroslav, his uncle Alexander assumed the sovereignty of the Grand Principality. He was a prince of much military renown. 
Bati, who was still encamped upon the banks of the Volga, sent to him a message as follows. Prince of Novgorod, it is well known by you that God has subjected to our sway innumerable peoples. If you wish to live in tranquility, immediately come to me in my tent, that you may witness the glory and the grandeur of the Mughals. Alexander obeyed with the promptness of a slave. Bati received the prince with great condescension, but commanded him to continue his journey some hundreds of leagues further to the east, that he might pay homage to the Grand Khan in Tartary. It was a terrible journey, beneath a blazing sun, over burning plains, whitened by the bones of those who had perished by the way. Those dreary solitudes had for ages been traversed by caravans, and instead of cities and villages, and the hum of busy life, the eye met only the tombs in which the dead mouldered, and the silence of the grave oppressed the soul. In the year 1249, Alexander returned from his humiliating journey to Tartary. The Khan was so well satisfied with his conduct that he appointed him king of all the realms of southern Russia. The Pope, now thoroughly alienated from Daniel, corresponded with Alexander, entreating him to bring the Greek church under the supremacy of Rome, and thus secure for himself the protection and the blessing of the father of all the faithful. Alexander returned the peremptory reply. We wish to follow the true doctrines of the church, as for your doctrines, we have no desire either to adopt them or to know them. Alexander administered the government so much in accordance with the will of his haughty masters that the Khan gradually increased his dominion. Bati, the Tartar chieftain, who was encamped with his army on the banks of the Volga and the Don, died in the year 1257, and his bloody sword, the only scepter of his power, passed into the hands of his brother Berkey. Alexander felt compelled to hasten to the Tartar camp with expressions of homage to the new captain, and with rich presents to conciliate his favor. Many of the Tartars had by this time embraced Christianity, and there were frequent intermarriages between the Russian nobles and the princesses of the Tartar race. It is a curious fact that even then the Tartars were so conscious of the power of the clergy over the popular mind that they employed all the arts of courtesy and bribes to secure their influence to hold the Russians in subjection. The Tartars exacted enormous tributes from the subjugated country. An insurrection, headed by the son of Alexander, broke out at Novgorod. The Grand Prince, terrified in view of the Mughal wrath which might be expected to overwhelm him, arrested and imprisoned his son who had countenanced the enterprise, and punished the nobles implicated in the movement with terrible severity. Some were hung, others had their eyes plucked out and their noses cut off. But unappeased by this fearful retribution, the Tartars were immediately on the march to avenge with their own hands the crime of rebellion. Their footsteps were marked with such desolation and cruelty that the Russians, goaded to despair, again ventured, like the crushed worm, an impotent resistance. Alexander himself was compelled to join the Tartars and aid in cutting down his wretched countrymen. The Tartars haughtily entered Novgorod. Silence and desolation reigned through its streets. They went from house to house, extorting, as they well knew how, treasures which beggared families and ruined the city. Throughout all Russia, the princes were compelled to break down the walls of their cities and to demolish their fortifications. In the year 1262, Alexander was alarmed by some indication of displeasure on the part of the Grand Khan, and he decided to take an immediate journey to the Mughal capital with rich presents, there to attempt to explain away any suspicions 
which might be entertained. His health was feeble and suffered much from the exposure of the journey. He was detained in the Mongol court in captivity, though treated with much consideration for a year. He then returned home, so crushed in health and spirit, that he died on the 14th of November, 1263. The prince was buried at Vladimir, and was borne to the grave surrounded by the tears and lamentations of his subjects. He seemed to have died the death of the righteous, breathing most fervent prayers of penitence and of love in the distressing situation in, in which his country was placed he could do nothing but seek to alleviate its woe and to this object he devoted all the energies of his life the name of alexander nevsky is still pronounced in russia with love and admiration his remains after reposing in the church of notre dame at vladimir until the eighteenth century were transported by Peter the Great to the banks of the Neva, to give renown to the capital which that illustrious monarch was rearing there. Yaroslav of Tavir succeeded almost immediately his father in the nominal sway of Russia. The new sovereign promised fealty to the Tartars, and feared no rival while sustained by their swords. His oppression became intolerable. The tocsin was founded in the streets of Novgorod, and the whole populace rose in insurrection. The movement was successful. The favorites and advisers of Yaroslav were put to death, and the prince himself was exiled. There is something quite refreshing in the energetic spirit with which the populace transmitted their sentence of repudiation to the discomfited prince blockaded in his palace the citizens met in a vast gathering in the church of st nicholas and sent to him the following act of accusation why have you seized the mansions of one of our nobles why have you robbed others of their money why have you driven from novgorod strangers who were living peaceably in the midst of us why do your gamekeepers exclude us from the chase and drive us from our own fields it is time to put an end to such violence leave us go where you please but leave us for we shall choose another prince yaroslav terrified and humiliated sent his son to the public assembly with the assurance that he was ready to conform to all their wishes if they would return to their allegiance it's too late was the reply leave us immediately or we shall be exposed to the inconvenience of driving you away yaroslav immediately left the city and sought safety in exile the novgorodans then offered the soiled and battered crown to dmitri a nephew of the deposed prince but dmitri fearing the vengeance of the tartars replied i am not willing to ascend a throne from which you have expelled my uncle yaroslav immediately sent an ambassador to the encampment of the tartars where they were ever eagerly waiting for any enterprise which promised carnage and plunder the ambassador imploring their aid said the novgorodans are your enemies they have shamefully expelled yaroslav and thus treated your authority with insolence they have deposed yaroslav merely because he was faithful in collecting tribute for you by such a crisis republicanism was necessarily introduced in novgorod the people destitute of a prince and threatened by an approaching army made vigorous efforts for resistance the two armies soon met face to face, and they were on the eve of a terrible battle when the worthy metropolitan bishop, Cyril, interposed and succeeded in effecting a treaty which arrested the flow of torrents of blood. The Novgorodans again accepted Yaroslav, he making the most solemn promises of amendment. The ambassadors of the Tartar Khan conducted Yaroslav again to the throne. 
The Tartars now embraced, almost simultaneously and universally, the Mohammedan religion, and were inspired with the most fanatic zeal for its extension. Yaroslav retained his throne only by employing all possible means to conciliate the Tartars. He died in the year 1272, as he was also on his return journey from a visit to the Tartar court. Vasily, a younger brother of Yaroslav, now ascended the throne, establishing himself at Vladimir, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, extending over a region of 60,000 square miles, was situated just north of Poland. The Tartars, dissatisfied with the Lithuanians, prepared an expedition against them, and marching with a great army, compelled many of the Russian princes to follow their banners. The Tartars spread desolation over the whole tract of country they traversed, and on their return took a careful census of the population of all the principalities of Russia, that they might decide upon the tribute to be imposed. The Russians were so broken in spirit that they submitted to all these indignities without a murmur. Still there were to be seen here and there indications of discontent. An ecclesiastical council was held at Vladimir in the year 1274. All the bishops of the north of Russia were assembled to rectify certain abuses which had crept into the church. A copy of the canons, then adopted, written upon parchment, is still preserved in the Russian archives. What a chastisement, exclaimed the bishops, have we received for our neglect of the true principles of Christianity. God has scattered us over the whole surface of the globe. Our cities have fallen into the hands of the enemy. Our princes have perished on the field of battle. Our families have been dragged into slavery. Our temples have become the prey of destruction and every day we groan more and more heavily beneath the yoke which is imposed upon us. It was decreed in this council of truly Christian men that, as a public expression of the importance of a holy life, none should be introduced into the ranks of the clergy but those whose morals had been irreproachable from their earliest infancy. A single pastor, said the decree of this council, faithfully devoted to his master's service, is more precious than a thousand worldly priests. Vasily died in the year 1276 and was succeeded by a prince of Vladimir named Dmitri. He immediately left his native principality and took up his residence in Novgorod which city at this time seemed to have been regarded as the capital of the subjugated and dishonored kingdom. The indomitable tribes inhabiting the fastness of the Caucasian mountains had, thus far, maintained their independence. The Tartars called upon Russia for troops to aid in their subjugation, and four of the princes, one of whom, Andrei of Gorodets, was a brother of Dmitri the king, submissively led the required army into the Mogul encampment. Andre, by his flattery, his presence, and his servile devotion to the interests of the Khan, secured a decree of dethronement against his brother and his own appointment as Grand Prince. Then, with the combined army of Tartars and Russians, he marched upon Novgorod to take possession of the crown. Resistance was not to be thought of, and Dmitri precipitately fled. Karamizin thus describes the sweep of this Tartar wave of woe. The Mughals pillaged and burned the houses, the monasteries, the churches from which they took the images, the precious vases and the books richly bound. Large troops of the inhabitants were dragged into slavery or fell beneath the sabers of the ferocious soldiers of the Khan. The young sisters in the convents were exposed to the brutality of these monsters. 
the unhappy laborers who to escape death or captivity had fled into the deserts perishing of exposure and starvation not an inhabitant was left who did not weep over the death of a father a son a brother or a friend thus andre ascended the throne and then returned the soldiers of the khan laden with the booty which they had so cruelly and iniquitously obtained the barbarians always greedy of rapine and blood were ever delighted to find occasion to ravage the principalities of russia the tartars having withdrawn dmitri secured the cooperation of some powerful princess drove his brother from Novgorod, and again grasped the scepter which his brother had wrested from him. The two brothers continued bitterly hostile to each other, and years passed of petty intrigues and with occasional scenes of violence and blood, as Dmitri struggled to hold the crown which André as perseveringly strove to seize. Again André obtained another Mughal army, which swept Russia with fearful destruction, and, taking possession of Vladimir and Moscow, and every city and village on their way, plundering, burning, and destroying, marched resistlessly to Novgorod, and placed again the traitorous, blood-stained monster on the throne. Dmitri, abandoning his palaces and his treasures, fled to a remote principality, where he soon died in the year 1294, an old man battered and wrecked by the storms of a life of woe. He is celebrated in the Russian annals only by the disasters which accompanied his reign. According to the Russian historians, the infamous André, his elder brother being now dead, found himself legitimately the sovereign of Russia. As no one dared to dispute his authority, the ill-fated kingdom passed a few years in tranquility. At length, Daniel, prince of Moscow, claimed independence of the nominal king, or grand prince, as he was called. In fact, most of the principalities were, at this time, entirely independent of the grand prince of Novgorod whose supremacy was, in general, but an empty and powerless title. As Daniel was one of the nearest neighbors of André, and reigned over a desolate and impoverished realm, the Grand Prince was disposed to bring him into subjection. But neither of the princes dared to march their armies without first appealing to their Mughal masters. Daniel sent an ambassador to the Mughal camp, but André went in person with his young and beautiful wife. The Khan sent his ambassador to Vladimir, there to summon before him the two princes and their friends, and to adjudge their cause. In the heat and bitterness of the debate, the two princes drew their swords and fell upon each other. Their followers joined in the melee, and a scene of tumult and blood ensued characteristic of those barbaric times the tartar guards rushed in and separated the combatants the tartar judge extorted rich presents from both of the appellants and settled the question by leaving it entirely unsettled ordering them to both go home they separated like two boys who have been found quarreling and who have been both soundly whipped for their pugnacity. In the autumn of the year 1303, an assembly of the Russian princes was convened at Pereslavle, to which Congress the imperious Khan sent his commands. It is my will, said the Tartar chief, that the principalities of Russia should henceforth enjoy tranquillity. I therefore command all the princes to put an end to their dissensions, and each one to contend himself with the possessions and the power he now has. Russia thus ceased to be even nominally a monarchy, unless we regard the Khan of Tartary as its sovereign. It was a conglomeration of principalities ruled by princes with irresponsible power 
but all paying tribute to a foreign despot, and obliged to obey his will whenever he saw fit to make that will known. Still there continued incessant tempests of civil war, violent but of brief duration, to which the Khan paid no attention, he deeming it beneath his dignity to intermeddle with such petty conflicts. André died on 27th July, 1304, execrated by his contemporaries, and he had been consigned to infamy by posterity. As he approached the spirit land, he was tortured with the dread of the scenes which he might encounter there. His crimes had condemned thousands to death and other thousands to live long woe. He sought by priestcraft and penance and monastic vows and garments of sackcloth to efface the stains of a soul crimsoned with crime. He died, and his guilty spirit passed away to meet God in judgment. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of the Empire of Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Empire of Russia from the remotest periods to the present time. By John Stephen Cabot Abbott. Chapter 8 Resurrection of the Russian Monarchy from 1304 to 1380. Defeat of Georges and the Tartars. Indignation of the Khan. Michel summoned to the Horde. His trial and execution. Assassination of Georges. Execution of Dmitri repulse and death of the ambassador of the khan vengeance of the khan increasing prosperity of russia the great plague supremacy of simon anarchy in the horde plague and conflagration the tartars repulsed reconquest of bulgaria the great battle of kulikov utter rout of the tartars the tartars now fierce mohammedans began to oppress severely particularly in cave the christians the metropolitan bishop of this ancient city with the whole body of the clergy pursued by persecution fled to vladimir and the others of the christians of cave were scattered over the kingdom the death of andre was as fatal to russia as had been his reign Two rival princes, Michel of Tver and Georges of Moscow, grasped at the shadow of a scepter which had fallen from his hands. In consequence, war and anarchy for a long time prevailed. At length, Michel, having appealed to the Tartars and gained their support, ascended the frail throne. But a fierce war now raged between Novgorod and Moscow. In the prosecution of this war, Georges obtained some advantage which led Michel to appeal to the Khan. The Prince of Moscow was immediately summoned to appear in the presence of the Tartar chieftain. By the most ignoble fawning and promises of plunder, Georges obtained the support of the Khan, and returning with a Tartar horde, cruelly devastated the principality of his foe. Michel and all his subjects, roused to the highest pitch of indignation, marched to meet the enemy. The two armies encountered each other a few leagues from Moscow. The followers of Michel, fighting with the energies of despair, were unexpectedly successful, and Georges, with his Russian and Tartar troops, was thoroughly defeated. Kavgadi, the leader of the tartar allies of georges was taken prisoner michel 
appalled by the thought of vengeance he might anticipate from the great khan whose power he had thus ventured to defy treated his captive kavgadi with the highest consideration and immediately set him at liberty loaded with presents georges accompanied by kavgadi repaired promptly to the court of the khan uzbek who was then encamped with a numerous army upon the shores of the caspian sea soon an ambassador of the khan arrived at vladimir and informed michel that uzbek was exasperated against him to the highest degree hasten said he to the court of the great khan or within a month you will see your provinces inundated by his troops think of your peril when kamgadi has informed uzbek that you have dared to resist his authority terrified by these words the nobles of michel entreated him not to place himself in the power of the khan but to allow some one of them to visit the horde as it was then called in his stead and endeavor to appease the wrath of the monarch no replied the high-minded prince uzbek demands my presence not yours far be it from me by my disobedience to expose my country to ruin if i resist the commands of the khan my country will be doomed to new woes thousands of christians will perish the victims of his fury it is impossible for us to repel the forces of the tartars what other asylum is there then for me but death is it not better for me to die if i may thus save the lives of my faithful subjects he made his will divided his estates among his sons and entreating them ever to be faithful to the dictates of virtue bade them an eternal adieu michel encountered the khan near the mouth of the don as it enters the sea of azov uzbek was on a magnificent hunting excursion accompanied by his chieftains and his army for six weeks he did not deign to pay any attention to the russian prince not even condescending to order him to be guarded the rich presents michel had brought in token of homage were neither received nor rejected but were merely disregarded as of no moment whatever at length one morning suddenly as if recollecting something which had been forgotten uzbek ordered his lords to summon michel before them and adjudge his cause a tent was spread as a tribunal of justice near the tent of the khan and the unhappy prince bound with cords was led before his judges he was accused of the unpardonable crime of having drawn his sword against the soldiers of the khan no justification could be offered michel was cruelly fettered with chains and thrown into a dungeon an enormous collar of iron was riveted around his neck uzbek then set out for the chase on an expedition which was to last for one or two months the annals of the time describe this expedition with great particularity presenting a scene of pomp almost surpassing credence some allowance must doubtless be made for exaggeration and yet there is a minuteness of detail which accompanied by corroborative evidence of the populousness and the power of these tartar tribes invests the narrative with a good degree of authenticity we are informed that several hundreds of thousands of men were in movement that each soldier was clothed in rich uniform and mounted upon a beautiful horse that merchants transported in innumerable chariots the most precious fabrics of greece and of the indies and that luxury and gaiety reigned throughout the immense camp which in the midst of savage deserts presented the aspects of brilliance and populous cities michel who was awaiting his sentence from uzbek was dragged loaded with chains in the train of the horde georges was in high favor with the khan and was importunately 
urging the condemnation of his rival with a wonderful fortitude the prince endured his humiliation and tortures the nobles who had accompanied him were plunged into inconsolable grief michel endeavored to solace them he manifested through the whole of this terrible trial the spirit of the christian passing whole nights in prayer and enchanting the psalms of david as his hands were bound one of his pages held the sacred book before him his faithful followers urged him to take advantage of the confusion and tumult of the camp to effect his escape never exclaimed michel will i degrade myself by flight moreover should i escape that would save me only not my country god's will be done the horde was now encamped among the mountains of circassia it was the twenty second of november thirteen nineteen when just after morning prayers which were conducted by an abbey and two priests who accompanied the russian prince michel was informed that uzbek had sentenced him to death he immediately called his young son constantine a lad twelve years of age into his presence and gave him his last directions to his wife and children say to them enjoined this christian prince that i go down into the tomb cherishing for them the most ardent affection i recommend to their care the generous nobles the faithful servants who have manifested so much zeal for their sovereign both when he was upon the throne and when in chains these thoughts of home overwhelmed him and for a moment losing his fortitude he burst into tears causing the bible to be opened to the psalm of david which in all ages have been the great foundation of consolation to the afflicted he read from the fifty-sixth psalm fifth verse fearfulness and trembling are come upon me and horror hath overwhelmed me prince said the abbey in the same psalm with which you are so familiar are the words cast thy burden upon the lord and he shall sustain thee he shall never suffer the righteous to be moved michel simply replied by quoting again from the same inspired page oh that i had wings like a dove for then would i fly away and be at rest at that moment one of the pages entered the tent pale and trembling and informed that a great crowd of people were approaching i know why they are coming said the prince and he immediately sent his young son away on a message that the child might not witness the cruel execution of his father two brawny barbarians entered the tent as the prince was fervently praying they smote him down with clubs trampled him beneath their feet and then plunged a poniard into his heart the crowd which had followed the executioners according to their custom rushed into the royal tent for pillage the gory body was left in the hands of the russian nobles they enveloped the remains in precious clothes and bore them with affectionate care back to moscow georges now confirmed in the dignity of grand prince by the khan returned to vladimir where he established his government sending his brother to novgorod to reign over that principality in his name dmitri and others of the sons of michel for several years waged implacable warfare against georges with but little success the khan however did not deign to interfere in a strife which caused him no trouble but in the year thirteen twenty five georges again went to the horde on the eastern banks of the caspian at the same time dmitri appeared in the encampment meeting georges accidentally whom he justly regarded as the murderer of his father he drew his sword and plunged it to the hilt in the heart of the grand prince the khan accustomed to such deeds of violence was not disposed to punish the son who had thus avenged the death of his father but the friends of georges so importunately 
urged that to pardon such a crime would be an ineffaceable stain upon his honor, would be an indication of weakness, and would encourage the Russian princes in the commission of other outrages that after the lapse of ten months, during which time Dmitri had been detained a captive, Uzbek ordered his execution, and the unfortunate prince was beheaded. Dmitri was then but twenty-seven years of age, and yet Uzbek seemed to have had some regard for the cause of the young prince, for he immediately appointed Alexander, a brother of Dmitri and son of Michel, to succeed Georgis in the Grand Principality. The Novgorodans promptly received him as their ruler. Affairs war in this state when, at the close of the summer of 1327, an ambassador of Uzbek appeared with a band of Tartars and entered the royal city of Tver, which was the residence of Alexander. The principality of Tver was spread along the headwaters of the Volga just north of the principality of Moscow. The report spread through the city that the Mughal ambassador Shkevkal, who was a zealous Mohammedan, had to come to convert the Russians to Mohammedanism, that he intended the death of Alexander, to ascend the throne himself, and to distribute the cities of the principality to his followers. The Tverians, in a paroxysm of terror and despair, rallied for the support of their prince and their religion in a terrible tumult all the inhabitants rose and precipitated themselves upon the ambassador and his valiant bodyguard from morning until night the battle raged in the streets of tver the tartars overpowered by numbers and greatly weakened by losses during the day took refuge in a palace the citizens set the palace on fire and every tartar perished either consumed by the flames or cut down by the russians when uzbek heard of this event he was at first stupefied by the audacity of the deed he imagined that all russia was in the conspiracy and that there was to be a general rising to throw off the tartar yoke still uzbek with his characteristic sagacity decided to employ the Russians to subdue the Russians. He at once deposed and outlawed Alexander and declared Jean Danilovich of Moscow to be Grand Prince, who promised the most obsequious obedience to his wishes. At the same time, he sent an army of 50,000 Tartars to cooperate with the Russian army which Jean Danilovitch was commanded to put in motion for the invasion of the principality of Tver. It was in vain to think of resistance, and Alexander fled. The invading army, with an awful devastation, ravaged the principality. Multitudes were slain, others were dragged into captivity. The smoking ruins of the cities and villages of Tver became the monument of the wrath of the khan alexander pursued by the implacable wrath of uzbek was finally taken and beheaded but few particulars are known respecting the condition of southern russia at this time the principalities were under the government of princes who were all tributary to the Tartars, and yet these princes were incessantly quarrelling with one another and the whole country was the scene of violence and blood the energies of the tartar horde were now engrossed by internal dissensions and oriental wars and for many years the conquerors still drawing their annual tribute from the country but in no other way interfering with its concerns devoted all their energies to conspiracies and bloody battles among themselves moscow now became the capital of the country and under the peaceful reign of john increased rapidly in wealth and splendor john acting professedly as the agent of uzbek extorted from many of the principalities double tribute one half of which he furtively appropriated to the increase of the wealth 
splendor and power of his own dominions his reign was on the whole one of the most prosperous russia had enjoyed for ages agriculture and commerce flourished the volga was covered with boats conveying to the caspian the furs and manufactures of the north and laden on their return with spices and fabrics of the indies on the thirty first of march thirteen forty jean died as he felt the approach of death his spirit was overawed by the realities of the eternal world laying aside his regal robes he assumed the dress of a monk and entered a monastery devoted his last days zealously to prayer his end was peace immediately after his death there were several princes who were ambitious of grasping the sceptre which he had dropped and as uzbek alone could settle that question there was a general rush to the horde simeon the eldest son of jean and his brothers were among the foremost who presented themselves in the tent of the all-powerful khan simeon eloquently urged the fidelity with which his father had always served the mogul prince and he promised in his turn to do everything in his power to merit the favor of the khan so successfully did he prosecute his suit that the khan declared him to be grand prince and commanded all his rivals to obey him as their chief the manners of the barbarian moguls had for some time been assuming a marked change they emerged from their native wilds as fierce and untamed as wolves the herds of the cattle they drove along with them supplied them with food and the skins of these animals supplied them with clothing and with tents their home was wherever they happened to be encamped but having reached the banks of the black sea and the fertile valleys of the volga and the don they became acquainted with the luxuries of europe and of the more civilized portions of asia commerce enriched them large cities were erected embellished by the genius of grecian and italian architects life became more desirable and the wealthy chieftains indulging in luxury were less eager to encounter the exposure of and perils of battle the love of wealth now became with them a ruling passion for gold they would grant any favors the golden promises of simeon completely won the heart of uzbek and the young prince returned to moscow flushed with success he assumed such airs of superiority and of power as secured for him the title of the superb he caused himself to be crowned king with much religious pomp in the cathedral of vladimir novgorod manifested some resistance to his assumptions he instantly invaded the principality hewed down all opposition and punished his opponents with such severity that there was a simultaneous cry for mercy rapidly he extended his power and the fragmentary principalities of russia began again to assume the aspect of concentration and adhesion ere two years had elapsed uzbek the khan died this remarkable man had been for some time the friend and ally of pope benoit the twelfth who had hoped to convert him to christian religion the khan had even allowed the pope to introduce christianity to the tartar territories bordering on the black sea chanebek the oldest son of uzbek upon the death of his father assassinated his brothers and thus attained the supreme authority he was a zealous mohammedan and commenced his reign by commanding all the princes of the principalities of russia to hasten to the horde and prostrate themselves in token of homage before his throne the least delay would subject the offender to confiscation and death simeon was one of the first to do homage to the new khan 
he was received with great favor and dismissed confirmed in all his privileges in the year thirteen forty six one of the most desolating plagues recorded in history commenced its ravages in china and swept over all asia and nearly all europe the disease is recorded in the ancient annals under the name of black death thirteen million of the population were in the course of a few months swept into the grave entire cities were depopulated and the dead by thousands laid unburied the pestilence swept with terrible fury the encampments of the tartars and weakened that despotic power beyond all recovery but one-third of the population of the principalities of pskov and of novgorod were left living at london fifty thousand were interred in a single cemetery the disease commenced with swellings on the fleshy parts of the body a violent spitting of blood ensued which was followed by death the second or third day it is impossible according to the ancient annalists to imagine a spectacle so terrible young and old fathers and children were buried in the same grave entire families disappeared in a day each curate found every morning thirty dead bodies often more in his church greedy men at first offered their services to the dying hoping to obtain their estates but when it was found that the disease was communicated by touch even the most wealthy could obtain no aid the son fled from the father the brother avoided the brother still there were not a few examples of the most generous and self-sacrificing devotion medical skill was of no avail whatever and the churches were thronged with the multitudes who in the midst of the dying and the dead were crying to god for aid multitudes in their terror bequeathed all their property to the church and sought refuge in the monasteries in truth it appeared as if heaven had pronounced the sentence of immediate death upon the whole human family five times during his short reign simeon was compelled to repair to the horde to remove suspicions and appease displeasure he at length so far ingratiated himself into favor with the khan that the tartar sovereign conferred upon him the title of grand prince of all the russias the death of simeon in the year thirteen fifty three caused a general rush of princes of the several principalities to the tartar horde each emulous of being appointed his successor chanabek the khan after suitable deliberation conferred the dignity upon jean ivanovitch of moscow his reign of six years was disturbed by a multiplicity of intestine feuds but no events occurred worthy of record he died in thirteen fifty nine again the russian princes crowded to the horde as in every age office seekers have thronged to the court the khan after due deliberation conferred the investiture of the grand principality upon dmitri of suzdal though the appointment was received with great dissatisfaction by the other princesses but now the power of the tartars was rapidly on the decline assassination succeeded assassination one chieftain after another securing the assassination of his rival and with bloody hands ascending the mogul throne the swords of the mogul warriors were turned against each other as rival chieftains rallied their followers for attack or defence civil war raged among these fierce bands with most terrible ferocity famine and pestilence followed the ravages of the sword while the horde was in this state of distraction antagonistic khans began to court the aid of the russian princes and a successful tartar chieftain who had poignarded his rival and thus attained the throne deposed dmitri of suzdal and declared a young prince 
Dmitri of Moscow to be sovereign of Russia. But as the Khan, whose whole energies were required to retain his disputed throne, could send no army into Russia to enforce this decree, Dmitri of Suzdal paid but little attention to the paper edict. Immediately the Russian princes arrayed themselves on different sides. The conflict was short but decisive, and a victorious prince of Moscow was crowned as sovereign. The light of the resurrection morning was now dawning upon Russian monarchy. There were, fortunately, at this time, two rival khans beyond the waves of the Caspian opposing each other with bloody scimitars. The energetic young prince, by fortunate marriage and by the success of his arms, rapidly extended his authority. But again the awful plague swept Russia. The analysts of those days thus describe the symptoms and the character of the malady. One felt himself suddenly struck as by a knife plunged into the heart through the shoulder blades or between the two shoulders. An intense fire seemed to burn the entrails. Blood flowed freely from the throat. A violent perspiration ensued, followed by severe chills. Tumors gathered upon the neck, the hip, under the arms or behind the shoulder blades. The end was invariably the same. Death. Inevitable, speedy, but terrible. Out of a hundred persons, frequently not more than ten would be left alive. Moscow was almost depopulated. In Smolensk, but five individuals escaped, and they were compelled to abandon the city. The houses and the streets being encumbered with the putrefying bodies of the dead. Just before this disaster, Moscow suffered severely from a conflagration. The imperial palace and a large portion of the city were laid in ashes. The prince then resolved to construct a Kremlin of stone, and he laid the foundation of a gorgeous palace in the year 1367. Dmitri now began to bid defiance to the Tartars. Doubly weakened by the sweep of the pestilence and by internal discord, there were a few minor conflicts in which the Russians were victorious, and, elated by success, they began to rally for a united effort to shake off the degrading Mughal yoke. Three bands of the Tartars were encamped at the mouth of the Dnieper. The Russians descended the river in barges, assailed them with the valor with which their fathers had displayed, and drove the pagans in wild rout to the shores of the Sea of Azov. The Tartars, astounded at such unprecedented audacity, forgetting, for the time, their personal animosities, collected a large army and commenced a march upon Moscow. The Grand Prince dispatched his couriers in every direction to assemble the princes of the empire with all the soldiers they could bring into the field. Again the Tartars were repulsed. For many years the Tartars had been in possession of Bulgaria, an extensive region east of the Volga. In the year 1376, the Grand Prince, Dmitri, fitted out an expedition for the reconquest of that country. The Russian arms were signally successful. The Tartars, beaten on all hands, their cities burned, their boats destroyed, were compelled to submit to the conqueror. A large sum of money was extorted from them to be distributed among the troops. They were forced to acknowledge themselves, in their turn, tributary to Russia, and to accept Russian magistrates for the government of their cities. Encouraged by this success, the Grand Prince made arrangements for other exploits. A border warfare ensued, which was continued for several years with alternating success and with great ferocity. Neither party spared age or sex and cities and villages were indiscriminately committed to the flames. Russia was soon alarmed by the rumor that Mamai, 
a tartar chieftain was approaching the frontiers of russia with one of the largest armies the moguls had ever raised this intelligence roused the russians to the highest pitch of energy to meet their foes in a decisive battle an immense force was soon assembled at moscow from all parts of the kingdom after having completed all his arrangements dmitri with his chief captains repaired to the church of the trinity to receive the benediction of the metropolitan bishop you will triumph said the venerable ecclesiastic but only after terrible carnage you will vanquish the enemy but your laurels will be sprinkled with the blood of a vast number of christian heroes the troops accompanied by the ecclesiastics who bore the banner of the cross passed out at the gate of the kremlin as the majestic host defiled from the city the grand prince passed the hours in the church of st michael kneeling upon the tomb of his ancestors fervently imploring the blessing of heaven animated by the strength which prayer ever gives he embraced his wife saying god will be our defender and then mounting his horse placed himself at the head of his army it was a beautiful summer's day calm serene and cloudless and the whole army was sanguine in the hope that god would smile upon their enterprise marching nearly south along the valley of the moskwa they reached in a few days the large city of kolomna a hundred miles distant on the banks of the oka here they were joined by several confederate princes with their contingents of troops swelling the army to one hundred and fifty thousand men seventy five thousand of these were cavalry superbly mounted never had russia even in her days of greatest splendor witnessed a more magnificent array mamai the tartar khan had assembled the horde in numbers which he deemed overwhelming on the waters of the don resolved not to await the eruption of the foe on the twentieth of august dmitri with his army crossed the oka and pressed forward towards the valley of the don they reached this stream on the sixth of september soon detachments of the advance guards of the two armies met and several skirmishes ensued dmitri assembled his generals in solemn conclave and saying to them the hour of god's judgment has sounded gave minute directions for the conflict aided by a dense fog which concealed their operations from the view of the enemy the army crossed the don the cavalry fording the stream while the infantry passed over by a hastily constructed bridge dmitri deployed his columns in a battle array upon the vast plain of kulikov a mound of earth was thrown up that dmitri upon its summit might overlook the whole plain as the russian prince stood upon this pyramid and contemplated his army there was spread before him such a spectacle as mortal eyes have seldom seen a hundred and fifty thousand men were marshalled on the plain it was the morning of the eighth of september thirteen eighty thousands of banners fluttered in the breeze the polished armor of the cavaliers sarahs spears and helmet glittered in the rays of the sun seventy five thousand steeds gorgeously caparisoned were neighing and prancing over the verdant savanna the soldiers according to their custom shouted the prayer which rose like the roar of many waters great god grant to our sovereign the victory the whole sublime scene moved the soul of dmitri to its profoundest depths and as he reflected that in the few hours perhaps the greater portion of that multitude might lie dead upon the field tears gushed from his eyes and kneeling upon the summit of the mound in the presence of the whole army he extended his hands towards heaven in a fervent prayer that god would protect russia and christianity from the heel of the infidel 
then mounting his horse he rode along the ranks exclaiming my brothers dearly beloved my faithful companions in arms by your exploits this day you will live forever in the memory of men and those of you who fall will find beyond the tomb the crown of martyrs the tartar host approached upon the boundless plain slowly and cautiously but in numbers even exceeding those of the russians notwithstanding the most earnest remonstrances of his generals dmitri led the charge exposing himself to every peril which the humblest soldier was called to meet it is not in me said he to seek a place of safety while crying out to you my brothers let us die for our country my actions shall correspond with my words i am your chief i will be your guide i will go in advance and if i die it is for you to avenge me again ascending the mound the king with a loud voice read the forty-sixth psalm god is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble therefore will not we fear though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea the battle was immediately commenced with ferocity on both sides which has probably never been surpassed for three hours the two armies were blended in a hand-to-hand -hand fight spreading over a space seven miles in length blood flowed in torrents and the sod was covered with the slain here the russians were victorious and the tartars fled before them there the tartars with frenzied shouts chased the russians in awful rout over the plain dmitri had stationed a strong reserve behind a forest when both parties were utterly exhausted suddenly this reserve emerged from their retreat and rushed upon the foe vladimir the brother of dmitri led the charge the moguls surprised confounded overwhelmed and utterly routed in the wildest confusion and with outcries which rent the heavens turned and fled the god of the christians has conquered exclaimed the tartar chief gnashing his teeth in despair the tartars were hewed down by sabre strokes from unexhausted arms and trampled beneath the hoofs of the war-horse the entire camp of the horde with immense booty of tents chariots horses camels cattle and precious commodities of every kind fell into the hands of the captors the valorous prince vladimir the hero of the day returned to the field of battle which his cavalry had swept like a tornado and planting his banner upon a mound with signal trumpets summoned the whole victorious host to rally around it the princes the nobles from every part of the extended field gathered beneath its folds but to their consternation the grand prince dmitri was missing amidst the surging of the battle he had disappeared and was nowhere to be found end of chapter eight chapter nine of the empire of russia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada the empire of russia from the remotest periods to the present time by john stephen cabot abbott chapter nine dmitri vassili and the mogul tamerlane from thirteen eighty to fourteen sixty two recovery of dmitri new tartar invasion the assault and capture of moscow new subjugation of the russians lithuania embraces christianity escape of vassili from the horde death of dmitri tamerlane his origin and career 
his invasion of India. Defeat of Bajazet. Tamerlane invades Russia. Preparations for resistance. Sudden retreat of the Tartars. Death of Vasily. Ascension of Vasily Vasilovich. The disputed succession. Appeal to the Khan. Rebellion of Yuri. Cruelty of Vasily. The retribution. Where is my brother? exclaimed Vladimir. Where is he to whom we are indebted for all this glory? No one could give any information respecting Dmitri. In the tumult he had disappeared. Sadly the chieftains dispersed over the plain to search for him among the dead. After a long exploration, two soldiers found him in the midst of a heap of the slain. Stunned by a blow, he had fallen from his horse and was apparently lifeless. As with filial love they hung over his remains, bathing his bloody brow, he opened his eyes. Gradually he recovered consciousness, and as he saw the indications of triumph in the faces of his friends, heard the words of assurance that he had gained the victory, and witnessed the Russian banners all over the field, floating above the dead bodies of the Tartars. In a transport of joy he folded his hands upon his breast, closed his eyes, and breathed forth a fervent, grateful prayer to God. The princes stood silently and reverently by, as their sovereign thus returned thanks to heaven. Joy operated so effectually as a stimulus that the prince, who had been stunned but not seriously wounded, mounted his horse and rode over the hard-fought field. Though thousands of Russians were silent in death, the prince could count more than four times as many dead bodies of the enemy. According to the annals of the time, a hundred thousand Tartars were slain on that day. Couriers were immediately dispatched to all the principalities with the joyful tidings. The anxiety had been so great that, from the moment that the army passed the dawn, the churches had been thronged by day and by night, and incessant prayers had ascended to heaven for its success. No language can describe the enthusiasm which the glad tidings inspired. It was felt that henceforth the prosperity, the glory, the independence of Russia was secure forever, that the supremacy of the horde was annihilated, that the blood of the Christians shed upon the plains of Kulikov was the last sacrifice Russia was doomed to make. But in these anticipations, Russia was destined to be sadly disappointed. Mamai, the discomfited Tartar chieftain, overwhelmed with shame and rage, reached with the wreck of his army one of the great encampments of the Tartars on the banks of the Volga. A new Khan, the world-renowned Tamerlane, now swayed the scepter of Tartar power. Two years were devoted to immense preparation for the new invasion of Russia. Suddenly and unexpectedly, Dmitri was informed that the Tartars were approaching in strength unprecedented. Russia was unprepared for the attack, and terror congealed all hearts. The invaders, crossing the Volga and the Oka, pressed rapidly towards Moscow. Dmitri, deeming it in vain to attempt the defense of the capital, fled with his wife and children, two hundred miles north, to the fortress of Kostroma. A young prince, Ostier, was left in command of the city, with orders to hold it to the last extremity against the Tartars, and with the assurance that the king would return as speedily as possible with an army from Kostroma to his relief. The panic in the city was fearful, and the gates were crowded, day and night, by the women and children, the infirmed and the timid seeking safety in flight. Ostier made the most vigorous preparations for defense, while the king, with untiring energy, was accumulating an army of relief. The merchants and laborers from the neighboring villages and even the monks and priests crowded to Moscow. 
demanding arms for the defense of the metropolis from the battlements of the city the advance of the barbarians could be traced by the volumes of smoke which arose as from a furnace through the day and by flames which flashed along the horizon from the burning cities and villages through the night on the evening of the twenty third of august thirteen eighty two the tartars appeared before the gates of the city some of the chiefs rode slowly around the ramparts examining the ditch the walls the height of the towers and selected the most favorable spot for commencing the assault the tartars did not appear in such overwhelming numbers as report had taught the russians to expect and they felt quite sanguine that they should be able to defend the city but the ensuing morning dispelled all these hopes it then appeared that these tartars were but the advance guard of the great army with the earliest dawn as far as the eye could reach the inundation of warriors came rolling on and the terror vanquished all hearts this army was under the command of a tartar chieftain called Toktamonish. the assault was instantly commenced and continued without cessation four days and nights at length the city fell vanquished it is said by stratagem rather than by force the tartars clambering by means of ten thousand ladders over the walls and rushing through the gates with no ear for mercy commenced the slaughter of the inhabitants the city was set on fire in all directions and a scene of horror ensued indescribable and unimaginable the barbarians laden with booty and satiated with blood and carnage encamped on the plain outside the walls exulting in the entireness of their vengeance moscow the gorgeous capital was no more the dwellings of the city became but the funeral pyre for the bodies of the inhabitants the tartars intoxicated with blood dispersed over the whole principality and all its populous cities vladimir zverengorod yuriev mojaisk and dmitrov experienced the same fate with that of moscow the khan then retired crossing the oka at kolomna dmitri arrived with his army at moscow only to behold the ruins the enemy had already disappeared in the profoundest affliction he gave orders for the internment of the charred and blackened bodies of the dead eighty thousand by count were interred which number did not include the many who had been consumed entirely by the conflagration the walls of the city and the towers of the kremlin still remained with great energy the prince devoted himself to the rebuilding and the repeopling of the capital many years however passed away ere it regained even the shadow of its former splendor thus again russia brought under the sway of the tartars was compelled to pay tribute and dmitri was forced to send his own son to the horde where he was long detained as a hostage the grand duchy of lithuania bordering on poland was spread over a region of sixty thousand square miles the grand duke jack helen a burly pagan had married hedgewise queen of poland promising as one of the conditions of this marriage which would unite lithuania and poland to embrace christianity he was married and baptized at krakow receiving the christian name of ladislaus he then ordered the adoption of christianity throughout lithuania and the universal baptism of his subjects in order to facilitate the baptism of over a million at once the inhabitants were collected at several central points they were arranged in vast groups and were sprinkled with water which had been blessed by the priests as the formula of baptism was pronounced to one entire group the name of peter was given to another the name of paul to another that of john these converts were received 
not into the greek church which was dominant in russia but to the romish church which prevailed in poland jack helen became immediately the inveterate foe of the russians whom he called heretics for new proselytes are almost invariably inspired with fanatic zeal and he forbade the marriage of any of his catholic subjects with members of the russian church this event caused great grief to dmitri for he had relied upon the cooperation of the warlike lithuanians to aid him to repel the moguls affairs were in this condition when vasily the son of dmitri escaped from the horde after three years captivity and traversing poland and lithuania arrived safely at moscow dmitri was now forty years of age he was a man of colossal stature and of vigorous health his hair and beard were as black as the raven's wing and his ruddy cheek and piercing eye seemed to give promise of a long life but suddenly he was seized with a fatal disease and it was soon evident that death was near the intellect of the dying prince was unclouded and with much fortitude in a long interview he bade adieu to his wife and his children he designated his son vasily then but seventeen years of age as his successor and then after offering a touching prayer folded his hands across his breast in the form of a cross and died without a struggle the grief of the russians was profound and universal for ages they had not known a prince so illustrious or so devoted to the welfare of his country the young vasily had been but a few years on the throne when tamerlane himself advanced with countless hordes from the far orient crushing down all opposition and sweeping over prostrate nations like the pestilence which had preceded him and the whole track he followed tamerlane was the son of a petty mogul prince he was born in a season of anarchy and when the whole tartar horde was distracted with civil dissensions the impetuous young man had hardly begun to think ere he had formed the resolve to attain the supremacy over all the mogul tribes to conquer the whole known world and thus to render himself immortal in the annals of glory behind a curtain of mountains and protected by vast deserts his persuasive genius collected a large band of followers who with enthusiasm adopted his views and hailed him their chief after inuring them to fatigue and drilling them thoroughly in the exercises of battle he commenced his career the most signal victory followed his steps and he soon acquired the title of hero ambitious war-loving thousands crowded to his standards and he had but just attained the age of thirty-five when he was undisputed monarch of all the mogul tribes and the whole asiatic world trembled at the mention of his name he took his seat proudly upon the throne of genghis khan a crown of gold was placed upon his brow a royal girdle encircled his waist and in accordance with oriental usage his robes glittered with jewels and gold at his feet were his renowned chieftains kneeling around his throne in homage tamerlane then took an oath that by his future exploits he would justify the title he had already acquired and that all kings of the earth should lie prostrate before him and now commenced an incessant series of wars and victories ever crowned by the banners of tamerlane he was soon in possession of all the countries on the eastern shores of the caspian sea he then entered persia and conquered the whole realm between the oxus and the tigris baghdad until now the proud capital of the caliphs submitted to his sway soon the whole region of asia from the sea of aral to the persian gulf and from tiflis to the great arabian desert recognized the empire 
of tamerlane the conqueror then assembled his companions in arms and thus addressed them friends and fellow-soldiers fortune who recognizes me as her child invites us to new conquests the universe trembles at my name and the movement even of one of my fingers causes the earth to quake the realms of india are open to us woe to those who oppose my will i will annihilate them unless they acknowledge me as their lord with flying banners and pealing trumpets he crossed the indus and marched upon delhi which for three centuries had been governed by the mohammedan sultans no opposition could retard the sweep of his locust legions and the renowned city at once passed into his hands indulging in no delay the order was still onwards and the host soon bathed their dusty limbs in the waves of the ganges here he was informed that bajazet the grand seigneur of turkey was on a career of conquest which rivalled his own that he had overrun all of asia minor that crossing the hellespont he had subjugated serbia macedonia thessaly and that he was even besieging the imperial city of constantine the jealousy of tamerlane was thoroughly aroused he instantly turned upon his steps to seek this foe worthy of his arms dispatching to him the following defiant message learn wrote tamerlane to bajazet that the earth is covered with my warriors from sea to sea kings compose my bodyguard and range themselves as servants before my tent are you ignorant that the destiny of the universe is in my hands who are you a turcoman ant and dare you raise your head against an elephant if in the forest of natolia you have obtained some trivial success if the timid europeans have fled like cowards before you return thanks to mohammed for your success for it is not owing to your own valor listen to the counsels of wisdom be content with the heritage of your fathers and however small that heritage may be beware how you attempt in the slightest degree to extend its limits lest death be the penalty of your temerity to this insolent letter bajazet responded in terms equally defiant for a long time he wrote bajazet has burned with the desire to measure himself with tamerlane and he returns thank to the all-powerful that tamerlane now comes himself to present his head to the scimitar of bajazet the two conquerors gathered all their resources for the great and decisive battle tamerlane speedily reached aleppo which city after a bloody conflict he entered in triumph the tartar chieftain was an impostor and a hypocrite as well as a merciless butcher of his fellow-men he assembled the learned men of aleppo and assured them in most eloquent terms that he was the devoted friend of god and that the enemies who resisted his will were responsible to god for all the evils their obstinacy rendered it necessary for him to inflict before every conflict he fell upon his knees in the presence of the army in prayer after every victory he assembled his troops to return thanks to god there are some sad accounts to be settled at the judgment day in marching from aleppo to damascus tamerlane visited ostentatiously the pretended tomb of noah that upon the shrine of that patriarch so profoundly venerated by the mohammedans he might display his devotion damascus was pillaged of all its treasures which had been accumulating for ages and was then laid in ashes the two armies headed by their respective chieftains met in galassia near ancura it was the sixteenth of june fourteen o two 
The storm of war raged for a few hours, and the army of Bajazet was cut to pieces by superior numbers, and he himself was taken captive. Tamerlane treated his prisoner with the most condescending kindness, seated him by his side upon the imperial couch, and endeavored to solace him by philosophical disquisitions upon the mutability of all human affairs. The annals of the day do not sustain the rumor that Bajazet was confined in an iron cage. The empire of Tamerlane now extended from the Caspian and the Mediterranean to the Nile and the Ganges. He established his capital at Samarkand, some six hundred miles east of the Caspian Sea. To this central capital he returned after each of his expeditions, devoting immense treasures to the erection of mosques, the construction of gardens, the excavation of canals, and the erection of cities. And now, in the pride and plenitude of his power, he commenced his march upon Russia. His army, four hundred thousand strong, defiled from the gates of Samarkand, and marching to the north between the Aral and the Caspian Seas, traverse vast plains where thousands of wild cattle had long enjoyed undisturbed pasturage these cattle afforded them abundant food the chase in which they engaged on the magnificent scale offered a very brilliant spectacle thousands of horsemen spread out in an immense circle making the tent of the emperor the central point with trumpet blasts the clash of arms and the clouds of javelins and arrows the cattle and wild beasts of every kind were driven in upon the imperial tent where tamerlane and his lords amused themselves with their destruction the soldiers gathered round the food thus abundantly supplied innumerable fires were built and feasting and mirth closed the day vast herds of cattle were driven along for the ordinary supply of the troops affording all the nourishment which those rude barbarians required pressing forward in a long march which occupied several months tamerlane crossed the volga and entered the southeastern principalities of russia the tidings of the invasion spread rapidly and all russia was paralyzed with terror the grand prince vassili however strove with all his energies to rouse the russians to resistance an army was speedily collected and veteran leaders placed in command the russian troops were rapidly concentrated near kolomna on the banks of the oka to dispute the passage of the river all the churches of moscow and of russia were thronged with the terrified inhabitants imploring divine aid the clergy conducting the devotions by day and by night tamerlane crossing from the volga to the don ascended the valley of the latter stream spreading the most cruel devastation everywhere around him it was his design to confound his enemies with terror he was pressing on resistlessly towards moscow and had arrived within a few days march of the russian army on the banks of the oka when suddenly he stopped and remained fifteen days without moving from his encampment then for some cause which history has never satisfactorily explained he turned retraced his steps and his banners soon disappeared beyond the frontiers of the empire it was early in september when he commenced this retrograde march some have surmised that he feared the russians strongly posted on the banks of the oka others that he dreaded the approaching russian winter others that intelligence of some conspiracy in his distant realms arrested his steps and others that god in answer to prayer directly interposed and rescued russia from ruin the joy of the russians was almost delirious 
and no one thought even of pursuing a foe who without arriving within sight of the banners of the grand prince or without hearing the sound of his war trumpets had fled as in a panic the whole of the remaining reign of vassili was a scene of tumult and strife civil war agitated the principalities the lithuanians united with poland were incessant in their endeavors to extend the triumph of their arms over the russian provinces and the tartar hordes again swept russia with the most horrible devastation in the midst of calamities and lamentations vassili approached his grave he died on the twenty ninth of february fourteen twenty five in the fifty third year of his age and the thirty sixth year of his reign vassili vassilievich son of the deceased monarch was but ten years of age when the sceptre of russia passed into his hands yuri the eldest brother of the late king demanded the throne in accordance with the ancient custom of descent and denied the right of his brother to bequeath the crown to his son after much trouble both of the rival claimants consented to submit the question to the decision of the tartar khan to whom it appeared that russia still paid tribute vassili was to remain upon the throne until the question was decided six years passed away and yet no answer to the appeal had been obtained from the khan at length both agreed to visit the horde in person it was a perilous movement and vassili as yet but a boy sixteen years of age wept bitterly as he left the church where he had implored the prayers of the faithful and set out upon his journey all the powers of bribery and intrigue were employed by each party to obtain a favorable verdict a tribunal was appointed to adjudge the cause over which matchmet the khan presided vassili claimed the dominion on the ground of the new rule of descent adopted by the russian princes yuri pleaded the ancient custom of the empire the power which the tartar horde still exercised may be inferred from the humiliating speech which john a noble of moscow made on this occasion in advocacy of the cause of the young vassili approaching matchment and bowing profoundly before him he said sovereign king your humble slave conjures you to permit him to speak in behalf of his young prince yuri founds his claim upon the ancient institutions of russia vassili appeals only to your generous protection for he knows that russia is but one of the provinces of your vast domains you as its sovereign can dispose of the throne according to your pleasure condescend to reflect that the uncle demands the nephew supplicates what signify ancient or modern customs when all depends upon your royal will is it not that august will which has confirmed the testament of vassili dmitrievich by which his son was nominated as heir of the principality of moscow for six years vassili vassilievich has been upon the throne would you have allowed him thus to remain there had you not recognized him as the legitimate prince this base flattery accomplished its object vassili was pronounced grand prince and in accordance with tartar custom the uncle was compelled to hold the bridle while his successful rival at the door of the tent mounted his horse on their return to moscow vassili was crowned with great pomp in the church of notre dame yuri while at the horde dared not manifest the slightest opposition to the decision but having returned to his own country he murmured loudly rallied his friends excited disaffection and soon kindled the flames of civil war yuri soon marched with an army upon moscow took the city by storm and vassili who had displayed but little energy of character was made captive 
Yuri proclaimed himself Grand Prince, and Vasily in vain endeavored to move the compassion of his captor by tears. The uncle, however, so far had pity for his vanquished nephew as to appoint him to the governorship of the city of Kolomna. This seemed perfectly to satisfy the pusillanimous young man, and, after partaking of a splendid feast with his uncle, he departed, rejoicing from the capital where he had been enthroned, to the provincial city assigned to him. A curious result ensued. Yuri brought to Moscow his own friends, who were placed in the posts of honor and authority. Such general discontent was excited that the citizens, in crowds, abandoned Moscow and repaired to Kolomna, and rallied with the utmost enthusiasm around their ejected sovereign. The dwellings and the streets of Moscow became silent and deserted. Kolomna, on the contrary, was thronged. To use the expression of a Russian analyst, the people gathered round their prince as bees cluster around their queen. The tidings of the life, activity, and thriving business to be found at Kolomna lured ever-increasing numbers, and, in a few months, grass was growing in the streets of Moscow, while Kolomna had become the thronged metropolis of the principality. The nobles, with their armies, gathered round Vasily, and Yuri was so thoroughly abandoned that, convinced of the impossibility of maintaining his position, he sent word to his nephew that he yielded to him the capital, and immediately left for his native principality of Galich. The journey of Vasily from Kolomna to Moscow, a distance of two hundred miles, was a brilliant triumph. An immense crowd accompanied the Grand Prince the whole distance, raising incessant shouts of joy. But Yuri was by no means prepared to relinquish his claim, and soon the armies of the two rivals were struggling upon the field of battle. While the conflict was raging, Yuri suddenly died at the age of sixty years. One of the sons of Yuri made an attempt to regain the throne which his father had lost, but he failed in the attempt and was taken captive. Vasily, as cruel as he was pusillanimous, in vengeance plucked out the eyes of his cousin. Vasily, now seated peacefully upon his throne, exerted himself to keep on friendly relations with the horde by being prompt in the payment of the tribute which they exacted. In June, 1444, the Tartars, having taken some offense, again invaded Russia. Vasily had no force of character to resist them. Under his weak reign, the Grand Principality had lost all its vigor. The Tartars surprised the Russian army near Moscow, and overwhelming them with numbers, two to one, trampled them beneath their horses. Vasily fought fiercely, as sometimes even the most timid will fight, when hedged in by despair. An arrow pierced his hand, a sabre stroke cut off several of his fingers, a javelin pierced his shoulder, thirteen wounds covered his head and breast. When by the blow of a battle-axe he was struck to the ground and taken prisoner, the Tartars, elated with their signal victory, and fearful that all russia might rise for the rescue of its prince retreated rapidly carrying with them their captive and immense booty as they retired they plundered and burned every city and village on their way after a captivity of three months the prince was released upon paying a moderate ransom and returned to moscow still new sorrows awaited the prince he was doomed to experience that even in this world providence often rewards a man according to his deeds the brothers of the prince whose eyes vasily had caused to be plucked out formed a conspiracy against him and they were encouraged in this conspiracy by the detestation with which the grand prince was now generally regarded 
During the night of the 12th of February, 1446, the conspirators entered the Kremlin. Vasily, who attempted to compensate for his neglect of true religion by punctilious and ostentatious observance of ecclesiastical rites, was in the Church of the Trinity attending a midnight mass. Silently the conspirators surrounded the church with their troops. Vasily was prostrate upon the tomb of a Russian saint, apparently absorbed in devotion. Soon the alarm was given and the prince, in a paroxysm of terror, threw himself upon his knees and for once, at least in his life, prayed with sincerity and fervor. His pathetic cries to God for help caused many of the nobles around him to weep. The prince was immediately seized, no opposition being offered, and was confined in one of the palaces of Moscow. Four nights after his capture, some agents of the conspirators entered his apartment and tore out his eyes, as he had torn out the eyes of his cousin. He was then sent, with his wife, to a castle in a distant city, and his children were immured in a convent. Dmitri Chemyaka, the prime mover of this conspiracy, now assumed the reins of government. Gradually the Grand Principality had lost its power over the other principalities of the empire, and Russia was again, virtually, a conglomeration of independent states. Public opinion now turned so sternly against Chemyaka and such bitter murmurs rose around his throne for the cruelty he had practiced upon Vasily, that he felt constrained to liberate the prince and to assign him a residence of splendor upon the shores of Lake Kuben. Chimyaka, thus constrained to set the body of his captive free, wished to enchain his soul by the most solemn oaths. With all his court he visited Vasily, the blinded prince, with characteristic duplicity, expressed heartfelt penitence in view of his past course, and took the most solemn oath never to attempt to disturb the reign of his conqueror. Vasily received the city of Vologda in Appanage, to which he retired with his family and with the nobles and bishops who still adhered to him. But a few months had passed ere he, with his friends, had enlisted the cooperation of many princes, and especially of the Tartar horde, and was on the march with a strong army to drive Chemyaka from Moscow. Chemyaka, utterly discomfited, fled, and Moscow fell easily into the hands of Vasily the Blind. Anguish of body and of soul seemed now to have changed the nature of Vasily and with energy, disinterestedness, and wisdom undeveloped before, he consecrated himself to the welfare of his country. He associated with himself his young son Ivan, who subsequently attained the title of the great. But Chimyaka, writes Karamisin, still lived, and in his heart, ferocious, implacable, sought new means of vengeance. His death seemed necessary for the safety of the state, and someone gave him poison, of which he died the next day. The author of an action so contrary to religion, to the principles of morality and of honor, remains unknown. A lawyer named Beda, who conveyed the news of his death to Moscow, was elevated to the rank of secretary by the Grand Prince, who exhibited on that occasion an indiscreet joy. On the 14th of March, 1462, Vasily terminated his eventful and tumultuous life at the age of 47. His reign was during one of the darkest periods in the Russian annals. Life to him and to his contemporaries was but a pitiless tempest through which hardly one ray of sunshine penetrated. It was under his reign that the horrible punishment of the knout was introduced into Moscow, a barbaric mode of scourging unknown to the ancient Russians. Firearms were also beginning to be introduced, which weapons have diminished rather than increased the carnage of the fields of battle. End of chapter 9
Chapter 10 of the Empire of Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time by John Stephen Cabot Abbott. Chapter 10. The Illustrious Ivan the Third, from 1462 to 1480. Ivan the Third, His Precocity and Rising Power. The Three Great Hordes. Russian Expedition Against Kazan. Defeat of the Tartars. Capture of Constantinople by the Turks. The Princess Sophia. Her journey to Russia. And marriage with Ivan the Third. Increasing renown of Russia. New difficulty with the Horde. The Tartars invade Russia. Strife on the banks of the Oka. Letter of the Metropolitan Bishop. Unprecedented panic. Liberation of Russia. In the middle of the 15th century, Constantinople was to Russia what Paris, in the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, was to modern Europe. The imperial city of Constantine was the central point of ecclesiastical magnificence, of courtly splendor, of taste, of all intellectual culture. To the Greeks, the Russians were indebted for their religion their civilization, and their social culture. Ivan the Third, who had for some time been associated with his father in the government, was now recognized as the undisputed prince of the Grand Principality, though his sway over the other provinces of Russia was very feeble and very obscurely defined. At twelve years of age, Ivan was married to Maria, a princess of Tver, at eighteen years of age he was the father of a son to whom he gave his own name. When he had attained the age of twenty-two years, his father died, and reins of government passed entirely into his hands. From his earliest years he gave indications of a character of much more than ordinary judgment and maturity. Upon his ascension to the throne, he not only declined making any appeal to the Khan for ratification of his authority, but refused to pay the tribute which the Horde had so long extorted. The result was that the Tartars were speedily rallying their forces with vows of vengeance, but on the march, fortunately for Russia, they fell into a dispute among themselves and exhausted their energies in mutual slaughter. According to Greek chronology, the world was then approaching the end of the 7,000th year since the creation, and the impression was universal that the end of the world was at hand. It is worthy of remark that this conviction seemed rather to increase recklessness and crime than to be promotive of virtue. But the years glided on, and gradually the impression faded away. Ivan, with extraordinary energy and sagacity, devoted himself to the consolidation of the Russian Empire and the development of all its sources of wealth. The refractory princes he assailed one by one, and, favored by a peculiar combination of circumstances, succeeded in chastising them into obedience. The great Mughal power was essentially concentrated in three immense hordes. All these three combined when there was work of national importance to be achieved. The largest of the hordes, and the most eastern, spread over a region of undefined extent, some hundreds of miles east of the Caspian Sea. The most western occupied a large territory upon the Volga and the Kama, called Kazan. From this, their encampment, where they had already erected many flourishing cities, 
enriched by commerce with India and Greece, they were continually ravaging the frontiers of Russia, often penetrating the country three or four hundred miles, laying the largest cities in ashes, and then retiring laden with plunder and prisoners. This encampment of the horde was but five hundred miles east of Moscow but much of the country directly intervening was an uninhabited waste, so great was the terror which the barbarians inspired. Ivan resolved to take Kazan from the horde. It was the boldest resolve which any Russian prince had conceived for ages. All the mechanics in the great cities which lined the banks of the upper Volga and the Oka were employed in constructing barges, which were armed with the most approved instruments of war. The enthusiasm of Russia was roused to the highest pitch by this naval expedition, which presented a spectacle as novel as it was magnificent and exciting. War has its pageantry as well as its woe. The two flotillas, with fluttering pennants and resounding music, and crowded with gaily dressed and sanguine warriors, floated down the streams until they met at the confluence of these rivers, near Nizhny Novgorod. Here the two fleets, covering the Volga for many leagues, were united. Spreading their sails, they passed rapidly down the river about two hundred miles until they arrived at Kazan, the capital of the Horde. Deeming their enterprise a religious one, in which the cross of Christ was to be planted against the banners of the infidel, they all partook of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and engaged in the most earnest exercises of devotion, the evening before they reached their place of landing. In those days, intelligence was only transmitted by means of couriers, at vast expense, and either accompanied by an army or by a strong bodyguard. The Mughals had no suspicion of the tempest which was about to break over their heads. On the 21st of May, 1469, before the dawn of the morning, the Russians leaped upon the shore near Kazan, the capital, and with trumpets, blasts, and appalling cries, rushed upon the sleeping inhabitants. Without resistance they penetrated the streets. The Russians, in war, were as barbaric as the Tartars. The city was set on fire, indiscriminate slaughter ensued, and an awful vengeance was taken for the woes which the Horde had for ages inflicted upon Russia. But few escaped. Those who fell not by the sword perished in the flames. Many Russian prisoners were found in the city who had been in slavery for years. Thus far, success, exceeding the most sanguine anticipations, had accompanied the enterprise. The victorious Russians, burdened with the plunder of the city, re-embarked and, descending the river some distance, landed upon an island which presented every attraction for a party of pleasure, and there they passed a week in rest, in feasting and in all festive joys. Ibrahim, prince of the Horde, escaped the general carnage, and in a few days rallied such a force of cavalry as to make a fierce assault upon the invaders. The strife continued from morning until night without any decisive results, when both parties were glad to seek repose, with the Volga flowing between them. The next morning neither were willing to renew the combat. Ibrahim soon had a flotilla upon the Volga nearly equal to that of the Russians. The war now raged, embittered by every passion which can goad the soul of man to madness. One of the Russian princes, a man of astonishing nerve and agility, in one of these conflicts sprang into a tartar boat, smiting with his war club upon the right hand and the left, and leaping from boat to boat of the foe, warded off every blow striking down multitudes, until he finally returned in safety to his own flotilla. 
cheered by the hussars of his troops. The moguls were punished, not subdued, but this punishment, so unexpected and severe, was quite a new experience for them. The Russian troops, elated with their success, returned to Nizhny Novgorod. In the autumn, Ivan the Third sent another army under the command of his two brothers, Yuri and Andre, to cooperate with the troops in Nizhny Novgorod in a new expedition. This army left Moscow in two divisions, one of which marched across the country and the other descended the Volga in barges. Ibrahim had made every effort in his power to prepare to repel the invasion. A decisive battle was fought. The Mughals, completely vanquished, were compelled to accept such terms as the conqueror condescended to grant. This victory attracted the attention of Europe, and the great monarchies of the southern portion of the continent began to regard Russia as an infant power which might yet rise to importance. Another event at this time occurred which brought Russia still more prominently into the view of the nations of the south. In the year 1467, the Grand Prince, with tears of anguish, buried his young and beautiful spouse. Five years of widowhood had passed away. The Turks had overrun Asia Minor, and, crossing the Hellespont under Mohammed II, with bloody scimitar, had taken Constantinople by storm. Cutting down 60,000 of its inhabitants, and bringing all Greece under the Turkish sway. The Mohammedan placed his heel upon the head of the Christian, and Constantinople became the capital of Muslim power. This was in the year 1472. Constantine Paleologue was the last of the Grecian emperors. One of his brothers, Thomas, escaping from the ruins of his country, fled to Rome, where, in consideration of his illustrious rank and lineage, he received a large monthly stipend from the Pope. Thomas had a daughter, Sophia, a princess of rare beauty and richly endowed with all mental graces and attractions. The Pope sought a spouse worthy of this princess, who was the descendant of a long line of emperors. Mohammed II, having overrun all Greece, flushed with victory, was collecting his forces for the invasion of the Italian peninsula, and his vaunt that he would feed his horse from the altar of St. Peter's had thrilled the ear of Catholic Europe. The Pope, Paul II, anxious to rouse all the Christian powers against the Turks, wished to make the marriage of the Grecian princes promotive of his political views. Her beauty, her genius, and her exalted birth rendered her a rare prize. Rumors had reached Rome of the vast population and extraordinary wealth of Russia. Nearly all the great Russian rivers emptied into the Black Sea, and along these channels the Russian flotillas could easily descend upon the conquerors of Constantinople. Russia was united with Greece by the ties of the same religion, and the recent victory over the Tartars had given the Grand Prince great renown. These considerations influenced the Pope to send an ambassador to Moscow, proposing to Ivan the Third the hand of Sophia. To increase the apparent value of the offer, the ambassador was authorized to state that the princess had refused the hand of the King of France and also of the Duke of Milan, she being unwilling, as a member of the Greek Church, to ally herself with a prince of the Latin religion. Nothing could have been more attractive to Ivan the Third and his nobles than this alliance. God himself, exclaimed a bishop, must have conferred the gift. She is a shoot from the imperial tree which formerly overspread all orthodox Christians. 
This alliance will make Moscow another Constantinople and will confer upon our sovereign the rights of the Grecian emperors. The Grand Prince, not deeming it decorous to appear too eager and yet solicitous, lest he might lose the prize, sent an ambassador with a numerous suite to Rome with a letter to the Pope and to report more particularly respecting the princess, not forgetting to bring him her portrait. This embassage was speedily followed by another, authorized to complete the arrangements. The ambassadors were received with signal honors by Sectus IV, who had just succeeded Paul II, and at length it was solemnly announced in a full conclave of cardinals on the 22nd of May, 1472, that the Russian prince wished to espouse Sophia. Some of the cardinals objected to the orthodoxy of Ivan the Third, but the Pope replied that it was by condescension and kindness alone that they could hope to open the eyes of one spiritually blind, a sentiment which is to be regretted that the court of Rome and also all other communions have too often ignored. On the 1st of June, the princess was sacredly affianced in the church of St. Peter's to the prince of Moscow. The ambassadors of Ivan the Third, assuring the Pope of the zeal of their monarch for the happy reunion of the Greek and Latin churches. The Pope conferred a very rich dowry upon Sophia and sent his legate to accompany her to Russia attended by a splendid suite of the most illustrious Romans. The affianced princess had a special court of her own, with its functionaries of every grade and its established etiquette. A large number of Greeks followed her to Moscow, hoping to find in that distant capital a second country. Directions were given by the Pope that, in every city through which she should pass, the princess should receive the honors due to her rank, and that, especially throughout Italy and Germany, she should be furnished with entertainment, relays of horses and guides, until she should arrive at the frontiers of Russia. Sophia left Rome on the 24th of August, and after a rapid journey of six days, arrived on the 1st of September at Lubeck on the extreme southern shore of the Baltic. Here she remained ten days, and on the 10th of September embarked in a ship expressly and gorgeously equipped for her accommodation. A sail of 800 miles along the Baltic Sea, which occupied 20 days and conveyed the princess to Revel, near the mouth of the Gulf of Finland. Arriving at this city on the 30th of September, she remained there for rest ten days, during which time she was regaled with the utmost magnificence by the authorities of the place. Couriers had been immediately dispatched by the way of Novgorod to Moscow to inform the prince of her arrival. Her journey from Revel to Lake Chowd presented a continuous triumphal show. On the 11th of October, she reached the shores of the lake. A flotilla of barges, decorated with garlands and pennants, here awaited her. A pleasant sail of two days conveyed her across the lake. Immediately upon landing at Skau, she repaired, with all her retinue, to the church of Notre Dame to give thanks to heaven for the prosperity which had thus far attended her journey. From the church she was conducted to the palace of the prince of that province, where she received from the nobles many precious gifts. After a five days sojourn at Skau, she left the city to continue her journey. Upon taking her departure, she aroused the enthusiasm of the citizens by the following words. I must hasten to present myself before your prince, who is soon to be mine. 
I thank the magistrates, the nobles, and the citizens generally for the receptions which they have given me, and I promise never to neglect to plead the cause of Skow at the court of Moscow. At Novgorod she was again entertained with all the splendor which Russian opulence and art could display. The Russian winter had already commenced, and the princess entered Moscow in a sledge on the 12th of November. An innumerable crowd accompanied her. She was welcomed at the gates of the city by the metropolitan bishop, who conducted her to the church, where she received his benediction. She was then presented to the mother of the grand prince, who introduced her to her future spouse. Immediately the marriage ceremony was performed with the most imposing pomp of the Greek church. This marriage contributed much in making Russia better known throughout Europe. In that age, far more than now, exalted birth was esteemed the greatest of earthly honors, and Sophia, the daughter of a long line of emperors, was followed by the eyes of every court in Europe to her distant destination. Moreover, many Greeks of high aesthetic and intellectual culture exiled from their country by the domination of the Turk, followed their princess to Russia. They, by their knowledge of the arts and sciences, rendered essential service to their adopted kingdom, which was just emerging from barbarism. They enriched the libraries by the books which they had rescued from the barbarism of the Turks, and contributed much to the eclat of the court of Moscow, by the introduction of the pompous ceremonies of the Grecian court. Indeed, from this date Moscow was often called a second Constantinople. The capital was rapidly embellished with palaces and churches constructed in the highest style of Grecian and Italian architecture. From Italy, also, mechanics were introduced, who established foundries for casting cannon and mints for the coinage of money. The prominent object in the mind of Ivan III was the consolidation of all the ancient principalities into one great empire, being firmly resolved to justify the title which he had assumed of sovereign of all the Russias. He wished to give new vigor to the monarchical power, to abolish the ancient system of almost independent appanages which was leading to incessant wars, and to wrest from the princes those prerogatives which limited the authority of the sovereign. This was a formidable undertaking, requiring great sagacity and firmness, but it would doubtless be promotive of the welfare of Russia to be under the sway of one general sovereign, rather than to be exposed to the despotism of a hundred petty and quarrelsome princes. Ivan the Third was anxious to accomplish this result without violating any treaty, without committing any arbitrary or violent act which could rouse opposition. That he might triumph over the princess, it was necessary for him to secure the affections of the people. The palace was consequently rendered easy of access to them all. Appointed days were consecrated to justice, and from morning until evening the grand prince listened to any complaints from his subjects. The old magistrates had generally forfeited all claim to esteem. Regarding only their own interests, they trafficked in offices, favored their relatives, persecuted their enemies, and surrounded themselves with crowds of parasites who stifled in the courts of justice all the complaints of the oppressed. Novgorod was first brought into entire subjection to the crown, then Skow. While affairs were moving thus prosperously in Russia, the horde upon the Volga was also recovering its energies, and the new Khan, Ahmet, war-loving and inflated by the success which his sword had already achieved, resolved to bring Russia again into subjection. 
he accordingly in the year fourteen eighty sent an embassy bearing an image of the khan as their credentials to moscow to demand the tribute which of old had been paid to the tartars ivan the third was in no mood to receive the insult patiently he admitted the embassage into the audience chamber of his palace his nobles in imposing array were gathered round prepared for a scene such as was not unusual in those barbaric times as soon as the ambassadors entered and were presented the image of the khan was dashed to the floor by the order of ivan and trampled under feet and all the mogul ambassadors with the exception of one were slain go said ivan sternly to him go to your master and tell him what you have seen tell him that if he has the insolence again to trouble my repose i will treat him as i have served his image and his ambassadors this emphatic declaration of war was followed on both sides by the mustering of armies the horde was soon in motion passing from the volga to the don in numbers which were represented to be as the sands of the sea they rapidly and resistlessly ascended the valley of this river marking their path by a swath of ruin many miles in width the grand prince took the command of the russian army in person and rendezvoused his troops at kaluga thence stationing them along the northern banks of the oka to dispute the passage of that stream all russia was in a state of feverish excitement one decisive battle would settle the question whether the invaders were to be driven in bloody rout out of the empire or whether the whole kingdom was to be surrendered to the devastation by savages as fierce and merciless as wolves about the middle of october the two armies met upon the opposite banks of the oka with only the waters of that narrow stream to separate them cannon and musket were then just coming into use but they were rude and feeble instruments compared with the power of such weapons at the present day swords arrows javelins clubs axes battering rams and catapults and the tramplings of horse were the engines of destruction which man then yielded most potently against his fellow man the quarrel was a very simple one some hundreds of thousands of moguls had marched to the heart of russia leaving behind them a path of flame and blood nearly a thousand miles in length that they might compel the russians to pay them tribute some hundred thousand russians had met them there to resist even to death their insolent and oppressive demand the tartars were far superior in numbers to the russians but ivan had made such a skilful disposition of his troops that ahmed could not cross the stream for nearly a week the two armies fought from the opposite banks throwing at each other bullets balls stones arrows and javelins a few were wounded and some slain in this impotent warfare the russians were however very faint-hearted it was evident that should the tartars affect the passage of the river the russians already demoralized by fear would be speedily overpowered the grand prince himself was so apprehensive as to the result that he sent one of his nobles with rich presents to the khan and proposed terms of peace ahmed rejected the presents and sent back the haughty reply i have come thus far to take vengeance upon ivan to punish him for neglecting for nine years to appear before me with tribute and in homage let him come penitently into my present and kiss my stirrup and then perhaps if my lords intercede for him i may forgive him as soon as it was heard in moscow that the grand prince was manifesting such timidity the clergy sent to him a letter urging the vigorous defense of their country and of their religion the letter was written by vassian 
the archbishop of moscow and was signed on behalf of the clergy by several of the higher ecclesiastics we have not space to introduce the whole of this noble epistle which is worthy of being held in perpetual remembrance the following extracts will show its spirits it was in the form of a letter from the archbishop to the king to which letter others of the clergy gave their assent it is our duty to announce the truth to kings and that which i have already spoken in the ear of your majesty i will now write to inspire you with new courage and energy when influenced by the prayers and the counsels of your bishop you left moscow for the army with the firm intention of attacking the enemy of the christians we prostrate ourselves day and night before god pleading with him to grant the victory to our armies nevertheless we learn that at the approach of akhmet of that ferocious warrior who has already caused thousands of christians to perish and who menaces your throne and your country you tremble before him you implore peace of him and send to him ambassadors while that impious warrior breathes only vengeance and despises your prayer ah oh, grand prince to what counsellors have you lent your ear what men unworthy of the name of christian have given you such advice will you throw away your arms and shamefully take to flight but reflect from what a height of grandeur your majesty will descend to what a depth of humiliation you will fall are you willing o prince to surrender russia to fire and blood your churches to pillage your subjects to the sword of the enemy what heart is so insensible as not to be overwhelmed by the thought even of such a calamity no we will trust in the all-powerful god no you will not abandon us you will blush at the name of a fugitive of being the betrayer of your country lay aside all fear redouble your confidence in god then one shall chase a thousand and two shall put ten thousand to flight there is no god like ours do you say that the oath taken by your ancestors binds you not to raise your arms against the khan but we your metropolitan bishop and all the other bishops representatives of jesus christ absolve you from that oath extorted by force we all give you our benediction and conjure you to march against ahmed who is but a brigand and an enemy of god god is a father full of tenderness for his children he knows when to punish and when to pardon and if formerly he submerged pharaoh to save the children of israel he will in the same manner save you and your people if you purify your heart by penitence for you are a man and a sinner the penitence of a monarch is his sacred obligation to obey the laws of justice to cherish his people to renounce every act of violence and grant pardon even to the guilty it is thus that god will elevate you among us as formerly he elevated moses joshua and the other liberators of israel that russia a new israel may be delivered by you from the impious ahmet that other pharaoh i pray you grand prince do not censure me for my feeble words for it is written give instructions to a wise man and he will be yet wiser so may it be receive our benediction you and your children all the nobles and chieftains and all your brave warriors children of jesus christ amen this letter instead of giving the king offence inspired him with a new zeal and courage he immediately abandoned all idea of peace a fortnight had now passed in comparative inaction the russians and the tartars menacing each other from opposite sides of the stream 
A cold month of November had now come, and a thin coating of ice began to spread over the surface of the stream. It was evident that Ahmed was only waiting for the river to be frozen over, and that, in a few days, he would be able to cross at any point. The Grand Prince, seeing that the decisive battle could not much longer be deferred, ordered his troops, in the night, to make a change of position, that he might occupy the plains of Borosk as a field more favorable for his troops. But the Russian soldiers, still agitated by the fears which their sovereign had not been able to conceal, regarded this order as the signal for retreat. The panic spread from rank to rank, and, favored by the obscurity of the night, soon the whole host, in the wildest confusion, were in rapid flight. No efforts of the officers could arrest the dismay. Before the morning, the Russian camp was entirely deserted, and the fugitives were rushing, like an inundation, up the valley of the Moskwa towards the imperial city. But God did not desert Russia in this decisive hour. He appears to have heard and answered the prayers which had so incessantly ascended. In the Russian annals, their preservation is wholly attributed to the interposition of that God whose aid the bishops, the clergy, and the Christian men and women in hundreds of churches had so earnestly implored. The Tartars, seeing in the earliest dawn of the morning the banks of the river entirely abandoned by the Russians, imagined that the flight was but a ruse of war, that ambuscades were prepared for them, and, remembering previous scenes of exterminating slaughter, they also were seized with a panic and commenced a retreat. This movement itself increased the alarm. Terror spread rapidly. In an hour, the whole Tartar host, abandoning their tents and their baggage, were in tumultuous flight. As the sun rose, an unprecedented spectacle was presented. Two immense armies were flying from each other in indescribable confusion and dismay, each actually frightened out of its wits, and no one pursuing either. The Russians did not stop for a long breath until they attained the walls of Moscow. Ahmed, having reached the headwaters of the Don, retreated rapidly down that stream, wreaking such vengeance as he could by the way, but not venturing to stop until he had reached his strongholds upon the banks of the Volga. Thus, singularly, providentially, terminated this last serious invasion of Russia by the Tartars. A Russian analyst, in attributing the glory of this well-authenticated event all to God, writes, Shall men, vain and feeble, celebrate the terror of their arms? No, it is not the might of earth's warriors, it is not to human wisdom that Russia owes her safety, but only to the goodness of God. Ivan the Third, in the cathedrals of Moscow, offered long continuous praises to God for this victory, obtained without the effusion of blood. An annual festival was established in honor of this great event. Achmet, with his troops disorganized and scattered, had hardly reached the Volga ere he was attacked by a rival Khan who drove him some five hundred miles south to the shore of the Sea of Azov. Here his rival overtook him, killed him with his own hand, took his wives and his daughters captives, seized all his riches, and then, seeking friendly relations with Russia, sent word to Moscow that the great enemy of the Grand Prince was in his grave. Thus terminated forever the sway of the Tartars over the Russians. For two hundred years Russia had been held by the Khans in slavery. Though the horde long continued to exist as a band of lawless and uncivilized men, often engaged in predatory excursions, no further attempts were made to exact either tribute or homage. End of chapter 10
Chapter 11 of The Empire of Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time by John Stevens Cabot Abbott Chapter 11 The Reign of Vasily From 1480 to 1533 Alliance with Hungary A Traveler from Germany Treaty between Russia and Germany Embassage to Turkey Court Etiquette Death of the Princess Sophia Death of Ivan Advancement of Knowledge Succession of Vasily Attack upon the Horde Rout of the Russians The Grand Prince takes the title of Emperor Turkish Envoy to Moscow Efforts to arm Europe against the Turks Death of the Emperor Maximilian and ascension of Charles V to the Empire of Germany. Death of Vasily. The retreat of the Tartars did not redound much to the glory of Ivan. The citizens of Moscow, in the midst of their rejoicings, were far from being satisfied with their sovereign. They thought that he had not exhibited that courage which characterizes grand souls and that he had been signally wanting in that devotion which leads one to sacrifice himself for the good of his country. They lavished, however, their praises upon the clergy, especially upon Archbishop Vassian, whose letter to the Grand Prince was read and re-read throughout the kingdom with the greatest enthusiasm. This noble prelate, whose Christian heroism had saved his country, soon after fell sick and died, deplored by all Russia. Hungary was at this time governed by Matthias, son of the renowned Hunayeds, a prince equally renowned for his valor and his genius. Matthias, threatened by Poland, sent ambassadors to Russia to seek alliance with Ivan the Third. Eagerly, Russia accepted the proposition and entered into friendly connections with Hungary, which kingdom was then, in civilization, quite in advance of the Northern Empire. In the year 1486, an illustrious cavalier named Nicholas Popel visited Russia, taking a letter of introduction to the Grand Prince from Frederick III, Emperor of Germany. He had no particular mission, and was led only by motives of curiosity. I have seen, said the traveler, all the Christian countries and all the kings, and I wish also to see Russia and the Grand Prince. The lords at Moscow had no faith in these words, and were persuaded that he was a spy sent by their enemy, the King of Poland. Though they watched him narrowly, he was not incommoded, and left the kingdom after having satisfied his desire to see all that was remarkable. His report to the German emperor was such that, two years after, he returned in the quality of an ambassador from Frederick III, with a letter to Ivan III, dated Ulm, December twenty-sixth, 1488. The nobles now received Popel with great cordiality. He said to them, After having left Russia, I went to find the emperor and the princes of Germany at Nuremberg. I spent a long time giving them information respecting your country and the grand prince. I corrected the false impression conceived by them that Ivan the Third was but the vassal of Casimir, king of Poland. That is impossible, I said to them. The monarch of Moscow is much more powerful and much richer than the king of Poland. His estates are immense, his people numerous, his wisdom extraordinary. All the court listened to me with astonishment, and especially the emperor himself, 
who often invited me to dine and pass hours with me conversing upon Russia. At length the emperor, desiring to enter into an alliance with the grand prince, has sent me to the court of your majesty as his ambassador. He then solicited, in the name of Frederick the Third, the hand of Ivan's daughter, Helen, for the nephew of the emperor, Albert, Margrave of Baden. The proposition for the marriage of the daughter of the grand prince with a mere margrave was coldly received. Ivan, however, sent an ambassador to Germany with the following instructions. Should the emperor ask if the grand prince will consent to the marriage of his daughter with the margrave of Baden, reply that such an alliance is not worthy of the grandeur of the Russian monarch, brother of the ancient emperors of Greece, who, in establishing themselves at Constantinople, ceded the city of Rome to the popes. Leave the emperor, however, to see that there is some hope of success should he desire one of our princesses for his son, the King Maximilian. The Russian ambassador was received in Germany with the most flattering attentions, even being conducted to a seat upon the throne by the side of the emperor. It is said that Maximilian, who was then a widower, wished to marry Helen, the daughter of the grand prince, but he wished very naturally first to see her through the eyes of his ambassador and to ascertain the amount of her dowry. To this request a polite refusal was returned. How could one suppose, writes the Russian historian Karamzin, that an illustrious monarch and a princess, his daughter, could consent to the affront of submitting the princess to the judgment of a foreign minister, who might declare her unworthy of his master? The pride of the Russian court was touched and the emperor's ambassador was informed, in very plain language, that the grand prince was not at all disposed to make a matter of merchandise of his daughter, that after her marriage the grand prince would present her with a dowry such as she should deem proportionate to the rank of the united pair, and that, above all, should she marry Maximilian, she should not change her religion, but should always have residing with her chaplains of the Greek church. Thus terminated the question of the marriage. A treaty, however, of alliance was formed between the two nations, which was signed at Moscow, August 16, 1490. In this treaty, Ivan III subscribes himself, by the grace of God, monarch of all the Russias, Prince of Vladimir, Moscow, Novgorod, Pskov, Yugaria, Vyathya, Perme, and Bulgaria. We thus see what portion of the country was then deemed subject to his sway. Ivan the Third, continually occupied in extending, consolidating, and developing the resources of his vast empire, could not but look with jealousy upon the encroachments of the Turks, who had already overrun all Greece, who had taken a large part of Hungary, and who were surging up the Danube in wave after wave of terrible invasion. Still, sound judgment taught him that the hour had not yet come for him to interpose, that it was his present policy to devote all his energies to the increase of Russian wealth and power. It was a matter of the first importance that Russia should enjoy the privileges of commerce with those cities of Greece now occupied by the Turks, to which Russia had access through the Dnieper and the Don, and partially through the vast floods of the Volga. But the Russian merchants were incessantly annoyed by the oppression of the lawless Turks. The following letter from Ivan the Third to Sultan Bajazet the Second gives one a very clear idea of the relations existing between the two countries at that time. It is dated Moscow, August thirty first, fourteen ninety two. To Bajazet, Sultan, King of the Princes of Turkey, Sovereign of the Earth and of the Sea, we, Ivan the Third, 
by the grace of god only true and hereditary monarch of all the russias and of the many other countries of the north and of the east behold that which we deem it our duty to write to your majesty we have never sent ambassadors to each other with friendly greetings nevertheless the russian merchants have traversed your estates in the exercise of traffic advantageous to both our empires often they complain to me of the vexations they encounter from your magistrates but i have kept silence the last summer the pasha of azov forced them to dig a ditch and to carry stones for the construction of the edifices of the city more than this they have compelled our merchants of azov and of kaffa to dispose of their merchandise for one half their value if any one of the merchants happens to fall sick the magistrates place seals upon the goods of all and if he dies the state seizes all these goods and restores but half if he recover no regard is paid to the clauses of a will the turkish magistrates recognizing no heirs but themselves to the property of the russians such glaring injustice has compelled me to forbid my merchants to engage in traffic in your country from whence come these acts of violence formerly these merchants paid only the legal tax and they were permitted to trade without annoyance are you aware of this or not one word more mahmed the second your father was a prince of grandeur and renown he wished it is reported to send to us ambassadors proposing friendly relations providence frustrated the execution of this project but why should we not now see the accomplishment of this plan we await your response the russian ambassador received orders from ivan the third to present his document to the sultan standing and not upon his knees as was the custom of the turkish court he was not to yield precedence to the ambassador of any other nation whatever and was to address himself only to the sultan and not to the pashas pleshchev the russian envoy obeyed his instructions to the letter and by his haughty bearing excited the indignation of the turkish nobles the pasha of constantinople received him with great politeness loaded him with attentions invited him to dine and begged him to accept of a present of some rich dresses and a purse of ten thousand sequins the haughty russian declined the invitation to dine returning the purse and the robes with the ungracious response i have nothing to say to pashas i have no need to wear their clothes neither have i any need of their money i wish only to speak to the sultan notwithstanding this arrogance bajazet the second the sultan received pleschev politely and returned a conciliatory answer to the grand prince promising the redress of those grievances of which he complained the turk was decidedly more civilized than the christian he wrote to mengli gairi the pasha of the crimea where most of these annoyances had occurred the monarch of russia with whom i desire to live in friendly relations has sent to me a clown i cannot consequently allow any of my people to accompany him back to russia lest they should find him offensive respected as i am from the east to the west i blush in being exposed to such an affront it is in consequence my wish that my son the sultan of kaffa should correspond directly with the grand prince of moscow with a sense of delicacy as attractive as it is rare bajazet the second refrained from complaining of the boorishness of the russian envoy but wrote to the grand prince ivan the third in the following courteous terms you have sent in the sincerity of your soul one of your lords to the threshold of my palace 
He has seen me and has handed me your letter, which I have pressed to my heart, since you have expressed a desire to become my friend. Let your ambassadors and your merchants no longer fear to frequent our country. They have only to come to certify to the veracity of all which your envoy will report to you from us. May God grant him a prosperous journey and a grace to convey to you our profound salutation. To you and to your friends, for those whom you love are equally dear to us. In the whole of this transaction, the Turkish court appears far superior to the Russian in the refinements and graces of polished life. There seems to be something in the southern clime which ameliorates harshness of manners. The Grecian emperors, perhaps, in abandoning their palaces, left also to their conquerors that suavity which has been transmitted even to our day the inviolable title of the polished Greek. In the year 1503, Ivan III lost his spouse, the Greek princess Sophia. Her death affected the aged monarch deeply and seriously impaired his health. Twenty-five years had now elapsed since he received the young and beautiful princess as his bride, and during all these tumultuous years her genius and attraction had been the most brilliant ornament of his court. The infirmities of age pressed heavily upon the king, and it was manifest that his days could not much longer be prolonged. With much ceremony in the presence of his lords, he dictated his will, declaring his oldest son, Vasily, to be his successor as monarch, and assigning to all his younger children rich possessions. The passion for the aggrandizement of Russia still glowed strongly in his bosom, even in the hour of death. Vasily, though twenty-five years of age, was as yet unmarried, he decided to select his spouse from the daughters of the Russian nobles, and fifteen hundred of the most beautiful belles of the kingdom were brought to the court that the prince from among them might make his selection. The choice fell upon a maiden of exquisite beauty, of Tartar descent. Her father was an officer in the army, a son of one of the chiefs of the horde. The marriage was immediately consummated, and all Moscow was in the blaze of illumination, rejoicing over the nuptials of the heir to the crown. The decay of the aged monarch, however, advanced day by day. His death, at last, was quite sudden in the night of the 27th of October, 1505, at the age of 66 years and nine months and at the close of a reign of forty-three years and a half. Ivan the Third will, through all ages, retain the rank of one of the most illustrious of the sovereigns of Russia. The excellencies of his character and the length of his reign combined in enabling him to give an abiding direction to the career of his country. He made his appearance on the political stage just in the time when a new system of government, favorable to the power of the sovereigns of Europe, was rising upon the ruins of feudalism. The royal authority was gaining rapidly in England and in France. Spain, freed from the domination of the Moors, had just become a power of the first rank. The fleets of Portugal were whitening the most distant seas, conferring upon the energetic kingdom wonderful wealth and power. Italy, though divided, exulted in her fleet, her maritime wealth, and her elevation above all other nations in the arts, the sciences, and the intrigues of politics. Frederick the Fourth, an emperor of Germany, an inefficient, apathetic man, was unable to restore repose to the empire. Distracted by civil war, his energetic son, Maximilian, was already meditating that political change which should give new strength to the monarch, 
and which finally raised the house of austria to the highest point of earthly grandeur hungary bohemia and poland governed by near relatives might almost be considered as a single power and they were as by instinct allied with austria in endeavors to resist the encroachment of the turks inventions and discoveries of the greatest importance were made in the world during the reign of ivan the third gutenberg and faust in strasbourg invented the art of printing christopher columbus discovered the new world until then the productions of india reached central europe through persia the caspian sea and the sea of azov on the twentieth of november fourteen ninety seven vasco de gama doubled the cape of good hope thus opening a new route to the indies and adding immeasurably to the enterprise and wealth of the world a new epoch seemed to dawn upon mankind favorable at least to the tranquillity of nations the progress of civilization and the strength of governments thus far russia in her remote seclusion had taken no part in the politics of europe it was not until the reign of ivan the third that this great northern empire emerged from that state of chaos in which she had neither possessed definiteness of form nor assured existence ivan the third found his nation in subjection to the tartars he threw off the yoke became one of the most illustrious monarchs in europe commanding respect throughout christendom he took his position by the side of emperors and sultans and by the native energies of his mind unenlightened by study he gave the wisest precepts for the internal and the external government of his realms but he was a rude stern man the legitimate growth of those savage times it is recorded that a single angry look from him would make any woman faint that at the table the nobles trembled before him not daring to utter a word vasily now ascended the throne and with great energy carried out the principles established by his father the first important measure of the new monarch was to fit out an expedition against the still powerful but vagabond horde at kazan on the volga to punish them for some acts of insubordination a powerful armament descended the volga in barges the infantry landed near kazan on the twenty second of may fifteen o six the tartars with a numerous array of cavalry were ready to receive their assailants and fell upon them with such impetuosity and courage that the russians were overpowered and driven back with much slaughter to their boats they consequently retreated to await the arrival of the cavalry the tartars imagining that the foe utterly discomfited it had fled back to moscow surrendered themselves to excessive joy a month passed away and on the twenty second of june an immense assemblage of uncounted thousands of tartars were gathered in festivity on the plains of arsk which spread around their capital city more than a thousand tents were spread upon the field merchants from all parts were gathered there displaying their goods and a scene of festivity and splendor was exhibited such as modern civilization has never paralleled suddenly the russian army horse and infantry were seen upon the plain as if they had dropped from the clouds they rushed upon the encampment cutting down the terrified multitude with awful butchery and trampling them beneath their horses feet the fugitives in dismay sought to regain the city crushing each other in their flight and in the desperate endeavor to crowd in at the gates and along the narrow streets the russians exhausted by their victory and lured by the luxuries which filled the tents instead of taking the city by storm as 
in the confusion they probably could have done, surrendered themselves to the pillage and the voluptuous indulgence. They found the tents filled with food, liquors of all kinds, and a great quantity of precious commodities, and forgetting that they were in the presence of an enemy, they plunged into the wildest excesses of festivity and wassail. The disgraceful carousal was briefly terminated during the night, but renewed with an additional zest in the morning. The songs and the shouts of the drunken soldiers were heard in the streets of Kazan, and from the battlements the Tartars beheld these orgies, equaling the most frantic revels of pagan bacchanals. The Tartar Khan, from the top of a bastion, watched the spectacle, and perceiving the negligence of his enemies, prepared for a surprise and for vengeance. On the 25th of June, just at the dawn of day, the gates were thrown open, and 20,000 horsemen and 30,000 infantry precipitated themselves with frightful yells upon the Russians, stupefied with sleep and wine. Though the Russians exceeded the Tartars two to one, yet they fled towards their boats like a flock of sheep, without order and without arms. The plain was speedily strewn with their dead bodies and crimsoned with their blood. Too much terrified to think even of resistance, they clambered into their barges, cut the cables, and pushed out into the stream. But for the valor of the Russian cavalry, all would have been destroyed. In the deepest humiliation, the fugitives returned to Moscow. Vasily resolved upon another expedition which should inflict signaled vengeance upon the horde, but while he was making his preparations, the Khan, terrified in view of the storm which was gathering, sent an embassage to Moscow, imploring pardon and peace, offering to deliver up all the prisoners and to take a new oath of homage to the Grand Prince. Vasily, who was just on the eve of war with Poland, with alacrity accepted these concessions. The king of Poland had heard with much joy of the death of Ivan the Third, whose energetic arm he had greatly feared, and he now hoped to take advantage of the youth and inexperience of Vasily. A harassing warfare was commenced between Russia and Poland, which raged for several years. Peace was finally made, Russia extorting from Poland several important provinces. In the year 1514, Vasily, entering into a treaty with Maximilian, the Emperor of Germany, laid aside the title of Grand Prince and assumed for himself that of Emperor, which was Kaiser in the German language and Tsar in the Russian. With great energy, Vasily pushed the work of concentrating and extending his empire, every year strengthening his power over the distant principalities. Bajazet II, the Turkish sultan, the victim of a conspiracy, was dethroned by his son Selim. Vasily, wishing, for the sake of commerce, to maintain friendly relations with Turkey, sent an ambassador to the new sultan. The ambassador, Alexiev, was authorized to make all proper protestations of friendship, but to be very cautious not to compromit the dignity of his sovereign. He was instructed not to prostrate himself before the sultan, as was the oriental custom, but merely to offer his hands. He was to convey rich presents to Selim with a letter from the Russian court, but was by no means to inquire for the health of the sultan, unless the sultan should first inquire for the health of the emperor. Notwithstanding these chilling punctilios, Selim received the Russian ambassador with much cordiality and sent back with him a Turkish ambassador to the court of Moscow. Nine months, from August to May, were occupied in the weary journey, 
while traversing the vast deserts of Veronage, their horses, exhausted and starving, sank beneath them, and they were obliged to toil along for weary leagues on foot, suffering from the want both of food and water. They nearly perished before reaching the frontiers of Razan, but here they found horses and retinue awaiting them, sent by Vasily. Upon their arrival at Moscow, the Turkish ambassador was received with great enthusiasm. It was deemed an honor, as yet unparalleled in Russia, that the terrible conquerors of Constantinople, before whose arms all Christendom was trembling, should send an ambassador fifteen hundred miles to Moscow to seek the alliance of the emperor. The Turkish envoy was received with great magnificence by Vasily, seated upon his throne and surrounded by his nobles clad in robes of the most costly furs. The ambassador, Theodoric Kamal, a Greek by birth, with the courtesy of the polished Greek, kneeling, kissed the hand of the emperor, presented him the letter of his master, the sultan, beautifully written upon parchment in Arabic letters, and assured the emperor of the wish of the sultan to live with him in eternal friendship. But the Turk, loud in protestations, was not disposed to alliance. It was evident that the office of a spy constituted the most important part of the mission of Kamal. This ambassador had but just left the court of Moscow when another appeared, from the Emperor Maximilian of Germany. The message with which the Baron Heberstein was commissioned from the court of Vienna to the court of Moscow is sufficiently important to be recorded. Ought not sovereigns, said the ambassador, to seek the glory of religion and the happiness of their subjects? Such are the principles which have ever guided the emperor. If he has waged war, it has never been from the love of false glory, nor to seize the territories of others, but to punish those who have dared to provoke him. Despising danger, he has been seen in battle, exposing himself like the humblest soldier, and gaining victories against superior forces because the Almighty lends his arm to aid the virtuous. The Emperor of Germany is now reposing in the bosom of tranquility. The Pope and all the princes of Italy have become his allies. Spain, Naples, Sicily, and twenty-six other realms recognize his grandson, Charles V for their legitimate and hereditary monarch. The king of Portugal is attached to him by the ties of relationship, and the king of England by the bonds of sincere friendship. The sovereigns of Denmark and Hungary have married the granddaughters of Maximilian, and the king of Poland testifies to unbounded confidence in him. I will not speak of your majesty, for the emperor of Russia well knows how to appreciate the sentiments of the Emperor of Germany. The King of France and the Republic of Venice, influenced by selfish interests and disregarding the prosperity of Christianity, have taken no part in this fraternal alliance of all the rest of Europe, but they are now beginning to manifest a love for peace, and I have just learned that a treaty is about to be concluded with them also. Let any one now cast a glance over the world, and he will see but one Christian prince who is not attached to the Emperor Maximilian, either by ties of friendship or affection. All Christian Europe is in the profound peace, excepting Russia and Poland. Maximilian has sent me to your majesty, illustrious monarch, to entreat you to restore repose to Christianity and to your states. Peace causes empires to flourish. War destroys their resources and hastens their downfall. Who can be sure of victory? Fortune often frustrates the wisest plans. 
Thus far I have spoken in the name of my master. I wish now to add that on my journey I have been informed by the Turkish ambassador himself that the sultan has just captured Damascus, Jerusalem, and all Egypt. A traveler worthy of credence has confirmed this deplorable intelligence. If, before these events, the power of the sultan inspired us with just fear, ought not this success of his arms to augment our apprehensions? Russia and Poland had long been engaged in a bloody frontier war, each endeavoring to wrest provinces from the other. But Russia was steadily on the advance. The embassage of Maximilian was not productive of peace. On the contrary, Vasily immediately sent an ambassador to Vienna to endeavor to secure the aid of Austria in his war with Poland. Maximilian received the envoy with very extraordinary marks of favor. He was invited to sit in the presence of the emperor with his hat upon his head, and whenever the ambassador during the conference mentioned the name of the Russian emperor, Maximilian uncovered his head in token of respect. The great object of Maximilian's ambition was to arm all Europe against the Turks, and he was exceedingly anxious to secure the cooperation of a power so energetic as that of Russia had now proved herself to be. Even then, with consummate foresight, he wrote, The integrity of Poland is indispensable to the general interests of Europe. The grandeur of Russia is becoming dangerous. Maximilian soon sent another ambassador to Moscow, who very forcibly described the conquest made by the Turks in Europe, Asia, and Africa, from the Thracian Bosphorus to the sands of Egypt, and from the mountains of Caucasia to Venice. He spoke of the melancholy captivity of the Greek church, which was the mother of Russian Christianity, of the profanation of the holy sepulchre of Nazareth, Bethlehem, and Sinai, which had fallen under the domination of the Turk. He suggested that the Turks, in possession of the Tauride, as the country upon the north shore of the Black Sea, bounded by the Dnieper and the Sea of Azov, was then called, threatened the independence of Russia herself, that Vasily had everything to fear from the ferocity, the perfidy, and the success of Selim, who, stained with the blood of his father and his three brothers, dared to assume the title of Master of the World. He untreated Vasily as one of the most powerful of the Christian princes to follow the banner of Jesus Christ and to cease to make war upon Poland, thus exhausting the Christian powers. Maximilian died before his ambassador returned, and thus these negotiations were interrupted. But Russia was then all engrossed with the desire of obtaining provinces from Poland. Turkey was too formidable a foe to think of assailing, and the idea at that time of wresting any territory from Turkey was preposterous. All Europe combined could only hope to check any further advance of the Moslem cemeteries. Influenced by these considerations, Vasily sent another ambassador to Constantinople to propose a treaty with Selim, which might aid Russia in the strife with her hereditary rival. The sultan, glad of any opportunity to weaken the Christian powers, ordered his pashas to harass Poland in every possible way on the south, thus enabling Russia more easily to assail the distracted kingdom on the north. The king of Poland, Sigismond, was in consternation. Poland was united with Rome in religion. The Pope Leo X, anxious to secure the cooperation of both Poland and Russia against the Turks, who were the great foe Christianity had most to dread, 
proposed that the king of Poland, a renowned warrior, should be entrusted with the supreme command of the Christian armies, and adroitly suggested to Vasily that Constantinople was the legitimate heritage of a Russian monarch who was the descendant of a Grecian princess, that it was sound policy for him to turn his attention to Turkey, for Poland, being a weaker power, and combined of two discordant elements, the original Poland and Lithuania would of necessity be gradually absorbed by the growth of Russia. Vasily hated the Pope, because he had ordered to diems in Rome, in celebration of a victory which the Poles had obtained over the Russians, and had called the Russians heretics. But still the bait the Pope presented was too alluring not to be caught at. In the labyrinthine mazes of politics, however, there were obstacles to the development of this policy, which years only could remove. Upon the death of Maximilian, Charles V of Spain ascended the throne of the German Empire and established a power the most formidable that had been known in Europe for several hundred years, that is, since the age of Charlemagne. Vasily was in the midst of these plans of aggrandizement when death came with its unexpected summons. He was in the fifty-fourth year of his age, with mental and physical vigor unimpaired. A small pimple appeared on his left thigh, not larger than the head of a pin, but from its commencement attended with excruciating pain. It soon resolved itself into a malignant ulcer, which rapidly exhausted all the vital energies. The dying king was exceedingly anxious to prepare himself to stand before the judgment seat of God. He spent days and nights in prayer, gave most affectionate exhortations to all around him to live for heaven, assume monastic robes, resolving that, should he recover, he would devote himself exclusively to the service of God. It was midnight, the third of December, 1533. The king had just partaken of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Suddenly his tongue was paralyzed, his eyes fixed, his hands dropped by his side, and the metropolitan bishop, who had been administering the last rites of religion, exclaimed, It is all over. The king is dead. End of chapter 11「from 1533 to 1546. Vasily at the chase, attention to distinguished foreigners, the autocracy, splendor of the edifices, slavery, aristocracy, infancy of Ivan IV, regency of Helen, conspiracies and tumults, war with Sigismund of Poland, death of Helen, struggles of the nobles, appalling sufferings of Dmitri, incursions of the Tatars, Successful Conspiracy, Ivan IV at the Chase, Coronation of Ivan IV. Under Vasily, the Russian court attained a degree of splendor which had before been unknown. The Baron of Herbenstein thus describes the appearance of the monarch when engaging in the pleasures of the chase. As soon as we saw the monarch entering the field, we dismounted and advanced to meet him on foot. He was mounted upon a magnificent charger, gorgeously caparisoned. He wore upon his head a tall cap, embroidered with precious stones, and surmounted by gilded plumes which waved in the wind. A poniard and two knives were attached to his girdle. He had upon his right allee, 
Tsar of Kazan, armed with a bow and arrows. At his left, two young princes, one of whom held an axe and the other a number of arms. His suite consisted of more than three hundred cavaliers. The chase was continued over the boundless plains for many days and often weeks. When night approached, the whole party, often consisting of thousands, dismounted and reared their village of tents. The tent of the emperor was ample, gorgeous, and furnished with all the appliances of luxury. Hounds were first introduced into these sports in Russia by Vasily. The evening hours were passed in festivity, with abundance of good cheer, and in narrating the adventures of the day. Whenever the emperor appeared in public, he was preceded by esquires chosen from among the young nobles, distinguished for their beauty, the delicacy of their features, and the perfect proportion of their forms. Clothed in robes of white satin and armed with small hatches of silver, they marched before the emperor and appeared to strangers, say his contemporaries, like angels descended from the skies. Vasily was especially fond of magnificence in the audiences which he gave to foreign ambassadors. To impress them with an idea of the vast population and wealth of Russia and of the glory and power of the sovereign, Vasily ordered, on the day of presentation, that all the ordinary avocations of life should cease, and the citizens, clothed in their richest dresses, were to crowd around the walls of the Kremlin. All the young nobles in the vicinity, with their retinues, were summoned, the troops were under arms, and the most distinguished officers, glittering in the panoply of war, rode to meet the envoys. Footnote. Francis da Callo relates that when he was received by the emperor, forty thousand soldiers were under arms, in the richest uniform, extending from the Kremlin to the hotel of the ambassadors. In the hall of audience, crowded to its utmost capacity, there was silence as of the grave. The king sat upon his throne, his bonnet upon one side of him, his scepter upon the other. His nobles were seated round upon couches draped in purple and embroidered with pearls and gold. Following the example of Ivan III, Vasily was unwearied in his endeavors to induce foreigners of distinction, particularly artists, physicians, and men of science, to take up their residence in Russia. Any stranger distinguished for genius or capability of any kind who entered Russia found it not easy to leave the kingdom. A Greek physician of much celebrity from Constantinople visited Moscow. Vasily could not find it in his heart to relinquish so rich a prize and detained him with golden bonds which the unhappy man, mourning for his wife and children, in vain endeavored to break away. At last the sultan was influenced to write in behalf of the Greek. Permit, he wrote, Mark to return to Constantinople to rejoin his family. He went to Russia only for a temporary visit. The emperor replied, For a long time Mark has served me to his and my perfect satisfaction. He is now my lieutenant at Novgorod. Send to him his wife and children. The power of the sovereign was absolute. His will was the supreme law. The lives, the fortunes of the clergy, the laity, the lords, the citizens, were dependent upon his pleasure. The Russians regarded their monarch as the executor of the divine will. Their ordinary language was, God and the prince, decree it. The Russians generally defend his autocracy as the only true principle of government. The philosophic Karamzin writes, Ivan III and Vasily knew how to establish permanently the nature of one government by constituting in autocracy the necessary attribute of empire, its sole constitution, and the only basis of safety, force, and prosperity. This limitless power of the prince is regarded as tyranny in the eye of strangers because... In their inconsiderate judgment, they forget that tyranny is the abuse of autocracy, and that the same tyranny may exist in a republic when citizens or powerful magistrates oppress society. Autocracy does not signify the absence of laws, since law is everywhere where there is any duty to be performed, 
and the first duty of the princes is it not to watch over the happiness of their people? To the traveller, in the age of Vasily, Russia appeared like a vast desert compared with the other countries of Europe. The sparseness of the habitations, the extended plains, dense forests and roads, rough and desolate, attested that Russia was still in the cradle of its civilization. But as one approached Moscow, the signs of animated life rapidly increased. Convoys crowded the grand route, which traversed vast prairies waving with grain and embellished with all the works of industry. In the midst of this plain rose the majestic domes and the glittering towers of Moscow. The convents, in massive piles, scattered around, resembled beautiful villages. The palace of the Kremlin alone was a city in itself. Around this, as the nucleus, but spreading over a wide extent, were the streets of the metropolis, the palaces of the nobles, the mansions of the wealthy citizens, and the shops of the artisans. The city in that day was indeed one of the magnificent distances, almost every dwelling being surrounded by a garden in luxurious cultivation. In the year 1520, the houses by count, which was ordered by the Grand Prince, amounted to 41,500. The Metropolitan Bishop, the Grand Dignitaries of the Court, the Princes and Lords, occupied splendid mansions of wood reared by Grecian and Italian architects in the environs of the Kremlin. On wide and beautiful streets there were a large number of very magnificent churches also built of wood. The bazaars, or shops, filled with the rich merchandise of Europe and of Asia, were collected in one quarter of the city and were surrounded by a high stone wall as a protection against the armies, domestic or foreign, which were ever sweeping over the land. From the 11th to the 16th century, slavery may be said to have been universal in Russia. Absolutely every man but the monarch was a slave. The highest nobles and princes avowed themselves the slaves of the monarch. There was no law but the will of the sovereign. He could deprive any one of property and of life, and there was no power to call him to account but the poniard of the assassin or the sword of rebellion. In like manner the peasant serfs were slaves of the nobles, with no privileges whatever, except such as the humanity of the selfishness of their lords might grant. But gradually custom, controlling public opinion, assumed almost the form of law. The kings established certain rules for the promotion of industry and the regulation of commerce. Merchants and scholars attained a degree of practical independence which was based on indulgence rather than any constitutional right, and, during the reign of Vasily, the law alone could doom the serf to death, and he began to be regarded as a man as a citizen protected by the laws. From this time we begin to see the progress of humanity and of higher conceptions of social life. It is perhaps worthy of record that anciently the peasants or serfs were universally designated by the name smerdi, which simply means smelling offensively. Is the exhalation of an offensive order the necessary property of a people imbruted by poverty and filth? In America, that unpleasant effluvium has generally been considered a peculiarity pertaining to the colored race. Philosophic observation may show that it is a disease, the result of uncleanliness, but, like other diseases, often transmitted from the guilty parent to the unoffending child. We have known white people who were exceedingly offensive in this respect, and colored people who were not so at all. The pride of illustrious birth was carried to the greatest extreme, and a noble would blush to enter into any friendly relations whatever with a plebeian. The nobles considered all business degrading excepting war, and spent the weary months, when not under arms, in indolence in their castles. 
The young women of the higher families were in a deplorable state of captivity. Etiquette did not allow them to mingle with society or even to be seen except by their parents, and they had no employment except sewing or knitting, no mental culture and no sources of amusement. It was not the custom of the young men to choose their wives, but the father of the maiden selected some eligible match for his daughter and made propositions to the family of his contemplated son-in-law, stating the dowry he would confer upon the bride, and the parties were frequently married without ever having previously seen each other. The death of Vasily transmitted the crown to his only son, Ivan, an infant but three years of age. By the will of the dying monarch, the regency, during the minority of the child, was placed in the hands of the youthful mother, the princess Helen. The brothers of Vasily and twenty nobles of distinction were appointed as counsellors for the queen regent. Two men, however, in concert with Helen, soon took the reins of government into their own hands. One of these was a sturdy, ambitious old noble, Michel Glinsky, an uncle of Helen, the other was a young and handsome prince, Ivan Telenev, who was suspected of tender liaisons with his royal mistress. The first act of the new government was to assemble all the higher clergy in the Church of the Assumption, where the Metropolitan Bishop gave his benediction to the child destined to reign over Russia, and who was there declared to be accountable to God only for his actions. At the same time, ambassadors were sent to all the courts of Europe to announce the death of Vasily and the ascension of Ivan IV to the throne. But a week passed after these ceremonies ere the prince Yuri, one of the brothers of Vasily, was arrested, charged with conspiracy to wrest the crown from his young nephew. He was thrown into prison, where he was left to perish by the slow torture of starvation. This severity excited great terror in Moscow. The Russians, ever strongly attached to their sovereigns, now found themselves under the reign of an oligarchy, which they detested. Conspiracies and rumors of conspiracies agitated the court. Many were arrested upon suspicion alone, and cruelly chained were thrown into dungeons. Michel Glinsky, indignant of the shameful intimacy evidently existing between Helen and Telenev, ventured to remonstrate with the regent boldly and earnestly, assuring her that the eyes of the court were scrutinizing her conduct, and that such vice, disgraceful anywhere, was peculiarly hideous upon a throne where all looked for examples of virtue. The audacious noble though president of the consul, was immediately arrested under the accusation of treason and was thrown into a dungeon where, soon after, he was assassinated. A reign of terror now commenced, and imprisonment and death awaited all those who undertook in any way to thwart the plans of Helen and Telenev. Andre, the youngest of the brothers of Vasily, a man of feeble character, now alone remained of the royal princes at court. He was nominally the tutor of his nephew, the young emperor Ivan IV, and though a prominent member of the council, which Vasily had established, he had no influence in the government, which had been grasped so energetically and despotically by Helen and her paramour Telenev. At length, André, trembling for his own life, timidly raised the banners of revolt, and gathered quite an army around him. But he had no energy to conduct a war. He was speedily taken, and, loaded with chains, was thrown into a dungeon, where, after a few weeks of most cruel deprivations, he miserably perished. Thirty of the lords implicated with him in the rebellion were hung upon the trees around Novgorod, Many others were put to torture and perished on the rack. Helen, surrendering herself to the dominion of guilty love, developed the ferocity of a tigress. Sigismund, king of Poland, taking advantage of the general discontent of the Russians 
under the sway of Helen, formed an alliance with a horde upon the lower waters of the Don, and invaded Russia, burning and destroying with mercilessness which demons could not have surpassed. Prince Telenev headed an army to repel him. The pen wearies in describing the horrors of these scenes. One hundred thousand Russians are now flying before one hundred and fifty thousand Polanders. Hundreds of miles of territory are ravaged. Cities and villages are stormed, plundered, burned. Women and children are cut down and trampled beneath the feet of cavalry, or escape shrieking into the forests, where they perish of exposure and starvation. But an army of recruits comes to the aid of the Russians, and now one hundred and fifty thousand Polanders are driven before two hundred thousand Russians. They sweep across the frontier like dust driven by the tornado. And now the cities and villages of Poland blaze. Her streams run red with blood. The Polish wives and daughters, in their turn, struggle, shriek, and die. From exhaustion, the warfare ceases. The two antagonists, moaning and bleeding, wait for a few years, but to recover sufficient strength to renew the strife, and then the brutal, demoniac butchery commences anew. Such is the history of man. In this brief but bloody war, the city of Starodub in Russia was besieged by an army of Poles and Tatars. The assault was urged with the most desperate energy and fearlessness. The defense was conducted with equal ferocity. Thousands fell on both sides in every mangled form of death. At last, the besiegers undermined the walls, and placing beneath hundreds of barrels of gunpowder, as with the burst of a volcano, uphove the massive bastions to the clouds. They fell in a storm of ruin upon the city, setting it on fire in many places. Through the flames and over the smoldering ruins, Poles and Tatars, blackened with smoke and smeared with blood, rushed into the city, and in a few hours thirteen thousand of the inhabitants were weltering in their gore. None were left alive. And this is but a specimen of the wars which raged for ages. The world now has but the faintest conception of the seas of blood and woe through which humanity has waded to attain even its present feeble recognition of fraternity. In this, as in every war with Poland, Russia was gaining. Ever wrestling from her rival the provinces of Lithuania, and attaching them to the gigantic empire. In the year 1534, Helen commenced the enterprise of surrounding the whole of Moscow with a ditch and a wall capable of resisting the batterings of artillery. An Italian engineer named Petroc Maloy superintended these works. The foundation of the walls was laid with imposing religious ceremonies, the wall was crowned with four towers at the openings of the four gates. Helen was so conscious of the importance of augmenting the population of Russia that she offered land and freedom from taxes for a term of years to all who would migrate into her territory from Poland. Perhaps also she had a double object, wishing to weaken a rival power. Much counterfeit coin was found to be in circulation, the regent issued an edict that any one found guilty of depreciating the current standard of coin should be punished with death, and his death was to be barbarously inflicted by first cutting off the hands of the culprit and then pouring melted lead through a tunnel down his throat. On the 3rd of April, 1538, Helen, in the prime of life, and with all her sins in full vigor and unrepented, retired to her bed at night, suddenly and seriously sick. Someone had succeeded in administering to her a dose of poison. She shrieked for a few hours in mortal agony, and soon after the hour of twelve was told, her spirit ascended to meet God in judgment. Being dead, she had no favors to confer, 
no terrors to execute, and her festering remains were the same day hurried ignominiously to the grave. Her paramour Telenev alone wept over her death. Russia rejoiced, and yet with trembling. Whose strong arm would now seize the helm of the tempest-torn ship of state, no one could tell. The young prince Ivan the Fourth was but seven years of age at the death of his mother Helen. For several days there was ominous silence in Moscow, the stillness which preceded the storm. The death of a regent had come so suddenly, so unexpectedly, that none were prepared for it. A week passed away, during which time parties were forming and conspiracies ripening, while Telenev was desperately endeavouring to retain that power which he had so despotically wielded in conjunction with his royal mistress. The prince Vasily Shuisky, who had occupied the first place in the council of Vasily, opened the drama. Having secured the cooperation of a large number of nobles, he declared himself the head of the government, arrested all the favorites of Helen, and threw Telenev bound with chains into a dungeon. There he was left to die of starvation, barbarity which, though in accordance with that brutal age, even all the similar excesses of Telenev could not justify. The beautiful sister of Telenev, Agrippine by name, was torn from the saloons her loveliness had embellished and was imprisoned for life in a convent. The victims of the cruelty of Helen, who were still languishing in prison, were set at liberty. Shuisky was a widower, and in the fiftieth year of his age. He wished to strengthen his power by engaging the cooperation of the still formidable energies of the Horde at Kazan, and accordingly married, quite hurriedly, the daughter of the Tsar of the Horde. But the regal diadem proved to him but a crown of thorns. Conspiracy succeeded conspiracy, and Shuisky felt compelled to enlist all the terrors of the dungeon, the scaffold, and the block to maintain his place. Six months only passed away, ere he too was writhing upon the royal couch in the agonies of death, whether paralyzed by poison or smitten by hand of God, the day of judgment alone can reveal. Ivan Shuisky, the brother of the deceased usurper, now stepped into the dangerous post which death had so suddenly rendered vacant. He was a weak man, assuming the most pompous airs, quite unable to discriminate between imposing grandeur and ridiculous parade. He soon became both despised and detested. This state of things encouraged the two hordes of Kazan and Torid to unite, and with an army of a hundred thousand men, they penetrated Russia almost unopposed, burning and plundering in all directions. Under these circumstances, the Metropolitan Bishop Joseph, a man of sincere piety and of very elevated character, and who enjoyed in the highest degree the confidence both of the aristocracy and the people, presented himself before the council, urged the incapacity of Ivan Shuisky to govern, and proposed that Ivan Belsky, a nobleman of great energy and moral worth, should be chosen regent. The proposal was carried by acclamation. So unanimous was the vote, so cordial was the adoption of the republican principle of election, that Ivan Shuisky was powerless and was merely dismissed. The new regent, sustained by the clergy and the aristocracy, governed the state with wisdom and moderation. All kinds of persecution ceased, and vigorous measures were adopted for the promotion of the public welfare. Old abuses were repressed, vicious governors deposed, and the rising flames of civil strife were quenched. Even the hitherto unheard of novelty of trial by jury was introduced. Jurors were chosen from among the most intelligent citizens. Though there was some bitter opposition among the corrupt nobles to these salutary reforms, the clergy, as a body, sustained them, and so did also even a majority of the lords. 
It was Christianity and the Church which introduced these humanizing measures. Among the innumerable tragedies of those days, let one be mentioned, illustrative to the terrific wrongs to which all the exposed under a despotic government. There was a young prince, Dmitri, a child, grandson of Vasily the Blind, whose claims to the throne were feared. He was thrown into prison and there forgotten. For forty-nine years he had now remained in a damp and dismal dungeon. He had committed no crime. He was accused of no crime. He was only feared that restive nobles might use him as an instrument for the furtherance of their plans. All the years of youth and of manhood had passed in darkness and misery. No beam of the sun ever penetrated his tomb. All unheeded, the tides of life surged in the world above him, while his mind with his body was wasting away in the long agony. Oh, who can tell what days, what nights he spent of tideless, waveless, sailless, shoreless woe. Mercy now entered his cell, but it was too late even for that angel visited to bring a gleam of joy. His friends were all dead. His name was forgotten on earth. He knew nothing of the world or of its days. His mind was enfeebled, and even the slender shock of knowledge which he had possessed as a child had vanished away. They broke off his chains and removed him from his dungeon to a comfortable chamber. The poor old man, dazzled by the light and bewildered by the change, lingered joylessly and without a smile for a few weeks and died. Immortality alone offers a solution for these mysteries. After death cometh the judgment. The Christian Bishop Joseph and Ivan Belsky the Regent, in cordial cooperation, endeavored in all things to promote prosperity and happiness. Again there was a coalition of the Tatars for the invasion of Russia. The three hordes, in Kazan, in the Tauride, and in the mouth of the Volga, united, and in an army one hundred thousand strong, with numerous cavalry and powerful artillery, commenced their march. The Russian troops were hastily collected upon the banks of the Oka, there to take their stand and dispute the passage of the stream. By order of the clergy, prayers were offered incessantly in the churches by the day and by night, that God would avert this terrible invasion. The young prince, Ivan the Fourth, was now ten years of age. The citizens of Moscow were moved to tears and to the deepest enthusiasm on hearing their young prince in the Church of the Assumption offer aloud and fervently the prayer. O Heavenly Father, Thou who didst protect our ancestors against the cruel Tamerlane, Take us also under thy holy protection, us in childhood and orphanage. Our mind and our body are still feeble, and yet the nation looks to us for deliverance. Accompanied by the Metropolitan Joseph, he entered the council and said, The enemy is approaching. Decide for me whether it be best that I should remain here or go to meet the foe. With one voice they exclaimed, Prince, Remain at Moscow. They then took a solemn oath to die, if necessary, for their prince. The citizens came forward in crowds and volunteered for the defense of the walls. The faubourgs were surrounded with palisades and batteries of artillery were placed to sweep in all directions the approaches to the city. The enthusiasm was so astonishing that the Russian analysts ascribe it to a supernatural cause. On the 30th of July, 1541, the Tatar army appeared upon the southern banks of the Oka, crowning all the heights which bordered the stream. Immediately they made an attempt to force the passage, but the Russians, thoroughly prepared for their assault, repelled them with 
prodigious slaughter. Night put an end to the contest. The Russians were elated with their success and waited eagerly for the morning to renew the strife. They even hoped to be able to cross the river and to sweep the camp of their foes. The fires of their bivouacs blazed all the night. Reinforcements were constantly arriving, and their songs of joy floated across the water and fell heavily upon the hearts of the dismayed Tatars. At midnight, the Hun and the whole host, conscious of their peril, commenced a precipitate retreat, in the haste abandoning many guns and much of their baggage. The Russians pursued the foe, but were not able to overtake them, so rapidly did they retrace their steps. The news of the expulsion of the enemy spread rapidly through Russia. The conduct of the Grand Prince everywhere excited the most lively enthusiasm. He entered the church and in an affecting prayer returned thanks to God for the deliverance. The people, with unanimity, exclaimed, Grand Prince, your angelic prayers and your happy star have caused us to triumph. Awful, however, were the woes which fell upon those people who were on the line of march of the barbaric Tatars. Ivan Belsky, the regent, had now attained the highest degree of good fortune, and in his own conscience, and in the general approbation of the people, he found ample recompense of his deeds of humanity and his patriotic exertions. But envy, that poison of society, raised up against him enemies. Ivan Shuisky, who had been deposed by vote of the council, organized a conspiracy among the disaffected nobles, and on the night of the 3rd of January, 1542, 300 cavaliers surrounded the residences of the regent and of the metropolitan bishop, seized them and hurried them to prison, and in the prison finished their work by assassination of Ivan Belsky. Ivan Shuisky, sustained by the sabers of his partisans, reassumed the government. A new metropolitan bishop, Makar, was appointed to take the place of Joseph, who was deposed and imprisoned. The clergy, overawed, were silent. The reign of silence was against commenced, and the, all the posts of honor and influence were placed in the hands of partisans of Shuisky. The government, such as it was, was now in the hands of triumvirate consisting of Ivan, Andrei, and Fyodor. Not a syllable of opposition would these men endure, and the dungeon and the assassin's poniard silenced all murmurs. The young prince, Ivan IV, was now thirteen years of age. He was endowed by nature with a mind of extraordinary sagacity and force, but his education had been entirely neglected, and the scenes of perfidy and violence he was continually witnessing were developing a character which menaced Russia with many woes. The infamous Shuiskis sought to secure the friendship of the young prince by ministering in every possible way to his pleasures. They led him to the chase, encouraged whatever disposition he chanced to manifest, and endeavored to train him in a state of feebleness and ignorance which might promote their ambitious plans. The Kremlin became the scene of constant intrigues. Cabal succeeded Cabal. The position of the triumvirate became, month after month, more perilous. The young prince gave decisive indications of discontent. It began to be whispered into his ears that it was time for him to assume the reins of government, and he was assured that all Russia was waiting, eager to obey his orders. The metropolitan bishop, either from a sense of justice or of policy, also espoused the cause of the youthful sovereign. It was evident that another party was rising into power. On the 29th of December, 1534, Ivan IV went with a large party of his lords to the chase. Instructed beforehand in the measures he was to adopt, he quite unexpectedly to the triumvirate, summoned all his lords around him, and, assuming an imperious and threatening tone, declared that the triumvirate had abused his extreme youth, had trampled upon justice, 
and as culprits deserved to die. In his great clemency, however, he decided to spare the lives of two, executing only one as an example to the nation. The oldest of the three, Andrei Shuisky, was immediately seized and handed over to the conductors of the hounds. They set the dogs upon him, and he was speedily torn to pieces in the presence of the company, and his mangled remains were scattered over the plain. The partisans of Shuisky, terrified by this deed, were afraid to utter a murmur. The nobles generally were alarmed, but it was evident that though they had escaped the violence of the triumvirate, they had fallen into hands equally to be dreaded. Confiscations and other acts of rigor rapidly succeeded, and the young prince, still too youthful to govern by the decision of his own mind, was quite under the control of the Glinskys, through whose counsel he had shaken off the triumvirate of the Shuiskys. Ivan the Fourth now made the tour of his kingdom, but with no other object than the promotion of his personal gratification. Most of his time was devoted to the excitements of the chase in the savage forests which spread over a large portion of his realms. He was always surrounded by a brilliant staff of nobles, and the sufferings of the people were all concealed from his view. The enormous expenses of his court were exacted from the people he visited, and his steps were followed by lamentations. In the year 1546, Ivan attained the eighteenth year of his age and made great preparations for his coronation. The imposing rites were to be performed at Moscow. On the 16th of January, the Grand Prince entered one of the saloons of his palaces while the nobles, the princes, the officers of the court, all richly dressed, were assembled in the antechamber. The confessor of the Grand Prince having received from Ivan IV a crucifix, placed it upon a plate of gold with a crown and other regalia, and conveyed them to the Church of the Assumption accompanied by the Grand Equerry, Glinsky, and other important personages of the court. Soon after, the Grand Prince also repaired to the Church. He was preceded by an ecclesiastic holding of his hand a crucifix and sprinkling to the right and to the left holy water upon the crowd. Ivan the Fourth, surrounded by all the splendors of his court, entered the church where he was encircled by the ecclesiastics and received the benediction of the metropolitan bishop. A hymn was then sang by the accumulated choirs which astounded the audience after which mass was celebrated. In the midst of the cathedral a platform was erected which was ascended by twelve steps. Upon this platform there were two thrones of equal splendor, covered with cloth of gold, one for the monarch, the other for the metropolitan bishop. In front of the stage there was a desk, richly decorated, upon which were placed the crown regalia. The monarch and the bishop took their seats. The bishop, rising, pronounced a benediction upon the monarch, placed the crown upon his head, the scepter in his hand, and then, with a loud voice, prayed that God would endow this new David with the influences of the Holy Spirit, establish his throne in the righteousness, and render him terrible to evildoers and a benefactor to those who should do well. The ceremonies were closed by an anthem by the choir. The young emperor then returned with his court to the Kremlin, through streets carpeted with velvet and damask. As they walked along, the emperor's brother Yuri scattered among the crowd hands full of gold coin, which he took from a vase carried at his side by Michael Glinsky. The moment Ivan the Fourth left the church, the people, till then motionless and silent, precipitated themselves upon the platform and all the rich cloths which had decorated it, were torn to shreds, each individual eager to possess a souvenir of the memorable day. End of chapter 12
Chapter 13 of The Empire of Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time by John Stevens Cabot Abbott. Chapter 13 The Reign of Ivan IV from 1546 to 1552. The title of Tsar, marriage of Ivan IV, virtues of his bride, depraved character of the young emperor, terrible conflagrations, insurrections, the rebuke, wonderful change in the character of Ivan IV, confessions of sin and measures of reform, Sylvester and Alexis Adashev, the code of laws, reforms in the church, encouragement to men of science and letters, the ambassage of Schlitt, war with Kazan, disasters and disgrace, immense preparations for the chastisement of the Horde, the march, repulse of the Tauridians, siege of Kazan, incidents of the siege. Though the monarchs of Russia, in all their relations with foreign powers, took the title of Tsar or Emperor, they also retained that of Grand Prince, which was consecrated by ancient usage and now the envoys of Ivan the Fourth were traversing Russia in all directions to find, among the maidens of noble blood, one whose beauty would render her worthy of the sovereign. The choice at last fell upon Anastasia, the daughter of a lady of illustrious rank, who was a widow. Language is exhausted by the Russian analysts in describing the perfections of her person, mind, and heart. All conceivable social and moral excellences were in her united with the most brilliant intellectual gifts and the most exquisite loveliness. The marriage was performed by the bishop in the church of Notre Dame. You are now, said the metropolitan in conclusion, united forever by virtue of the mysteries of the gospel. Prostrate yourselves then before the Most High and secure his favor in the practice of every virtue. But those virtues which should especially distinguish you are the love of truth and of benevolence. Prince, love and honor your spouse. Princes, truly Christian, be submissive to your husband, for as the Redeemer is the head of the church, so is man the head of the woman. For many days Moscow was surrendered to festivity and rejoicings. The emperor devoted his attention to the rich, the empress to the poor. Anastasia, since the death of her father, had lived remote from the capital in the most profound rural seclusion. Suddenly, and as by magic, she found herself transported to the scenes of the highest earthly grandeur, but still she maintained the same beautiful simplicity of character which she had developed in the saddened home of her widowed mother. Ivan the Fourth was a man of ungovernable passions, and accustomed only to idleness, he devoted himself to the most gross and ignoble pleasures. Mercilessly he confiscated the estates of those who displeased him, and with caprice equal to his mercilessness, he conferred his possessions upon his favorites. He seemed to regard his arbitrary conduct as indicative of his independence and grandeur. The situation of Russia was perhaps never more deplorable than at the commencement of the reign of Ivan IV. The Glinskys were in high favor and easily persuaded the young emperor to gratify all their desires. Laden with honors and riches, they turned a deaf ear to all the murmurs which despotism the most atrocious exhorted from every portion of the empire. The inhabitants of Pskov, oppressed beyond endurance by an infamous governor, sent seventy of their most influential citizens to Moscow to present their grievances to the emperor. Ivan IV raved like a madman at what he called the insolence of his subject in complaining of their governor. Almost choking with rage, he ordered the seventy deputies to be put to death by the most cruel tortures. Anastasia wept in anguish over these scenes, and her prayers were incessantly ascending that God would change the heart of her husband. Her prayers were heard and answered. The same power which changed Saul of Tarsus into Paul the Apostle seemed to renew the soul of Ivan the Fourth. 
history is full of these marvelous transformations a mental phenomenon only to be explained by the scriptural doctrine of regeneration in ivan's case as in that of thousands of others afflictions were instruments made available by the holy spirit for the heart's renewal moscow was at this time a capital of vast extent and of great magnificence as timber was abundant and easily worked most of the buildings even the churches and the palaces were constructed of wood though almost every house was surrounded by a garden these enclosures were necessarily not extensive and the city was peculiarly exposed to the perils of conflagration on the twelfth of april fifteen forty seven the cry of fire alarmed the inhabitants and soon the flames were spreading with fury which baffled all human power the storehouses of commerce the magazines of the crown the convent of epiphany and a large number of dwellings extending from the gate of ilinsky to the kremlin and the moskva were consumed the river alone arrested the destruction a powder magazine took fire and with a terrible explosion its towers were thrown into the air taking with them a large section of the walls the ruins fell like an avalanche into the river completely filling up the channel adding the destruction of a deluge to that of the fire a week had hardly passed ere the cry of fire again was raised and in a few hours the whole section of the city on the other side of Yauza was in ashes. This region was mostly occupied by mechanics and manufacturers. The destruction of the city was almost as entire and as signal a proof of the divine displeasure as that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Even the metropolitan bishop, who was in the church of the Assumption, pleading for divine interposition, was with great difficulty rescued smothered and in a state almost of insensibility he was conveyed through billows of flame and smoke seventeen hundred adults besides uncounted children perished in the fire for many days the wretched inhabitants were seen wandering about in the fields and among the ruins searching for their children their friends or any articles of furniture which might by chance have escaped the flames many became maniacs and their cries arose in all directions like the howlings of wild beasts the emperor and the nobles to avoid the spectacle of so much misery retired to the village of vorobyov a few miles from moscow the whole population of moscow being in a state of despair and reckless of consequences were ripe for any conspiracy against an emperor and his favorites whose iniquities in their judgment had brought down upon them the indignation of heaven several of the higher clergy in cooperation with some of the princes and nobles resolved to arouse the energies of the populace to effect a change in the government the glinskys were the advisers and instigators of the king against them the fury of the populace was easily directed these doomed minions of despotism were pursued with fury energized by despair ivan the fourth was quite unable to protect them the glinskys with their numerous partisans had returned to moscow to make arrangements for the rebuilding of the kremlin when the mob fell upon them and they were nearly all slain in the eye of the populace there was something so sacred in the person of their prince that no one thought of offering him any harm Ivan the Fourth, astounded by this outbreak, was trembling in his palace at Vorobyov, and his truly pious wife Anastasia was, with tears, pleading with heaven, when one of the clergy, an extraordinary man named Sylvester, endowed with the boldness of an ancient prophet, entered the presence of the emperor. He was venerable in years, and his grey locks fell in clusters upon his shoulders. The boy-king was overawed by his appearance. One word from that capricious king would cause the head of Sylvester to fall from the block, but the intrepid Christian, with the solemnity of an ambassador from God, with pointed finger and eye sparkling with indignation, thus addressed him. God's avenging hand is suspended over the head of a God-forgetting, man-oppressing Tsar. Fire from heavens had consumed Moscow, the anger of the Most High has called up the people in revolt and is spreading over the kingdom anarchy, fury, and blood. Then, 
taking from his bosom a copy of the New Testament, he read to the king those divinely inspired precepts, which are alike applicable to monarchs and peasants, and, in tones subdued by sadness, urged the king to follow these sacred lessons. The warning was heeded, and Ivan became a new creature. Whatever explanations philosophy may attempt of the sudden and marvelous change of the character of Ivan the Fourth, the fact remains one of the marvels of history. He appears to have been immediately overwhelmed with a sense of his guilt. With tears he extended his hand to the courageous monitor, asked imploringly what he could do to avert the wrath and secure the favor of heaven, and placed himself at once under the guidance of his new-found friend. Sylvester, a humble world-renouncing Christian, sought nothing for himself and would accept neither riches nor honors, but he remained near the throne to strengthen the young monarch in his good resolutions. There was a young man, Alexis Adashev, connected with the court, who possessed a character of extraordinary nobleness and loveliness. He was of remarkable personal beauty, and his soul was pure and sensitive, entirely devoted to the good of others, without the least apparent mixture of sordid motives. He engaged in the service of the Tsar, and became to him a friend of priceless value. Alexis, mingling freely with the people, was acquainted with all their wants and griefs, and he, cooperating with Sylvester, inspired the emperor with a heart to conceive and energy to execute all good things. From this conjunction is to be dated the commencement of the glory of the reign of Ivan the Fourth. The first endeavor of the reformed monarch was to quell the tumult among the people. Three days after the assassination of the Glinskys, a mob from Moscow rushed out to the village of Vorobyov, surrounded the palace, and demanded one of the aunts of the emperor and another of the nobles who had become obnoxious to them. The king immediately opened a fire upon mob and dispersed them. This decisive act restored order. Ivan IV immediately devoted all his energies to preparing dwellings for the houseless poor and in relieving their necessities. His whole soul seemed aroused to promote the happiness of his subjects, both temporal and spiritual, and all selfish considerations were apparently obliterated from his mind. In order to consolidate, by the aid of religion, the happy change effected in the government and in his own heart, the young sovereign shut himself up for several days in solitude, and in the exercises of self-examination, fasting and prayer, made the entire consecration of himself to his Maker. He then assembled the bishops in one of the churches, and, in their presence, with touching words and tearful eyes, made confessions of his faults, implored divine forgiveness, and then, with the calmness of a soul, relieved of the burden of sin, received the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. With true nobility of soul, he wished his penitence to be as conspicuous as his sins had been. He resolved to humble himself before his Maker, and, in the presence of all Russia, that his subjects universally might understand the new principles which animated his heart, and the new desires which would enlist his energies. Every city in the empire received orders to send deputies to Moscow, chosen from all the ranks of society, to attend the matters of the utmost importance to the country. The Sabbath morning after their arrival they were all assembled, an immense multitude, in one of the public squares of the city. The Tsar, accompanied by the clergy and the nobles, left the palace of the Kremlin to meet the deputies. The solemnity of the Sabbath hallowed the scene, and the people received their sovereign in profound silence. The Metropolitan Bishop first offered a prayer. Ivan IV, then standing on a platform, addressed the bishop in the following terms. Holy Father, your zeal for religion, your love for our country, are well known to me. Aid me in my good intentions. I lost while an infant my parents, and the nobles who sought only their own aggrandizement, neglected entirely my education, and have usurped in my name wealth and power. They have enriched themselves by injustice, and have crushed the poor without any one daring to check their ambition. I was, as it were, both deaf and dumb to my deplorable ignorance, for I heard not the lamentations of the poor, and my words solaced them not in their sorrows. 
Who can tell the tears which have been shed, the blood which has flowed? For all these things the judgment of God is to be feared. Bowing then on all sides to the people, the monarch continuing thus addressed them, O oh, you my people, whom the all-powerful has entrusted to my care, I invoke this day in my behalf both your religion and the love you have for me. It is impossible to repair past faults, but I will hereafter be your protector from oppression and all wrong. Forget those griefs which shall never be renewed. Lay aside every subject of discord and let Christian love fraternize your hearts. From this day I will be your judge and your defender. Religious ceremonies, simple yet imposing, closed the scene. Alexis Adashev was appointed Minister of Justice, receiving special instructions to watch the empire with a vigilant eye, that the poor especially should be subject to no oppression. From that moment all the actions of the sovereign were guided by the counsels of Sylvester and Adashev. Ivan the Fourth assembled around him a council of his wisest and best men, and ever presided in person over their meetings. With great energy he entered upon the work of establishing a code of laws which should be based upon love of justice and good order. In the year 1550 this important code was promulgated, which forms almost the basis of Russian civilization. On the 23rd of February 1551, a large convention of the clergy, of the nobles, and of the principal citizens of the empire, was assembled at the Kremlin, and the emperor presented to them, for their own consideration and approval, the code of laws which has been framed. The mind of Ivan IV expanded rapidly under these noble toils, and in a speech of great eloquence he urged them to examine these laws, to point out any defects, and to cooperate with him in every endeavor for the prosperity of Russia. After having thus settled the affairs of the state, the monarch turned his attention to those of the church, urging the clergy to devote themselves to the work of ecclesiastical reform, to add simplicity to the ceremonies of religion, to prepare books of piety for people, to train up a thoroughly instructed clergy for the pulpits, to establish rules of the decorous observance of divine worship, to abolish useless monasteries, to purify the convents of all immorality, and to insist that ecclesiastics of every grade should be patterns of piety for their flocks. The clergy eagerly engaged in this plan of reform, and vied with their Christian monarchs in their efforts for the public weal. Among the number of projects truly worthy of the Grand Prince, we must not neglect particular mention of his attempt to enrich Russia by encouraging the immigration from other lands of men distinguished in the arts and sciences. A distinguished German named Schlitt, being in Moscow in 1547, informed the Tsar of the rapid progress Germany was making in civilization and enlightenment. Ivan IV listened attentively and, after many interviews and protracted questionings, proposed that he should return to Germany as an envoy from Russia and invite, in his name, to Moscow, artists, physicians, apothecaries, printers, mechanics, and also literary men, skilled in the languages dead or living, and learned theologians. Schlitt accepted the mission and hastened to Augsburg, where the Emperor Charles V was then presiding over a diet. Schlitt presented to him a letter from Ivan IV, relative to this business. Charles was a little doubtful as to the expediency of allowing illustrious men from his empire to immigrate and thus add to the consideration and power of a rival kingdom. Nevertheless, after a long deliberation with an assembled states, he consented to gratify the Tsar on consideration that he would engage by oath not to allow any of the artists or the literati to pass from Russia into Turkey, and that he would not employ their talents in any manner hurtful to the German Empire. Turkey was at the time assuming an attitude so formidable that it was deemed expedient to increase the power of Russia, as that kingdom might thus more effectually aid as a barrier against the Turks, while at the same time it was deemed a matter of the utmost moment that Turkey should receive no aid whatever from Christian civilization. 
Charles V accordingly gave Schlitt a written commission to raise his corps of emigrants. He soon assembled 120 illustrious men at Lübeck, where they were to embark for Russia. But in the meantime, the opposition had gained ground, and even Charles V himself had become apprehensive that Russia, thus enlightened, might attain to formidable power. He accordingly had Schlitt arrested, the corps of immigrants thus deprived of their leader, and consequently disheartened, soon dispersed. Several months passed away before Ivan the Fourth received intelligence of the sad fate of his envoy. Though the plan thus failed, nevertheless, quite a number of these German artists, notwithstanding the prohibition of the emperor, effected their escape from Germany, secretly entered Russia, and engaged in the service of the Tsar, where they were very efficient in contributing to Russian civilization. The barbarian horde at Kazan still continued to annoy Russia with very many incursions. Some were mere petty forays, others were extended invasions, but all were alike merciless and bloody. In February 1550, Ivan IV, then but twenty-two years of age, placed himself at the head of a large army to descend the Volga and punish the horde. The monarch was young and totally inexperienced in war. A series of terrible disasters from storms and floods thinned his ranks, and the monarch in great dejection returned to Moscow to replenish his forces. Again, early in December, he hastened to meet his army, which had been rendezvoused at Nizhny Novgorod on the Volga, about three hundred miles west of Moscow. In the early spring they descended the river, and in great force encamped before the walls of Kazan. The walls were of wood. The Russians were sixty thousand strong, and were aided with several batteries of artillery. The assault was immediately commenced, and for one whole day the battle raged with equal valor on the part of the assailants and the defendants. The next day a storm arose, the rain falling abundantly and freezing as it touched the ground. The encampment was flooded, and the assailants, unable to make any progress, were again compelled to beat a retreat. These reverses mortified the young Tsar, though he succeeded in effecting a treaty with the barbarians, which in some degree covered his disgrace. But the horde, entirely disorganized, paid no regard to treaties and continued their depredations. Again in the year 1552, the Tsar prepared another expedition to check their ravages. He announced to the council, in a very solemn session, that the time had arrived when it was necessary at all hazards to check the pride of the horde. God is my witness, said he, that I do not seek vain glory, but I wish to secure the repose of my people. How shall I be able in the day of judgment to say to the Most High, Behold me and the subject thou hast entrusted to my care, if I do not shelter them from the eternal enemies of Russia, from these barbarians, from whom one can have neither peace nor truce? The lords endeavor to persuade the emperor to remain at Moscow and to entrust the expedition to his experienced generals, but he declared that he would not expose his army to perils and fatigues, which he was not also ready and willing to share. Though many were in favor of a winter's campaign, as Kazan was surrounded with streams and lakes which the ice would then bridge, yet Ivan decided upon the summer as more favorable for the transportation of his army down the rivers. By the latter part of May, the waters of the Volga and the Oka were covered with bateaux laden with artillery and with military stores, and the banks of those streams were crowded with troops upon the march. Nizhny Novgorod, where the Oka empties into the Volga, was as usual the appointed place of rendezvous. The 16th of June, Ivan took leave of the Empress Anastasia. Her emotion at parting was so great that she fell fainting into the arms of her husband. From his palace, Ivan proceeded to the Church of the Assumption, where the blessing of heaven was implored, and then issuing orders that the bishops all over the empire should offer prayers daily for the success of the expedition, he mounted his horse, and accompanied by the cavalry of his guard, took the route to Kolomna, a city on the Oka, about a hundred miles south of Moscow. 
It will be remembered that the Tartar horde existed in several vast encampments. One of these encampments occupied Taurid, as the region north of the Crimea and including that peninsula was then called. These barbarians, thinking that the Russian army was now 500 miles west of Moscow at Kazan, and that empire was thus defenseless, with a vast army of invasion, were on the eager march for Moscow. Ivan and Kolomna heard joyfully of their approach, for he was prepared to meet them and to chastise them with merited severity. On the 22nd of July, the horde, unconscious of their danger, surrounded the walls of Tula, a city about a hundred miles south of Kolomna. Ivan himself, heading a division of the army, fell fiercely upon them, and the Tatars were totally routed, losing artillery, camels, banners, and a large number of prisoners. They were pursued a long distance, as in wild rout they fled back to their own country. This brilliant success greatly elated the army, Ivan IV sending his trophies to Moscow as an encouragement to the capital, again put his army in motion towards Kazan. The relation which existed between the sovereign and his pastor, the faithful metropolitan bishop, may be inferred from the following communications which passed between them equally worthy of them both. May the soul of your majesty, wrote the metropolitan, remain pure and chaste, be humble in prosperity and courageous in adversity. The piety of a sovereign saves and blesses his empire. The Tsar replied, Worthy pastor of the church, we thank you for your Christian instructions. We will engrave them in our heart. Continue to ask your wise counsels, and aid us also with your prayers. We advance against the enemy. May the Lord soon enable us to secure peace and repose to the Christians. On the 13th of August, with his assembled army, he reached Vyansk on the Volga, about 50 miles above Kazan. Here he encamped to concentrate and rest his troops after so long a march. Barges freighted with provisions, merchandise and munitions of war were incessantly arriving from the vast regions watered by the Volga and the Oka. As by magic, an immense city spread out over the green plain. Tents glistened in the sun, banners waved, and horsemen and footmen, in all the gorgeous panoply of war, extended as far as the eye could reach. While resting here, Ivan IV sent an embassy to Kazan, saying that the Tsar sought their repentance and amendment, not their destruction, that if they would deliver up to the punishment of the authors of sedition, he would give satisfactory pledges of future friendliness they might live in peace under the paternal government of the Tsar. To this message, a contemptuous and defiant response was returned by the Tatar Khan. The answer was closed with these words, We are anxiously awaiting your arrival and are all ready to commence our festivities. That very day the Russian army, amounting to 150,000 men, arrived within sight of Kazan. A prairie four miles in width, carpeted with flowers, extended from Volga to the range of mountains at the base of which the city stood. The Tatars, abounding in wealth, by the aid of engineers and architects from all lands, had surrounded the city with massive walls defended with towers, ramparts, and bastions in the most formidable strength of military art as then known. Within the walls rose the minarets of innumerable mosques, and the turrets of palaces embellished with all the gorgeousness of oriental wealth and taste. The horde, relying upon the strength of their fortification, remained behind their walls, where they prepared for a defense which they doubted not would be successful. Two days were employed in disembarking the artillery and the munitions of war. While thus engaged, a deserter escaped from the city and announced to the Tsar that the fortress was abundantly supplied with artillery, provisions, and all means of defense, that the garrison consisted of 32,700 veteran soldiers, that a numerous corps of cavalry had been detached to scour the surrounding country and raise an army of cavalry and infantry to assail the besiegers in flank and rear, while the garrisons should be prepared to sally from their entrenchments. In the 23rd of August, at the dawn of day, the army, advancing from the river, approached the city. 
The moment the sun appeared in the horizon, at the sound of innumerable trumpets, the whole army arrested their steps, and the sacred standard was unfurled, presenting the effigy of Jesus Christ, our Savior, surmounted by a golden cross. Ivan IV and his staff alighted from their horses, and, beneath the shadow of the banner, with prayers and other exercises of devotion, received the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The monarch then rode along the ranks, and, in an impassioned harangue, roused the soldiers to the noblest enthusiasm. Exalting the glory of those who might fall in the defense of religion, he assured them, in the name of Russia, that their wives and their children should never be forgotten, but that they should be the objects of his special care and should ever enjoy protection and abundance. In conclusion, he assured them that he was determined to sacrifice his own life, if necessary, to secure the triumph of the cross. These words were received with shouts of acclaim. The chaplain of Ivan, elevated to the view of the whole army, pronounced a solemn benediction upon the sovereign and upon all the troops, and then, bowing to the sacred standard, exclaimed, O Lord, it is in thy name we now march against the infidels. With waving banners and pealing trumpets, the army was now conducted before the walls of the city. Everything there seemed abandoned and in profound silence and solitude. Not the slightest movement could be perceived. Not an individual appeared upon the walls. Many of the Russians began to rejoice, imagining that the Tsar of Kazan, struck with terror, had fled with his army into the forest. But the generals more experienced suspected a snare and regarded the aspect of affairs as a motive for redoubled prudence. With great caution they made their dispositions for commencing the siege. As a division of seven thousand troops were crossing a bridge which they had thrown over a ditch near the walls, suddenly a violent uproar succeeded the profound silence which had reigned in the city. The air was filled with cries of rage. The massive gates rolled open upon their hinges, and fifteen thousand mounted Tatars, armed to the teeth, rushed upon the little band with a shock utterly resistless, and in a few moments the Russians were cut to pieces in the presence of the whole army. The victorious Tatars, having achieved this signal exploit, swept back again into the city, and the gates were closed. This event taught the Russians prudence. Anticipating a long siege, a city of tents was reared, with its streets and squares beyond the reach of the guns from the walls. Three churches of canvas were constructed where worship was daily held. Day after day the siege was conducted with the usual events witnessed around a beleaguered fortress. There were the thunderings of artillery, the explosions of mines, fierce and bloody sorties, the shrieks of the combatants, and the city ever burning by flames and kindled by red-hot shot thrown over the walls. The Russian batteries grew every day more and more formidable, and the ramparts crumbled beneath their blows. The Russian army was so numerous that the soldiers relieved themselves at the batteries, and the bombardment was continued day and night. At length a Tatar army was seen descending the distant mountains and hastening to the relief of the garrison. Ivan dispatched one half his army to meet them. The Tatars, after a sanguinary conflict, were cut to pieces. As the division returned, covered with dust and blood, and exulting in their great achievement, Ivan displayed the prisoners, the banners, and the spoils he had taken before the walls of the city. A herald was then sent to address these words to the besieged. Ivan promises you life, liberty, and pardon for the past, if you will submit yourselves to him. The response returned was, We had rather die by our own pure hands than perish by those of miserable Christians. The answer was followed by a storm of all the missiles of war. The monarch, wishing as far as possible to save the city from destruction and to avoid the effusion of blood, directed a German engineer to sink a mine under an important portion of the walls. The miners proceeded until they could hear the footsteps of the Kazanians over their heads. Eleven tons of powder were placed in the vault. On the 5th of September, the match was applied. The explosion was awful. 
Large portions of the wall, towers, buildings, rocks, the mutilated bodies of men, were thrown hundreds of feet into the air and fell upon the city, crushing the dwellings and the inhabitants. The besieged were seized with mortal terror, not knowing to what to attribute so dire a calamity. The Russians, who were prepared for the explosion, waving their swords, with loud outcries, rushed in at the breach. But the Kazanians, soon recovering from their consternation, with their breasts and their artillery presented a new rampart, and beat back the foe. Thus, day after day, the horrible carnage continued. Within the city and without the city, death held high carnival. There were famine and pestilence and misery in all imaginable forms within the walls. In the camp of the besiegers there were mutilation and death's agonies and despair. Army after army of Tatars came to the help of the besieged by they were mown down mercilessly by Russian sabers and trampled beneath Russian hoofs. Ivan, morning and evening with his generals, entered the church to implore the blessings of God upon his enterprise. In no other way could he rescue Russia from the invasion of these barbarians than by thus appealing to the energies of the sword. In the contemplation of such a tragedy, the mind struggles in bewilderment and can only say, Be still and know that I am God. End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of the Empire of Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time by John Stevens Cabot Abbott. Chapter fourteen. The Reign of Ivan the Fourth. Continued. From 1552 to 1557. Siege of Kazan, artifices of war, the explosion of mines, the final assault, complete subjugation of Kazan, gratitude and liberality of the Tsar, return to Moscow, joy of the inhabitants, birth of an heir to the crown, insurrection in Kazan, the insurrection quelled, conquest of Astrakhan, the English expedition in search of a northeast passage to India, the establishment at Archangel, commercial relations between France and Russia, Russian embassy to England, extension of commerce. The Russians had now been a month before the walls of Kazan. Ten thousand of the defenders had already been slain. The autumnal sun was rapidly declining and the storms of winter were approaching. Secretly, they now constructed, a mile and a half from the camp, an immense tower upon wheels, and rising higher than the walls of the city. Upon the platform of this tower they placed sixteen cannon of the largest caliber, which were worked by the most skillful gunners. In the night this terrible machine was rolled up to the walls, and with the first dawn of the morning opened its fire upon the dwellings and the streets. The carnage was at first horrible, but the besieged at length took refuge in subterranean walks and covered ways, where they indomitably continued the conflict. The artillery placed upon the walls of Kazan were speedily dismounted by the batteries on the tower. A new series of mines beneath the walls were now constructed by the Russian engineers, which were to operate with destructive power hitherto unrecorded in the annals of war. On the 1st of October the Tsar announced to the army that the mines were ready to be fired, and wished them to prepare for the general assault. While one half of the troops continued the incessant bombardment, the other half were assembled in the churches to purify themselves for the conflict by confession, penitence, prayer, and the partaking of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The divisions then exchanged, that the whole army might prostrate itself before God. Ivan the Fourth himself retired with his confessor and passed several hours in earnest devotion. The night preceding the assault there was no repose in either camp. 
The Kazanians, who were anxiously awaiting events, had perceived an extraordinary movement among the Russians, as each battalion was guided to the spot whence it was to rush over the ruins immediately after the explosion. Forty-eight tons of powder had been placed in the mines. The morning of the 2nd of October dawned serene and cloudless. The earliest light revealed the Russians and the Kazanians each at their posts. The moment the sun appeared above the horizon, the explosion took place. First the earth trembled and rose and fell for many miles as if shaken by an earthquake. A smothered roar, swelling into peeling thunder, ensued which appalled every mind. Immense volumes of smoke, thick and suffocating, instantaneously rolled over the city and the beleaguering camp, converting day into night. A horrible melange of timber, rocks, guns, and mutilated bodies of men, women, and children were hurled into the air through the storm cloud of war and fell in hideous ruin alike upon the besiegers and the besieged. At the moment when the explosion took place, one of the bishops in the church was reading the words of our Saviour, foretelling the peaceful reign of fraternity and of heavenly love. Henceforth there shall be but one flock and one shepherd. Strange contrast between the spirit of heaven and the woes of the fallen world. For a moment even the Russians, though all prepared for the explosion, were paralyzed by its direful effects. But instantly recovering, they raised this simultaneous shout, God is with us, and rushing over the debris of ruin and blood, penetrated the city. The Tatars met them with the fury of despair, appealing in their turn to Allah and Mohammed. Soon the Russian banner floated over tottering towers and blackened walls, though for many hours the battle raged with fierceness which human energies cannot exceed. Prince Vorotinsky, early in the afternoon, soiled with blood and blackened with smoke, rode from the ruins of the city into the presence of Ivan, and bowing said, Sire, rejoice! Your bravery and your good fortune have secured the victory. Kazan is ours, the Khan is in your power, the people are slain or taken captive. Unspeakable riches have fallen into our hands. Let God be glorified, cried Ivan, raising his eyes and his hands to heaven. Then, taking the sacred standard in his own hands, he entered the city, planted the banner in one of the principal squares, ordered a Te Deum there to be chanted, and then directed that upon that spot the foundation should be laid of the first Christian temple. All the booty Ivan surrendered to the army, saying, The only riches I desire are the repose and the honor of Russia. Then, assembling his troops around him, he thus addressed them. Valiant lords, generals, officers, all of you who in this solemn day have suffered for the glory of God, for religion, your country, and your emperor, you have acquired immortal glory. Never before did a people develop such bravery. Never before was so signal a victory gained. How can I suitably reward your glorious actions? And you who repose on the field of honor, noble children of Russia, you are already in the celestial realms, in the midst of Christian martyrs, and all resplendent with glory. This is the recompense with which God has rewarded you. But as of us, it is our duty to transmit your names to future ages, and the sacred list in which they shall be enrolled shall be placed in the temple of the Lord, that they may ever live in the memory of men. You, who bathed in your blood, still live to experience the effects of my love and my gratitude. All of you brave warriors now before me, listen attentively to my words, and repose perfect confidence in the promises I make to you this day, that I will cherish you and protect you to the end of my life. These were not idle words. Ivan personally visited the wounded, cheered them with his sympathy, 
and ever after watched over them with parental care. His brother-in-law Daniel was immediately sent an envoy to the empress and to the metropolitan bishop to inform them of the victory. The day was closed by a festival in a gorgeous tent where all the principal officers and lords were invited to dine with the Tsar. A proclamation was addressed to all the tribes and nations of the conquered region. Come, said the Russian Tsar, without fear to me. The past is forgotten, for perfidy has received its reward. I shall require of you only the tribute which you have heretofore paid to the Tsars of Kazan. On the 3rd of October, the dead were buried and the whole city was cleansed. The next day Ivan, accompanied by his clergy, his council, and the chiefs of his army, made his triumphal entrance and laid, on the designated spot, the cornerstone of the cathedral church of the Visitation. He also made the tour of the city, bearing the sacred banner and consecrating Kazan to the true God. The clergy sprinkled holy water upon the streets and upon the walls of the houses, imploring the benediction of heaven upon this new rampart of Christianity. They prayed that the inhabitants might be preserved from all maladies, that they might be strengthened to repel every enemy, and that the city might forever remain the glorious heritage of Russia. Having traversed the whole city and the designated places for the erection of churches, the Tsar gave orders for the immediate rebuilding of the fortifications, and then, accompanied by his court, he took possession of the palace of the Khan, over which now floated the banners of the cross. It was thus that one of the most considerable principalities of the descendants of Genghis Khan fell into the hands of Russia. Kazan was founded upon the ruins of ancient Bulgaria and, situated upon the frontiers of Russia, had long filled the empire with terror. Ivan immediately established a new government for the city and the surrounding region, which was occupied by five different nations powerful in numbers and redoubtable in war. An army of about 10,000 men was left to garrison the fortresses of the city. On the 11th of October, the emperor prepared to return to Moscow. Many of the lords counseled that he should remain at Kazan until spring, that the more distant regions might be overawed by the presence of the army. But the monarch, impatient to see his spouse and to present himself in Moscow fresh from these fields of glory, rejected these sage counsels and adopted the advice of those who also wished to repose beneath the laurels they had already acquired. Passing the night of the 11th of October on the banks of the Volga, he embarked on the morning of the 12th in a barge to ascend the stream while the cavalry followed along upon the banks. The emperor passed one day at Sviazk and proceeded to Nizhny Novgorod. The whole city, men, women, and children, flocked to meet him. They could not find words strong enough to express their gratitude for their deliverance from the terrible incursions of the horde. They fell at their monarch's feet, bathed his hands with their tears, and implored heaven's blessing upon him. From Nizhny Novgorod the emperor took the land route through Balakna and Vladimir to Moscow. On the way he met a courier from the Empress Anastasia, announcing to him that she had given birth to a son whom she named Dmitri. The Tsar, in the tumult of his joy, leaped from his horse, passionately embraced Trachaniot, the herald, and then falling upon his knees with his tears trickling down his cheeks, rendered thanks to God for the gift. Not knowing how upon this spot to recompense the herald for the blissful tidings, he took the royal cloak from his own shoulders and spread it over Trahaniot, and passed into his hands the magnificent charger from whom he the monarch had just alighted. He spent the night of the 28th of October in a small village but a few miles from Moscow, all things being prepared for his triumphant entrance into the capital the next day. With the earliest light in the morning he advanced toward the city. The crowd, even at that early hour, was so great that for a distance of four miles there was but a narrow passage left through the dense ranks of the people for the Tsar and his guard. The emperor advanced slowly, greeted by the acclaim of more than a million of his people, 
With uncovered head, he bowed to the right and to the left, while the multitude incessantly cried, May heaven grant long life to our pious Tsar, conqueror of barbarians and savior of Christians. At the gate he was met by the Metropolitan, the bishops, the lords, and the princes, ranged in order of procession under the sacred banner. Ivan IV dismounted and addressed them in touching words of congratulation. The response of the Metropolitan was soulful, flooding the eyes of the monarch and exciting all who heard it to the highest enthusiasm. As for us, O Tsar, he said in conclusion, in testimony of our gratitude for your toils and your glorious exploits, we prostrate ourselves before you. At these words, the Metropolitan, the clergy, the dignitaries and the people fell upon their knees before their sovereign, bowing their faces to the ground. There were sobbings and shoutings, cries of benedictions and transports of joy. The monarch was now conducted to the Kremlin, which had been rebuilt, and attended Mass in the Church of the Assumption. He then hastened to the palace to greet his spouse. The happy mother was in the chamber of convalescence with her beautiful boy at her side. For once at least there was joy in a palace. The enthusiasm which reigned in the capital and throughout all Russia was such as has never been surpassed. The people trained to faith and devotion crowded the churches which were constantly open, addressing incessant thanksgiving to heaven. The preachers exhausted the powers of eloquence in describing the grandeur of the actions of their prince, his exertions, fatigues, bravery, the stratagems of war during the siege, the despairing ferocity of the Kazanians, and the final and glorious result. After several days passed in the bosom of his family, Ivan gave a grand festival in his palace on the 8th of November. The Metropolitan, the bishops, the abbeys, the princes, and all the lords and warriors who had distinguished themselves during the siege of Kazan were invited. Never, say the analysts, had there before been seen at Moscow a feat so sumptuous, joy so intense, or liberality so princely. The feat continued for three days, during which the emperor did not cease to distribute, with a liberal hand, proofs of his munificence. His bounty has extended from the metropolitan bishop down to the humblest soldier distinguished for his bravery or his wounds. The monarch, thus surrounded with glory, beloved by his people, the conqueror of a foreign empire and the pacificator of his own, distinguished for the nobleness of his personal character and the grandeur of his exploits, likewise as a legislator and humane as a man, was still but twenty-two years of age. His career, thus far, presents a phenomenon quite unparalleled in history. As soon as Anastasia was able to leave her couch, she accompanied the Tsar to the monastery of Troitsky, where his infant son Dmitri received the ordinance of baptism. It seems to be the doom of life that every calm should be succeeded by a storm, that days of sunshine should be followed by darkness and tempests. Early in the year 1553 tidings reached Moscow that the barbarians at Kazan were in bloody insurrection. The Russian troops had been worsted in many conflicts, very many of them were slain. The danger was imminent that the insurrection would prove successful and that the Russians would be entirely exterminated from Kazan. The imprudence of the emperor in withdrawing before the conquest was consolidated was now apparent to all. To add to the consternation, the monarch himself was suddenly seized with an inflammatory fever. The progress of the malady was so rapid that almost immediately his life was despaired of. The mind of the Tsar was unclouded, and being informed of his danger, without any apparent agitation, he called for his secretary to draw up his last will and testament. The monarch nominated for his successor his infant son, Dmitri. To render the act more imposing, he requested the lords, who were assembled in an adjoining saloon, 
to take the oath of allegiance to his son. Immediately the spirit of revolt was manifested. Many of the lords dreaded the long minority of the infant prince and the government of the regency which would probably ensue. The contest, loud and angry, reached the ears of the king, and he sent for the refractory lords to approach his bedside. Ivan, burning with fever, with hardly strength to speak, and expecting every hour to die, turned his eyes to them reproachfully and said, Who then do you wish to choose for your Tsar? I am too feeble to speak long. Dmitri, though in his cradle, is none the less your legitimate sovereign. If you are deaf to the voice of conscience, you must answer for it before God. One of the nobles frankly responded, Sire, we are all devoted to you and to your son, but we fear the regency of Yuriev, who will undoubtedly govern Russia in the name of an infant who has not yet attained his intellectual faculties. This is the true cause of our solicitude. To how many calamities we were not exposed during the government of the lords before your majesty had attained the age of reason. It is necessary to avoid the recurrence of such woes. The monarch was now too feeble to speak, and the nobles withdrew from his chamber. Some took the oath to obey the will of the sovereign, others refused, and the bitter strife extended through the city and the kingdom. The dissentients rallied round the prince Vladimir, and the nation was threatened with civil war. The next day the Tsar had revived a little, and again assembled the lords in his chamber, and entreated them to take the oath of submission to his son and to Anastasia, the guardian of the infant prince. Overcome by the exertion, the monarch sank into a state of lethargy, and to all seemed to be dying. But being young, temperate and vigorous, it proved but the crisis of the disease. He awoke from his sleep calm and decidedly convalescent. Deeply wounded by the unexpected opposition which he had encountered, he yet manifested no spirit of revenge, though Anastasia, with woman's more sensitive nature, could never forget the opposition which had been manifested towards herself and her child. Ivan, during his sickness, had made a vow that in case of recovery he would visit in homage the monastery of St. Cyril, some thousand miles distant beyond the waves of the Volga. It is pleasant to record the remonstrance with Maxim, one of the clergy, made against the fulfillment of his wishes. You are about, said he, to undertake a dangerous journey with your spouse and your infant child. Can the fulfillment of a vow which reason disapproves, be agreeable to God? It is useless to seek in desert that heavenly Father who fills the universe with His presence. If you desire to testify to heaven the gratitude you feel, do good upon the throne. The conquest of Kazan, an event so propitious for Russia, has nevertheless caused the death of many Christians. The widows, the mothers, the orphans of warriors, who fell upon the field of honor, are overwhelmed with affliction. Endeavor to comfort them and to dry their tears by your beneficence. These are the deeds pleasing to God and worthy of a czar. Nevertheless, the monarch persisted in his plan and entered upon the long journey. He buried his child by the way and returned overwhelmed with grief. But he encountered a greater calamity than the death of the young prince in bad advice, which he received from Vasyan, the aged and venerable prince of Kolomna. Sire, had the unwise ecclesiastic, if you wish to become a monarch truly absolute, ask advice of no one, and deem no one wiser than yourself. Establish it as an irrevocable principle never to receive the counsels of others, but, on the contrary, give counsel to them. Command, but never obey. Then you will be a true sovereign, terrible to the lords. Remember that the counselors of the wisest princes always in the end dominate over them. The subtle poison which this disclosure distilled 
penetrated the soul of Ivan. He seized the hand of Vasyan, pressed it to his lips, and said, My father himself could not have given me advice more salutary. Bitterly was the prince deceived. Experience has proved that in the counsel of the wise and virtuous there is safety. There was no sudden change in the character of Ivan. He still continued for some years to manifest the most sincere esteem for the opinions of Sylvester and Adashev. But the poison of bad principles was gradually diffusing itself through his heart. A year had not passed away ere Ivan was consoled by the birth of another son. In the meantime, he devoted himself with ardor to measures for the restoration of tranquillity in Kazan. A numerous army was assembled at Nizhny Novgorod with orders to commence the campaign for the reconquest of the country as soon as the cold of winter should bridge the lakes and streams. The Tatars had made very vigorous efforts to repel their foes by summoning every fighting man to the field and by the construction of fortresses and throwing up of redoubts. In November of 1553, the storm of battle was recommenced on fields of ice and amidst smothering tempests of snow. For more than a month there was not a day without a conflict. In these incessant engagements the Tatars lost 10,000 men slain and 6,000 prisoners. 1,600 of the most distinguished of these prisoners, princes, nobles and chieftains, who had been the most conspicuous in the rebellion, were put to death. Nevertheless, these severities did not stifle the insurrection. The Tatars, in banditti bands, even crossing the Volga, pillaging, massacring, and burning with savage cruelty. For five years the war raged in Kazan with every accompaniment of ferocity and misery. The country was devastated and almost depopulated. Hardly a chief of note was left alive. The horrors of war then ceased the Russians took possession of the country, filled it with their own emigrants, reared churches, established Christianity, and spread over the community the protection of Russian law. Most of the Kazanians who remained embraced Christianity, and from that time, Kazan, the ancient Bulgaria, has remained an integral portion of the Russian Empire. Soon after a new conquest, more easy but not less glorious was added to that of Kazan. The city and province of Astrakhan, situated at the mouth of the Volga as it enters the Caspian, had existed from the remotest antiquity enjoying wealth and renown even before the foundation of the Russian Empire. In the third century of the Christian era, it was celebrated for its commerce, and it became one of the favorite capitals of the all-conquering Tatars. Russia, being now in the possession of all the upper waters of the Volga, decided to extend their dominions down the river to the Caspian. It was not difficult to find ample causes of complaint against pagan and barbaric hordes, whose only profession was robbery and war. Early in the spring of 1554, a numerous and choice army descended the Volga in Bato to the delta on which Astrakhan is built. The low lands, intersected by the branching stream, is composed of innumerable islands. The inhabitants of the city, abandoning the capital entirely, took refuge among these islands, where they enjoyed great advantages in repelling assailants. The Russians took possession of the city, prosecuted the war vigorously through the summer, and the Tsar, on the 20th of October, which was his birthday, received the gratifying intelligence that every foe was quelled and that the Russian government was firmly established on the shores of the Caspian. Well might Russia now be proud of its territorial greatness. The opening of these new realms encouraged commerce, promoted wealth, and developed to an extraordinary degree the resources of the empire. England was, at that time, far beyond the bounds of the political horizon of Russia. In fact, the Russians hardly knew that there was such a nation. Great Britain was not at that time a maritime power of the first order. Spain, Portugal, Venice, and Genoa were then the great monarchs of the ocean, 
England was just beginning to become the dangerous rival of those states whom she was already so infinitely surpassed in maritime greatness. She had then formed the project of opening a shorter route to the Indies through the North Sea, and, in 1553, during the reign of Edward VI, had dispatched an expedition of three vessels under Hugh Willoughby in search of a northeast passage. These vessels, separated by a tempest, were unable to reunite, and two of them were wrecked upon the icy coast of Russian Lapland in the extreme latitude of 80 degrees north. Willoughby and his companions perished. Some Lapland fishermen found their remains in the winter of the year 1554. Willoughby was seated in a cabin constructed upon the shore, with his journal before him, with which he appeared to have been occupied until the moment of his death. The other ship, commanded by Captain Chancellor, was more fortunate. He penetrated the White Sea and, on the 24th of August, landed in the Bay of Dvina at the Russian monastery of St. Nicholas, where now stands the city of Archangel. The English informed the inhabitants, who were astonished at the apparition of such a ship in their waters, that they were bearers of a letter to the Tsar from the King of England, who desired to establish commercial relations with the great and hitherto almost unknown northern empire. The commandant of the country furnished the mariners with provisions, and immediately dispatched a courier to Ivan at Moscow, which was some six hundred miles south of the Bay of Divina. Ivan the Fourth wisely judged that this circumstance might prove favorable to Russian commerce, and immediately sent a courier to invite Chancellor to come to Moscow, at the same time making arrangements for him to accomplish the journey with speed and comfort. Chancellor, with some of his officers, accepted the invitation. Arriving at Moscow, the English were struck with astonishment in view of the magnificence of the court, the polished address and the dignified manners of the nobles, the rich costume of the courtiers, and particularly with the jeweled and golden brilliance of the throne upon which was seated a young monarch decorated in the most dazzling style of regal splendor and in whose presence all observed the most respectful silence. Chancellor presented to Ivan IV the letter of Edward VI. It was a noble letter worthy of England's monarch, and, being translated into many languages, was addressed generally to all the sovereigns of the East and the North. The letter was dated London in the year 5517 of the creation and of our reign the 17th. The English were honorably received and were invited to dine with the Tsar in the royal palace, which furnished them with a new occasion of astonishment from the sumptuousness which surrounded the sovereign. The guests, more than a hundred in number, were served on plates of gold. The goblets were of the same metal. The servants, one hundred and fifty in number, were also in livery richly decorated with gold lace. The Tsar wrote to Edward that he desired to form with him an alliance of friendship conformable to the precepts of the Christian religion and of every wise government, that he was anxious to do anything in his power which should be agreeable to the King of England, and that the English ambassadors and merchants who might come to Russia should be protected, treated as friends, and should enjoy perfect security. When Chancellor returned to England, Edward the Sixth was already in the tomb, and Mary, bloody Mary, the child of brutal Henry the Eighth, was on the throne. The letter of Ivan the Fourth caused intense excitement throughout England. Every one spoke of Russia as of a country newly discovered, and all were eager to obtain information respecting its history and its geography. An association of merchants was immediately formed to open avenues of commerce with this new world. Another expedition of two ships was fitted out, commanded by Chancellor, to conclude a treaty of commerce with the Tsar. Mary and her husband, Philip of Spain, who was son of the Emperor Charles V, wrote a letter to the Russian monarch full of the most gracious expressions. 
Chancellor and his companions were received with the same cordial hospitality as before. Ivan gave them a seat at his own table, loaded them with favors, and gave to the Queen of England the title of My Dearly Beloved Sister. A commission of Russian merchants was appointed to confer with the English to form a commercial treaty. It was decided that the principal place for the exchange of merchandise should be at Kolmogar, on the Bay of Dwina, nearly opposite the convent of St. Nicholas, that each party should be free to name its own prices, but that every kind of fraud should be judged after the criminal code of Russia. Ivan then delivered to the English a diploma, granting them permission to traffic freely in all the cities of Russia without molestation and without paying any tribute or tax. They were free to establish themselves wherever they pleased to purchase houses and shops and to engage servants and mechanics in their employ and to exact from them oaths of fidelity. It was also agreed that a man should be responsible for his own conduct only and not for that of his agents and that though the sovereign might punish the criminal with the loss of liberty and even of life, yet under no circumstances should he touch his property that should always pass to his natural heirs. The port of St. Nicholas, which for ages had been silent and solitary in these northern waters, where the English had found but a poor and gloomy monastery, the tomb, as it were, of hooded monks, soon became a busy place of traffic. The English constructed there a large and beautiful mansion for the accommodation of their merchants, and streets were formed lined with spacious storehouses. The principal merchandise which the English then imported into Russia consisted of cloths and sugar. The merchants offered twelve guineas for what was then called a half piece of cloth and four shillings a pound for sugar. In 1556, Chancellor embarked for England with four ships, richly laden with the gold and produce of Russia, accompanied by Joseph Nepea, an ambassador to the Queen of England. Fortune, which until then had smiled upon this hardy mariner, now turned adverse. Tempests dispersed his ships, and one only reached London. Chancellor himself perished in the waters upon the coast of Scotland, the ships dashed upon the rocks, and the Russian ambassador Nepea barely escaped with his life. Arriving at London, he was overwhelmed with caresses and presents. The most distinguished dignitaries of the state and 140 merchants, accompanied by a great number of attendants, all richly clad and mounted upon superb horses, rode out to meet him. They presented to him a horse magnificently caparisoned, and thus escorted, the first Russian ambassador made his entrance into the capital of Great Britain. The inhabitants of London crowded the streets to catch a sight of the illustrious Russian, and thousands of voices greeted him with the heartiest acclaim. A magnificent mansion was assigned for his residence, which was furnished in the highest style of splendor. He was invited to innumerable festivals, and the court were eager to exhibit to him everything worthy of notice in the city of London. He was conducted to the Cathedral of St. Paul, to Westminster Abbey, to the Tower, and to all parks and palaces. The Queen received Napea with the most marked consideration. At one of the most gorgeous festivals he was seated by her side, the observed of all observers. The ambassador could only regret that the rich presents of furs and Russian fabrics, which the Tsar had sent by his hand to Mary, were all engulfed upon the coast of Scotland. The Queen sent to the Tsar the most beautiful fabrics of the English looms and the most exquisitely constructed weapons of war, such as sabres, guns, and pistols, and the living lion and lioness animals, which never before had been seen within the bounds of the Russian Empire. In September of 1557, Nepea embarked for Russia, taking with him several English artisans, miners, and physicians. Ivan was anxious to lose no opportunity to gain from foreign lands everything which could contribute to Russian civilization. The letter which Mary and Philip returned to Moscow was flatteringly addressed to the august Emperor Ivan IV. 
when the Tsar learned all the honors and the testimonials of affection with which his ambassador had been greeted in London, he considered the English as the most precious of all the friends of Russia. He ordered mansions to be prepared for the accommodations of their merchants in all the commercial cities of the empire, and he treated them in other respects with such marked tokens of regard that all the letters which they wrote to London were filled with expressions of gratitude towards the Russian sovereign. In the year 1557, an English commercial fleet entered the Baltic Sea and proceeded to the mouth of Dvina to establish there an entrepot of English merchandise. The commander-in-chief of the squadron visited Moscow, where he was received with the greatest cordiality, and thence passed down the Volga to Astrakhan, that he might there establish commercial relations with the Persia. The Tsar, reposing entire confidence in the London merchants, entered into their views and promised to grant them every facility for the transportation of English merchandise, even to the remotest sections of the empire. This commercial alliance with Great Britain, founded upon reciprocal advantages without any commingling of political jealousies, was impressed with a certain character of magnanimity and fraternity which greatly augmented the renown of the reign of Ivan IV, and which was a signal proof of the sagacity of his administration. How beautiful are the records of peace when contrasted with the hideous annals of war! The merchants of the other nations of southern and western Europe were not slow to profit by the discovery that the English had made. Ships from Holland, freighted with the goods of that ingenious and industrious people, were soon coasting along the bays of the great empire and penetrating her rivers engaged in traffic which neither Russia or England seemed disposed to disturb. While the Tsar was engaged in those objects which we have thus rapidly traced, other questions of immense magnitude engrossed his mind. The Tatar horde in Taurid, terrified by the destruction of the horde in Kazan, were ravaging southern Russia with continual invasions which the Tsar found it difficult to repress. Poland was also hostile, ever watching for an opportunity to strike a deadly blow, and Sweden, under Gustavus Vasa, was in open war with the Empire. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of the Empire of Russia」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish the Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time by John Stevens Cabot Abbott Chapter 15 The Abdication of Ivan IV From 1557 to 1582 Terror of the Horde in Taurid War with Gustavus Vasa of Sweden Political Punctilios The Kingdom of Livonia next to Sweden Death of Anastasia Conspiracy against Ivan his abdication, his resumption of the crown, invasion of Russia by the Tatars and Turks, heroism of Serebrinov, utter discomfiture of the Tatars, relations between Queen Elizabeth of England and Russia, intrepid ambassage, new war with Poland, disasters of Russia, the emperor kills his own son, anguish of Ivan IV. The entire subjugation of the Tatars in Kazan terrified the horde in Taurid, lest their turn to be overwhelmed should next come. Devlet Giray, the Han of this horde, was a man of great ability and ferocity. Ivan IV was urged by his consuls immediately to advance to the conquest of the Crimea. The achievement could then doubtless have been easily accomplished, but it was a journey of nearly a thousand miles from Moscow to Taurid. The route was very imperfectly known, much of the intervening region was an inhospitable wilderness. The Sultan of Turkey was the sovereign master of the Horde, and Ivan feared that all the terrible energies of Turkey would be roused against him. There was, moreover, another enemy nearer at home, 
whom Ivan had greater cause to fear. Gustavus Vasa, the king of Sweden, had for some time contemplated with alarm the rapidly increasing power of Russia. He accordingly formed a coalition with the kings of Poland and Livonia, and with the powerful dukes of Prussia and of Denmark, for those two states were then but dukedoms, to oppose the ambition of the Tsar. An occasion for hostilities was found in a dispute respecting the boundaries between Russia and Sweden. The terrible tragedy of war was inducted by a prologue of burning villages, trampled harvests, and massacred peasants upon the frontiers. Sieges, bombardments, and fierce battles ensued with the alternations of success. From one triumphal march of invasion into Sweden, the Russians returned so laden with prisoners that, as their analysts record, a man was sold for one dollar and a girl for five shillings. At length, as usual, both parties became weary of toil and blood and were anxious for a respite. Gustavus proposed terms of reconciliation. Ivan IV accepted the overtures, though he returned a reproachful and indignant answer. Your people, he wrote, have exhausted their ferocity upon our territories. Not only have they burnt our cities and massacred our subjects, but they have even profaned our churches, purloined our images, and destroyed our bells. The inhabitants of Novgorod implored the aid of our grand army. My soldiers burnt with impatience to carry the war to Stockholm, but I restrained them. So anxious was I to avoid the effusion of human blood. All the misery resulting from this war is to be attributed to your pride. Admitting that you were ignorant of the grandeur of Novgorod, you might have learned the facts from your own merchants. They could have told you that even the suburbs of Novgorod are superior to the whole of your capital of Stockholm. Lay aside this pride and give up your quarrelsome disposition. We are willing to live in peace with you. Sweden was not in a condition to resent this rebuke. In February 1557, the ambassadors of Gustavus, consisting of four of the most illustrious men in the empire, clergy and nobles, accompanied by a brilliant suite, arrived in Moscow. They were not received as friends, but as distinguished prisoners who were to be treated with consideration and whose wants were to be abundantly supplied. The Tsar refused to have any direct intercourse with them and would only treat through the dignitaries of his court. A truce was concluded for forty years. The Tsar, to impress the ambassadors with his wealth and grandeur, entertained them sumptuously, and they were served from vessels of gold. Though peace was thus made with Sweden, a foolish quarrel for some time prevented the conclusion of a treaty with Poland. Ivan IV demanded that Augustus, king of Poland, should recognize him as emperor of Russia. Augustus replied that there were but two emperors in the world, the emperor of Germany and the sultan of Turkey. Ivan sent, through his ambassadors to Augustus, the letter of Pope Clement and of Emperor Maximilian, of the Sultan, of the kings of Spain, Sweden, and Denmark, and the recent dispatch of the King of England, all of whom recognized his title of Tsar or Emperor. Still the Polish king would not allow Ivan the title, which seemed to place the Russian throne on an eminence above that of Poland. Unfriendly relations consequently continued, with jealousies and border strifes, though there was no vigorous outbreak of war. Ivan IV now succeeded in attaching Livonia to the great and growing empire. It came in first as tributary, purchasing by an annual contribution peace with Russia and protection. Though there were many subsequent conflicts with Livonia, the territory subsequently became an integral portion of the empire. Russia had now become so great that her growth was yearly manifest as surrounding regions were absorbed by her superior civilization and her armies. The unenlightened states which surrounded her were ever provoking hostilities, invasion, and becoming absorbed. In the year 1558, the Tatars of Taurid, having assembled an army of 100,000 horsemen, a combination of Tatars and Turks, 
suddenly entered Russia, and sweeping resistlessly on, a war tempest of utter desolation reached within two hundred miles of Moscow. There they learned that Ivan himself, with an army more numerous than their own, was on the march to meet them. Turning, they retreated more rapidly than they advanced. Notwithstanding their retreat, Ivan resolved to pursue them to their own haunts. A large number of bateaux was constructed and launched upon the Don and also upon the Dnieper. The army, in these two divisions, descended these streams, one to the Sea of Azov, the other to the mouth of the Dnieper. Thence, invading Torid both by the east and the west, they drove the terrified inhabitants, taken entirely by surprise like sheep before them. The tents of these nomads they committed to the flames. The flocks and herds were seized with a great amount of booty, and many Russian captives were liberated. The Tatars fled to fastnesses whence they could not be pursued. Some Turks, being taken with a horde, Ivan sent them with rich presents to the Sultan, stating that he did not make war against Turkey, only against the robbers of Torid. The Russian troops returned from this triumphant expedition by ascending the waters of the Dnieper. All Russia was filled with rejoicing, while the churches resounded with te deums. And now domestic griefs came to dark in the palace of Ivan. For thirteen years he had enjoyed all the happiness which conjugal love can confer. Anastasia was still in the brilliance of youth and beauty, when she was attacked by a dangerous sickness. As she was lying upon her couch, helpless and burning with fever, the cry of fire was heard. The day was excessively hot. The windows of the palace, all open and drought of several weeks, made everything dry as tinder. The conflagration commenced in an adjoining street, and in a moment volumes of flame and smoke were swept by the wind, enveloping the Kremlin and showering upon it and into it innumerable flakes of fire. The queen was thrown into a paroxysm of terror. The attendants hastily placed her upon a litter and bore her, almost suffocated through the blazing streets, out of the city to the village of Kolomensk. The emperor then returned to assist in arresting the conflagration. He exposed himself like a common laborer, inspiring others with intrepidity by mounting ladders, carrying water, and opposing the flames in the most dangerous positions. The conflagration proved awful in its ravages, many of the inhabitants perishing in the flames. This calamitous event was more than the feeble frame of Anastasia could endure. She rapidly failed, and on the 7th of August, 1560, she expired. The grief of Ivan was heart-rending, and never was national affliction manifested in a more sincere and touching manner. Not only the whole court, but almost the entire city of Moscow, followed the remains of Anastasia to their interment. Many, in the bitterness of their grief, sobbed aloud. The most inconsolable were the poor and friendless, calling Anastasia by the name of mother. The anguish of Ivan for a time quite unmanned him, and he wept like a child. The loss of Anastasia did indeed prove to Ivan the greatest of earthly calamities. She had been his guardian angel, his guide to virtue. Having lost his guide, he fell into many errors from which Anastasia would have preserved him. In the course of a few months, either the tears of Ivan were dried up, or political considerations seemed to render it necessary for him to seek another wife. Notwithstanding the long hereditary hostility which had existed between Russia and Poland, perhaps in consequence of it, Ivan made proposals for a Polish princess, Catherine, sister of Sigismund Augustus the king. The Poles demanded, as an essential item in the marriage contract, that the children of Catherine should take the precedence of those of Anastasia as heirs to the throne. This iniquitous demand the Tsar rejected with the scorn it merited. The revenge in which the Poles indulged was characteristic of the rudeness of the times. The court of Augustus, sent a white mare, beautifully caparisoned, to Ivan with the message that such a wife he would find to be in accordance with his character and wants. 
The outrageous insult incensed Ivan to the highest degree, and he vowed that the Poles should feel the weight of his displeasure. Catherine, in the meantime, was married to the Duke of Finland, who was brother to the King of Sweden, and whose sister was married to the King of Denmark. Thus the three kingdoms of Poland, Sweden, and Denmark, and the Duchy of Finland, were strongly allied by matrimonial ties, and were ready to combine against the Russian emperor. Ivan IV nursed his vengeance, waiting for an opportunity to strike a blow which should be felt. Elizabeth was now Queen of England, and her ambassador at the court of Russia was in high favor with the emperor. Probably through his influence, Ivan showed great favor to the Lutheran clergy, who were gradually gaining followers in the empire. He frequently admitted them to court, and even listened to their arguments in favor of the reformed religion. The higher clergy and the lords were much incensed by this liberality, which, in their view, endangered the ancient usages, both civil and religious, of the realm, and very formidable conspiracy was organized against the Tsar. Ivan IV was a prize of the conspiracy, and, with singular boldness and magnanimity, immediately assembled his leading nobles and higher clergy in the great audience chamber of the Kremlin. He presented himself before them in the glittering robes and with all the insignia of royalty. Divesting himself of them all, he said to his astonished auditors, You have deemed me unworthy any longer to occupy the throne. I here and now give in my abdication and request you to nominate some person whom you may consider worthy to be your sovereign. Without permitting any reply, he dismissed them and the next day convened all the clergy of the Moscow in the Church of St. Mary. A high mass was celebrated by the Metropolitan, in which the monarch assisted, and he then took an affecting leave of them all in a solemn renunciation of all claims to the crown. Accompanied by his two sons, he retired to the strong yet secluded castle of Kalusians, situated about five miles from Moscow. Here he remained several days waiting, and his generally disposed for a delegation to call, imploring him again to resume the crown. In this expectation he was not disappointed. The lords were unprepared for such decisive action. In their councils there was nothing but confusion. Anarchy was rapidly commencing its reign, which would be followed inevitably by civil war. The partisans of the emperor in the provinces were very numerous, and could be rallied by a word from him, and no one imagined that the emperor had any idea of retiring so peacefully. It was not doubted that he would soon appear at the head of an army and punish relentlessly the disaffected who would all then be revealed. The citizens, the nobles, and the clergy met together and appointed a numerous deputation to call upon the emperor and implore him again to resume the reins of power. "'Your faithful subjects, sire,' exclaimed the petitioners, "'are deeply afflicted. The state is exposed to fearful peril from dissension within and enemies without. We do, therefore, most earnestly entreat your majesty as a faithful shepherd still to watch over his flock. We do entreat you to return to your throne, to continue your favor to the deserving, and not to forsake your faithful subject in consequence of the errors of a few. Ivan listened with much apparent indifference to this pathetic address, and either really felt, or affected, great reluctance again to resume the cares of royalty. He requested a day's time to consider their proposal. The next morning the nobles were again convened, and Ivan acquainted them with his decision. Rebuking them with severity for their ingratitude, reproaching them with the danger to which his life had been exposed through their conspiracy, he declared that he could not again assume the cares and the perils of the crown. Still his refusal was not so decisive as to exclude all room for further entreaties. They renewed their supplications with tears, for Russia was indeed exposed to all the horrors of civil war, should Ivan persist in his resolve, and it was certain that the empire thus distracted would at once be invaded by both Poles and Turks. Thus importuned, 
Ivan at last consented to return to the Kremlin. He resolved, however, to make an example of those who had conspired against him, which should warn loudly against the renewal of similar attempts. The principal movers of the plot were executed. Ivan then surrounded himself with a bodyguard of two hundred men carefully selected from the distant provinces, and who were in no way under the influence of any of the lords. This bodyguard, composed of low-born, uneducated men, incapable of being roused by any high enthusiasm, subsequently proved quite a nuisance. Ivan the Fourth had but just resumed his seat upon the throne when couriers from the southern provinces brought the alarming intelligence that an immense army of combined Tatars and Turks had invaded the empire and were on the rapid march, burning and destroying all before them. Selim, the son and successor of Soliman the Magnificent, entered into an alliance with several oriental princes who were to send him succors by the way of the Caspian Sea and raised an army of 300,000 men. These troops were embarked at Constantinople and crossing the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov entered to Reed. Here they were joined by a reinforcement of Crimean Tatars consisting of 40,000 well-armed and veteran fighters. With this force the Sultan marched directly across the country to the Russian city and province of Astrakhan at the mouth of the Volga. But a heroic man, Serebrinov, was in command of the fortresses in this remote province of the Russian Empire. He immediately assembled all his available troops, and, advancing to meet the foe, selected his own ground for the battle in a narrow defile, where the vast masses of the enemy would only encumber each other. Falling upon the invaders unexpectedly from ambuscades, he routed the Turks with great carnage. They were compelled to retreat, having lost nearly all their baggage and heavy artillery. The triumphant Russians pursued them all the way back to the city of Azov, cannonading them with the artillery and the ammunition they had wrestled from their foes. Here the Turks attempted to make a final stand, but a chance shot from one of the guns penetrated the immense powder magazine, and an explosion so terrific ensued that two-thirds of the city were entirely demolished. The Turks, in consternation, now made a rush for their ships, but Zerebrinov, with coolness and sagacity, which no horrors could disturb, had already planned his batteries to sweep them with a storm of bullets and balls. The cannonade was instantly commenced, the missiles of death fell like hailstones into the crowded boats and upon the crowded decks. Many of the ships were sunk, others disabled, and but a few torn and riddled succeeded in escaping to sea, where the most of them also perished beneath the waves of the stormy Euxine. Such was the utter desolation of this one brief war tempest, which lasted but a few weeks. Queen Elizabeth, anxious to maintain friendly relations with an empire so vast and opening before her subjects such a field of profitable commerce, having been informed of the conspiracy against Ivan IV, of his abdication, and of his resumption of the crown, sent to him an ambassador with expressions of her kindest wishes, and assured him that, should he ever be reduced to the disagreeable necessity of leaving his empire, he would find a safe retreat in England, where he would be received and provided for, in a manner suitable to his dignity, where he could enjoy the free exercise of his religion, and be permitted to depart whenever he should wish. The tolerant spirit manifested by Ivan IV towards the Lutherans continued to disturb the ecclesiastics, and the clergy and nobles of the province of Novgorod, headed by an archbishop, formed a plot of dissevering Novgorod from the empire and attaching it to the kingdom of Poland. This conspiracy assumed a very formidable attitude and one of the brothers of the Tsar was involved in it. Ivan immediately sent an army of 15,000 men to quell the revolt. We have no account of this transaction, but from the pens of those who were envenomed by their animosity to the religious toleration of Ivan, we must consequently receive these narratives with some allowance. The army, according to their account, ravaged the whole province, took the city by storm, 
and cut down in indiscriminate slaughter twenty-five thousand men, women, and children. The brother of Ivan the Fourth was seized and thrown into prison, where he miserably perished. The archbishop was stripped of his canonical robes, clad in the dress of a harlequin, paraded through the streets on a grey mare, an object of derision to the people, and then was imprisoned for life. Such cruelty does not seem at all in accordance with the character of Ivan, while the grossest exaggeration is in accordance with the character of all civil and religious partisans. War with Poland seems to have been the chronic state of Russia. Whenever either party could get a chance to strike the other a blow, the blow was sure to be given, and they were alike unscrupulous whether it were a saber blow in the face or a dagger thrust in the back. In the year 1571, a Russian army pursued a discomfited band of Livonian insurgents across the frontier into Poland. The Poles eagerly joined the insurgents and sent envoys to invite the Crimean Tatars to invade Russia from Tauride, while Poland and Livonia should assail the empire from the west. The Tatars were always ready for war at a moment's notice. Seventy thousand men were immediately on the march. They rapidly traversed the southern provinces, trampling down all opposition until they reached the Oka. Here they encountered a few Russian troops who attempted to dispute the passage of the stream. They were, however, speedily overpowered by the Tatars and were compelled to retreat. Pressing on, they arrived within sixty miles of the city, when they found the Russian again concentrated, but now in large numbers, to oppose their progress. A fierce battle was fought. Again the Russians were overpowered, and the Tatars, trampling them beneath their horses' hoofs, with yells of triumph, pressed on towards the metropolis. The whole city was in consternation, for it had no means of effectual resistance. Ivan the Fourth, in his terror, packed up his most valuable effects, and, with the royal family, fled to a strong fortress far away in the north. From the battlements of the city, the banners of these terrible barbarians were soon seen on the approach. With bugle blasts and savage shouts, they rushed at the gates, swept the streets with their sabers, pillaged houses and churches, and set the city on fire in all directions. The city was at that time, according to the testimony of the contemporary analysts, forty miles in circumference. The weltering flames rose and fell as the crater of a volcano, and in six hours the city was in ashes. Thousands perished in the flames. The fire, communicating with a powder magazine, produced an explosion which uphoved the buildings like an earthquake, and prostrated more than a third of a mile of the city walls. According to the most reliable testimony, there perished in Moscow by fire and sword from this one raid of the Tatars more than 150,000 of its inhabitants. The Tatars, tottering beneath the burden of their spoil and dragging after them many thousand prisoners of distinction, slowly, proudly, defiantly retired. With barbaric genius, they sent to the Tsar a naked scimitar accompanied by the following message. This is a token left to your majesty by an enemy whose revenge is still unsatiated and who will soon return again to complete the work which he has but just begun. Such is war. It is but a succession of miseries. A hundred and fifty thousand Tatars perished but a few months before in the waves of Euxine. Now a hundred and fifty thousand Russians perish in their turn amidst the flames of Moscow. When we contemplate the wars which have incessantly ravaged this globe, the history of man seems to be but the record of the strifes of demons with occasional gleams of angel magnanimity. After the retreat of the Tatars, Ivan IV convened a council of war, punished with death those officers who had fled before the enemy as he himself had done, and Rendered pliant by accumulated misfortune, he presented such overtures to the king of Poland as to obtain the promise of a truce for three years. Soon after this, Sigismund, king of Poland, died. 
The crown was elective, and the nobles, who met to choose a new monarch, by a considerable majority invited Maximilian II, Emperor of Germany, to assume the scepter. They assigned as a reason for this choice, which surprised Europe, the religious liberality of the emperor, who, as they justly remarked, had conciliated the contending factions of the Christian world, and had acquired more glory by his pacific policy than other princes had acquired in the exploits of war. A minority of the nobles were displeased with this choice, and refusing to accede to the vote of the majority, proceeded to another election, and chose Stefan Bathory, a warrior chief of Transylvania, as their sovereign. The two parties now rallied around their rival candidates and prepared for war. Ivan IV could not allow so favorable an opportunity to interfere in the politics of Poland to escape him. He immediately sent ambassadors to Maximilian, offering to assist him with all the power of the Russian armies against Stefan Bathory. Maximilian gratefully acknowledged the generosity of the Tsar, and promised to return the favor whenever an opportunity should be presented. At the same time, Stefan Bathory, who was already been crowned King of Poland, sent an ambassador to Moscow to inform Ivan of his election and coronation, and to propose friendly relations with Russia. Ivan answered frankly that a treaty already existed between him and the Emperor Maximilian, but that, since he wished to live on friendly terms with Poland, whoever her monarch might be, he would send ambassadors to examine into the claims of the rival candidates for the crown. Thus, adroitly, he endeavored to obtain for himself the position of umpire between Maximilian and Stefan Bathory. The death of the Emperor Maximilian on the 12th of October 1576 settled this strife, and Stefan attained the undisputed sovereignty of Poland. Almost the first measure of the new sovereign in accordance with hereditary usage was war against Russia. His object was to regain those territories which the Tsar had heretofore wrestled from the Poles. Apparently trivial incidents revealed the rude and fierce characters of the times. Stefan chivalrously sent first an ambassador, Basil Lapotinsky, to the court of Ivan to demand the restitution of the provinces. Lapotinsky was accompanied by a numerous train of nobles, magnificently mounted and armed to the teeth. As the glittering cavalcade, protected by its flag of truce, swept along through the cities of Russia towards Moscow, and it became known that they were the bearers of an imperious message, demanding the surrender of portions of the Russian Empire, the populace were with difficulty restrained from falling upon them. Through a thousand dangers they reached Moscow. When there, Lapotinsky declared that he came not as a suppliant, but to present a claim which his master was prepared to enforce, if necessary, with a sword, and that in accordance with the character of his mission, he was directed in his audience with Ivan to present the letter with one hand while he held his unsheathed saber in the other. The officers of the imperial household assured him that such bravado would inevitably cost him his life. The Tsar, Lapotinsky replied, can easily take my life, and he may do so if he please, but nothing shall prevent me from performing the duty with which I am entrusted with the utmost exactitude. The audience day arrived, Lapotinsky was conducted to the Kremlin, the Tsar in his imperial robes, glittering with diamonds and pearls, received him in a magnificent hall. The haughty ambassador, with great dignity and in respectful terms, yet bold and decisive, demanded reparation for the injuries which Russia had inflicted upon Poland. His gleaming saber was carelessly held in one hand, and the letter to the Tsar from the King of Poland in the other. Having finished his brief speech, he received a scimitar from one of his suite, and, advancing firmly, yet very respectfully, to the monarch, presented them both, saying, Here is peace, and here is war. It is for your majesty to choose between them. 
Ivan IV was capable of appreciating the nobility of such a character. The intrepidity of the ambassador, which was defiled with no comminglings of insolence, excited his admiration. The emperor with a smile took the letter, which was written on parchment in the Russian language and sealed with a seal of gold. Slowly and carefully he read it, and then, addressing the ambassador, said, Such menaces will not induce Russia to surrender her dominions to Poland. We who have vanquished the Poles on so many fields of battle, who have conquered the Tatars of Kazan and Astrakhan, and who have triumphed over the forces of the Ottoman Empire, will soon cause the King of Poland to repent his rashness. He then dismissed the ambassador, ordering him to be treated with the respect due to his high station. War being thus formally declared, both parties prepared to prosecute it with the utmost vigor. The Tsar immediately commenced raising a large army, reinforced his garrisons, and sent a secret envoy to Tauride to excite the Crimean Tatars to invade Poland on the southeast, while Russia should make an assault from the north. The Poles opened the campaign by crossing the frontiers with a large army, seizing several minor cities and laying siege to the important fortress of Polotsk. After a long siege, which constituted one of those terrific tragedies of blood and woe, with which the pages of history are filled, but which no pen can describe and no imagination can conceive, the city, a pile of gory and smoldering ruins, fell into the hands of the Poles. Battle after battle, siege after siege, ensued, in nearly all of which the Poles were successful. They were guided by their monarch in person, a veteran warrior who possessed extraordinary military skill. The blasts of winter drove both parties from the field, but in the earliest spring the campaign was opened again with redoubled energy. Again the Poles, who had obtained strong reinforcements of troops from Germany and Hungary, were signally successful. Though the fighting was constant and arduous, the whole campaign was but a series of conquests on the part of Stephen, and when the snows of another winter whitened the fields, the Polish banners were waving over large portions of the Russian territory. The details of these scenes are revolting. Fire, blood, and the brutal passions of demoniac men were combined in deeds of horror the recital of which makes the ears to tingle. Before the buds of another spring had opened into leaf, the contending armies were again upon the march. Poland had now succeeded in enlisting Sweden in her cause, and Russia began to be quite seriously imperiled. Riga, on the Dvina, soon fell into the hands of the Poles, and their banners were resistlessly on the advance. Ivan IV, much dejected, proposed terms of peace. Stephen refused to treat unless Russia would surrender the whole of Livonia, a province nearly three times as large as the state of Massachusetts, to Poland. The Tsar was compelled essentially to yield to these hard terms. The Treaty of Peace was signed on the 15th of January, 1582. Ivan IV surrendered to Poland all of Livonia, which bordered on Poland, which contained thirty-four towns and castles, together with several other important fortresses on the frontiers. A truce was concluded for ten years, should both parties live so long. But should either die, the survivor was at liberty immediately to attack the territory of the deceased. No mention whatever was made of Sweden in this treaty. This neglect gave such offence to the Swedish court that in petty revenge they sent an Italian cook to the Polish court as an ambassador with the most arrogant demands. Stephen very wisely treated the insult, which he probably deserved, with contempt. The result of this war, so humiliating to Russia, rendered Ivan very unpopular. Murmurs loud and deep were heard all over the empire. Many of the nobles threw themselves at the feet of the Tsar, and entreated him not to assent to so disgraceful a treaty, assuring him that the whole nation were ready at his call to rise and drive the invaders from the empire. 
Ivan was greatly incensed and petulantly replied that if they were not satisfied with his administration, they had better choose another sovereign. Suspecting that his son was inciting this movement and that he perhaps was aiming at the crown, Ivan assailed him in the bitterest terms of reproach. The young prince replied in a manner which so exasperated his father that he struck him with a staff which he had in his hand. The staff was tipped with an iron ferrule, which unfortunately hid the young man on the temple, and he fell senseless at his father's feet. The anguish of Ivan was unspeakable. His paroxysm of anger instantly gave place to a more intense paroxysm of grief and remorse. He threw himself upon the body of his son, pressed him fervently to his heart, and addressed him in the most endearing terms of affection and affliction. The prince, so far revived as to be able to exchange a few words with his father, but in four days he died. The blow which deprived the son of life forever after deprived the father of peace. He was seldom again seen to smile. Any mention of his son would ever throw him into a paroxysm of tears. For a long time he could with difficulty be persuaded to take any nourishment or to change his dress. With the utmost possible demonstrations of grief and respect, the remains of the prince were conveyed to the grave. The death of this young man was a calamity to Russia. He was the worthy son of Anastasia, and from his mother he had inherited both genius and moral worth. By a subsequent marriage Ivan had two other sons, Fyodor and Dmitri. But they were of different blood, feeble in intellect, and possessed no requisites for the exhaled station opening before them. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of the Empire of Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Kluckner. The Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time by John Stevens Cabot Abbott. Chapter 16 The Storms of Hereditary Succession from 1582 to 1608. Anguish and Death of Ivan the Fourth, His Character, Fyodor and Dmitri, Usurpation of Boris Gudnow, The Polish Election, Conquest of Siberia, Assassination of Dmitri, Death of Fyodor, Boris Crowned King, Conspiracies, Reappearance of Dmitri, Boris Poisoned, The Pretender Crowned, Embarrassments of Dmitri, A New Pretender, Assassination of Dmitri, Crowning of Zuski, Indignation of Poland, historical romance. The hasty blow which deprived the son of Ivan of life was also fatal to the father. He never recovered from the effects. After a few months of anguish and remorse, Ivan the Fourth sank sorrowing to the grave. Penitent, prayerful, and assured that his sins were forgiven, he met death with perfect composure. The last days of his life were devoted exclusively to such preparations for his departure that the welfare of his people might be undisturbed. He ordered a general act of amnesty to be proclaimed to all the prisoners throughout all the empire, abolished several onerous taxes, restored several confiscated estates to their original owners, and urged his son Fyodor, who was to be his successor, to make every possible endeavor to live at peace with his neighbors, that Russia might thus be saved from the woes of war. Exhausted by a long interview with his son, he took a bath. On coming out he reclined upon a couch, and suddenly, without a struggle or a groan, was dead. Ivan the Fourth has ever been regarded as one of the most illustrious of the Russian monarchs. He was eminently a learned prince for the times in which he lived, entertaining uncommonly just views both of religion and politics. In religion he was tolerant far above his age, allowing no Christians to be persecuted for their belief. We regret that this high praise must be limited by his treatment of the Jews, whom he could not endure. With conscientiousness, unenlightened and bigoted, he declared that those who had betrayed and crucified the Savior of the world ought not to be tolerated by any Christian prince. He accordingly ordered every Jew either to be baptized into the Christian faith, or to depart from the empire. 
Ivan was naturally of a very hasty temper, which was nurtured by the cruel and shameful neglect of his early years. Though he struggled against this infirmity, it would occasionally break out in paroxysms, which caused bitter repentance. The death of his son, caused by one of these outbreaks, was the great woe of his life. Still, he was distinguished for his love of justice. At stated times, the aggrieved of every rank were admitted to his presence, where they in person presented their petitions. If any minister or governor was found guilty of oppression, he was sure to meet with condign punishment. This impartiality, from which no noble was exempted, at times exasperated greatly the haughty aristocracy. He was also inflexible in his determination to confer office only upon those who were worthy of the trust. No solicitations or views of self-interest could induce him to swerve from this resolve. Intemperance he especially abominated, and frowned upon the degrading vice alike in prince or peasant. He conferred an inestimable favor upon Russia by causing a compilation, for the use of his subjects, of a body of laws, which was called the Book of Justice. This code was presented to the judges, and was regarded as authority in all law proceedings. The historians of those days record that his memory was so remarkable that he could call all the officers of his army by name, and could even remember the name of every prisoner he had taken, numbering many thousands. In those days of dim enlightenment, when the masses were little elevated above the animal, the popular mind was more easily impressed by material than intellectual grandeur. It was then deemed necessary, among the unenlightened nations of Europe, to overawe the multitude by the splendor of the throne by scepters, robes, and diadems glittering with priceless jewels and with gold. The crown regalia of Russia were inestimably rich. The robe of the monarch was of purple, embroidered with the precious stones, and even his shoes sparkled with diamonds of dazzling luster. When he sat upon his throne to receive foreign ambassadors, or the members of his own court, he held in his right hand a globe, the emblem of universal monarchy, enriched with all the jeweled splendor which art could entwine around it. In his left hand he held a scepter, which also dazzled the eye by its superb embellishments. His fingers were laden with the most precious gems the Indies could afford. Whenever he appeared in public, the arms of the empire, finely embroidered upon a spread eagle, and magnificently adorned, were borne as a banner before him, and the masses of the people bowed before their monarch, thus arrayed as though he were a god. Ivan the Fourth left two sons, Fyodor and Dmitri. Fyodor, who succeeded his father, was twenty years of age, weak, characterless, though quite amiable. In his early youth his chief pleasure seemed to consist in ringing the bells of Moscow, which led his father, at one time, to say that he was fitter to be the son of a sexton than of a prince. Dmitri was an infant. He was placed, by his father's will, under the tutelage of an energetic, ambitious noble by the name of Bogdan Bielski. This aspiring nobleman, conscious of the incapacity of Fyodor to govern, laid his plans to obtain the throne for himself. Fyodor was crowned immediately after the death of his father, and proceeded at once to carry out the provisions of his will by liberating the prisoners, abolishing the taxes, and restoring confiscated estates. He also abolished the bodyguard of the Tsar, which had become peculiarly obnoxious to the nation. These measures rendered him, for a time, very popular. This popularity thwarted Bielski in the plan of organizing the people and the nobles in a conspiracy against the young monarch, and the nobles even became so much alarmed by the proceedings of the haughty minister, who was so evidently aiming at the usurpation of the throne, that they besieged him in his castle. The fortress was strong, and the powerful feudal lord, rallying his vassals around him, made a valiant and a protracted defense. At length, finding that he would be compelled to surrender, he attempted to escape in disguise. Being taken a captive, he was offered his choice, death or the renunciation of all political influence and departure into exile. He chose the latter, and retired beyond the Volga to one of the most remote provinces of Kazan. Fyodor had married the daughter of one of the most illustrious of his nobles. His father-in-law, a man of peculiar address and capacity, with ability both to conceive and execute the greatest undertakings, soon attained supremacy over the mind of the feeble monarch. The name of this noble, who became renowned in Russian annals, was Boris Gudenow. He had the rare faculty of winning the favor of all whom he approached. With rapid strides he attained the posts of Prime Minister, Commander-in-Chief, and Co-Regent of the Empire. A Polish ambassador at this time visited Moscow, and, witnessing the extreme feebleness of Fyodor, sent word to his ambitious master, Stephen Bathory, that nothing would be easier than to invade Russia successfully, that Smolensk could easily be taken, 
and that thence the Polish army might find an almost unobstructed march to Moscow. But death soon removed the Polish monarch from the labyrinths of war and diplomacy. Boris was now virtually the monarch of Russia, reigning, however, in the name of Fyodor. We have before mentioned that Poland was an elective monarchy. Immediately upon the death of a sovereign, the nobles, with their bands of retainers, often eighty thousand in number, met upon a large plain, where they spent many days in intrigues, and finally in the election of a new chieftain. Boris Gudnow now roused all his energies in the endeavor to unite Poland and Russia under one monarchy, by the election of Fyodor as sovereign of the latter kingdom. The Polish nobles, proud and self-confident, and apprised of the incapacity of Fyodor, were many of them in favor of the plan, as Boris had adroitly intimated to them that they might regard the measure rather as the annexing Russia to Poland than Poland to Russia. All that Boris cared for was the fact accomplished. He was willing that the agents of his scheme should be influenced by any motives which might be most efficacious. The Polish Diet met in a stormy session, and finally a majority of its members, instead of voting for Fyodor, elected Prince Sigismond, a son of John, King of Sweden. This election greatly alarmed Russia, as it allied Poland and Sweden by the most intimate ties, and might eventually place the crown of both of those powerful kingdoms upon the same brow. These apprehensions were increased by the fact that the Crimean Tartars soon again began to make hostile demonstrations, and it was feared that they were moving only in accordance with suggestions which had been sent to them from Poland and Sweden, and that thus a triple alliance was about to desolate the empire. The Tartars commenced their march, but Boris met them with such energy that they were driven back in utter discomfiture. The northern portion of Asia consisted of a vast, desolate, thinly peopled country called Siberia. It was bounded by the Caucasian and Altai Mountains on the south, the Ural Mountains on the west, the Pacific Ocean on the east, and the Frozen Ocean on the north. Most of the region was within the limits of the frozen zone, and the most southern sections were cold and inhospitable, enjoying but a gleam of summer sunshine. This country, embracing over four millions of square miles, being thus larger than the whole of Europe, contained but about two millions of inhabitants. It was watered by some of the most majestic rivers on the globe, the Obi, Enese, and the Lena. The population consisted mostly of wandering Mohammedan Tartars, in a very low state of civilization. At that time there were but two important towns in this region, Tura and Tobolsk. Some of the barbarians of this region descended to the shores of the Volga in a desolating, predatory excursion. A Russian army drove them back, pursued them to their homes, took both of these towns, erected fortresses, and gradually brought the whole of Siberia under Russian sway. This great conquest was achieved almost without bloodshed. Boris Gudnow now exercised all the functions of sovereign authority. His energy had enriched Russia with the accession of Siberia. He now resolved to lay aside the feeble Prince Fyodor, who nominally occupied the throne, and to place the crown upon his own brow. It seemed to him an easy thing to appropriate the emblems of power, since he already enjoyed all the prerogatives of royalty. Under the pretense of rewarding, with important posts of trust, the most efficient of the nobles, he removed all those whose influence he had most to dread, to distant provinces and foreign embassies. He then endeavored, by many favors, to win the affections of the populace of Moscow. The young Prince Dmitri had now attained his ninth year, and was residing, under the care of his tutors, at the city of Uglitz, about two hundred miles from Moscow. Uglitz, with its dependencies, had been assigned to him for his appanage. Gudenow deemed it essential, to his secure occupancy of the throne, that this young prince should be put out of the way. He accordingly employed a Russian officer, by the promise of immense rewards, to assassinate the child. And then, the deed having been performed, to prevent the possibility of his agency in it being divulged, he caused another low-born murderer to track the path of the officer and plunge a dagger into his bosom. Both murders were successfully accomplished. The news of the assassination of the young prince soon reached Moscow and caused intense excitement. Gudenow was by many suspected, though he endeavored to stifle the report by clamorous expressions of horror and indignation, and by apparently making the most strenuous efforts to discover the murderers. As an expression of his rage, he sent troops to demolish the fortress of Uglitz, and to drive the inhabitants from the city, because they had, as he asserted, harbored the assassins. Soon after this, Fyodor was suddenly taken ill. He lingered upon his bed for a few days in great pain, and then died. When the king was lying upon this dying bed, Boris Gudnow, who, it will be recollected, was the father of the wife of Fyodor, succeeded in obtaining from him a sort of bequest of the throne, and immediately upon the death of the king, 
he assumed the state of royalty as a duty enjoined upon him by this bequest. The death of Fyodor terminated the reign of the House of Rurik, which had now governed Russia for more than seven hundred years. Not a little artifice was still requisite to quell the indignant passions which were rising in the bosoms of the nobles. But Gudenow was a consummate master of his art, and through the intrigues of years had the program of operations all arranged. According to custom, six weeks were devoted to mourning for Fyodor. Boris then assembled the nobility and principal citizens of Moscow, in the Kremlin, and, to the unutterable surprise of many of them, declared that he could not consent to assume the weighty cares and infinite responsibilities of royalty, that the empire was unfortunately left without a sovereign, and that they must proceed to designate the one to whom the crown should be transferred, that he, worn down with the toils of state, had decided to retire to a monastery, and devote the remainder of his days to poverty, retirement, and to God. He immediately took leave of the astonished and perplexed assembly, and withdrew to a convent about three miles from Moscow. The partisans of Boris were prepared to act their part. They stated that intelligence had arrived that the Tartars, with an immense army, had commenced the invasion of Russia, that Boris alone was familiar with the condition and resources of the empire, and with the details of administration, that he was a veteran soldier, and that his military genius and vigorous arm were requisite to beat back the foe. These considerations were influential, and a deputation was chosen to urge Boris, as he loved his country, to continue in power and accept the scepter, which, as Prime Minister, he had so long successfully wielded. Boris affected the most extreme reluctance. The populace of Moscow, whose favor he had purchased, surrounded the convent in crowds, and with vehemence, characteristic of their impulsive, childish natures, threw themselves upon the ground, tore their hair, beat their breasts, and declared that they would never return to their homes unless Boris would consent to be their sovereign. Pretending at last to be overcome by these entreaties, Boris consented to raise and lead an army to repel the Tartars, and he promised that should Providence prosper him in this enterprise, he would regard it as an indication that it was the will of heaven that he should ascend the throne. He immediately called all his tremendous energies into exercise, and in a few months collected an army, of the nobles and of the militia, amounting to five hundred thousand men. With great pomp he rode through the ranks of this mighty host, receiving their enthusiastic applause. In that day, as neither telegraphs, newspapers, or stagecoaches existed, intelligence was transmitted with difficulty, and very slowly. The story of the Tartar invasion proved a sham. Boris had originated it to accomplish his purposes. He amused and conciliated the soldiers with magnificent parades, intimating that the Tartars, alarmed by his vast preparations, had not dared to advance against him. A year's pay was ordered for each one of the soldiers. The nobles received gratuities, and were entertained by the Tsar in festivals, at which parties of ten thousand, day after day, were feasted during an interval of six weeks. Boris then returned to Moscow. The people met him several miles from the city, and conducted him in triumph to the Kremlin. He was crowned, with great pomp, Emperor of Russia, on the 1st of September, 1577. Boris watched, with an eagle eye, all those who could by any possibility disturb his reign or endanger the permanence of the new dynasty which he wished to establish. Some of the princes of the old royal family were forbidden to marry. Others were banished to Siberia. The diadem, thus usurped, proved indeed a crown of thorns. That which is founded in crime can generally by crime alone be perpetuated. The manners of the usurper were soon entirely altered. He had been affable, easy of access, and very popular but now he became haughty, reserved, and suspicious. Wishing to strengthen his dynasty by royal alliances, he proposed the marriage of his daughter to Gustavus, son of Eric the Fourteenth, king of Sweden. He accordingly invited Gustavus to Moscow, making him pompous promises. The young prince was received with magnificent display and loaded with presents. But there was soon a falling out between Boris and his intended son-in-law, and the young prince was dismissed in disgrace. He, however, succeeded in establishing a treaty of peace with the Poles, which was to continue twenty years. He also was successful in contracting an alliance for his daughter Exinia with Duke John of Denmark. The marriage was celebrated in Moscow in 1602 with great splendor. But even before the marriage festivities were closed, the Duke was taken sick and died, to the inexpressible disappointment of Boris. The Turks from Constantinople sent an embassy to Moscow with rich presents, proposing a treaty of friendship and alliance. But Boris declined the presence, and dismissed the ambassadors, saying that he could never be friendly to the Turks, as they were the enemies of Christianity. 
Like many other men, he could trample upon the precepts of the gospel, and yet be zealous of Christianity as a doctrinal code or an institution. A report was now circulated that the young Dmitri was still alive, that his mother, conscious of the danger of his assassination, had placed the prince in a position of safety, and that another child had been assassinated in his stead. This rumor overwhelmed the guilty soul of Boris with melancholy. His fears were so strongly excited that several nobles, who were supposed to be in the interests of the young prince, were put to the rack to extort a confession. But no positive information respecting Dmitri could be gained. The mother of Dmitri was banished to an obscure fortress six hundred miles from Moscow. The emissaries of Boris were everywhere busy to detect, if possible, the hiding place of Dmitri. Intelligence was at length brought to the Kremlin that two monks had escaped from a convent and had fled to Poland, and that it was apprehended that one of them was the young prince in disguise. It was also said that Wisnowski, prince of Kiev, was protector of Dmitri, and, in concert with others, was preparing a movement to place him upon the throne of his ancestors. Boris was thrown into paroxysms of terror. Not knowing what else to do, he frantically sent a party of Cossacks to murder Wisnowski, but the prince was on his guard, and the enterprise failed. The question, have we a bourbon among us, has agitated the whole of the United States. The question, have we a Dmitri among us, then agitated Russia far more intensely. It was a question of the utmost practical importance, involving civil war and the removal of the new dynasty for the restoration of the old. Whether the person said to be Dmitri were really such is a question which can now never be settled. The monk Griska Utrapeja, who declared himself to be the young prince, sustained his claim with such an array of evidence as to secure the support of a large portion of the Russians, and also the cooperation of the court of Poland. The claims of Griska were brought up before the Polish Diet, and carefully examined. He was then acknowledged by them as the legitimate heir to the crown of Russia. An army was raised to restore him to his ancestral throne. Sigismund, the king of Poland, with ardor espoused his cause. Boris immediately dispatched an embassy to Warsaw to remind Sigismund of the treaty of alliance into which he had entered, and to insist upon his delivering up the pretended Dmitri, dead or alive. A threat was added to the entreaty. If you countenance this impostor, said Boris, you will draw down upon you a war which you may have cause to repent. Sigismund replied that though he had no doubt that Griska was truly the Prince Dmitri, and, as such, entitled to the throne of Russia, Still he had no disposition personally to embark on the advocacy of his rights, but that if any of his nobles felt disposed to espouse his claims with arms or money, he certainly should do nothing to thwart them. The Polish nobles, thus encouraged, raised an army of forty thousand men, which they surrendered to Griska. He, assuming the name of Dmitri, placed himself at their head, and boldly commenced a march upon Moscow. As soon as he entered the Russian territories, many nobles hastened to his banners, and several important cities declared for him. Boris was excessively alarmed. With characteristic energy, he speedily raised an army of two hundred thousand men, and then was in the utmost terror lest this very army should pass over to the ranks of his foes. He applied to Sweden and to Denmark to help him, but both kingdoms refused. Dmitri advanced triumphantly, and laid siege to Novgorod on the 21st of December, 1605. For five months the war continued with varying success. Boris made every attempt to secure the assassination of Griska, but the wary chieftain was on his guard, and all such endeavors were frustrated. Griska at length decided to resort to the same weapons. An officer was sent to the Kremlin with a feigned account of a victory obtained over the troops of Dmitri. This officer succeeded in mingling poison with the food of Boris. The drug was so deadly that the usurper dropped and expired almost without a struggle and without a groan. As soon as Boris was dead, his widow, a woman of great ambition and energy, lost not an hour in proclaiming the succession of her son, Fyodor. The officers of the army were promptly summoned to take the oath of allegiance to the new sovereign. Fyodor was but fifteen years of age, a thoroughly spoilt boy, proud, domineering, selfish and cruel. There was now a revolt in the army of the late Tsar. Several of the officers embraced the cause of Griska, declaring their full conviction that he was the Prince Dmitri, and they carried over to his ranks a large body of the soldiers. The defection of the army caused great consternation at court. The courtiers, eager to secure the favor of the prince whose star was so evidently in the ascendant, at once abandoned the hapless Fyodor and his enraged mother, and the halls of the Kremlin and the streets of Moscow were soon resounding with the name of Dmitri. 
A proclamation was published declaring general amnesty, and rich rewards to all who should recognize and support the rights of their legitimate prince, but that his opponents must expect no mercy. The populace immediately rose in revolt against Fyodor. They assailed the Kremlin. In a resistless inundation they forced its gates, seized the young Tsar with his mother, sister, and other relatives, and hurried them all to prison. Dmitri was at Thula when he received intelligence of this revolution. He immediately sent an officer, Basilius Galitzan, to Moscow to receive the oath of fidelity of the city, and, at the same time, he diabolically sent an assassin, one Ivan Bogdanov, with orders to strangle Fyodor and his mother in the prison, but with directions not to hurt his sister. Bogdanov reluctantly executed his mission. On the 15th of July, 1605, Dmitri made his triumphal entry into Moscow. He was received with all the noisy demonstrations of public rejoicing, and, on the 29th of July, was crowned, with extraordinary grandeur, Emperor of all the Russias. The ceremonies of the triumphal entrance are perhaps worthy of record. A detachment of Polish horse in brilliant uniform led the procession, headed by a numerous band of trumpeters. Then came the gorgeous coach of Dmitri, empty, drawn by six horses, richly caparisoned, and proceeded, followed, and flanked by dense columns of musketeers. Next came a procession of the clergy in their ecclesiastical robes, and with the banners of the church. This procession was led by the bishops, who bore effigies of the Virgin Mary, and of St. Nicholas, the patron saint of Russia. Following the clergy appeared Dmitri, mounted on a white charger, and surrounded by a splendid retinue. He proceeded first to the church of Notre Dame, where a Te Deum was chanted, and where the new monarch received the sacrament. He then visited the tomb of Ivan the Fourth, and kneeling upon it, as the tomb of his father, implored God's blessing. Perceiving that the body of Boris Gudnow had received internment in the royal cemetery, he ordered his remains, with those of his wife and son, all three of whom Dmitri had caused to be assassinated, to be removed to a common churchyard without the city. Either to silence those who might doubt his legitimacy, or being truly the son of Ivan the Fourth, he sent two of the nobles, with a brilliant retinue, to the convent, more than six hundred miles from Moscow, to which Boris had banished the widow of Ivan. They were to conduct the queen dowager to the capital. As she approached the city, Dmitri went out to receive her, accompanied by a great number of his nobles. As soon as he perceived her coach, he alighted, went on foot to meet his alleged mother, and threw himself into her arms with every demonstration of joy and affection, which embraces she returned with equal tenderness. Then, with his head uncovered, and walking by the side of her carriage, he conducted her to the city and to the Kremlin. He ever after treated her with a deference due to a mother, and received from her corresponding proofs of confidence and affection. But Dmitri was thoroughly a bad man, and every day became more unpopular. He debauched the young sister of Fyodor, and then shut her up in the convent. He banished seventy noble families who were accused of being the friends of Boris, and gave their estates and dignities to his Polish partisans. A party was soon organized against him, who busily circulated reports that he was an impostor, and a conspiracy was formed to take his life. Perplexities and perils now gathered rapidly around his throne. He surrounded himself with Polish guards, and thus increased the exasperation of his subjects. To add to his perplexities, another claimant of the crown appeared, who declared himself to be the son of the late Tsar Fyodor, son of Ivan IV. This young man, named Peter, was seventeen years of age. He had raised his standard on the other side of the Volga, and had rallied four thousand partisans around him. In the meantime, Dmitri had made arrangements for his marriage with Mariana Meniski, a Polish princess of the Roman Church. This princess was married to the Tsar by proxy, in Krakow, and in January 1606, with a numerous retinue, set out on her journey to Moscow. She did not reach the capital of Moscow until the 1st of May. Her father's whole family, and several thousand armed Polanders, by way of guard, accompanied her. Many of the Polish nobles also took this opportunity of visiting Russia, and a multitude of merchants put themselves in her train for purposes of traffic. The Tsarina was met, at some distance from Moscow, by the royal guard, and escorted to the city, where she was received with ringing of bells, shoutings, discharge of cannons, and all the ordinary and extraordinary demonstrations of popular joy. On the 8th of May, the ceremony of blessing the marriage was performed by the patriarch, and immediately after she was crowned Tsarina with greater pomp than Russia had ever witnessed before. But the appearance of this immense train of armed Poles incensed the Russians, and the clergy, 
who were jealous of the encroachments of the Church of Rome, were alarmed in behalf of their religion. An intrepid noble, Zuski, now resolved, by the energies of a popular insurrection, to rid the throne of Dmitri. With great sagacity and energy the conspiracy was formed. The Tsarina was to give a grand entertainment on the evening of the 17th of May, and the conspirators fixed upon that occasion for the consummation of their plan. Twenty thousand troops were under the orders of Zuski, and he had led them all into the city, under the pretense of having them assist in the festival. At six o'clock in the morning of the appointed day, these troops, accompanied by some thousands of the populace, surrounded the palace and seized its gates. A division was then sent in, who commenced the indiscriminate massacre of all who were, or who looked like Polanders. It was taken for granted that all in the palace were either Poles or their partisans. The alarm bells were now rung, and Zuski traversed the streets with a drawn saber in one hand and a cross in the other, rousing the ignorant populace by the cry that the Poles had taken up arms to murder the Russians. Dmitri, in his chamber, hearing the cries of the dying and the shrieks of those who fled before the assassins, leaped from his window into the courtyard, and, by his fall, dislocated his thigh. He was immediately seized, conveyed into the grand hall of audience, and the strong guard was set over him. The murderers ransacked the palace, penetrating every room, killing every Polish man and treating the Polish ladies with the utmost brutality. They inquired eagerly for the Tsarina, but she was nowhere to be found. She had concealed herself beneath the hoop of an elderly lady whose gray hairs and withered cheek had preserved her from violence. Zuski now went to the dowager Tsarina, the widow of Ivan the Fourth, and demanded that she should take her oath upon the Gospels whether Dmitri were her son. He reported that, thus pressed, she confessed that he was an impostor, and that her true son had perished many years before. The conspirators now fell upon Dmitri, and his body was pierced with a thousand dagger thrusts. His mangled remains were then dragged through the streets and burned. Mariana was soon after arrested and sent to prison. It is said that nearly two thousand Poles perished in this massacre. Even to the present day, opinion is divided in Russia in regard to Dmitri, whether he was an impostor or the son of Ivan IV. Respecting his character, there is no dispute. All that can be said in his favor is that he would not commit an atrocious crime unless impelled to do it by very strong temptation. There was now no one who seemed to have any legitimate title to the throne of Russia. The nobles and the senators who were at Moscow then met to proceed to the election of a new sovereign. It was an event almost without a parallel in Russian history. The lords, though very friendly in their deliberations, found it difficult to decide into whose hands to entrust the scepter. It was at last unanimously concluded to make an appeal to the people. Their voice was for Zuski. He was accordingly declared Tsar, and was soon after crowned with a degree of unanimity which, though well authenticated, seems inexplicable. The Poles were exasperated beyond measure at the massacre of so many of their nobles, and at the insult offered to Mariana, the Tsarina. But Poland was at that time distracted by civil strife, and the king found it expedient to postpone the hour of vengeance. Zuski commenced his reign by adopting measures which gave him great popularity with the adjoining kingdoms, while they did not diminish the favorable regards of the people. But suddenly affairs assumed a new aspect, so strange that a writer of fiction would hardly have ventured to imagine it. An artful man, a schoolmaster in Poland, who could speak the Russian language, declared that he was Dmitri, that he had escaped from the massacre in his palace, and that it was another man, mistaken for him, whom the assassins had killed. Poland, inspired by revenge, eagerly embraced this man's cause. Mariana, who had been liberated from prison, was let into the secret, and willing to ascend again to the grandeur from which she had fallen, entered with cordial cooperation into this new intrigue. The widowed Tsarina and the Polish adventurer contrived their first meeting in the presence of a large concourse of nobles and citizens. They rushed together in a warm embrace, while tears of affected transport bedewed their cheeks. Their farce was so admirably performed that many were deceived, and this new Dmitri and the Tsarina occupied for several days the same tent in the Polish encampment, apparently as husband and wife. End of chapter 16 Recording by Jeff Kluckner, Plymouth, UK Chapter 17 of The Empire of Russia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Kluckner 
The Empire of Russia, from the remotest periods to the present time, by John Stevens Cabot Abbott. Chapter 17. A Change of Dynasty, from 1608 to 1680. Conquest by Poland. Sweden in alliance with Russia. Grandeur of Poland. Ladislaus elected King of Russia. Commotions and Insurrections. Rejection of Ladislaus and election of Michael Fyodor Romanow. Sorrow of his mother. Pacific character of Romanow. Choice of a bride. Eudochia Strechnu. The Archbishop Fyodor. Death of Michael and accession of Alexis. Love in the palace. Successful intrigue. Mobs in Moscow. Change in the character of the Tsar. Turkish invasions. Alliance between Russia and Poland. This public testimonial of conjugal love led men, who had before doubted the pretender, to repose confidence in his claims. The king of Poland took advantage of the confusion now reigning in Russia to extend his dominions by wresting still more border territory from his great rival. In this exigence, Zuski purchased the loan of an army of 5,000 men from Sweden by surrendering Livonia to the Swedes. With these suckers united to his own troops, he marched to meet the pretended Dmitri. There was now universal confusion in Russia. The two hostile armies, avoiding a decisive engagement, were maneuvering and engaging in incessant petty skirmishes, which resulted only in bloodshed and misery. Thus five years of national woe lingered away. The people became weary of both the claimants for the crown, and the nobles boldly met, regardless of the rival combatants, and resolved to choose a new sovereign. Poland had then attained the summit of its greatness. As an energetic military power, it was superior to Russia. To conciliate Poland, whose aggressions were greatly feared, the Russian nobles chose, for their sovereign, Ladislaus, son of Sigismond, the king of Poland. They hoped thus to withdraw the Polish armies from the banners of the pretended Dmitri, and also to secure peace for their war-blasted kingdom. Ladislaus accepted the crown. Zuski was seized, deposed, shaved, dressed in a friar's robe, and shut up in a convent to count his beads. He soon died of that malignant poison, grief. Dmitri made a show of opposition, but he was soon assassinated by his own men, who were convinced of the hopelessness of his cause. His party, however, lasted for many years, bringing forward a young man who was called his son. At one time there was quite an enthusiasm in his favor. Crowds flocked to his camp, and he even sent ambassadors to Gustavus the Ninth, King of Sweden, proposing an alliance. At last he was betrayed by some of his own party, and was sent to Moscow, where he was hanged. Sigismond was much perplexed in deciding whether to consent to his sons accepting the crown of Russia. That kingdom was now in such a state of confusion and weakness that he was quite sanguine that he would be able to conquer it by force of arms, and bring the whole empire under the dominion of his own scepter. His armies were already besieging Smolensk, and the city was hourly expected to fall into their hands. This would open to them almost an unobstructed march to Moscow. The Poles, generally warlike and ambitious of conquest, represented to Sigismond that it would be far more glorious for him to be the conqueror of Russia than to be merely the father of its Tsar. Sigismond, with trivial excuses, detained his son in Poland, while, under various pretexts, he continued to pour his troops into Russia. Ten thousand armed Poles were sent to Moscow to be in readiness to receive the newly elected monarch upon his arrival. Their general, Stanislaus, artfully contrived even to place a thousand of these Polish troops in garrison in the citadel of Moscow. These foreign soldiers at last became so insolent that there was a general rising of the populace, and they were threatened with utter extermination. The storm of passion thus raised, no earthly power could quell. The awful slaughter was commenced and the Poles, conscious of their danger, resorted to the horrible but only measure which could save them from destruction. They immediately set fire to the city in many different places. The city then consisted of 180,000 houses, most of them being of wood. As the flames rose, sweeping from house to house and from street to street, the inhabitants, distracted by the endeavor to save their wives, their children, and their property, threw down their arms and dispersed. When thus helpless, the Poles fell upon them, and one of the most awful massacres ensued of which history gives any record. A hundred thousand of the wretched people of Moscow perished beneath the Polish scimitars. For fifteen days the depopulated and smoldering capital was surrendered to pillage. The royal treasury, the churches, the convents were all plundered. The Poles, then, laden with booty, 
but leaving a garrison in the citadel, evacuated the ruined city and commenced their march to Poland. These horrors roused the Russians. An army under a heroic general, Zachary Lipinow, besieged the Polish garrison, starved them into a surrender, and put them all to death. The nobles then met, declared the election of Ladislaus void, on account of his not coming to Moscow to accept it, and again proceeded to the choice of a sovereign. After long deliberation, one man ventured to propose a candidate very different from any who had before been thought of. It was Michael Fyodor Romanow. He was a studious, philosophic young man, seventeen years of age. His father was an archbishop of Rostow, a man of exalted reputation, both for genius and piety. Michael, with his mother, was in a convent at Kastroma. It was modestly urged that in this young man there were centered all the qualifications essential for the promotion of the tranquility of the state. There were but three males of his family living, and thus the state would avoid the evil of having numerous relatives of the prince to be cared for. He was entirely free from embroilments in the late troubles. As his father was a clergyman of known piety and virtue, he would counsel his son to peace, and would conscientiously seek the best good of the empire. The proposition, sustained by such views, was accepted with general acclaim. There were several nobles from Kostroma who testified that though they were not personally acquainted with young Romanow, they believed him to be a youth of unusual intelligence, discretion, and moral worth. As the nobles were anxious not to act hastily in a matter of such great importance, they dispatched two of their number to Kostroma with a letter to the mother of Michael, urging her to repair immediately with her son to Moscow. The affectionate, judicious mother, upon the reception of this letter, burst into tears of anguish, lamenting the calamity which was impending. "'My son,' she said, "'my only son is to be taken from me to be placed upon the throne, only to be miserably slaughtered like so many of the czars who have preceded him.' She wrote to the electors entreating them that her son might be excused, saying that he was altogether too young to reign, that his father was a prisoner in Poland, and that her son had no relations capable of assisting him with their advice. This letter, on the whole, did but confirm the assembly of nobles in their conviction that they could not make a better choice than that of the young Romanow. They accordingly, with great unanimity, elected Michael Fyodor Romanow, sovereign of all the Russias, then, repairing in a body to the cathedral, they proclaimed him to the people as their sovereign. The announcement was received with rapturous applause. It was thus that the house of Romanow was placed upon the throne of Russia. It retains the throne to the present day. Michael, incited by singular sagacity and by true Christian philanthropy, commenced his reign by the most efficient measures to secure the peace of the empire. As soon as he had notified his election to the king of Poland, his father, Archbishop of Rostow, was set at liberty and sent home. He was immediately created by his son Patriarch of all Russia, an office in the Greek Church almost equivalent to that of the Pope in the Romish hierarchy. While these scenes were transpiring, Charles the Ninth died, and Gustavus Adolphus succeeded to the throne of Sweden. Gustavus and Michael both desired peace. The preliminaries were soon settled, and peace was established upon a basis far more advantageous to the Swedes than to the Russians. By this treaty, Russia ceded to Sweden territory, which deprived Russia of all access to the Baltic Sea. Thus the only point now upon which Russia touched the ocean was on the North Sea. No enemies remained to Russia but the Poles. Here there was trouble enough. Ladislaus still demanded the throne, and invaded the empire with an immense army. He advanced, ravaging the country, even to the gates of Moscow. But, finding that he had no partisans in the kingdom, and that powerful armies were combining against him, he consented to a truce for fourteen years. Russia was now at peace with all the world. The young Tsar, aided by the counsels of his excellent father, devoted himself with untiring energy to the promotion of the prosperity of his subjects. It was deemed a matter of much political importance that the Tsar should be immediately married. According to the custom of the empire, all the most beautiful girls were collected for the monarch to make his choice. They were received in the palace, and were lodged separately, though they all dined together. The Tsar saw them, either incognito or without disguise, as suited his pleasure. The day for the nuptials was appointed, and the bridal robes prepared, when no one knew upon whom the monarch's choice had been fixed. On the morning of the nuptial day, the robes were presented to the empress-elect, who then, for the first time, learned that she had proved the successful candidate. The rejected maidens were returned to their homes laden with rich presents. The young lady selected was Eudochia Streshnew, who chanced to be the daughter of a very worthy gentleman, in quite straitened circumstances, residing nearly two hundred miles from Moscow. 
the messenger who was sent to inform him that his daughter was Empress of Russia, found him in the field at work with his domestics. The good old man was conducted to Moscow, but he soon grew weary of the splendors of the court, and entreated permission to return again to his humble rural home. Eudocia, reared in virtuous retirement, proved as lovely in character as she was beautiful in person, and she soon won the love of the nation. The first year of her marriage she gave birth to a daughter. The three next children proved also daughters, to the great disappointment of their parents. But in the year 1630 a son was born, and not only the court, but all Russia, was filled with rejoicing. In the year 1634 the Tsar met with one of the greatest of afflictions in the loss of his father by death. His reverence for the venerable patriarch Feodor had been such that he was ever his principal counselor, and all his public acts were proclaimed in the name of the Tsar and his majesty's father, the most holy patriarch. As he had joined, writes an ancient historian, the mitre to the sword, having been a general in the army before he was an ecclesiastic, the affable and modest behavior, so becoming the ministers of the altar, had tempered and corrected the fire of the warrior, and rendered his manners amiable to all that came near him. The reign of Michael proved almost a constant success. His wisdom and probity caused him to be respected by the neighboring states, while the empire, in the enjoyment of peace, was rapidly developing all its resources, and increasing in wealth, population, and power. His court was constantly filled with ambassadors from all the monarchies of Europe, and even of Asia. The Tsar, rightly considering peace as almost the choicest of all earthly blessings, resisted all temptations to draw the sword. There were a few trivial interruptions of peace during his reign, but the dark clouds of war, by his energies, were soon dispelled. This pacific prince, one of the most worthy who ever sat upon any throne, died revered by his subjects on the 12th of July, 1645, in the forty-ninth year of his age, and the thirty-third of his reign. He left but two children, a son, Alexis, who succeeded him, and a daughter, Irene, who a few years after died unmarried. Alexis was but sixteen years of age when he succeeded to the throne. To prevent the possibility of any cabals being formed, in consequence of his youth, he was crowned the day after his father's death. In one week from that time, Eudocia also died, her death being hastened by grief for the loss of her husband. An ambitious noble, Morrison, supremely selfish, but cool, calculating, and persevering, attained the post of prime minister or counselor of the young Tsar. The great object of his aim was to make himself the first subject in the empire. In the accomplishment of this object there were two leading measures to which he resorted. The first was to keep the young Tsar as much as possible from taking any part in the transactions of state, by involving him in an incessant round of pleasures. The next step was to secure for the Tsar a wife who would be under his own influence. The love of pleasure incident to youth rendered the first measure not difficult of accomplishment. Peculiar circumstances seemed remarkably to favor the second measure. There was a nobleman of high rank but of small fortune, strongly attached to Morrison, who had two daughters of marvelous beauty. Morrison doubted not that he could lead his ardent young monarch to marry one of these lovely sisters, and he resolved himself to marry the other. He would thus become the brother-in-law of the emperor. Through his wife he would be able to influence her sister, the empress. The family would also feel that they were indebted to him for their elevation. The plan was triumphantly successful. The two young ladies were invited to court, and were decorated to make the most impressive display of their loveliness. With the young Tsar, a boy of sixteen, it was love at first sight, and that very day he told Morrison that he wished to marry Maria, the eldest of the beauties. Rich presents were immediately lavished upon the whole family, so that they could make their appearance at court with suitable splendor. The Tsar and Maria were immediately betrothed, and in just eight days the ardent lover led his bride from the altar. At the end of another week Morrison married the other sister. Morrison and Milo Slusky, the father of the two brides, now ruled Russia, while the Tsar surrendered himself to amusements. The people soon became exasperated by the haughtiness and insolence of the Dumveret, and murmurs growing deeper and louder, ere long led to an insurrection. On the 6th of July, 1648, the Tsar, engaged in some civic celebration, was escorted in a procession to one of the monasteries of Moscow. The populace assembled in immense numbers to see him pass. On his return, the crowd broke through the attendant guards, seized the bridle of his horse, and entreated him to listen to their complaints concerning the outrages perpetrated by his ministers. The Tsar, much alarmed by their violence, listened impatiently to their complaints, and promised to render them satisfaction. 
the people were appeased, and were quietly retiring, when the partisans of the ministers rode among them, assailing them with abusive language, crowding them with their horses, and even striking at them with their whips. The populace, incensed, began to pelt them with stones, and though the guard of the Tsar came to their rescue, they escaped with difficulty to the palace. The mob was now thoroughly aroused. They rushed to the palace of Morrison, burst down the doors, and sacked every apartment. They even tore from the person of his wife her jewels, throwing them into the street, but in other respects treating her with civility. They then passed to the palace of Miloslavsky, treating it in the same manner. The mob had now possession of Moscow. Palace after palace of the partisans of the ministers was sacked, and several of the most distinguished members of the court were massacred. The Tsar, entirely deficient in energy, remained trembling in the Kremlin during the whole of the night of the 6th of July, only entreating his friends to strengthen the guards and to secure the palace from the outrages of the populace. Afraid to trust the Russian troops, who might be found in sympathy with the people, Alexis sent for a regiment of German troops who were in his employ, and stationed them around the palace. He then sent out an officer to disperse the crowd, assuring them that the disorders of which they complained should be redressed. They demanded that the offending ministers should be delivered to them, to be punished for the injuries they had inflicted upon the empire. Alexis assured them, through his messenger, upon his oath, that Morrison and Miloslavsky had escaped, but promised that the third minister whom they demanded, a noble by the name of Plesion, who was judge of the Supreme Court of Judicature of Moscow, should be brought out directly, and that those who had escaped should be delivered up as soon as they could be arrested. The guilty, wretched man, thus doomed to be the victim to appease the rage of the mob, in a quarter of an hour was led out bareheaded by the servants of the Tsar to the marketplace. The mob fell upon him with clubs, beat him to the earth, dragged him over the pavements, and finally cut off his head. Thus satiated, about eleven o'clock in the morning they dispersed and returned to their homes. In the afternoon, however, the reign of violence was resumed. The city was set on fire in several places, and the mob collected for plunder, making no effort to extinguish the flames. The fire spread with such alarming rapidity that the whole city was endangered. At length, however, after terrible destruction of property and the loss of many lives, the fury of the conflagration was arrested. The affrighted Tsar now filled the important posts of the ministry with men who had a reputation for justice, and the clergy immediately espousing the cause of order, exhorted the populace to that respect and obedience to the higher powers which their religion enjoined. Alexis personally appeared before the people and addressed them in a speech, in which he made no apology for the outrages which had been committed by the government, but, assuming that the people were right in their demands, promised to repeal the onerous duties, to abolish the obnoxious monopolies, and even to increase the privileges which they had formerly enjoyed. The people received this announcement with great applause. The Tsar, taking advantage of this return to friendliness, remarked, I have promised to deliver up to you Morrison and his confederates in the government. Their acts I admit to have been very unjust, but their personal relations to me renders it peculiarly trying for me to condemn them. I hope the people will not deny the first request I have ever made of them, which is, that these men, whom I have displaced, may be pardoned. I will answer for them for the future, and assure you that their conduct shall be such as to give you cause to rejoice at your lenity. The people were so moved by this address, which the Tsar pronounced with tears, that, as with one accord, they shouted, God grant His Majesty a long and happy life. The will of God and of the Tsar be done. Peace was thus restored between the government and the people, and great good accrued to Russia from this successful insurrection. During the early reign of Alexis, there were no foreign wars of any note. The Poles were all the time busy in endeavors to beat back the Turks, who, in wave after wave of invasion, were crossing the Danube. Upon the death of Ladislaus, king of Poland, Alexis, who had then a fine army at his command, offered to march to repel the Turks, if the Poles would choose him king of Poland. But at the same time, France made a still more alluring offer, in case they would choose John Casimir, a prince in the interests of France, as their sovereign. The choice fell upon John Casimir. The provinces of Smolensk, Kiev, and Chernigov were then in possession of the Poles, having been, in former wars, wrested from Russia. The Poles had conquered them by taking advantage of internal troubles in Russia, which enabled them with success to invade the empire. Alexis now thought it right, in his turn, to take advantage of the weakness of Poland, harassed by the Turks, to recover these lost provinces. 
he accordingly marched to the city of Smolensk, and encamped before it with an army of three hundred thousand men. Smolensk was one of the strongest places which military art had then been able to rear. The Poles had received sufficient warning of the attack to enable them to garrison the fortifications to their utmost capacity, and to supply the town abundantly with all the materials of war. The siege was continued for a full year, with all the usual accompaniments of carnage and misery which attend a beleaguered fortress. At last the city, battered into ruins, surrendered, and the victorious Russians immediately swept over Lithuanian Poland, meeting no force to obstruct its march. Another army, equally resistless, swept the banks of the Dnieper, and recovered Chernikov and Kiev. Misfortunes seemed now to be falling like an avalanche upon Poland. While the Turks were assailing them on the south, and the Russians were wresting from them opulent and populous provinces on the north, Charles Gustavus of Sweden was crossing her eastern frontiers with invading hosts. The impetuous Swedish king, in three months, overran nearly the whole of Poland, threatening the utter extinction of the kingdom. This alarmed the surrounding kingdoms, lest Sweden should become too powerful for their safety. Alexis immediately entered into a truce with Poland, which guaranteed to him the peaceable possession of the provinces he had regained, and then united his armies with those of his humiliated rival, to arrest the strides of the Swedish conqueror. Sieges, cannonades, and battles innumerable ensued, over hundreds of leagues of territory, bordering the shores of the Baltic. For several years the maddened strife continued, producing its usual fruits of gory fields, smoldering cities, desolated homes, with orphanage, widowhood, starvation, pestilence, and every conceivable form of human misery. At length, all parties being exhausted, peace was concluded on the 2nd of June, 1661. The great insurrection in Moscow had taught the Tsar Alexis a good lesson, and he profited by it wisely. He was led to devote himself earnestly to the welfare of his people. His recovery of the lost provinces of Russia was considered just, and added immeasurably to his renown. Conscious of the imperfection of his education, he engaged earnestly in study, causing many important scientific treatises to be translated into the Russian language, and perusing them with diligence and delight. He had the laws of the several provinces collected and published together. Many new manufactures were introduced, particularly those of silk and linen. Though rigidly economical in his expenses, he maintained a magnificent court and a numerous army. He took great interest in the promotion of agriculture, bringing many desert wastes into cultivation, and peopling them with the prisoners taken in the Polish and Swedish wars. It was the custom in those barbaric times to drive, as captives of war, the men, women, and children of whole provinces to be slaves in the territory of the conqueror. Often they occupied the position of a vassal peasantry, tilling the soil for the benefit of their lords. With singular foresight, Alexis planned for the construction of a fleet both on the Caspian and the Black Sea. With this object in view, he sent for ship carpenters from Holland and other places. All Europe was now trembling in view of the encroachments of the Turks. Several very angry messages had passed between the Sultan and the Tsar, and the Turks had proved themselves ever eager to combine with the Tartars in bloody raids into the southern regions of the empire. Alexis resolved to combine Christian Europe, if possible, in a war of extermination against the Turks. To this end he sent ambassadors to every court in Christendom. As his ambassador was presented to Pope Clement X, the Pope extended his foot for the customary kiss. The proud Russian drew back, exclaiming, so ignoble an act of homage is beneath the dignity of the prince whom I have the honor to serve. He then informed the Pope that the Emperor of Russia had resolved to make war against the Turks, that he wished to see all Christian princes unite against those enemies of humanity and religion, that for that purpose he had sent ambassadors to all the potentates of Europe, and that he exhorted His Holiness to place himself at the head of a league so powerful, so necessary for the protection of the Church, and from which every Christian state might derive the greatest advantages. Foolish punctilios of etiquette interfered with any efficient arrangements with the court of Rome, and though the ambassadors of other powers were received with the most marked respect, these powers were all too much engrossed with their own internal affairs to enlist in this enterprise for the public good. The Turks were, however, alarmed by these formidable movements, and, fearing such an alliance, were somewhat checked in their career of conquest. On the 10th of November, 1674, the King of Poland died, and again there was an attempt on the part of Russia to unite Poland and the Empire under the same crown. 
all the monarchies in Europe were involved in intrigues for the Polish crown. The electors, however, chose John Sobieski, a renowned Polish general, for their sovereign. The Tsar was very apprehensive that the Poles would make peace with the Turks, and thus leave the Sultan at liberty to concentrate all his tremendous resources upon Russia. Alexis raised three large armies, amounting in all to 150,000 men, which he sent into the Ukraine, as the frontier country, watered by the lower Dnieper, was then called. The Turkish army, which was spread over the country between the Danube and the Dniester, now crossed this latter stream, and, in solid battalions, 400,000 strong, penetrated the Ukraine. They immediately commenced the fiend-like work of reducing the whole province to a desert. The process of destruction is swift. Flames, in a few hours, will consume a city which centuries alone have reared. A squadron of cavalry will, in a few moments, trample fields of grain which have been slowly growing and ripening for months. In less than a fortnight nearly the whole of the Ukraine was a depopulated waste, the troops of the Tsar being shut up in narrow fortresses. The king of Poland, apprehensive that this vast Turkish army would soon turn with all their energies of destruction upon his own territories, resolved to march, with all the forces of his kingdom, to the aid of the Russians. One hundred thousand Polish troops immediately besieged the great city of Humal, which the Turks had taken, midway between the Dnieper and the Dniester. John Sobieski, the newly elected king of Poland, was a veteran soldier of great military renown. He placed himself at the head of other divisions of the army, and endeavored to distract the enemy and to divide their forces. At the same time, Alexis himself hastened to the theater of war, that he might animate his troops by his presence. The Turks, finding themselves unable to advance any further, sullenly returned to their own country by the way of the Danube. Upon the retirement of the Turks, the Russians and the Poles began to quarrel respecting the possession of the Ukraine. Affairs were in this condition when the Tsar Alexis, in all the vigor of manhood, was taken sick and died. He was then in the forty-sixth year of his age. His first wife, Maria Miloslavsky, had died several years before him, leaving two sons and four daughters. His second wife, Natalia Nariskin, to whom he was married in the year 1671, still lived with her two children, a son, Peter, who was subsequently entitled the Great, as being the most illustrious monarch Russia has known, and a daughter, Natalia. Alexis, notwithstanding the unpropitious promise of his youth, proved one of the wisest and best princes Russia had known for years. He was a lover of peace, and yet prosecuted war with energy when it was forced upon him. His oldest surviving son, Fyodor, who was but eighteen years of age at the time of his father's death, succeeded to the crown. Fyodor, following the counsel which his father gave him on his dying bed, soon took military possession of nearly all of the Ukraine. The Turks entered the country again, but were repulsed with severe loss. Apprehensive that they would speedily return, the Tsar made great efforts to secure a friendly alliance with Poland, in which he succeeded by paying a large sum of money in requital for the provinces of Smolensk and Kiev, which his arms had recovered. In the spring of 1678, the Turks again entered the Ukraine with a still more formidable army than the year before. The campaign was opened by laying siege to the city of Zeherin, which was encompassed by nearly 400,000 men, and, after a destructive cannonade, was carried by storm. The garrison, consisting of 30,000 men, were put to the sword. The Russian troops were so panic-stricken by this defeat that they speedily retreated. The Turks pursued them a long distance, constantly harassing their rear. But the Turks, in their turn, were compelled to retire, being driven back by famine, a foe against whom their weapons could make no impression. The Ottoman port soon found that little was gained by waging war with an empire so vast and sparsely settled as Russia, and that their conquest of the desolated and depopulated lands of the Ukraine was by no means worth the expenses of the war. The port was therefore inclined to make peace with Russia, that the Turkish armies might fall upon Poland again, which presented a much more inviting field of conquest. The Poles were informed of this through their ambassador at Constantinople, and earnestly appealed to the Tsar of Russia, and to all the princes in Christendom to come to their aid. The selfishness which every court manifested is humiliating to human nature. Each court seemed only to think of its own aggrandizement. Fyodor consented to aid them only on condition that the Poles should renounce all pretension to any places then in possession of Russia. To this the Polish king assented, and the armies of Russia and Poland were again combined to repel the Turks. End of chapter 17 Recording by Jeff Kluckner, Plymouth, UK
Chapter 18 of The Empire of Russia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Kluckner The Empire of Russia, From the Remotest Periods to the Present Time, by John Stevens Cabot Abbott. Chapter 18 The Regency of Sophia, From 1680 to 1697 Administration of Fyodor, Death of Fyodor, Incapacity of Ivan, Succession of Peter, Usurpation of Sophia, Insurrection of the Strelitzes, Massacre in Moscow, Success of the Insurrection, Ivan and Peter declared sovereigns under the Regency of Sophia, General Discontent, Conspiracy against Sophia, Her Flight to the Convent, The Conspiracy Quelled, New Conspiracy, Energy of Peter, he assumes the crown. Sophia banished to a convent. Commencement of the reign of Peter. Fyodor, influenced by the wise counsels of his father, devoted much attention to the beautifying of his capital and to developing the internal resources of the empire. He paved the streets of Moscow, erected several large buildings of stone in place of the old wooden structures. Commerce and arts were patronized, he even loaning from the public treasury sums of money to enterprising men to encourage them in their industrial enterprises. Foreigners of distinction, both scholars and artisans, were invited to take up their residence in the empire. The Tsar was particularly fond of fine horses, and was very successful in improving, by importations, the breed in Russia. Fyodor had always been of an exceedingly frail constitution, and it was evident that he could not anticipate long life. In the year 1681, he married a daughter of one of the nobles, his bride, Opimia Rutowski, was also frail in health, though very beautiful. Six months had hardly passed away ere the youthful empress exchanged her bridal robes and couch for the shroud and the tomb. The emperor himself, grief-stricken, was rapidly sinking in a decline. His ministers almost forced him to another immediate marriage, hoping that, by the birth of a son, the succession of his half-brother Peter might be prevented. The dying emperor received into his emaciate, feeble arms the new bride who had been selected for him, Marva Matwiauna, and after a few weeks of languor and depression, died. He was deeply lamented by his subjects, for during his short reign of less than three years he had developed a noble character, and had accomplished more for the real prosperity of Russia than many a monarch in the longest occupation of the throne. Fyodor left two brothers, Ivan, a brother by the same mother, Eudocia, and Peter, the son of the second wife of Alexis. Ivan was very feeble in body and in mind, with dim vision and subject to epileptic fits. Fyodor consequently declared his younger brother Peter, who was but ten years of age, his successor. The custom of the empire allowed him to do this, and rendered this appointment valid. It was generally the doom of the daughters of the Russian emperors, who could seldom find a match equal to their rank, to pass their lives immured in a convent. Fyodor had a sister, Sophia, a very spirited, energetic woman, ambitious and resolute, whose whole soul revolted against such a moping existence. Seeing that Fyodor had but a short time to live, she left her convent and returned to the Kremlin, persisting in her resolve to perform all sisterly duties for her dying brother. Ivan, her own brother, was incapable of reigning from his infirmities. Peter, her half-brother, was but a child. Sophia, with wonderful energy, while tending at the couch of Fyodor, made herself familiar with the details of the administration, and, acting on behalf of the dying sovereign, gathered the reins of power into her own hands. As soon as Fyodor expired, and it was announced that Peter was appointed successor to the throne, to the exclusion of his elder brother Ivan, Sophia, through her emissaries, excited the militia of the capital to one of the most bloody revolts Moscow had ever witnessed. It was her intention to gain the throne for the imbecile Ivan, as she doubted not that she could, in that event, govern the empire at her pleasure. Peter, child as he was, had already developed a character of self-reliance, which taught Sophia that he would speedily wrest the scepter from her hands. The second day after the burial of Fyodor, the militia, or Strelitzes, as they were called, a body of citizen soldiers in Moscow, corresponding very much with the National Guard of Paris, surrounded the Kremlin, in a great tumult, and commenced complaining of nine of their colonels, who owed them some arrears of pay. They demanded that these officers should be surrendered to them, 
and their demand was so threatening that the court, intimidated, was compelled to yield. The wretched officers were seized by the mob, tied to the ground naked, upon their faces, and whipped with most terrible severity. The soldiers thus overawed opposition, and became a power which no one dared resist. Sophia was their inspiring genius, inciting and directing them through her emissaries. Though some have denied her complicity in these deeds of violence, still the prevailing voice of history is altogether against her. Sophia, having the terrors of the mob to wield, as her executive power, convened an assembly of the princes of the blood, the generals, the lords, the patriarch, and the bishops of the church, and even of the principal merchants. She urged upon them that Ivan, by right of birth, was entitled to the empire. The mother of Peter, Natalia Nariskin, now Empress Dowager, was still young and beautiful. She had two brothers occupying posts of influence at court. The family of the Nariskins had consequently much authority in the empire. Sophia dreaded the power of her mother-in-law, and her first efforts of intrigue were directed against the Nariskins. Her agents were everywhere busy, in the court and in the army, whispering insinuations against them. It was even intimated that they had caused the death of Fyodor, by bribing his physician to poison him, and that they had attempted the life of Ivan. At length, Sophia gave to her agents a list of forty lords, whom they were to denounce to the insurgent soldiery as enemies to them and to the state. This was the signal for their massacre. Two were first seized in the palace of the Kremlin, and thrown out of the window. The soldiers received them upon their pikes, and dragged their mutilated corpses through the streets to the great square of the city. They then rushed back to the palace, where they found Athanasius Nariskin, one of the brothers of the Queen Dowager. He was immediately murdered. They soon after found three of the proscribed in a church, to which they had fled as a sanctuary. Notwithstanding the sacredness of the church, the unhappy lords were instantly hewn to pieces by the swords of the assassins. Thus frenzied with blood, they met a young lord whom they mistook for Ivan Nariskin, the remaining brother of the mother of Peter. He was instantly slain, and then the assassins discovered their error. With some slight sense of justice, perhaps of humanity, they carried the bleeding corpse of the young nobleman to his father. The panic-stricken, heart-broken parent dared not rebuke them for the murder, but thanked them for bringing to him the corpse of his child. The mother, more impulsive and less cautious, broke out into bitter and almost delirious reproaches. The father, to appease her, said to her, in an undertone, Let us wait till the hour shall come when we shall be able to take revenge. Someone overheard the imprudent words, and reported them to the mob. They immediately returned, dragged the old man down the stairs of his palace by the hair, and cut his throat upon his own door sill. They were now searching the city, in all directions, for von Gaden, the German physician of the late Tsar, who was accused of administering to him poison. They met in the streets, the son of the physician, and demanded of him where his father was. The trembling lad replied that he did not know. They cut him down. Soon they met another German physician. You are a doctor, they said. If you have not poisoned our sovereign, you have poisoned others, and deserve death. He was immediately murdered. At length they discovered von Gaden. He had attempted to disguise himself in a beggar's garb. The worthy old man, who, like most eminent physicians, was as distinguished for humanity as for eminent medical skill, was dragged to the Kremlin. The princesses themselves came out and mingled with the crowd, begging for the life of the good man, assuring them that he had been a faithful physician, and that he had served their sovereign with zeal. The soldiers declared that he deserved to die, as they had positive proof that he was a sorcerer, for, in searching his apartments, they had found the skin of a snake and several reptiles preserved in bottles. Against such proof, no earthly testimony could avail. They also demanded that Ivan Nariskin, whom they had been seeking for two days, should be delivered up to them. They were sure that he was concealed somewhere in the Kremlin, and they threatened to set fire to the palace and burn it to the ground unless he were immediately delivered to them. It was evident that these threats would be promptly put into execution. Firing the palace would certainly ensure his death. There was the bare possibility of escape by surrendering him to the mob. The empress herself went to her brother in his concealment and informed him of the direful choice before him. The young prince sent for the patriarch, confessed his sins, partook of the Lord's Supper, received the sacrament of extreme unction in preparation for death, and was then led out by the patriarch himself, dressed in his pontifical robes and bearing an image of the Virgin Mary, and was delivered by him to the soldiers. 
The queen and the princesses accompanied the victim, surrounding him, and, falling upon their knees before the soldiers, they united with the patriarch in pleading for his life. But the mob, intoxicated and maddened, dragged the young prince and the physician before a tribunal, which they had constituted on the spot, and condemned them to what was expressively called the punishment of ten thousand slices. Their bodies were speedily cut into the smallest fragments, while their heads were stuck upon the iron spikes of the balustrade. These outrages were terminated by a proclamation from the soldiery that Ivan and Peter should be joint sovereigns under the regency of Sophia. The regent rewarded her partisans liberally for their efficient and successful measures. Upon the leaders she conferred the confiscated estates of the proscribed. A monument of shame was reared, upon which the names of the assassinated were engraved as traitors to their country. The soldiers were rewarded with double pay. Sophia unscrupulously usurped all the prerogatives and honors of royalty. All dispatches were sealed with her hand. Her effigy was stamped upon the current coin. She took her seat as presiding officer at the council. To confer a little more dignity upon the character of her imbecile brother, Ivan, she selected for him a wife, a young lady of extraordinary beauty, whose father had command of a fortress in Siberia. It was on the 25th of June, 1682, that Sophia assumed the regency. In 1684, Ivan was married. The scenes of violence which had occurred agitated the whole political atmosphere throughout the empire. There was intense exasperation, and many conspiracies were formed for the overthrow of the government. The most formidable of these conspiracies was organized by Kuvansky, commander-in-chief of the Strelitzes. He was dissatisfied with the rewards he had received, and, conscious that he had placed Sophia upon the throne through the energies of the soldiers he commanded, he believed that he might just as easily have placed himself there. Having become accustomed to blood, the slaughter of a few more persons, that he might place the crown upon his own brow, appeared to him a matter of but little moment. He accordingly planned to murder the two Tsars, the regent Sophia, and all the remaining princes of the royal family. Then, by lavishing abundant rewards upon the soldiers, he doubted not that he could secure their efficient cooperation in maintaining him on the throne. The conspiracy was discovered upon the eve of its accomplishment. Sophia immediately fled with the two Tsars and the princes to the monastery of the Trinity. This was a palace, a convent, and a fortress. The vast pile, reared of stone, was situated thirty-six miles from Moscow, and was encompassed with deep ditches, and massive ramparts bristling with cannon. The monks were in possession of the whole country for a space of twelve miles around this almost impregnable citadel. From this safe retreat, Sophia opened communications with the rebel chief. She succeeded in alluring him to come halfway to meet her in conference. A powerful band of soldiers, placed in ambush, seized him. He was immediately beheaded with one of his sons and thirty-seven strelitzes who had accompanied him. As soon as the strelitzes in Moscow, numbering many thousands, heard of the assassination of their general and of their comrades, they flew to arms, and in solid battalions, with infantry, artillery, and cavalry, marched to the assault of the convent. The regent rallied her supporters, consisting of the lords who were her partisans, and their vassals, and prepared for a vigorous defense. Russia seemed now upon the eve of a bloody civil war. The nobles generally espoused the cause of the Tsars under the regency of Sophia. Their claims seemed those of legitimacy, while the success of the insurrectionary soldiers promised only anarchy. The rise of the people in defense of the government was so sudden and simultaneous that the Strelitzes were panic-stricken, and soon, in the most abject submission, implored pardon, which was wisely granted them. Sophia, with the Tsars, surrounded by an army, returned in triumph to Moscow. Tranquility was thus restored. Sophia still held the reins of power with a firm grasp. The imbecility of Ivan and the youth of Peter rendered this usurpation easy. Very adroitly, she sent the most mutinous regiments of the Strelitzes on apparently honorable missions to the distant provinces of the Ukraine, Kassan, and Siberia. Poland, menaced by the Turks, made peace with Russia, and purchased her alliance by the surrender of the vast province of Smolensk and all the conquered territory in the Ukraine. In the year 1687, Sophia sent the first Russian embassy to France, which was then in the meridian of her splendor, under the reign of Louis XIV. Voltaire states that France, at that time, was so unacquainted with Russia that the Academy of Inscriptions celebrated this embassy by a medal, as if it had come from India. The Crimean Tartars, in confederacy with the Turks, 
kept Russia, Poland, Hungary, Transylvania, and the various provinces of the German Empire in perpetual alarm. Poland and Russia were so humiliated that for several years they had purchased exemption from these barbaric forays by paying the Tartars an annual tribute amounting to fifty thousand dollars each. Sophia, anxious to wipe out this disgrace, renewed the effort, which had so often failed, to unite all Europe against the Turks. Immense armies were raised by Russia and Poland and sent to the Tauride. For two years a bloody war raged with about equal slaughter upon both sides, while neither party gained any marked advantage. Peter had now attained his eighteenth year, and began to manifest pretty decisively a will of his own. He fell in love with a beautiful maiden, Autokessa Lepuchin, daughter of one of his nobles, and, notwithstanding all the intriguing opposition of Sophia, persisted in marrying her. This marriage increased greatly the popularity of the young prince, and it was very manifest that he would soon thrust Sophia aside, and with his own vigorous arm wield the scepter alone. The regent, whose hands were already stained with the blood of assassination, now resolved to remove Peter out of the way. The young prince, with his bride, was residing at his country seat, a few miles out from Moscow. Sophia, in that corrupt, barbaric age, found no difficulty in obtaining, with bribes, as many accomplices as she wanted. Two distinguished generals led a party of six hundred strelitzes out of the city, to surround the palace of Peter and to secure his death. The soldiers had already commenced their march, when Peter was informed of his danger. The Tsar leaped upon a horse, and spurring him to his utmost speed, accompanied by a few attendants, escaped to the convent of the Trinity, to which we have before alluded as one of the strongest fortresses of Russia. The mother, wife, and sister of the Tsar immediately joined him there. The soldiers were not aware of the mission which their leaders were intending to accomplish. When they arrived at the palace, and it was found that the Tsar had fled, and it was whispered about that he had fled to save his life, the soldiers, by nature more strongly attached to a chivalrous young man than to an intriguing, ambitious woman, whose character was of very doubtful reputation, broke out into open revolt, and, abandoning their officers, marched directly to the monastery and offered their services to Peter. The patriarch, whose religious character gave him almost unbounded influence with the people, also found that he was included as one of the victims of the conspiracy, that he was to have been assassinated, and his place conferred upon one of the partisans of Sophia. He also fled to the convent of the Trinity. Sophia now found herself deserted by the soldiery and the nation. She accordingly, with the most solemn protestations, declared that she had been accused falsely, and after sending messenger after messenger to plead her cause with her brother, resolved to go herself. She had not advanced more than halfway, ere she was met by a detachment of Peter's friends who informed her, from him, that she must go directly back to Moscow, as she could not be received into the convent. The next day Peter assembled a council, and it was resolved to bring the traitors to justice. A colonel, with three hundred men, was sent to the Kremlin to arrest the officers implicated in the conspiracy. They were loaded with chains, conducted to the Trinity, and in accordance with the barbaric custom of the times, were put to the torture. In agony too dreadful to be borne, they of course made any confession which was demanded. Peter was reluctant to make a public example of his sister. There ensued a series of punishments of the conspirators too revolting to be narrated. The mildest of these punishments was exile to Siberia, there, in the extremest penury, to linger through scenes of woe so long as God should prolong their lives. The executions being terminated and the exiles out of sight, Sophia was ordered to leave the Kremlin and retire to the cloisters of Denitz, which he was never again to leave. Peter then made a triumphal entry into Moscow. He was accompanied by a guard of eighteen thousand troops. His feeble brother Ivan received him at the outer gate of the Kremlin. They embraced each other with much affection, and then retired to their respective apartments. The wife and mother of Peter accompanied him on his return to Moscow. Thus terminated the regency of Sophia. From this time Peter was the real sovereign of Russia. His brother Ivan took no other share in the government than that of lending his name to the public acts. He lived for a few years in great seclusion, almost forgotten, and died in 1696. Peter was physically, as well as intellectually, a remarkable man. He was tall and finely formed, with noble features lighted up with an extremely brilliant eye. His constitution was robust, enabling him to undergo great hardship, and he was, by nature, a man of great activity and energy. His education, however, was exceedingly defective. The regent Sophia had not only exerted all her influence to keep him in ignorance, 
but also to allure him into the wildest excesses of youthful indulgence. Even his recent marriage had not interfered with the publicity of his amours, and all distinguished foreigners in Moscow were welcomed by him to scenes of feasting and carousing. Notwithstanding these deplorable defects of character, for which much allowance is to be made from the neglect of his education and his peculiar temptations, still it was manifest to close observers even then that the seeds of true greatness were implanted in his nature. When five years of age he was riding with his mother in a coach, and was asleep in her arms. As they were passing over a bridge, where there was a heavy fall of water from spring rains, the roar of the cataract awoke him. The noise, with the sudden aspect of the rushing torrent, created such terror that he was thrown into a fever, and, for years, he could not see any standing water, much less a running stream, without being thrown almost into convulsions. To overcome this weakness, he resolutely persisted in plunging into the waves, until his aversion was changed into a great fondness for that element. Ashamed of his ignorance, he vigorously commenced studying German, and, notwithstanding all the seductions of the court, succeeded in acquiring such a mastery of the language as to be able both to speak and write it correctly. Peter's father, Alexis, had been anxious to open the fields of commerce to his subjects. He had, at great expense, engaged the services of shipbuilders and navigators from Holland. A frigate and a yacht had been constructed, with which the Volga had been navigated to its mouth at Astrakhan. It was his intention to open a trade with Persia through the Caspian Sea. But, in a revolt at Astrakhan, the vessels were seized and destroyed, and the captain killed. Thus terminated this enterprise. The master builder, however, remained in Russia, where he lived a long time in obscurity. One day, Peter, at one of his summer palaces of Izmailov, saw upon the shore of the lake the remains of a pleasure-boat of peculiar construction. He had never before seen any boat but such as was propelled by oars. The peculiarity of the structure of this arrested his attention, and, being informed that it was constructed for sails as well as oars, he ordered it to be repaired, that he might make trial of it. It so chanced that the shipwright, Brandt, from Holland, who had built the boat, was found, and the Tsar, to his great delight, enjoyed, for the first time in his life, the pleasures of a sail. He immediately gave directions for the boat to be transported to the great lake near the convent of the Trinity, and here he ordered two frigates and three yachts to be built. For months he amused himself piloting his little fleet over the waves of the lake. Like many a plebeian boy, the Tsar had now acquired a passion for the sea, and he longed to get a sight of the ocean. With this object in view, in 1694 he set out on a journey of nearly a thousand miles to Archangel, on the shores of the White Sea. Taking his shipwrights with him, he had a small vessel constructed, in which he embarked for the exploration of the frozen ocean, a body of water which no sovereign had seen before him. A Dutch man-of-war, which chanced to be in the harbour at Archangel, and all the merchant fleet there accompanied the Tsar on this expedition. The sovereign himself had already acquired much of the art of working a ship, and on this trip devoted all his energies to improvement in the science and practical skill of navigation. While the Tsar was thus turning his attention to the subject of a navy, he at the same time was adopting measures of extraordinary vigour for the reorganization of the army. Hither, though, the army had been composed of bands of vassals, poorly armed and without discipline, led by their lords, who were often entirely without experience in the arts of war. Peter commenced, at his country residence, with a company of fifty picked men, who were put through the most thorough drill by General Gordon, a Scotchman of much military ability, who had secured the confidence of the Tsar. Some of the sons of the lords were chosen as their officers, but these young nobles were all trained by the same military discipline. Peter setting them the example by passing through all the degrees of the service from the very lowest rank. He shouldered his musket, and commencing at the humblest post, served as sentinel, sergeant, and lieutenant. No one ventured to refuse to follow in the footsteps of his sovereign. This company, thus formed and disciplined, was rapidly increased until it became the royal guard, most terrible on the field of battle. When this regiment numbered five thousand men, another regiment upon the same principle was organized, which contained twelve thousand. It is a remarkable fact, stated by Voltaire, that one-third of these troops were French refugees, driven from France by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. One of the first efforts of the far-sighted monarch was to consolidate the army and to bring it under the energy of one mind, by breaking down the independence of the nobles, who had heretofore acted as petty sovereigns, leading their contingents of vassals. Peter was thus preparing to make the influence of Russia felt among the armies of Europe, as it had never been felt before. 
the Russian Empire, sweeping across Siberian Asia, reached down indefinitely to about the latitude of 52 degrees, where it was met by the Chinese claims. Very naturally, a dispute arose respecting the boundaries, and with a degree of good sense which seems almost incredible in view of the developments of history, the two half-civilized nations decided to settle the question by conference rather than by war. A place of meeting for the ambassadors was appointed on the frontiers of Siberia, about 900 miles from the great Chinese wall. Fortunately for both parties, there were some Christian missionaries who accompanied the Chinese as interpreters. Probably through the influence of these men of peace, a treaty was soon formed. Both parties pledged themselves to the observance of the treaty in the following words, which were doubtless written by the missionaries. If any of us entertain the least thought of renewing the flames of war, we beseech the supreme Lord of all things, who knows the heart of man, to punish the traitor with sudden death. Two large pillars were erected upon the spot to mark the boundaries between the two empires, and the treaty was engraved upon each of them. Soon after, a treaty of commerce was formed, which commerce, with brief interruptions, has continued to flourish until the present day. Peter now prepared, with his small but highly disciplined army, to make vigorous warfare upon the Turks, and to obtain, if possible, the control of the Black Sea. Early in the summer of 1695, the Russian army commenced its march. Striking the head waters of the Don, they descended the valley of that river to attack the city of Azov, an important port of the Turks, situated on an island at the mouth of the Don. The Tsar accompanied his troops, not as commander-in-chief, but a volunteer soldier. Generals Gordon and Lefort, veteran officers, had the command of the expedition. Azov was a very strong fortress, and was defended by a numerous garrison. It was found necessary to invest the place and commence a regular siege. A foreign officer from Danzig, by the name of Jacob, had the direction of the battering train. For some violation of military etiquette, he had been condemned to ignominious punishment. The Russians were accustomed to such treatment, but Jacob, burning with revenge, spiked his guns, deserted, joined the enemy, adopted the Mussulman faith, and with great vigor conducted the defense. Jacob was a man of much military science, and he succeeded in thwarting all the efforts of the besiegers. In the attempt to storm the town, the Russians were repulsed with great loss, and at length were compelled to raise the siege and to retire. But Peter was not a man to yield to difficulties. The next summer he was found before Azov, with a still more formidable force. In this attempt the Tsar was successful, and on the 28th of July the garrison surrendered without obtaining any of the honors of war. Elated with success, Peter increased the fortifications, dug a harbor capable of holding large ships, and prepared to fit out a strong fleet against the Turks, which fleet was to consist of nine sixty-gun ships, and forty-one of from thirty to fifty guns. While the fleet was being built he returned to Moscow, and to impress his subjects with a sense of the great victory obtained, he marched the army into Moscow beneath triumphal arches, while the whole city was surrendered to all the demonstrations of joy. Characteristically, Peter refused to take any of the credit of the victory which had been gained by the skill and valor of his generals. These officers consequently took the precedency of their sovereign in the triumphal procession, Peter declaring that merit was the only road to military preferment, and that, as yet, he had attained no rank in the army. In imitation of the ancient Romans, the captives taken in the war were led in the train of the victors. The unfortunate Jacob was carried in a cart, with a rope about his neck, and, after being broken upon the wheel, was ignominiously hung. End of chapter 18 Recording by Jeff Kluckner, Plymouth, UK Chapter 19 of The Empire of Russia from the remotest periods to the present time. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Bascom. The Empire of Russia from the Remotest Periods to the Present Time by John S. C. Abbott. Chapter 19. Peter the Great. From 1697 to 1702. Young Russians sent to foreign countries. The Tsar decides upon a tour of observation. His plan of travel. Anecdote. Peter's mode of life in Holland. Characteristic anecdotes. The presentation of the ambassador. The Tsar visits England. Life at Deptford. Illustrious foreigners engaged in his service. 
Peter visits Vienna. The game of landlord. Insurrection in Moscow. Return of the Tsar and measures of severity. War with Sweden. Disastrous defeat of Narva. Efforts to secure the shores of the Baltic. Designs upon the Black Sea. It was a source of mortification to the Tsar that he was dependent upon foreigners for the construction of his ships. He accordingly sent sixty young Russians to the seaports of Venice and Leghorn in Italy to acquire the art of shipbuilding and to learn scientific and practical navigation. Soon after this he sent forty more to Holland for the same purpose. He sent also a large number of young men to Germany to learn the military discipline of that warlike people. He now adopted the extraordinary resolve of traveling himself, incognito, through most of the countries of Europe, that he might see how they were governed, and might become acquainted with the progress they had made in the arts and sciences. In this European tour he decided to omit Spain, because the arts there were but little cultivated, and France, because he disliked the pompous ceremonials of the court of Louis the Fourteenth. His plan of travel was as ingenious as it was odd. An extraordinary embassage was sent by him as Emperor of Russia to all the leading courts of Europe. These ambassadors received minute instructions and were fitted out for their expedition with splendor which should add to the renown of the Russian monarchy. Peter followed in the retinue of this embassage as a private gentleman of wealth, with the servants suitable for his station. Three nobles of the highest dignity were selected as ambassadors. Their retinue consisted of four secretaries, twelve gentlemen, two pages for each ambassador, and a company of fifty of the royal guard. The whole embassage embraced two hundred persons. The Tsar was lost to view in this crowd. He reserved for himself one valet de chambre, one servant in livery, and a dwarf. It was, says Voltaire, a thing unparalleled in history, either ancient or modern, for a sovereign of five and twenty years of age to withdraw from his kingdoms only to learn the art of government. The regency during his absence was entrusted to two of the lords in whom he reposed confidence, who were to consult in cases of importance with the rest of the nobility. General Gordon, the Scotch officer, was placed in command of four thousand of the royal troops to secure the peace of the capital. The ambassadors commenced their journey in April, 1697. Passing directly west from Moscow to Novgorod, they thence traversed the province of Livonia until they reached Riga, at the mouth of the Duina. Peter was anxious to examine the important fortifications of this place, but the governor peremptorily forbade it. Riga then belonged to Sweden. Peter did not forget the affront. Continuing their journey, they arrived at Konigsberg, the capital of the feeble electorate of Brandenburg, which has since grown into the kingdom of Prussia. The elector, an ambitious man, who subsequently took the title of king, received them with an extravagant display of splendor. At one of the Bacchanalian feasts given on the occasion, the bad and good qualities of Peter were very conspicuously displayed. Heated with wine, and provoked by a remark made by Lafort, who was one of his ambassadors, he drew his sword and called upon Lafort to defend himself. The ambassador humbly bowed, folded his hands upon his breast, and said, Far be it from me, rather let me perish by the hand of my master. The Tsar, enraged and intoxicated, raised his arm to strike, when one of the retinue seized the uplifted hand and averted the blow. Peter immediately recovered his self-possession, and sheathing his sword, said to his ambassador, I ask your pardon. It is my great desire to reform my subjects, and yet I am ashamed to confess that I am unable to reform myself. From Konigsberg they continued their route to Berlin, and thence to Hamburg, near the mouth of the Elbe, which was, even then, an important maritime town. They then turned their steps towards Amsterdam. As soon as they reached Emmerich on the Rhine, the Tsar, impatient of the slow progress of the embassage, forsook his companions, and hiring a small boat, sailed down the Rhine and proceeded to Amsterdam, reaching that city fifteen days before the embassy. He flew through the city, says one of the analysts of those days, like lightning, and proceeded to a small but active seaport town on the coast, Zandam. The first person they saw here was a man fishing from a small skiff at a short distance from the shore. 
the czar who was dressed like a common dutch skipper in a red jacket and white linen trousers hailed the man and engaged lodgings of him consisting of two small rooms with a loft over them and an adjoining shed strangely enough this man whose name was kissed had been in russia working as a smith and he knew the czar he was strictly enjoined on no account to let it be known who his lodger was a group soon gathered around the strangers with many questions peter told them that they were carpenters and laborers from a foreign country in search of work but no one believed this for the attendants of the czar still wore the rich robes which constituted the costume of russia with sympathy as beautiful as it is rare peter called upon several families of ship carpenters who had worked for him and with him at archangel and to some of these families he gave valuable presents which he said that the czar of russia had sent to them he clothed himself and ordered his companions to clothe themselves in the ordinary dress of the dockyard and purchasing carpenter's tools they all went vigorously to work the next day was the sabbath the arrival of these strangers so peculiar in aspect and conduct was noised abroad and when peter awoke in the morning he was greatly annoyed by finding a large crowd assembled before his door indeed the rumor of the russian embassage and that the czar himself was to accompany it had already reached amsterdam and it was shrewdly suspected that these strangers were in some way connected with the expected arrival of the ambassadors one of the barbers in amsterdam had received from a ship carpenter and archangel a portrait of the czar which had been for some time hanging in his shop he was with the crowd around the door the moment his eye rested on peter he exclaimed with astonishment that is the czar his form features and character were all so marked that he could not easily be mistaken no further efforts were made at concealment though peter was often very much annoyed by the crowds who followed his footsteps and watched all his actions he was persuaded to change his lodgings to more suitable apartments though he still wore his workman's dress and toiled in the shipyard with energy and also with skill which no one could surpass the extraordinary rapidity of his motions astonished and amused the dutch such running jumping and clamoring over the shipping they said we never witnessed before to the patriarch in moscow he wrote i am living in obedience to the commands of god which were spoken to father adam in the sweat of thy brow shalt thou eat thy bread very many anecdotes are related of peter during this portion of his life which though they may be apocryphal are very characteristic of his eccentric nature at one time he visited a celebrated iron manufactory and forged himself several bars of iron directing his companions to assist him in the capacity of journeyman blacksmiths upon the bars he forged he put his own mark and then he demanded of muller the proprietor payment for his work at the same rate he paid other workmen having received eighteen altins he said looking at the patched shoes on his feet this will serve me to buy a pair of shoes of which i stand in great need i have earned them well by the sweat of my brow with hammer and anvil when the ambassadors entered amsterdam peter thought it proper to take a part in the procession which was arranged in the highest style of magnificence the three ambassadors rode first followed by a long train of carriages with servants in rich livery on foot the czar dressed as a private gentleman was in one of the last carriages in the train of his ambassadors the eyes of the populace searched for him in vain from this fete he returned eagerly to his work with saw hammer and adze at zandam he persisted in living like the rest of the workmen rising early building his own fire and often cooking his own meals one of the inhabitants of zandam thus describes his appearance at that time the czar is very tall and robust quick and nimble of foot dexterous and rapid in all his actions his face is plump and round fierce in his look with brown eyebrows and short curly hair of a brownish color he is quick in his gait swinging his arms and holding in one of them a cane the dutch were so much interested in him that a regular diary was kept in zandam of all he said and did those who were in daily intercourse with him preserved a memorandum of all that occurred he was generally called by the name of master peter while hard at work in the shipyard he received intelligence of troubles in poland the renowned king john sobieski died in sixteen ninety six the electors were divided in the choice of a successor augustus the second elector of saxony by means of bribes and his army obtained the vote but there was great dissatisfaction and a large party of the nation rallied around the prince of conti the rival candidate peter learning these facts immediately sent word from his carpenter's shop to augustus offering to send an army of thirty thousand men to his assistance 
he frequently went from zaandam to amsterdam to attend the anatomical lectures of the celebrated ruche his thirst for knowledge appeared to be universal and insatiable he even performed himself several surgical operations he also studied natural philosophy under witzen most minds would have been bewildered by such a multiplicity of employments but his mental organization was of that peculiar class which grasps and retains all within its reach he worked at the forge in the rope walks at the sawing mill and in the manufactures for wire drawing making paper and extracting oil while at zaandam peter finished a sixty-gun ship upon which he had worked diligently from the laying of the keel as the russians then had no harbor in the baltic this ship was sent to archangel on the shores of the white sea peter also engaged a large number of french refugees and swiss and german artists to enter his service and sent them to moscow whenever he found a mechanic whose work testified to superior skill he would secure him at almost any price and send him to moscow to geography he devoted great attention and even then devised the plan of uniting the caspian and the black sea by a ship canal early in january sixteen ninety eight peter having passed nine months at zaandam left for the hague king william the third sent his yacht to the hague to convey the czar to england with a convoy of two ships of war peter left the hague on the eighteenth of january and arrived in london on the twenty first though he attempted here no secrecy as to his rank he requested to be treated only as a private gentleman a large mansion was engaged for him near the royal navy yard at deptford a small town upon the thames about four miles from london the london postman one of the leading metropolitan journals of that day thus announces this extraordinary visit the czar of muscovy desiring to raise the glory of his nation and avenge the christians of all the injuries they have received from the turks has abrogated the wild manners of his predecessors and having concluded from the behavior of his engineers and officers who were sent him by the elector of brandenburg that the western nations of europe understood the art of war better than others he resolved to take a journey thither and not wholly to rely upon the relations which his ambassadors might give him and at the same time to send a great number of his nobility into those parts through which he did not intend to travel that he might have a complete idea of the affairs of europe and enrich his subjects with the arts of all other christian nations and as navigation is the most useful invention that ever was yet found out he seems to have chosen it as his own part in the general inquiry he is about his design is certainly very noble and discovers the greatness of his genius but the model he has proposed himself to imitate is a convincing proof of his extraordinary judgment for what other prince in the world was a fitter pattern for the great emperor of muscovy than william the third king of great britain in london and deptford peter followed essentially the same mode of life which he had adopted in amsterdam there was not a single article belonging to a ship from the casting of a cannon to the making of cables to which he did not devote special attention he also devoted some time to watchmaking. A number of English artificers, and also several literary and scientific gentlemen from England, were taken into his service. He made arrangements with a distinguished Scotch geometrician and two mathematicians from Christchurch Hospital to remove to Moscow, who laid the foundation in Russia of the Marine Academy. To astronomy, the calculation of eclipses, and the laws of gravitation he devoted much thought guided by the most scientific men England could then produce. Perry, an English engineer, was sent to Russia to survey a route for a ship canal from the ocean to the Caspian, and from the Caspian to the Black Sea. A company of merchants paid the Tsar $75,000 for permission to import tobacco into Russia. The sale of this narcotic had heretofore been discouraged in Russia by the Church as demoralizing in its tendency and inducing untidy habits. Peter was occasionally induced to attend the theatre, but he had no relish for that amusement. He visited the various churches and observed the mode of conducting religious worship by the several sects. Before leaving England, the Tsar was entertained by King William with the spectacle of a sham sea-fight. In this scene Peter was in his element, and in the excess of his delight he declared that an English admiral must be a happier man than even the Tsar of Russia. His Britannic Majesty made his guest also a present of a beautiful yacht called the Royal Transport. In this vessel Peter returned to Holland in May 1698, having passed four months in England. 
he took with him quite a colony of emigrants consisting of three captains of men of war twenty-five captains of merchant ships forty lieutenants thirty pilots thirty surgeons two hundred and fifty gunners and three hundred artificers these men from holland sailed in the royal transport to archangel from whence they were sent to different places where their services were needed the officers whom the czar sent to italy also led back to russia many artists from that country from holland the emperor of russia with his suite repaired to vienna to observe the military discipline of the germans who had then the reputation of being the best soldiers in europe he also wished to enter into a closer alliance with the austrian court as his natural ally against the turks peter however insisted upon laying aside all the ceremonials of royalty and as a private person held an interview with the emperor leopold nothing of a special interest occurred during the brief residence of peter in vienna the emperor of germany paid the czar every possible attention which could be conferred upon one who had the strongest reluctance to be gazed upon or to take part in any parade for the amusement of the czar the emperor revived the ancient game of landlord the royal game is as follows the emperor is landlord the empress landlady the heir apparent to the throne the archdukes and archduchesses are generally their assistants they entertain people of all nations dressed after the most ancient fashion of their respective countries the invited guests draw lots for tickets on each of which is written the name or nation of the character they are to represent one is a chinese mandarin another a persian mirza another a roman senator a queen perhaps represents a dairymaid or a nursery girl a king or prince represents a miller a peasant or a soldier characteristic amusements are introduced the landlord and landlady with their family wait upon the table on this occasion the emperor's eldest son joseph who was the heir apparent represented with the countess of tron the ancient egyptians his brother the archduke charles and the countess of walstein appeared as flemings in the reign of charles v his sister mary and count fran were tartars josephine another daughter of leopold with the count of Warkla, represented persians marianne a third daughter and prince maximilian of hanover were north holland peasants peter presented himself as a friesland boar a character we regret to say which the czar could personify without making the slightest change in his usual habits for peter was quite a stranger to the graces of the polished gentleman this game seems to have been quite a favorite in the austrian court maria antoinette introduced it to versailles the tourist is still shown the dairy where that unhappy queen made butter and cheese the mill where louis the sixteenth ground his grist and the mimic village tavern where the king and queen of france as landlord and landlady received their guests peter was just leaving vienna to go to venice when he received intelligence that a rebellion had broken out in moscow his ambitious sister Sophia, who had been placed with a shaven head in the cloisters of a monastery, took advantage of the Tsar's absence to make another attempt to regain the crown. She represented that the nation was in danger of being overrun with foreigners, that their ancient customs would all be abolished, and that their religion would be subverted. She involved several of the clergy in her plans, and a band of eight thousand insurgents were assembled, who commenced their march towards Moscow, hoping to rouse the metropolis to unite with them general gordon whom peter had left in command of the royal guard met them and a battle ensued in which a large number of the insurgents were slain and the rest were taken prisoners and conducted to the capital hearing these tidings peter abandoned all plans for visiting italy and set out impetuously for moscow and arrived at the kremlin before it was known that he had left germany peter was a rough stern man and he determined to punish the abettors of this rebellion with severity which should appall all the discontented general gordon in the battle had slain three thousand of the insurgents and had taken five thousand captive these prisoners he had punished decimating them by lot and hanging every tenth man peter rewarded magnificently the royal guard and then commenced the terrible chastisement of all who were judged guilty of sympathizing in the conspiracy some were broken on the wheel and then beheaded others were hung in chains on gibbets near the gates of the city and left frozen as solid as marble to swing in the wind through the long months of winter stone monuments were erected on which were engraved the names the crimes and the punishment of the rebels a large number were banished to siberia to astrakhan and to the shores of the sea of azov the entire corps of the strelitzis was abolished and their place supplied by the new guard marshalled and disciplined on the model of the german troops 
The long and cumbersome robes which had been in fashion were exchanged for a uniform better adapted for rapid motion. The sons of the nobles were compelled to serve in the ranks as common soldiers before they could be promoted to officers. Many of the young nobles were sent to the Tsar's fleet in the Sea of Azov to serve their apprenticeship for the navy. The revenue of the empire had thus far been raised by the payment of a stipulated sum from each noble according to his amount of land. The noble collected this sum from his vassals or bondmen, but they often failed of paying in the amount demanded. Peter took now the collection of the revenue into his own hands, appointing officers for that purpose. Reforms in the church he also undertook. The patriarch Adrian, who was the pope of the Greek church, dying about this time, Peter declared that he should have no successor. Virtually assuming the authority of the head of the church, he gathered the immense revenues of the patriarchal see into the royal treasury. Though professedly entrusting the government of the church to the bishops, he controlled them with despotism which could brook no opposition. Anxious to promote the population of his vast empire so sparsely inhabited, he caused a decree to be issued that all the clergy of every grade should be married, and that, whenever one of the clergy lost a wife, his clerical functions should cease until he obtained another. Regarding the monastic vow, which consigned young men and young women to a life of indolence in the cloister, as alike injurious to morality and to the interests of the state, he forbade any one from taking that vow until after the age of fifty had been passed. This salutary regulation has since his time been repealed. The year in Russia had for ages commenced with the 1st of September. Peter ordered that, in conformity with the custom in the rest of Europe, the year should commence with the 1st of January. This alteration took place in the year 1700, and was celebrated with the most imposing solemnities. The national dress of the Russians was a long flowing robe which required no skill in cutting or making. Razors were also scarce, and every man wore his beard. The Tsar ordered long robes and beards to be laid aside. No man was admitted to the palace without a neatly shaven face. Throughout the empire a penalty was imposed upon anyone who persisted in wearing his beard. A smooth face thus became in Russia and has continued to the present day the badge of culture and refinement. Peter also introduced social parties, to which ladies with their daughters were invited, dressed in the fashions of southern Europe. Heretofore, whenever a Russian addressed the Tsar, he always said, Your slave begs, etc. Peter abolished this word and ordered subject to be used instead. Public inns were established on the highways and relays of horses for the convenience of travelers. Conscious of the power of splendor to awe the public mind, he added very considerably to the magnificence of his court, and instituted an order of knighthood. In all these measures Peter wielded the energies of an unrelenting despotism, and yet of a despotism which was constantly devoted not to his own personal aggrandizement, but to the welfare of his country. The Tsar established his great shipyard at Voronezh on the Don, from which place he could float his ships down to the Sea of Azov, hoping to establish there a fleet which would soon give him the command of the Black Sea. In March 1699 he had thirty-six ships launched and rigged, carrying each from thirty to sixty guns, and there were then twenty more ships on the stocks. There were also, either finished or in process of construction, eighteen large galleys, one hundred small brigantines, seven bomb ships, and four fire ships. At the same time, Peter was directing his attention to the Volga and the Caspian, and still more vigorously to the Baltic, upon whose shores he had succeeded in obtaining a foothold. And now the kingdom of Sweden came with a rush into the political arena. Poland had ceded to Sweden nearly the whole of Livonia. The Livonians were very much dissatisfied with the administration of the government under Charles the Eleventh, and sent a deputation to Stockholm to present respectful remonstrances. The indignant king consigned all of the deputation consisting of eight gentlemen to prison, and condemned the leader, John Patgall, to an ignominious death. Patgall escaped from prison, and hastening to Poland, urged the new sovereign, Augustus, to reconquer the province of Livonia, which Poland had lost assuring him the Livonians would aid with all their energies to throw off the Swedish yoke. Patgall hastened from Poland to Moscow and urged Peter to unite with Augustus in a war against Sweden, assuring him that thus he could easily regain the provinces of Ingria and Karelia, which Sweden had wrested from his ancestors. Denmark also, under its new sovereign, Frederick IV, was induced to enter into the alliance with Russia and Poland against Sweden. 
just at that time charles the eleventh died and his son charles the twelfth a young man of eighteen ascended the throne the youth and inexperience of the new monarch encouraged the allies in the hope that they might make an easy conquest charles the twelfth a man of indomitable of maniacal energy and who speedily infused into his soldiers his own spirit came down upon denmark like northern wolves into southern flocks and herds in less than six weeks the war was terminated and the danes thoroughly humbled then with his fleet of thirty sail of the line and a vast number of transports he crossed the baltic entered the gulf of finland and marching over ice and snow encountered the russians at narva a small town about eighty miles southwest of the present site of the city of st petersburg the russians were drawn up eighty thousand strong behind entrenchments lined with one hundred and forty-five pieces of artillery charles the twelfth had but nine thousand men taking advantage of one of the fiercest of wintry storms which blew directly into the faces of the russians smothering them with the snow and sleet mingled with smoke and which concealed both the numbers and the movements of the swedes charles the twelfth hurled his battalions with such impetuosity upon the foe that in less than an hour the camp was taken by storm one of the most awful routs known in the annals of war ensued the swedes toiled to utter exhaustion in cutting down the flying fugitives thirty thousand russians perished on that bloody field nearly all of the remainder were taken captive with all their artillery disarmed and with uncovered heads thirty thousand of these prisoners defiled before the victorious king peter the day before this disastrous battle had left the entrenchments at narva to go to novgorod ostensibly to hasten forward the march of some reinforcements when peter was informed of the annihilation of his army he replied with characteristic coolness i know very well that the swedes will have the advantage of us for a considerable time but they will teach us at length to beat them he immediately collected the fragments of his army at novgorod and repairing to moscow issued orders for ascertained proportions of the bells of the church and convents throughout the empire to be cast into cannon and mortars in a few months one hundred pieces of cannon for sieges and forty-two field pieces with twelve mortars and thirteen howitzers were sent to the army which was rapidly being rendezvoused at novgorod charles the twelfth having struck this terrific blow left the czar to recover as best he could and turned his attention to poland resolved to hurl augustus from the throne peter himself hurried to poland to encourage augustus to the most vigorous prosecution of the war promising to send him speedily twenty thousand troops in the midst of these disasters and turmoil the czar continued to prosecute his own plans for the internal improvement of his empire and commenced the vast enterprise of digging a canal which should unite the waters of the baltic with the caspian first by connecting the don with the volga and then by connecting the don with the duina which empties into the baltic near riga war continued to rage very fiercely for many months between the swedes on one side and russia and poland on the other charles the twelfth gaining almost constant victories the Swedes so signally proved their superiority in these conflicts that when on one occasion eight thousand Russians repulsed four thousand Swedes, the Tsar said, Well, we have at last beaten the Swedes, when we were two to one against them. We shall by and by be able to face them man to man. In these conflicts it was the constant aim of Peter to get a foothold upon the shores of the Baltic, that he might open to his empire the advantages of commerce. He launched a large fleet upon Lake Ladoga, a large inland sea, which, by the river Neva, connects with the gulf of finland the fleets of sweden penetrated these remote waters and for months their solitudes resounded with the roar of naval conflicts we cannot refrain from recording the heroic conduct of colonel slippenbuck the swedish commander of the town of notberg on this lake the town was invested by a large russian army for a month the russians battered the town night and day until it presented the aspect of a pile of ruins and the garrison was reduced to one hundred men yet so indomitable was this little band that standing in the breaches they extorted honorable terms of capitulation from their conqueror they would not surrender but on condition of being allowed to send for two swedish officers who should examine their remaining means of defence and inform their master charles the twelfth that it was impossible for them to any longer preserve the town peter was a man of too strong sense to be elated and vainglorious in view of such success he knew full well that Charles the Twelfth, since the Battle of Narva, looked with utter contempt upon the Russian soldiers, and he was himself fully conscious of the vast superiority of the Swedish troops. 
but while Charles the Twelfth, with a monarch's energies, was battering down fortresses and cutting to pieces the armies of Poland, Peter had gained several victories over small detachments of Swedish troops left in Russia. To inspire his soldiers with more confidence, he ordered a very magnificent celebration of these victories in Moscow. It was one of the most gorgeous fete days the metropolis had ever witnessed. The Swedish banners taken in several conflicts on sea and land were borne in front of the procession, while all the prisoners taken in the campaign were marched in humiliation in the train of the victors. While thus employed, the stern, indefatigable Tsar was pressing forward the building of his fleet on the dawn for the conquest of the Black Sea, and was unwearied in his endeavors to promote the elevation of his still semi-barbaric realms by the introduction of the sciences, the arts, the manufactures, and the social refinements of southern Europe. Footnote 11. Postman number 417. Footnote 12. These are the numbers as accurately as they can now be ascertained by the most careful sifting of the contradictory accounts. The forces of the Russians have been variously estimated at from 40,000 to 100,000. That the Swedes had but 9,000 is admitted on all hands. End of chapter 19